from Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. Hi. Pat Keller, Universal Adjustment Bureau. Good to hear your voice, Patsy. Thought you were transferred to Baltimore. That's where I am. Say, John, can you handle one for me? What kind of one? It's a life and accident policy. Eastern Fidelity paid off five years ago. A man named John Reardon was the insured party. He died in 1950. Wife was a beneficiary. It's a crazy one. Well, go on. Eastern wants us to look into the matter QT. One of their officers has reason to believe Reardon is still alive. Why would he think that? Because he saw him two days ago. I'll get the first plane. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Baltimore, Maryland. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Chesapeake fraud matter. Expense account item one, $22.75. Plane fare and incidentals, Hartford to Baltimore. I arrived at 3.15 in the afternoon at Friendship International Airport. It was a cold, gray day. I took a cab directly to Pat Callahan's office. <laughs> Good to see you, John. He was ten pounds heavier. Outside of that, he looked swell. Ah, uh, we'll have to have dinner once you eat my wife. Where are your bags? You didn't go to a hotel. I checked my stuff at the airport, Patsy. I didn't know how long I'd be here. Over the Alleghenies on the plane, I got to thinking about the number of alive but dead reports I've investigated at one time or another. They happen all the time, or they never pan out. Yeah, well, this one isn't like that, John. Sit down. Thanks. You no, know, and a man like Paul Coombs, chairman of the board for Eastern Fidelity, not to mention vice president of two oil companies and one construction company, when he romps in here and says somebody's still alive, it's supposed to be dead, we got to listen to him. Sure you do, Pat. It's your job. Your job now. Coombs claims he not only saw Reardon, but talked to him. I'll go into that later. Policy was issued in 1944. Mm-hmm. My wife's a beneficiary. Yeah. Elizabeth Jane Reardon, $10,000. 20, John. Double indemnity on the accident clause. Oh. Well, look, I'll look at this stuff later. Maybe you'd better tell me about that first. Okay. John Reardon was lost in a boat accident out on Chesapeake Bay. When? August 13th, 1950. There were four people in the party. They went out for the afternoon on a power cruiser, and the thing exploded in the middle of the bay. Yeah, I may have read about it. Was there a man named Sharpston involved? Yeah, yeah. uh, Sharpston owned the boat. He and his wife were aboard, and another man named Blaine. Did all of them go down? That's right. They recovered Mr. and Mrs. Sharpston's body and Blaine's. They never found John Reardon. What caused the explosion? No explainable reason. It was never determined. Oh, there's always a reason. Yeah, well, that probably blew up with the boat, too. As it happened, we conducted the investigation for Atlantic States Limited. They held the insurance on the Sharpstons and the boat. These are our findings in the matter. We found no reason for Atlantic not to honor the claim made by Sharpston's estate. Mm-hmm. How about the other man who was killed, Blaine? His case was adjusted by another company. So that leaves us John Reardon. Yeah. About a month after the accident, his wife filed claim for payment. Our investigation was ended by then. We notified the insurance commissioner of the circumstances of his death and requested a judgment. Routine. Did it go through all right? Yeah. The appellate court declared John Reardon legally dead after the required three-year waiting period. Pretty standard when there's no body. Sure. Eastern honored the claim and paid Mrs. Reardon $20,000. So, that's about it. Except that now somebody thinks he's alive. Not just somebody. Paul Coombs. Yeah, yeah. And if that's so, Eastern's been swindled for $20,000. Tell me about the beneficiary. Miss Reardon? Mm Mm-hmm. Nice woman. Met her a couple of times. She didn't need money, I can tell you that much. Oh? Yeah, worth over $200,000. Never married again. You say she didn't file her claim until a month after the accident. That's right. She ever give any reason for waiting that long? Well, she was pretty broken up about it. The money wasn't important, particularly. Maybe she just forgot. Pat... I've got a question. What's that, John? How can you forget $20,000? Expense account item two, $10, for drinks I had with Pat Kelleher while we talked some more about the Reardon case. 
At 7 o'clock that night, I had on a fresh shirt and a press suit. They seemed to impress Paul Coombs, vice president, chairman of boards, etc. Dollar? That's right, Mr. Coombs. Universal adjustment. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Come in, come in. I talked to Mr. Kelleher there. He sent you? Yes, sir. Yes. Oh, yes, yes. I recall your name now. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, uh, we can sit here, Mr. Dollar. Now, you hear about John Reardon, of course. That's right. I'm glad they sent a man like you. I'm glad you're the one who's going to look into it. You puzzle me, Mr. Coombs. No, I don't. And that's a compliment to your perceptive abilities, young man. As a matter of fact, you're here because you're only curious about me. You want to have a look at the man who thinks he saw John Reardon alive, right? I suppose so. You don't believe he is alive? I didn't say that. Hmm. I admire your caution. I'm glad you're the one who's going to look into it because, well, John Reardon was a close friend of mine. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, I knew him for a number of years. And Mrs. Reardon. He was a fine, sensitive man. I'm sure you'll know how to handle him when you meet him. You sound very certain that I will meet him, Mr. Coombs. There's no doubt in my mind about that. Three nights ago at the Brown Palace Hotel in Denver, Colorado, I saw John Reardon. I walked up and spoke to him. I talked with him for 15 or 20 minutes. I know it was him. He didn't admit it. He denied it completely. He told me his name was Frank Bauer and that he had lived in Denver ever since the war. Frank Bauer? Yes. I was so certain it was John Reardon, I insisted. He laughed at me. Seemed good-natured about it. Even bought me a drink. I see. I asked him where he had lived before Denver. He said something about Toledo. Uh I asked him if he'd gone to college there. He told me he'd gone to Ohio State. Told me he was an engineer, a mining engineer. Everything he told me seemed plausible and reasonable, except that all the time I knew he was lying. I knew his name wasn't Frank Bowers. That was John Reardon. How did you leave it with him? Well, the whole thing unnerved me somewhat. I'm afraid I looked like rather a fool. I simply caught my limousine out of the airport and came back here to Baltimore. Did you get his address in Denver? No. Any of his business connections, anything like that? No. Was he alone when you met him? There was no one with him. At the bar, he even ordered his drink the way John always ordered it. You know, like this. Oh, yeah. Well, a lot of people make that signal for two fingers of bourbon. Wore clothes the same way, too. Have you spoken of this matter to anyone outside of Pat Kelleher? No. No, I thought it should be looked into before I called up Elizabeth. Elizabeth? Elizabeth Reardon, John's widow. Oh, yes. It'll do no good bothering her just now. I'm afraid she'll have to be bothered. Why? Can't you investigate the information I've given you without upsetting everyone? With this kind of information, somebody's bound to get upset. Look, uh, don't put restrictions on me, Mr. Coombs, or we won't get anywhere. You say John Reardon was a close friend of yours. Yes. I presume his wife was, too. That's right. A lovely, lovely person. Yeah, I'll keep that in mind when I talk to her. Uh, maybe you aren't the man for this. You can get somebody else, Mr. Coombs. No, no, no. It's just that I suddenly had a strange feeling about it all. Depressing. If John Reardon is alive, and you seem to be certain of it, then I understand your feeling. How's that? <laughs> your friend's party to a $20,000 fraud, not to mention his wife. Possibly he's not as sensitive and she's not as lovely as you thought. I spent the rest of the evening with Pat Kelleher and his wife hoping to see the bright lights and listen to some laughter. We picked a couple of fancy bistros and started the rounds to watch champagne flow and eavesdrop on the happy stories of success, promotion, and love. But it didn't work. Like the place, John? It's swell. You're as low as a cricket's ankle. Well, today a man kept telling me a friend of his was alive who's supposed to be dead. He told me what a fine fellow this friend is, or was. Yeah. Ninety-nine times out of a hundred, I tell him to go jump in the lake, but Paul Coombs comes under the title Reliable Witness in anybody's book. Give me a match. Here. How you fix for plans? Start somebody looking into Frank, whatever his name is, in Denver, who's supposed to be Reardon. I'll start with a beneficiary, but... Miss Reardon? Yeah. I'll march out and say, uh, let me look at some pictures of your husband. What kind of a guy was he? Did you enjoy each other or try to kill each other? Did you ever, uh, uh, why didn't Coombs look into it himself? Why didn't he go out to the widow and tell her about his meeting the guy in Denver? Because he came to us, John. Yeah, I know, Patsy, I'm sorry. But the prospect of going to somebody, anybody, with a flimsy story like that makes me sore. It might get her hopes up that her husband's alive. That's a lousy thing to do. 
Reliable or not, Coombs is probably all wet. Probably. Sour racket. Sour racket. You being a parrot? Just being agreeable, John. If you want to be sad, I'll be sad with you. <laughs> we both know situations like this are part of the trade. Oh, I should have been a... Oh, let's have another belt. Sure. Later. Well, John, mm -hmm. maybe another way to handle Mrs. Reardon with that. That's her over there at the bar. Nice, isn't she? Hey, she is lovely. Hmm? Not nothing. She looks a little tight. Yeah, well, I hear she gets that way quite a bit these days. Say, John, you want me to introduce you like a friend? It might make it easier. No, I'll handle it myself. Who's with you? Beats me. Hey, he's looking for a phone booth. Pat. Yeah. I may be able to find out what I want and not let her know what it's about. You mean right now? I mean right now. Hello. You're Elizabeth Reardon, aren't you? Oh, well, yes. Well, probably you don't remember me. My name's Johnny Dollar. We met some time ago. I'm afraid I don't remember, Mr. Dollar. I'm in the insurance business. Don't remember? Well, where was it we met? <laughs> no, I can't remember. May I sit down? Well, I'm expecting someone. He'll be back in a minute. Yes. Would you care for a drink? I have this one. Thank you. Oh. How's John these days? John? Your husband, Mrs. Redden. His name is John, isn't it? My husband's been dead nearly five years. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I I mean, it must be... <laughs> this is very awkward. That's all right. Five years. I could have sworn it was just three years ago I met you and John. In Denver. It couldn't have been. We were never there. Oh, well, pardon me. I... I sit here making bad conversation with you, and it's it's very apparent you're distressed. Look, I'm I'm very sorry I upset you. Is there anything I could do? No. No, Mr. Dolly, you didn't upset me. You look like a very nice person. How long are you going to be in Baltimore? A few more days. Perhaps you'll come out to the house for a drink before you go back. Say tomorrow. Oh, I'd like that, Mrs. Rudin. You can call me. I'm in the book. Mrs. John Rudin? Yes. I will. Again, I'm sorry that I brought Do up... me a favor, Mr. Dollar. When you come to my house for a drink, call me Elizabeth. And please, don't mention my husband's name. I'd appreciate it very much if I never heard it again. There'll be another exciting episode in our story of the Chesapeake fraud matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, a little talk to a widow who might not be a widow at all. And a strong feeling that a smile can sometimes be more dangerous than a gun. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. Pat Gallagher at Universal. How'd you make out with Miss Reardon? I met her. She thinks I'm an insurance broker or something. I told her I knew her husband when he was alive. Industrial hazard lying. 
part of the business, John. Did you find out anything that'll help you? I found out she's pretty upset about everything in the world. That's the only report you have for Universal Adjustment Bureau? Oh, she invited me for cocktails. I'm going to call her later this afternoon and keep the date. Maybe I'll get some information then. Cocktails, see? You made out okay. Oh, shut up. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Baltimore, Maryland. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Chesapeake fraud matter. Expense account item three, $23.60, long-distance telephone call to George Hanley in Denver, Colorado. George is an old friend of mine in the private detective business. I told him about the report that John Reardon was still alive and living in Denver under the name of Frank Bowers. I requested him to gather information that would help in determining whether Bowers was really John Reardon or not. I spent the remainder of the day reading over the facts of the case as supplied to me by Pat Kelleher of Universal Adjustment. Expense account item four, ten cents, another phone call. This one to John Reardon's widow. Hello? Mrs. Reardon? Yes. This is Johnny Dollar. Oh, yes, Mr. Dollar. You're the man who used to know John? Uh, yes. I asked you over for a drink. I hope you're coming. What time? Seven would be fine. I was at her home at seven o'clock, knocking on the door. It was a nice home, and she seemed like a nice person. Even nicer than the night before. I asked you to call me Elizabeth, Mr. Dollar. I remember her. Yes, you also asked me not to mention your husband's name. I wish you'd forget that. I was upset last night when we met. Forgive me? How's your drink? Not swell. I don't know why, but I feel I should explain myself a little more about saying what I did about John. I... I was very shocked at his death. I suppose I still am, even though it was five years ago. It always disturbs me when I'm reminded of it. Yet it's good to be reminded, I suppose. To know that he really is dead. That he won't come through that door anymore. That he won't telephone me from the office or make any plans with me. Does that make sense? I suppose so. Well, we can drink another one. Sometimes things make more sense with a few drinks. <laughs> Sometimes they don't make any sense at all, Elizabeth. That's right, too, Johnny. You know, I like you. I like you. Tell me about your business. You said insurance? Yes. You're a broker? Well, uh, not exactly. A salesman? No. I'm an investigator. That must be terribly interesting work. I suppose you travel everywhere. Have you ever been to she had a nice mouth. Soft, frank, wide-open eyes. A couple of times I was on the verge of telling her exactly what I was working on and why I was talking to her. But I didn't. Somehow I felt comfortable in the house. Over the drinks and music, we eventually got around to John Reardon. She told me of their four years' marriage that ended with his sudden death. Gave me everything I could possibly want to have. Well, why do I tell you all this? I never talked to anybody about it. Oh, I don't know. Possibly because you... Just want to talk to somebody about it. You're easy to talk to, Johnny. I was 19 when I was married. I'd never known another man. It was wonderful at first. Wonderful all the time, I suppose. I, I just wasn't grown up enough to realize it. Can I ask you a question? Surely. Did you really love him? Yes. I'm not convinced. Why? Oh, just a feeling. Well, I did. I'm not so sure he loved me. That's an awful thing to say. No, I don't think so. It's probably been on your mind a long time. You don't know me from a load of coal, but we've sat here and talked an hour. I think I know you. I think so, too. You still seem very 
despondent about his death. Yet you aren't sure he loved you. I loved him. Ah. <laughs> Here I am explaining things again, I suppose, because they sound so foolish. Once we both loved each other, very much, but we kicked it away. We just didn't get along. He was out spending his money on other people, and I was taking up this pastime. Can you tell when I've had too much? No. Thank you. Thank you awfully. Oh, Hugh. Elizabeth. Johnny, this is Hugh Bryan. This is Mr. Dollar, Hugh. Hello, Mr. Dollar. How's your drink, Liz? Fine. Now tell me again, who is this? This is Mr. Dollar. What's your business, Mr. Dollar? I haven't seen you around before. Obviously, you just met Miss Reardon, or you'd never, never start drinking with her. I wouldn't. No. That's true, Liz, isn't it? He was a friend of John's, Hugh. Well, that's nice. I don't think I ever heard him mention your name. I was a friend of his, too. As a matter of fact, his attorney. Hugh, you don't have to do this and in front of And since John me. is no longer here, I've undertaken to look after some of the problems he left behind him, as an old friend would. Elizabeth, say goodnight to Mr. Dollar. Now, look here, Hugh. Say goodnight Hugh, to him. He's just leaving. Maybe it's better right now, Johnny. Good night. Do you want me to leave? She just said it would be better. I'll call you at your hotel. Good night. Good night, mister. No, no, you still have something in your glass. Finish your drink. Okay. Huh. An old friend of John's. That's good. Very good. It is? She picked you up in a bar last night. I saw her. I was with her. You never knew John Reardon in your life. You have no business being here. And I don't like cheap opportunists invading her home. Evidently, you can talk to her any way you want to, and she'll take it. Why, I don't know. But don't talk to me that way. I don't have to take anything. You were just leaving, weren't you? Hugh Bryan was a large, bristling sort of man with a smooth manner. I didn't like him, and he didn't like me. Expense account item five, eighteen dollars. Even cab fares, lunches, etc. In and about Chesapeake Bay, talking to the principals connected with the boat explosion death of John Reardon. One of these was Lieutenant Jack Halverson, United States Coast Guard. You want some coffee? If I have to go out in that wind to get it, no. Make it right here for just such occasions. Just a sec, I'll plug her in. There. Hmm, brother, someday. It's nice in the summertime. Now, what can I do for you? Tell me about the boat going down. You made out the report for the Coast Guard. You mean the Sharpston's boat? Yeah. We have a reliable witness who thinks that one of the passengers, a man named John Reardon, didn't go down with it at all, that he's still alive. You said you had my report. Those are the facts. But you picked up three bodies. Why not the fourth? Why not Reardon's? Well, we searched the bay for a solid week looking for his body. We used every piece of equipment at our disposal. We did everything we could. But you didn't find him. First you come in here complaining about our weather, now you're mad about the way we were on the Coast Guard. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's a very lousy-sounding apology. What do you want to find out? How that boat exploded? Why you couldn't find Reardon's body if you found the others? Now, look, if a bunch of rich jerks want to take a high-powered boat out and they don't know the first thing about high-test fuel or engine running, they're doing it at their own risk. That help? Yes, some. I wish you could have put it on the report. That's my ideas, buddy. The report just has the facts. Now, for the other, about finding Reardon. I don't know why. He blew up, went down, or drifted out to sea. If his body had been in the bay, we'd found it. Was there a chance he might have survived and been rescued? All we had left of the boat was pieces of wreckage. And if he was rescued, it was never reported, and I wouldn't know about that. Could that have happened? Sure. I could be an admiral tomorrow, sir. <laughs> It was four o'clock in the afternoon when I got to Elizabeth Reardon's house. You. Hello, Mr. Bryan. Is Mrs. Reardon in? No. Then I'll wait. It's important that I see her. I thought I made it clear to you last night I didn't want her being molested. You did make it clear and cruel, Mr. Bryan. Now, I'm here... Any to... business for her comes to me first. I'm an insurance investigator. I know that, she told me. But she didn't tell you because she didn't know and I didn't want her to know that I'm working on a case that involves her. You what? I have a report that her husband might still be alive. St Come in, Mr. Dollar. I'll have to admit that Hugh Bryan's concern was as genuine as his surprise. 
He led me into the house and we sat at the bar. Only this time, no one had a drink. He listened while I told him about the report of Paul Coombs, that John Reardon was living in Denver under the name of Frank Bowers. Do you think there's any truth to him? It doesn't matter what I think, Mr. Bryan. I have to investigate it. Yes, of course. And if he were alive, it would be the best thing in the world. Would it? Of course. She's been lost without him all these years. She needs him, Mr. Dollar. She always needed him. This little bit of drinking has been going on too long. These tearful little episodes with one man or another. Oh, yes, I mistook you for one of those last night. I apologize for that sincerely. Actually, Mr. Dollar, she... She's been quite a task. Uh-huh. Well, maybe I better talk to her now. Uh, do you have to? There's certain information I'd like to get. I think she's the only one who can give it to me. You'll have to tell her about the report? Yes. And there's probably so much talk. But it'll give her a terrible kind of hope. All right, I'll get her. No, you'd better mix one for her. She'll need it. W- wait a minute. Yeah? I need vital statistics on Reardon. Pictures, handwriting samples, everything. Could you help me gather them? I'll do anything I can. Well, then there's no need to bother her, is there? You're a gentleman, Mr. Dollar. I don't know why. I do. You don't want to hurt her any more than I do. An hour later, I was back in my hotel room. The next day, I had an appointment to meet you, Brian, and get all the material I had asked for. I was more depressed than ever about the case. About then, the phone rang. Johnny Dollar. Johnny? Yes. This is Elizabeth Rears. Please. Please don't look for him. What? Just forget it. Did Hugh Bryan tell you what I was about? I overheard you two talking. Don't bother with it. John's dead and that's that. Promise me. Promise you won't do anything else. I'm sorry, Elizabeth. I have to investigate it. Johnny, is is that final? I'm sorry. I don't have any choice. Elizabeth? Elizabeth! There'll be another exciting episode in our story of the Chesapeake fraud matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, a trip to Denver and a look at a man whose gun makes it pretty emphatic that he doesn't want to be looked at. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. Uh, Hugh Bryan, Mr. Dollar. How are you this morning? Not so good. I didn't sleep very well. How'd you do? I think I have about what you want on John Reardon. Well, if you haven't, I can get it from Mrs. Reardon. What? Well, I thought you didn't want to tell her about the report, that her husband might still be alive. She knows. She overheard us talking last night. Oh. Well, what do you want to do? I might as well look at what you have and get this over with. How about an hour from now? I'll be waiting for you. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, 
America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Baltimore, Maryland. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Chesapeake fraud matter. Expense account item six, dollar and a half. One collect telegram from Denver, Colorado. I've located Frank Bowers as per your request. Cursory investigation discloses little evidence that would lead me to believe he might be the John Ridden of Baltimore. Looks like a ham bone to me, Johnny. What do I do now? Signed, George Hanley, George Hanley Investigations Incorporated, Denver, Colorado. Item seven, two dollars, same thing. Telegram from me. Things are about the same way here. Sit tight. I'll see you in a day or two. Love, Johnny. Once the telegrams were out of the way, I walked three blocks from my hotel to the office building of Hugh Bryan. It was an impressive place full of lawyers and doctors. Hugh Bryan looked a little haggard when I saw him. It took me a while to get all this together. Half the night. There wasn't that big a rush. Oh, get it out of the way. The sooner you have what you need, the sooner you can make sure, and the sooner I won't worry about it anymore. Uh, did you talk to Elizabeth yet today? No, just last night. Oh, I thought maybe she might have called you this morning. I'm... Uh, I'm so sorry for that girl. Well, don't feel too bad, Mr. Bryan. We both did everything we could to keep the report that her husband might be alive from her. Awkward as it was. Yes, I know, I know. I still don't understand it, I guess. Well, a man named Coombs, an insurance official, thinks he saw Reardon in Denver last week using the name Frank Bowers. He's sure that Bowers was Reardon. If he turns out to be Reardon, the insurance company has been taken for $20,000 they paid to Elizabeth Reardon, just to set you straight. Well, that'd make Elizabeth party to a fraud. And John. Lord knows that's silly. Well, silly or not. Yes. Well, here's what I have. Now, uh, this is one of the last pictures taken of John Reardon. Mm-hmm. Have the negatives? Yes. Uh, here. And these are some vital statistics on him. The physical part I got from his doctor. Mm -hmm. He stood an examination about a month before the accident. This the doctor's name here? Yes. Now, these other things are in his background and education. Uh, here, a copy of his marriage license, birth certificate. How did you get hold of these things? Well, I handled a lot of business for John, filed a lot of his papers for him. These were just packed away. It took a while to find them. Hey. Hmm? A copy of his fingerprints? Well, would those help? More than any of this other stuff. Fingerprints aren't standard papers in anybody's file. Before John went in the Army, he did some engineering work for the Proving Grounds in Aberdeen. Oh. He was fingerprinted there. It was a gag at the time. He had a set of his own blown up and put on the wall in a picture frame. You know, just a joke. Yeah. I dug them out of his personal things. Now then, here's a copy of his financial records, tax returns and whatnot. I spent about an hour in Hugh Bryan's office going over material that would help me in the investigation. The pictures and fingerprints were the most helpful items. After I'd finished, I went back to my hotel, packed my bags, and checked out. Expense account item eight, $398. My hotel and incidentals in Baltimore and plane fare to Denver. I got there at nine in the morning. The air crisp, thin, and full of sunshine. I rented a car at the airport and drove into town. A half an hour later, I was talking to my detective friend, George Hanley. How do you like Denver, old pal? I haven't been here for a few years. It doesn't look the same. Bigger and better, huh? They're thinking of putting up buildings as big as those mountains over there. I love it. So's the wife. I'm glad. You ought to try a place like this for a while, Johnny. Uh, maybe I will. Ought to find yourself a girl and settle down. Uh, let's us settle down, Georgie. Huh? Oh, sure. How'd it go? You asked me to look into Frank Bowers. I looked into him as much as I could without talking to him. There you are, Johnny. His bank account, his friends, his troubles, his enemies, everything. Mm -hmm. How about his police record? One traffic violation two years ago. Never been in any kind of trouble around here. Gets along fine with everybody. Well, tell me about everybody, Georgie. His laundry man, the milkman, the guy who tends bar in his neighborhood, the man he buys gas from. I talk to all of them. How about the people he works with? Well, he don't do much of that as far as I can see. He's got an office downtown, calls himself a consulting engineer. Goes there once or twice a week to pick up his mail. Well, now, that's a very nice way to be able to live. Is he starving to death, Georgie? No, he's got a good bank account. Makes regular deposits. Money comes from a New York bonding firm. 
He owns a little two-bedroom house out beyond Park Hill. Paid $38,000 for it. Wow. Sleeps in one bedroom, uses the other one for a kind of studio. Putters around with clay, oils, and according to the nosy dame who lives across the street, he tries to write. How about his friends? Lots of them. Pays his bills, gets drunk now and then, normal. Tell me about his wife. He hasn't got one. Lives alone. Find out who he goes with, Georgie? No. As much as I could find out, he doesn't go with anybody. Enemies? Well, the guy in the cleaning shop hates his guts. Bowers doesn't like his shirts with starch. <laughs> Did you check out the residency business? As far as I could. He bought that house out in Park Hill in 1951. Paid cash for it. Record of the sale gives his former residence is Toledo, Ohio. Well, how long has he been a resident here? As near as I can figure, and this is just rough, four or five years ago, the first financial transaction was the house he bought. The next was a car. He could have been here a long time before that, though. Well, the time element would fit for Reardon. What do you think, Georgie? I think you're probably wasting a lot of money investigating this guy. He doesn't seem like the kind of man who's hiding out from anybody. Here. <clears throat> Look at this photo. Is this Frank Bowers? Yeah, yeah, I'd say so. 5'11", 170, olive complexion, no scars, no glasses, brown hair, about 35. Could be him from that, yes. This is a picture of John Reardon. And the description is Reardon's. What do you want to do now? Keep on it. I got George Hanley busy making a check with some people in Toledo who could find out whether or not a Frank Bauer had once lived there. Then I took my rented car and drove out to the address Hanley had given me. It was in the east side of the city near the airport. A one-story frame house, a 53 Merc in the driveway. I'm looking for Mr. Frank Bowers. Oh, who are you? Johnny Dollar. Oh, I'm Frank Bauer. Well, I'm an insurance investigator, Mr. Bowers. I'd like to talk to you. Oh, well, come on in. Huh? Thank you. Take chair anywhere, huh? Son, you might. Just making a routine check, Mr. Bowers. Thought perhaps you could help me. <laughs> well, I don't know anything about my neighbors, if that's that kind of thing. No, I'm running down a report that came across our office in Baltimore. Baltimore? Ever been there, Mr. Bowers? No. Swell place on Chesapeake Bay. Well, I like Denver. <laughs> What's this all about? Huh? Well, do you happen to remember a few days ago when you were at a place called the Ship's Tavern? Well, that's in the Brown Palace. This right? was uh, last Friday, to be exact. Well, should I remember? What I do, steal an ashtray or walk out on a check? No, a, a man from Baltimore was there that day, Mr. Bowers. His name was Coombs. Paul Coombs. You met him. Well, did I? Yes, right at the bar. You had a drink or two with him. Well, I might have. I don't know whether to admit it or not. What are you getting at? I, I don't understand this. I know it seems confusing. Uh, uh, maybe this will help. Take a look at this. Mm-hmm. Now, you must admit, you look a great deal like the man in that picture. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose I do. Well, I'll be done. Hey, I'd do it that. You know, this could be a picture of me. That's why I'm here, Mr. Powers. You see, the company I represent insured the man in this picture for quite an amount of money. His name was John Reardon. He was lost in a boat accident in Chesapeake Bay five years ago. The Mr. Coombs who met you at the bar here last week thought you were John Reardon. Well, I don't blame him. But I'm not. Close, though. Now, want to smoke? Oh, thanks. Thanks. Sure. Mr. Coombs was a lifelong friend of John Reardon's. I have his sworn statement here about that meeting with you and the certainty of his identity. You do? Yes, right here. Would you like to see it? <laughs> well, not particularly. I understand you went to Ohio State. What year did you graduate? I didn't go to Ohio State. Look, what is this? Huh? Well, that's what you told Mr. Coombs. It's in the statement. Oh, I remember that bird now. Oh, I might have told him anything, Mr. Dolly. You know, he's one of those inquisitive kind, real sure of himself. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Look, don't tell me they sent you all the way out here from Baltimore. They did. On that guy say so? <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, that's funny. Did you go to college, Mr. Bowers? What? I'd like to clear up that detail. Did you go to college? Well, yes, yes. I went to Carnegie Tech, 36 through 40. You haven't lived all your life in Colorado, then. Where else have you lived? Look, do you have any right to ask me questions like this? No, no, but you'll help me a lot if you'll answer them. Well, why not? Okay, I've lived in New York, Pittsburgh, Kansas City, Toledo, around the country. Came here a few years ago. My health seemed good for my asthma. Ever been married? Once in 1942. It didn't last long. Oh, what else do you want to know? Well, if you're in a hurry, I can come back later. No, no, it's not that. 
It's, well, look, you seem like a nice guy, Dollar, but it just makes me uncomfortable answering these questions of yours. I appreciate the time you've given me already, Mr. Bauer. Please understand, it's a matter of establishing identity. But you know who I am. I just told you. That's true. I don't like this business much. Is there, is there any way you can eliminate it? The most positive identification would be from fingerprints. Oh? Uh-huh. Now, Mr. Bauer, I'm not so much interested in who you are as in proving that you're not John Reardon. If you volunteered a set of fingerprints, it'd save me a great deal of work and you a great deal of trouble. Well, sure, why not? We drove downtown together to George Hanley's office and used the portable fingerprint kit. I took a complete set of Frank Bauer's prints he attached. I thanked him for his time and trouble, and he left. If he was trying to cover something, it certainly wasn't apparent from his conversational reactions. There had been a moment when I was sure he wasn't Frank Bauer. On the other hand, I was sure that he wasn't John Ridden. That cuts it, Johnny. Right thumb and index prints don't match at all. <sighs> oh, not even close, George. And I thought I was getting somewhere. I found out he was never in Toledo, or at least never registered or licensed as an engineer. Well, these prints do it. When are you going home, Johnny? Oh, I don't know. There's no reason to stick around any longer. This is crazy. You proved your case with the prints. He was too anxious to help me prove it, Georgie. You ask any ordinary man on the street two personal questions about himself, and he'll tell you to go jump in the lake. You ask him for his fingerprints, and he's liable to smash you. So? Get on him. Stay with him 24 hours a day. Get a couple of other men. It'll cost you money. Get busy. Expense account item nine, $200, detective service. I didn't believe Frank Bowers. I didn't believe his background. And most of all, I didn't believe his fingerprints. There'll be another exciting episode in our story of the Chesapeake fraud matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, another man comes to Denver. He doesn't check in a hotel or carry luggage. At least not much luggage. Just a thirty-eight Colt. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. This is Western Union, Mr. Dollar. Message for you from Baltimore, Maryland. Okay, go ahead. Received your air special regarding investigation of the Chesapeake matter. You've proved Frank Bowers of Denver is not John Ridden of Baltimore. Fingerprints don't lie, therefore logical to believe John Ridden really did. Come on home. Your expenses are running too high. That's signed Pat Kelleher, Universal Adjustment Bureau. Or should I mail this to you? No, that's all right. Can I send an answer? Yes, sir. Pat Kelleher, Universal Adjustment Bureau, Baltimore, Maryland. Fingerprints don't lie, but people do. All the time. For all sorts of reasons. It may be finished as far as you're concerned, but I'm just beginning. Love, Johnny. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, 
Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Baltimore, Maryland. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Chesapeake fraud matter. I'd set out to prove that John Reardon had not died back in 1950 in a boat accident on Chesapeake Bay. To prove that he was still very much alive in the person of one Frank Bowers, currently living here in Denver, Colorado. Everything, all I could learn of the man's history, reports from his neighbors, friends, even his fingerprints, everything indicated he really was Frank Bowers. And yet, for some fool reason or other, I wasn't convinced. Expense account continued. Item 10, 63 bucks for one overcoat. Denver can be a very cold city when the wind comes in from the north and it decides to snow. Almost as cold as the damp wind off Chesapeake Bay on a certain day back in 1950. Hi. Hiya, George. How's it going? Well, I watched Bauer's house from six last night till two this morning. He read a book last night in the living room. He made a phone call and then he went to bed. And then I went home and went to bed. How many men have you got working? Two others beside myself. We're keeping an eye on Bowers around the clock. I go on again at six. Okay, good. I don't know why, Johnny. He isn't your guy and you know it. Fingerprints proved it. We can watch him from now till doomsday and nothing's going to change that. Oh, look, don't you start, Georgie. Huh? I got a wire from my home office this morning telling me to close it up and come on home. Why don't you close it up and come on home? I like to make dough. I'm in the private detective business, but I hate to see an old pal doing a lot of work on nothing. Why don't you shut up? Sure. We can go on like this forever, can't we, Johnny? Ah. Goodbye, Johnny. I walked around the streets of Denver trying to enjoy the sights. But mostly, I wasn't enjoying anything. I was thinking about the whole case from beginning to end. And my only reason for hanging on and being stubborn about it was the fact that Frank Bowers had been too anxious to cooperate. Too anxious to help me prove so easily that he was not John Reardon. And then something else happened. He got anxious once more. Yeah? Mr. Dollar, this is Frank Bowers. Oh, hello. You didn't tell me where you were stopping. Phoned everywhere in town. <laughs> Wondered how you made out. Made out? Yeah, with my fingerprints. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, they don't match at all. Oh, then I'm not your man. Guess not, Mr. Bowers. Well, I was just curious. Didn't hear from you after you took the sample of my prints. Oh, well, that was pretty nice of you to help me out. Uh, how can I thank you? <laughs> well, you could buy me a drink if you want to. Hey, you're on. All right, meet you at six at the ship's tavern. It was the voice of a confident man again. An overconfident man. The kind who sandbags in a poker game. Who knows about a boat ride and a horse race. And so help me, I knew I was right about him. Expense account item 11, $14, booze. For Frank Bowers and myself in the ship's tavern. The same bar, incidentally, where a week before, a close friend of the deceased John Reardon had run into Bowers and sworn he was John Reardon. When Bowers came in, he was followed by George Hanley, as per my instructions. I saw George pick a stool at the far end of the bar. Well, I suppose you'll be packing up and leaving the old Mile High City pretty quick now, huh? Did I say that, Frank? No, no, but I just suppose it. You will, won't you? Oh, I haven't decided yet. What do you think I should do? Huh? I said, what do you think I should do? (laughs) Are you kidding me? (laughs) Well, maybe I'm just kidding myself. But you don't seem like the kind of fella you should be, somehow. No, I don't. No. Now, you were too nice about answering questions when I came out to your house the other day. Too nice about letting me fingerprint you so I could compare the samples with John Reardon's prints. Too nice about calling up and asking how it all came out. Came out bad, thank you. (laughs) I'm a pretty nice fella. (laughs) Yeah? That's what the book says. (laughs) Uh, what book? I had a private detective friend make one up on you before I even got here. 
friends, enemies, money, and whatnot. All very nice. Mm, of course it is. You know what your trouble is, Dolly? You, you don't trust anybody. I'm a nice fella, and you don't trust me. You don't believe what you see. I believe the fingerprints don't match, if that's what you mean. You're the bird I don't believe. Hey, should I get sore? If you want to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna. <laughs> you know why? Because I'm a nice fella. <laughs> sure you are. But you ought to get mad when a man calls you a liar. Oh, you didn't call me a liar. I meant to. You're a liar. You know what? I'm not a nice fella all the time. I can't like to hit you in the face or something right now. You're needling me. Am I? Uh-huh. I think I better call up a girl I know, see what she's doing for dinner. Well, see if she's got a friend. No, no, you're too nasty, friend. You sit tight. Order me a drink. I'll be back in a jiffy. He's a little drunk. Sure he is, George. He's also worried. Any particular reason for getting him that way, Johnny? Yes, he's using the booth in the lobby. Scoot out there and see if you can get a line on who he might be calling. Right. A long ten minutes later, Frank Bowers came back to the bar. He was weaving a little when he got on the stool next to me. George Hanley followed him back inside and took his place at the end of the bar again. Uh, She's busy. Took her a long time to tell you that. She's a girl who takes a long time with everything. Oh, what's her name? Huh? What's her name? The girl you just called. Oh, Rita. Rita. Well, here's to Rita. Come on, drink up. You might have to eat with me. I don't want to drink to Rita, and I don't want to have dinner with you. What do you think of that? Huh? I thought you were a nice fella. Remember? God of blazes. Hold on. Hey! Johnny, you may have something with this bird at that. How come, George? That call he just made, long distance to Baltimore. I got that much. He said he'd never been there. Didn't know anyone there. Keep an eye on us, Georgie. You betcha, pal. Hey, hey, Frank. Hey, hey, look, what's the matter, friend? I just left you, I thought, for good. Oh, come on, I'll buy you dinner. You buy me nothing, Dollar. Go on back to Baltimore. Why don't you? What? Why don't you go back to Baltimore? What's that supposed to mean? Just what it means. Well? Well, Maybe we better talk some more. Fine, fine. My car is in the lot here. Okay. You're after me, aren't you? Well, let's say I met you yesterday to get some facts. Let's say I drank with you tonight to find out what kind of a guy you are. I've done most of the talking up to date. Now it's your turn. Uh Uh-huh. Well? I don't know whether I got anything to say to you. Oh, make up your mind, will you? Look, suppose I were John Ridden. I'm not. But suppose I were. I can't tell you what a court would do about an insurance fraud. No. Well, you're just a clumsy ox stumbling around for some answers and you haven't got any yet. Get out of my way. Wait a minute. Hey! He's a very handy fella. I didn't want to interfere, Johnny. Stay on him. See where he goes, what he does, Georgie. Hurry. You all right, pal? Sure. Hurry. I wasn't all right at all. Frank Bowers was not only big, but fast, and he caught me off guard. I went back through the hotel lobby up to my room and lay down on the bed, and I waited for the phone to ring. Sooner or later, it would be George Hanley or Frank Bowers' tale reporting some development that had solved the whole case. But the phone didn't ring. Nothing happened. No one phoned. No one came by. I went to sleep about one o'clock. The next morning, George Hanley called and asked me how I was feeling after the punching session in the parking lot. He reported that Frank Bowers had jumped in his car, driven straight home, and gone straight to bed. Expense account item 12, 48 cents, postage. Cost of mailing a sample of Bowers' fingerprints to Washington, D.C. At 8 o'clock that night, I had another phone call. Hi, baby. This is George Hanley. How do you feel? Okay. What's up, Georgie? I'm still keeping my eye on Frank Bowers. He's nervous, all right. Been staying in the house all day. I can see him walking back and forth in the living room. He must have smoked a package of cigarettes every hour. Uh Uh-huh. Has he used the phone? Yeah, yeah. Looks like long-distance stuff again. You know, place the call, hang up, then wait for the operator to call back. Hmm. Possibly Baltimore again. Possible. How about it? 
I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Where are you? Right across the street from his house. Be right out. The heater in my rented car wasn't working that night. I remember that part very well. My feet and hands were numb with the ten below weather when I flicked off the lights and pulled up alongside George Hanley, stationed across the street from Frank Bowers' home. Uh, it's some weather. Yeah. How's Bower doing? I think he's got a visitor with him now, Johnny. Must have showed up while I was calling you. Big guy wrapped in an overcoat. I've seen him move around the room a couple of times. George, let's go in and shake him up. I'm tired of all this. You think he's reared? I don't know, but I want to wind it up one way or the other. Okay. Want to wait for his friend to leave? Nope. Oh, it's a nutty thing. You're the one who's nutty. You already proved he isn't John Reardon. That's all you wanted. I know, I know. Now I want to prove I'm getting old and crotchety and don't believe what I see in here. Bear with me, Georgie. Sure, pal. You're crazy, but I love you. Hey. Huh? Visitor's leaving. Make him? No. An overcoat and a hat aren't much to go on. He's... Georgie, come on! Hey, Johnny, look out! down, the gun of the man in the overcoat had gone off a couple more times. The nearest bullet came six inches from the ground. Without my gun, all I could do was hug the ground for cover and try to stay out of his line of fire. The shot deafened me for a moment. When my hearing came back, I heard someone very close to me. It was Georgie. He was dying. There'll be another exciting episode in our story of the Chesapeake fraud matter tomorrow. Tomorrow? Proof that an insurance case is one thing. Murder of a pal is something else. Tomorrow, the wind-up. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. This is the operator. Ready with your call to Mr. Pat Kelleher in Baltimore. Go ahead, please. Hello? Hello, Pat. I got your wire. What's all this? What happened? We're still trying to find out. The man calling himself Frank Bowers was killed an hour ago. George Hanley, one of the operatives I had watching him, was killed too. We've got a vague description of the killer. Are you all right? Yeah, but I'm going to be tied up with the police here. Well, you need money for bail or anything like that, just draw a draft on the company. I'll confirm it. Thanks, Pat. Too bad about your friend. Yeah, he was a good guy. I want to find out who killed him. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Universal Adjustment Bureau, Baltimore, Maryland. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Chesapeake fraud matter. Expense account continued. Item 13, a quarter for some aspirin. It turned out to be a long night. 
Several homicide officers arrived at the double murder scene within a matter of minutes and got right down to the business at hand. Frank Bowers had been shot to death. George Hanley had been shot to death. Lieutenant Tom O'Neill was in charge, a big blonde man who seemed to know what he was about. Okay, let's see that ID again. Here you go. Ah, insurance investigator, hmm? That's right. Okay. What was your business here with these two men? My home office in Baltimore had reason to believe that Frank Bowers was really a man named John Reardon. Reardon was supposed to have died five years ago. I was sent out here to investigate it since there had been a $20,000 claim in the matter. Sure, sure. I hired George Hanley to help me out. He was keeping an eye on Frank Bowers. I came out earlier tonight to give him a hand and the shooting began. Any idea who did it? A big man in a top coat and a hat. I really didn't get a look at him, Lieutenant. I was busy with George Hanley. Sure. You carry a gun? Sometimes. I didn't have one tonight. You tried to chase the killer? I said I was busy with my friend. Yeah, that's right, you did. Well, how was your investigation coming along? Frank Bauer's fingerprints didn't match the samples I had for John Reardon. But it didn't satisfy me. There were a lot of things about him personally I couldn't accept. I harassed him a little last night, and he got pretty excited and slugged me. This was after I found out he'd been trying to call Baltimore. Who in Baltimore? I don't know. But tell me about this harassing. You'll make a check with the phone company. Well, I needled him purposely, trying to scare him into a blunder. I think I was doing pretty good. I'll never know now. Uh-huh. What else you got to say about your case? Well, that's about it, Lieutenant. It is, huh? Well, that's all I got to say because that's all I know about it. Next time, be careful with your needling tactics. Boy. I was doing what I thought best on the case. Sure you were. You were doing swell. You let a friend of yours get shot down in front of your eyes. Not to mention the other guy. You can't give us a description of the killer or a hint at the motive. Now, maybe George Hanley wasn't a friend of yours at that. Why, you... Dad, take it easy, kiddo. Take it easy. Remember to blow the bell. I'm sorry. You've had quite a night. Nobody in your business or mine knows what's behind the door when he kicks it in. I'm just a cop trying to get straightened out, so I push too hard sometimes. We'll get it taken care of. Nobody walks in a man's house and shoots him down without somebody hearing something or seeing something. I mean, somebody besides you. Now, my men will cover every house in the block, in this whole area if we have to. Bound to be somebody somewhere. The dogged Lieutenant O'Neill turned out to be 100% correct. In fact, he turned out to be 300% correct. For by 11 o'clock the following morning, his men had located three different people who had information about the brutal murders of Frank Bowers and George Hanley. The first was a man named Randall who had lived across the street. He had seen Bowers open his front door and admit the unknown killer. He said he wore glasses. The second was a paper boy who had come to collect while the killer was there. He stated that the killer and Bowers were arguing when he came up to the door. The third witness, a housewife, gave the most important information as to the man's description. He was a good deal taller than Mr. Bowers. How much taller? Mm, three, four inches at least. I saw him standing in the doorway from here. He had on a brown tweed top coat. My husband has one just like it. How old would you say he was? Mm, Forty-five. Have you ever seen him before? No. Would you know him if you saw him again? Yes, anywhere. You got that good look at him, huh? Yes, the porch light was on. Here's something, Dollar. Lieutenant O'Neill had issued an all-points bulletin based on the combined descriptions given by the witnesses. In the meantime, his men had checked the local cab companies and found out that one of the drivers had carried a fare to Frank Bauer's home at 8 o'clock in the evening. The cab driver verified the housewife's description of the suspect and added the important information that he'd picked up the man at the airport. When that was checked, it was found the man had come in on a plane from the east at 5.45 in the afternoon. He had used the name Oren Williams. Expense account item 14, $8.95. Another long-distance phone call to Baltimore and Pat Kelleher. Well, I'll be darned. Do you have to stay there, John? Of course I have to stay here. I'm a material witness. Not to mention the fact that a pal of mine was shot down. Don't get on your high horse, John. It was just a question. Have any idea what it was all about? Well, at the moment, I'm just sure a guy named Oren Williams flew in, shot up two people, and beat it. If we had Williams, I'd give you the whole thing on a silver platter. You're awfully touchy. Well, this thing has gotten out of hand. Well, I won't press you on it anymore, John. You do what you think is best. As far as the company's concerned, it's really not our business anymore, is it? It's our business until it's cleared up. Well, I mean Bowers. He wasn't John Reardon. Dollar? Hold it, Pat. Yeah? Answer from Washington on your wire. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Here. Let me see. Pat. Yeah? It is our business after all. Huh? The lieutenant here sent a hurry-up request to Washington on some of Bowers' fingerprints I mailed a couple of days ago. They check out. I don't get it. Bowers was John Reardon. Oh. Well, 
Well, wh- where'd you get the samples of Reardon's prints that didn't check out? From Hugh Bryan, Reardon's attorney. Well, I better call him. Don't you dare. Don't open your mouth. I'll handle it when I get there. Tell me about this fella, Hugh Bryan. According to the phone company, that's the man Bowers was trying to call in Baltimore. I told him all I knew. And Lieutenant O'Neill listened thoughtfully. It became apparent from that point on, since Bowers' true identity had been established through Army records, that the bulk of the case could be concluded not in Denver, but in Baltimore. Expense account item 16, $216, plane fare and incidentals, Denver to Baltimore. I arrived at 10.15 in the evening, checked with the Baltimore police who had been informed of the case by Tom O'Neill in Denver. At his request, they'd taken no action as yet. From the police station, I went directly to Hugh Bryan's residence. The house was English, conservative, and expensive. The fire in the living room looked cheerful when the door opened. Elizabeth Reardon did not look so cheerful. Hello, Johnny. Hello, Mrs. Reardon. Didn't expect to find you here. No, I suppose not. I never expected to see you again. Elizabeth, I have something to tell you. Don't tell me now, Johnny. It's about your husband. All right. I want to tell Mr. Bryan, too. He's upstairs in his study. Oh, wait. Look, I've done what I thought best about all this, and I'm trying to do what's best now. It doesn't make any difference, Johnny. I'm a married woman again. Huh? Yes. You and I were married this morning. Excuse me. I walked in and watched John Reardon's widow, alias Frank Bauer's widow, now Hugh Bryan's bride, disappear up a column stairway. The news that she had married Hugh Bryan cleared up some of the small doubts in my mind. When Bryan came back down the stairs with her, he looked anything but the happy bridegroom. Hello, Dollar. You're a late caller. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, how did you come out in Denver? Everything okay? No, everything's not okay. Well, uh, what's the matter? Do I have to tell you... I'll run along upstairs, Hugh. It's getting terribly late. All right, dear. Good night, Mr. Dollar. Good night, Mrs. Bryan. There'll be some men out to see you pretty soon, Bryan. Policemen. Oh. Liz. Yes, dear? I think you'll be interested in what Mr. Dollar has to say. What? I don't understand, Hugh. I wasn't in Philadelphia yesterday, Liz. I was in Denver, Colorado. What? I flew there to see John. He's been alive and living there all this time. You. I'm sorry. This is only for her benefit, Dollar. I'll tell it just once. When it gets into court, it'll be different. How did it happen, Brian? John Reardon didn't die in that boat. No. He was picked up in a bay by a fishing boat on its way to Florida. They didn't have a radio on the fishing boat. The first port they came to was Charleston. John phoned me from there and told me all about it. Now, this was ten days after we all thought he was dead. That part was all accident. Sure. The rest of it was a little different. Liz, it was his idea. You've got to believe that. What was his idea? Not showing up ever again. Letting everyone think he was really dead. Making you a widow. I don't believe it. He hated his life here. Yes, everything about it. He was in debt right up to his ears... Of course, there was your money, but he... Well, I flew down to Charleston to talk to him. He was like a crazy man. Kept saying there was a way out. I didn't know what he meant at first. Then he came right out and said it was his chance to get away from all the things he hated. He knew how I felt about you then, how I feel about you now. He said I could have you for a price. What was the price? Those checks he got every week from a New York bonding concern? Yes. What did they come to? 25000 a year, regular weekly payments. I could afford it. I could afford anything for you, Liz. Did he come right out and tell you he hated me? He just said he wanted to get away from everything. And it went that way for five years. I believe I asked you to marry me every six months. Yes. But that didn't work out either. And then, one day, along came Johnny Dollar. How does it feel to be so efficient, Mr. Dollar? We don't have to go into that, do we? No. I'll admit you did everything to throw me off. And it threw me off. Especially the fingerprints you provided. Didn't John Reardon insist his name was Frank Bowers and do everything he could to make you believe that was true? He did too much to make me think it was true. Where is he now? Where's John? He's dead, Mrs. Bryan. Oh. Truly dead now. He was shot to death last night by Mr. Bryan. 
Mr. Bryan also shot a friend of mine, didn't you, Bryan? Yes. John got scared, called me, said he was going to tell everything to Dollar, blow the whole thing. You. All I wanted out of this was you, Liz. He didn't want you. I didn't. Last week you decided to marry me. It took you five years to do that. And it took him one afternoon to decide he was going to come back to you. The proof that John Reardon's widow is guilty or not guilty of a fraudulent insurance claim is a matter for Eastern Fidelity to decide. The matter of Hugh Bryan and two murders is a matter for the courts. Expense account item 17, same as item 1, expenses from Baltimore to Hartford. Item 18, $89 even, car rentals, miscellaneous, etc. Expense account total, $1,124.98. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, please, there'll be a new exciting story on Johnny Dollar beginning next Monday. Next week, a quiet, sleepy little town in Mexico and a beautiful senorita that... Well, things didn't stay quiet and sleepy for long. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Gene Bates, D.J. Thompson, High Everback, Will Wright... John Daner, Tony Barrett, Paul Dubov, and Forrest Lewis. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. Fred Wilkins at Northeastern Fidelity, Johnny. Oh, hi, Fred. I got a case for you. Remember the Alvin Summers embezzlement? Sure, he took off with 75,000 bucks about six months ago. Right. We held a bond on him, so we're stuck with it. So? This morning, a guy called from a little town on the west coast of Mexico, Santo Tomas. It was a bad connection, but I gathered he had some information on Summers and wanted somebody to go down there and talk to him. I nominated you. Then he's expecting me, huh? What's his name? I don't know. Well, how do I contact him in Santa Tomas? I'm afraid I don't know that either. You mean I'm supposed to go looking for somebody whose name I don't even know? How come he's so coy? I don't think it's a case of being coy, Johnny. Before we could get very far into the conversation, the connection was broken off at his end. Okay, friend, I'm on my way. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Northeastern Fidelity and Bonding, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Alvin Summers matter. Item one, $220, plane, train, and boat fare to Santa Tomas, Mexico. For a town trying to be a resort, Santa Tomas shouldn't be so hard to get to. The last lap was by far the worst. A creaky, twice-a-week boat from Mazatlan. 
And I may be wrong, but it looked to me like the only outfit interested in making a resort out of Santa Tomas was the big new hotel up on a cliff overlooking the sea, the Playa del Mar. The rest of the town just didn't seem to care. It was a sleepy fishing village. A dilapidated pier, a long curving beach with the jungle crowding in on it, and a miscellaneous assortment of adobe shacks huddled here and there, sort of digging their feet into the ground. Even at a distance, the Playa del Mar looked too rich for my purpose, so I checked in at the other hotel. It was an old two-story job in town that I found after carefully detouring around a belligerent rooster scratching up a meal in the street outside. Once inside, I couldn't help feeling that the rooster was better off. It was small, dingy, and hot. I signed the beat-up ledger that passed for a register, and a little character wearing a ragged shirt with no collar, a big grin, and a baseball cap swooped down on me and grabbed my suitcase. Right over the stairs, senor. Okay. Are you the star of the Santa Tomas Nine or something? Okay. The baseball cap. Oh, is it first-class hotel here? I got to wear a uniform. Oh, sure. Silly of me. Uh, which way? Uh, follow me, senor. Uh, you come here to fish? Not exactly. My cousin has a very good boat to hire a cheap. Sorry. Oh. Well, if you're here on just a vacation, I'll be glad to show you the scenic sights for a very small fee. Hey, look, promoter, before you start making a career out of me, how about showing me my room? Okay, okay, senor. Here. It's a very nice room, no? Oh, sure. Hey, uh, look, can we get a little air in here? Oh, see, si, I turn on the overhead fan. It's better, no? No. There's a balcony out here? Oh, see, si, with a beautiful view of the ocean, Senor Dollar. Beautiful. The only thing I can see is the wall of that building across the alley. Ah, but if you climb up on the railing and stand in the corner and look over the roof of the building, there in the distance you'll see the... Beautiful. Building. Look, um... Uh, Benito, senor. Benito, I gather that in addition to a few other assorted enterprises, you're the bellboy in this establishment. I do everything. I must really be a strain. Oh, see, I'm always a straining. Been in Santa Tomas long? Si, senor. Too long. Have you heard my name mentioned around town lately? Anybody asking for me? No, senor. Holy rat. Oh, the door to the balcony. Well, it's nothing, senor. Only the fan. Why? Well, when the fan is on the door, it blows shut. You're jumpy, senor. Huh? See, you are jumpy. Yeah, well, I'm in a good business for it, but, you know. Tell me, did you ever hear the name Summers? Summers? Senor, in Santo Tomas is always Summers. Okay. I mean a man named Summers. Alvin Summers. Here's his picture. Take a look. Hmm. Ever seen him before? Senor, in this heat, it's a strain to use the memory. Yeah, well, you, uh, you think this might make you forget the heat? Quien sabe, Senor Dollar. It might help. Here. Oh. Five dollars, American. Gracias. Now, how about it? Si, senor. I have seen this man. Here in Santa Tomas? I think so. Where? How long ago? I don't remember, but I'll try to find out for you. Okay, Benito. That bill I gave you, I've got a few more just like it, if you can locate the guy in this picture, Alvin Summers. Or if you can find anybody who's asking about me. Senor, for that kind of money, I'll not only find him, I'll bring him to you on a silver planter. Item two on expense account. Five dollars American to Benito the bellboy. Flying blind the way I was in this deal, I figured I needed all the help I could get. And who knows, Benito just might turn something. After he left, I stretched out on the rickety bed and tried to figure out a plan of operations. I had to make myself conspicuous if I wanted the man who'd called the home office to contact me. On the other hand, if Alvin Summers himself was in the vicinity, I'd have to be pretty inconspicuous to stand a chance of getting anywhere near him. Trying to do both at the same time might not be exactly easy. Yeah? Dollar? Well, yeah. Who are you? Carson's the name, E.K. Carson, and I'm sure glad I found you, friend. Hey, you the guy who telephoned and wanted to see me? I sure am. Well, my luck seems to be holding up pretty well. Not too well, I hope. <laughs> huh? 
Yes, sir, as soon as I saw you check in, I phoned a desk clerk to ask who you were. I says to him, he looks like an American to me. See, I'm in room 10 downstairs. Wait a minute, uh, desk clerk? I thought you meant that long-distance call. Well, the reason I hope your luck's not too good, friend, I'm sure hoping to get you into a little cribbage game. Cribbage? You play, don't you? No, I'm strictly the gin rummy type. Well, I could teach you, friend. Wouldn't take a jiffy. Uh, Sorry, I thought you were somebody else. Oh, I... I sure wish I could get you into a little game, friend. Gets mighty lonesome making arounds these small towns. Are you in business here? No, I'm a traveling man. Regional sales manager for hold tight zippers. Zippers? Down here? Sure thing. All a matter of education. As I often say, business is where you find it. Why, half the world is just waiting to be zipped up. Great thought, ain't it? Terrifying. Uh, look, Mr. Carson, if you'll excuse well, what me... What about that cribbage game, friend? Sorry, as I told now, you... Now, I'll I... bet if you just learned to play the game, you'd find out it was a whale of a lot of fun. I'll wait. Well, then, why don't we have us a good talk about business? Look, if you don't mind, I've got a few things to do around oh, here, so... Sure, sure, I know. To tell you the truth, I guess I'm just plain lonely. Daytimes aren't so bad when I'm out on the road, but... Nights, I don't seem to be able to find anyone to talk to. Now that you're yeah, here... Yeah, well, uh, maybe we can have a drink sometime. Say, I'd sure like that. Then maybe we can get up a little game later. Well, maybe. I ushered E.K. Carson, the cribbage king, politely but firmly out of the door. I'd figured him for the man who wanted to talk about Alvin Summers. But all he apparently had on his mind was cribbage and zippers. I ambled on downstairs into the cantina next door. I cut my way through the smoke to the bar and looked around. A few tired-looking characters at the tables, and over in one corner, a little fellow bent over a guitar, eyes closed, and a world all his own. Then I saw the girl. Three stools down the bar from me. But when I looked up again after a drink, she was only one stool away. Hi. Hi. Welcome to Sound of Tomas. Thanks. Really something, isn't he? Hmm? That guitar player. I saw you watching him. Oh. You know, those guys give me the creeps. They start playing and all of a sudden they're gone. Real far away. I don't think he even knows there's anybody else in here. Lucky man, huh? Yeah. It's funny. A cheap run-down bar like this. Nobody listening to him. Except us. And he's playing like he's on a cloud. Yeah. There's a flamenco singer like that up at the hotel. That night out on the terrace when she starts those wailing songs of hers. She gives me the creeps, too. Up at the hotel, the Playa del Mar? Yeah. Oh, he must be down here to see how the other half lives. You mean to see if anybody lives in this town? They sure picked me a great spot for a vacation. Pretty dull, huh? Real. At least, it has been. Oh? Say, uh, do you know that guy over there? The American at the corner table? Yeah, the muscle man. I sure don't. You, uh, certain? Of course I am. Why? Well, he's been staring at us. Oh. Never saw him before, huh? Mm-mm. Of course I've never been in here before. Maybe he's the bouncer. He sure looks like he could qualify. Well. Look, he's leaving. Yeah. I guess we made him self-conscious. I guess I'd better leave, too. Where to? Uh, Gloria. Johnny. Johnny. I think I'll go back up to the hotel and change. Then what? I don't know. There's a moon tonight. Got a date? Mm-hmm. Me? Mm-hmm. When? On the terrace. Half an hour. She left, and I sat there a drink or two, thinking her over and wondering what her angle was. I was pretty sure she was interested in me for more than my manly charms. And it occurred to me that it might not be too unpleasant finding out what was on her mind. Especially if it could help me locate an embezzler named Alvin Summers. I went up to my room to change. When I got there, I found I had company. Close the door. Well, my friend from the bar downstairs. I said close the door. Okay. Why the gun? Turn around. Face the wall. Okay. Hands against the wall. Hey, look, what are you... Shut up. Well, if you're looking for my gun, it's under my left arm. Thanks. Now turn around. So what's this all about? That's just what you're going to tell me. What's your name? Johnny Dollar. I'll bet. Cross my heart. We'll try again. What's your name? I told you, Johnny Dollar. 
You can think of a better one than that. Wise up, Buster. It sounds so phony, it's got to be legitimate. And speaking of names, what's yours? I'm asking the questions. You're answering. Okay, we'll play it your way. What are you doing down here, Dollar? Look, I'll make a deal with you. You tell me why you want to know, and maybe I'll be... Don't play games with me, Dollar. Next time you get more than the barrel of the gun. (sighs) Hey, look, I don't know what this is all about. Okay, we'll... Cut out the question and answer routine. I know why you're here. Oh? So forget it, Dollar. Drop the whole thing and beat it. Maybe I'll like it around here. But you won't like it around here anymore, Dollar. You'll learn to hate it. You and that gun put up a pretty convincing argument. I'll give it to you once more, Dollar. Slow and easy so you can get it this time. Go on away. Don't ever come back. If you don't go now, you will never go. There'll be another exciting episode in the story of the Alvin Summers matter tomorrow. Tomorrow night, a threesome on a moonlit beach. A beautiful girl, me, and a guy with a knife. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. Where have you been, Johnny? I thought we had a date. Oh, Gloria. I'm sorry, baby. I've already had a date. What? Remember the big gorilla at the corner table downstairs in the cantina? The one who kept staring at us? Sure. What about him? Well, he was waiting for me in my room just now. He didn't like the way I parted my hair, I guess, so he changed it with a gun barrel. Johnny, are you all right? Uh, Aside from a lump or two, sure. Sounds to me like you need a little nursing, Johnny. I always do. It's beautiful out on the terrace tonight. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Santo Tomas, Mexico. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Northeastern Fidelity and Bonding, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of additional expenses during my investigation of the Alvin Summers embezzlement case. <laughs> Item 4, $3 American to Eduardo Moreno, M.D., the doctor who dressed the assorted lumps and bruises I'd collected from the strong arm who seemed quite convinced that I should leave town. For a moment, I figured he could be the man who was to contact me with information as to the whereabouts of Alvin Summers, the embezzler. But as it turned out, all he wanted to say to me was goodbye, and he said it very convincingly. But Gloria was waiting for me. She definitely seemed to want to get better acquainted. And although I didn't know what her angle was, I figured it might be fun finding out. I left the joint where I was staying and went up to the Playa del Mar, the big expensive hotel overlooking the sea. There was a terrace with some tables and a flamenco singer wailing at the moon. Gloria was at one of the tables. Hi. Johnny, what in the world happened to you when I talked to you over the phone? I'm sorry I'm late, Gloria. You can see by my face I ran into kind of a rough detour. You all right now? Yeah. 
Johnny, you said it was that man who kept staring at us in the bar where we met? That's the one. Real charming fellow. Muscles, too. What happened? I went to my room to change before coming up here. He was waiting for me, worked me over. The general idea was I should leave Santa Tomas in a hurry. But why? I don't know. Yet. But somewhere along the line, I'm going to make it a point to find out. Cigarette? Okay. Well, looks like things are picking up a little. How so? I told you I'd found this place pretty dull so far. But now, with you getting beat up and told to get out of town, it's beginning to sound a little more interesting. Well, I could do with more dullness and a few less bruises, believe me. You must be down here on a lot more than just a vacation, Johnny. Oh, I don't know. A lot of people apparently come down here to this town just for a vacation. That's why you told me you came here, remember? There's only one difference. What's that, Gloria? I really am on a vacation, and I don't think you are. Oh? You're not the Santa Tomas type. Why not? Mexico City, maybe. Havana, maybe. But not Santa Tomas. No, I think you came down here to meet somebody. Or to find somebody. Okay. Suppose I did. Who would I be looking for? If you don't know, how would I? Looking for, uh, you, maybe? Oh, now that's the nicest thing that's been said to me all day. If you are, it's too bad I didn't know it sooner. Why? It would have made this town a little more bearable. Waiting. Or maybe you've been looking for me. (laughs) Let's not be blunt here. I thought I was being so subtle. You have been looking for me? I must admit I've been looking for someone who's alive in this town. Of course, what I should say is that I've always been looking for you, that I... Okay, okay. I guess that leaves me right where I started from. Hmm? Skip it. So, we're just two happy people on a vacation. Yeah. Okay, Johnny. Okay. Hey, that music... That the flamenco singer you were telling me about? Mm Mm-hmm. Sounds pretty weird, doesn't she? But I like it. You know something? Mm Hmm? Sounds even weirder from down below on the beach. Oh? Like to see for yourself? Yeah. Yeah, I think I'd like to. Well, give me a minute. What's the matter? Speaking of people staring at you... That guy again? Where is he? No... It's a little man this time. Over at the end of the terrace, see? Oh, that's Benito. Who? The bellboy at my hotel. Hey, excuse me a minute. Be right back. Sure. Senor Dollar. Hiya, Benito. The desk clerk told me you'd come up here. What's on your mind? You told me you'd pay me money if I could get some information for you. That's right. I want to know if anybody's been trying to contact me. You turn up anything? Not about that, senor, but the picture you showed... The one of Alvin Summers? Si. I told you I thought I'd seen him here in Santo Tomas. Now I'm sure of it. Good boy. Tonight I talked to a friend of mine. I described senor Summers to him. He told me he used to work for him as a houseboy. Good. Did he tell you where Summers is now? No, he could not tell me that. Couldn't or wouldn't? I do not know, senor, but he told me where the house is that... Summers lived Where is it? You could not find it, senor. It's in from the beach in the jungle a little way. I would have to take you there. All right, let's go. Well, not now. I'm uh, supposed to be on duty back at the hotel. I, I must get down there at once before the hotel clerk finds out I'm gone. When do you get off duty? At midnight. I'll come to your room then and take you to senor Summers house. Okay, midnight. Good boy, Benino. Uh... <clears throat> A real good boy, senor? Mm. Oh, yeah. Here. Oh, gracias, senor. Mm. <laughs> but uh, you should not have come here. Now, look, I've already had one guy tell me to leave town tonight. Don't you start? No, I mean you should not have come here to the Playa del Mar. Oh, why not? Because after you pay your check here, senor, you'll not have any more money left to pay me with. <laughs> Well, don't worry about it, Benita. I'll bully you through somehow. See you later. Si, senor. Well, hello, Dollar. Oh, no. Carson, E.K. Carson, remember? Sure, the zipper salesman. What brings you up here? Oh, same thing as you, friend, out doing a little stepping. I thought you told me down at the hotel that you figured half the world was just waiting to be zipped up. 
How can you afford to take the time off? All work and no play, friend. Haven't you heard? Yeah, well, I, uh, I, I have a date. See you later, Carson. I'm still waiting to get you into a cribbage game, friend. Good. That's just what you do. You mean play cribbage? No, I mean keep waiting. When I got back to the table, Gloria was gone. I looked around, no sign of her. This I didn't get, and I didn't like. Why would she pull a disappearing act on me now? Johnny. Then I spotted her, just off the terrace on the path that led to the cabanas on the beach. I went over. She was carrying a scarf and wearing a one-piece bathing suit. The scarf looked bigger. Hi. Well. I thought as long as we were going down to the beach, we might as well go for a swim. Why not? Be right with you. Item five on expense account. Seven dollars for one pair of swimming trunks. Five for the trunks and two bucks to get the hotel shopkeeper out of bed to sell them to me. After all, I figured I ought to stay close to Gloria. That's the way she seemed to want it, and I wanted to know why. She could have some information on the whereabouts of Alvin Summers I could use. Well, she might. Oh. Oh, that was fun. Yeah. Come on, there's a place over against the rocks at the foot of the cliff. Okay. What do we do now? Build a fire and roast marshmallows? I'm sorry, I didn't bring any marshmallows. Oh, it's just as well. I'm strictly the hot dog and beer type anyway. Here we are. This is my place, Johnny. I come down here almost every night. Oh, it's nice. I told you there was a moon tonight. Yeah. And the flamenco singer. Music comes right down the rocks to us. Doesn't she ever get tired? Doesn't seem to. What's she singing about? Do you know? Uh-huh. It's about a man in jail in a little town. His sweetheart tosses a rose to him through the bars. It drives him crazy. <laughs> Cheerful. There aren't any walls around you, Johnny. Uh-huh. The only trouble is... I don't have a rose. Well, who needs a rose? Oh, Johnny. Darling. Gloria, look, I... You were saying... You know something? I forgot what it was. Good. Let's keep it that way, darling. Hold it. So who's thinking of moving? Shh. What is it? They're in the moonlight coming along the beach. Two men? Yeah. Take a good look at the one in front. Johnny, yeah. let's go. I want to work me over in my hotel room tonight. And it looks like he brought along a stooge with a machete. They're looking for you? Look, get around behind the rock here, then back up the path to the hotel. No, Quiet, Johnny. Quiet, get going. I'm not going to leave you. Please? please, Johnny, please, don't go out there. Now stay out of sight. They can't see us here in the shadows. Gloria, sooner or later I got a little matter to settle with that big ape and might as well be soon. No, please, I, I don't want you to get hurt again, Johnny. I'm not going to leave you. you. Okay, okay, come on. Let's shift around to the other side of this rock and keep it quiet. Can you see that? Keep your head down. Keep your eyes open. I saw him come down the path about half an hour ago. Maybe it's farther up the beach. Now watch the water. That could be it. <sighs> that was close. Too close. Yeah. Johnny, are you in some kind of trouble? Not yet. You seem pretty concerned about me. I am. You sure that was why you didn't want me to tangle with him? Of course. You don't know the guy, huh? I told you I didn't. Why? Oh, I was just wondering if maybe he was a friend of yours and didn't want me moving in on him. Johnny, you're, you're talking crazy. I've never seen him in my life before today in the bar of your hotel. I told you I didn't want you to get hurt again. I mean it. I... Maybe this will prove it. Well, it's a pretty strong argument. Look, Gloria... I hate to, believe me, but I've got to leave. What? Must be almost midnight. So? So there's something i got to take care of. Oh, fine. I know, I'm sorry. Pretty strange vacation you're on, Johnny. Yeah. So, my timing was terrible. But I had to meet Benito the bellboy in my hotel room at midnight to find out more about Alvin Summer's whereabouts. I walked Gloria back up to her hotel and headed for mine. It was a couple of minutes after 12 when I got there. 
I walked into my room and started to reach for the light switch. Then I froze. The moonlight was streaming in through the louvered door to the balcony, and I could see a silhouette against it. Somebody was out on that balcony, crouching against the door. Slowly, carefully, I eased over to it, then suddenly jerked it open. Bonito. And I knew I wasn't going to get any more information about Alvin Summers out of him. After all, you can't do much talking when your throat's been cut. There'll be another exciting episode in our story of the Alvin Summers matter tomorrow. Tomorrow? Well, there are some people you just wouldn't want to meet in a dark alley. But sometimes it can't be helped. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. This is Lieutenant Gomez of the Santo Tomas Police Department. Oh, yeah, Lieutenant. I have been trying to reach you for some time. Sorry, I was out making some funeral arrangements. It is about the dead man that I wish to speak to you, senor. Fire away, Lieutenant. What's on your mind? Precisely the question I was about to ask you. What do you mean? Surely I do not need to remind you that Benito Escanza was found dead in your hotel room earlier this evening. You certainly don't. But I've already told one of your cops the whole story. Perhaps. Perhaps not. I suggest that you come to see me so that we can discuss it further. Is that an invitation or an order? Uh, let us call it an invitation. But if you do not accept, we will have to come and get you. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Santo Tomas, Mexico. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Northeastern Fidelity and Bonding, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of additional expenses during my investigation of the Alvin Summers $75,000 embezzlement case. <laughs> Item 6, $25 American. Funeral and burial expenses for Benito the Bellboy. Somebody had to do it, and he apparently had no family. After I made the arrangements with the town's undertaker, I went back to my room and received Lieutenant Gomez's polite but firm invitation to drop in on him. So I went on down to police headquarters. Sit down, Senor Dollar. Thanks, Lieutenant. So? So, the autopsy has confirmed the fact that Benito Escanza died from knife wounds. I didn't need an autopsy to tell me that. It was obvious. But what is not obvious is your part in all of this. Look, the story hasn't changed a bit since I told it to your Sergeant Romero. I went back to my room at midnight. I opened my balcony door and enrolled Benito. His throat had been cut. That is the story. As to what is behind the story, that may well be another matter. For instance? For instance, 
In a case such as this, everyone is a potential suspect. Everyone, including you. Isn't this being pretty ridiculous, Gomez? Is it? Then perhaps you would be kind enough to tell me if there was some legitimate reason Benito had his throat cut in your hotel room. Well, in the first place, if you're interested in alibis, I've got one. Indeed? Indeed. I was with a girl named Gloria Harris up at the Hotel Playa del Mar all evening. You can check that. Oh, you may be quite certain that I am checking on all your activities this evening, senor. In the second place, if you're interested in motives, I don't have one. No? Why would I want to kill Benito when I was hoping to get some information from him? Information of what sort, senor Dollar? Oh, I guess I'd better start at the top, Lieutenant. Here's my card. You are an insurance investigator. That's right. About six months ago, a man named Alvin Summers up in the States embezzled $75,000 from the company he worked for. The outfit I'm representing in the deal wrote the bond on him, so they were stuck for the money. $75,000. A couple of days ago, they got a long-distance phone call from down here in Santo Tomas. The man who called claimed that he had information about Alvin Summers. That's why I came down here. Now, who was the man who telephoned? We don't know. I came on the chance that he might contact me here, or that I might get some kind of lead on Alvin Summers' whereabouts. And have you? No, on both counts. Benito said he knew about a place where Summers used to live. He was going to take me there tonight. But apparently somebody had other ideas. And a knife to back them up. I see. And nobody has tried to contact you? Oh, sure, sure. Several people have. But always for the wrong reason. First, there was a man named Carson, a zipper salesman. He contacted me for the purpose of setting up a cribbage game. Cribbage? What is this cribbage? Oh, now, that's something I hope I never find out. Hmm? Then there was a strong arm who bounced me around with a gun barrel and suggested politely that I wanted to leave town. Oh? Uh, what did he look like? Well, he was heavy in the shoulders, thick neck, low forehead, short dark hair, scar over the bridge of his nose. Scar? That would be Senor Kraus. You know him? I know him by sight. Well, who is he? What's his pitch? That is something I do not know. Senor, you must understand that Santo Tomas is a rather strange town and a dangerous one. Come in. Hey, Lieutenant. Can't you see that I'm busy, Sergeant Romero? A body is about Senor Dollar. Oh. Well, uh, what is it? Well, I have talked to a Senorita Gloria Harris at the Hotel Playa del Mar. She said that Senor Dollar was with her throughout the evening. <laughs> Very well, Romero. Uh, one thing more. We have just arrested a man, an uh, American tourist, uh, uh, Senor Carson. I will talk to him when I have time. Hey, now, wait say... a minute. That's the zipper salesman I was telling you about. Indeed? Yeah. Hey, look, maybe he ties into this deal after all. What's the charge? Romero? Uh, it's uh, disturbing the peace. Oh, great. Just when I thought I had a lead. What's the matter? He got a few too many under his belt, maybe? Well, Romero? Uh, here, here's the report. The Senor Carson is outside. Gracias. That will be all. Uh, I will talk to the man. Sí, Lieutenant. Senor Donald, if you know this man, perhaps you had better come with me. Okay. Dollar! Say, I'm sure glad to see you. Hi, Carson. What seems to be the trouble? Well, it, it wasn't as much as they made it, Dollar. A fella goes out stepping. Sometimes he, well... Well, you know. Hey, he steps a little too far. Well, I was only having a little fun. Senor Carson, this report states that you are at the Hotel Playa del Mar this evening. Uh, that's right. But now, Lieutenant... It further what... states that you became increasingly noisy and that at one point, during a dance by an entertainer, you grabbed a serape from one of the musicians and attempted to join in the dance. Now, now Lieutenant, maybe I was a little out of line, but I... Further, I... that when the dancer refused to dance with you, you chased her around the patio several times. Trying to sell her a zipper, maybe? Oh, no, Dollar, let up on a guy, will you? And that finally, when the musician attempted to get his therapy away from you, you broke his guitar over his head. Say, when you get going, you're a real tiger, aren't you? Are these things true, Senor Carson? Well, I, I suppose the facts are correct, but they sound different somehow down here. I was just trying to have a little fun, you know. See, uh, Sergeant Romero will conduct you to the magistrate. Romero! A dollar? Are you just going to stand there and not do anything? After all, we both live at the same hotel, and... And? And? Oh, you're a big help. What'll have it to him, Lieutenant? Oh, you will have to pay the damages, and there will be a fine. Which will probably go on his expense account. Lieutenant, you started to tell me about this Beetlebrow Krauss who put a few dents in me. 
I started to say that before the people from Mexico City built the new hotel, this town unfortunately used to be something of a haven for undesirable characters from the United States. Fugitives, huh? Some of them still remain. And although I know very little about Senor Kraus, it is probable that he is one of them. Could be. You say that he and Senor Carson are the only ones who have made any effort to contact you? Yeah, except for Gloria Harris, of course. I still haven't found out what's on her mind. Hmm? I mean, what else is on her mind. She says she's down here on a vacation. Indeed. In that case, it has certainly been a long vacation. What do you mean? She has been here for several months, to my knowledge. Well, well. Now, that's very interesting, Lieutenant. Thanks. Anything else you want to ask me about, Benito? Uh, Not at the moment, but I suggest you remain available. You know where to find me. One moment, Senor Dollar. Hmm? A word of warning. As I told you, this town can be a dangerous place. I would suggest that you be quite careful. Yeah, yeah. And uh, one thing I wish to impress upon you. If you are at any time tempted during your investigation to take the law into your own hands... I assure you that you will regret it. Well, in that case, I hope you're around when and if I need you. Whether or not I am available, the warning still applies. Okay. Be seeing you. Johnny. Wow, Gloria. I thought you were tucked in for the night. I couldn't sleep, so I called your hotel. Oh? They told me that the bellboy had been murdered, that you were at the police station, so I came down here. Is there anything I can do? Not for Benito, I'm afraid. He was killed in your room? Yeah. You think he could have been killed by mistake? Mistake? You mean maybe I was supposed to be the target? Hey, it's a thought. Johnny, you're in trouble of some kind. I wish you'd tell me what it is. You're not just down here on a vacation. Speaking of vacations, Gloria, let's... Johnny, what is it? Keep looking straight ahead. There's somebody across the street in the shadows. He's tailing us. Can you see who it is? When he goes past that light, I'll be... Well, what do you know? My old friend Krause again. You mean the man who came to your room and was looking for you on the beach? That's the boy. Funny how he always seems to pop up when I'm with you. Johnny, I tell you, I don't know Doesn't him. Doesn't matter right now. Come on. Turn into the alley here. Okay. Now keep going straight down this alley and out the other end. Go back to your hotel and I'll call you there later. I may be a while. What are you going to do? Wait for him. No, Johnny. Look, Gloria, don't give me any argument this time. Get going. After she was out of sight, I ducked into a doorway. Then I waited. Yeah, Krauss was following all right. I waited until he got right up to me. And I dove at him. You! That's right, me. Drop the gun. Drop it! Yeah, this time I'm ready for you, sweetheart. Funny thing about me, Krauss. I don't like guys working over me with a gun barrel ever. All right. Now you're going to tell me what this is all about. Why you've been tailing me. Why you worked me over with a gun barrel in my room last night. I want to hear all about it. You know why. Talk. I said talk. You, you're not taking me back. Taking you back? I know you came down here after me, but I ain't going back. What are you talking about? I know what happens to a three-time loser. Three-time loser? You want me back home, you got to carry me. Hey, wait a minute. You ever hear of a man named Alvin Summers? Oh? How about Gloria Harris? No, no, no. You sure about that, Cross? <laughs> Look, don't. Look, I'm telling you the truth. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you are. You're too punchy right now to give me a routine. Yeah, I think I get it. You're wanted in the States. You figured I was a cop and came down here to make a pinch. Brother, right now, I sure wish I was. I mean, you... No, I'm no cop. Oh. I guess I made a mistake. You sure did, Buster. Um, no hard feeling? Oh, no, no, not at all. I just love the feel of a gun barrel whipping across my face. Kraus, I got a nice little piece of advice for you. Next time, you better find out what the score is before you jump into the ball game. <laughs> I left him there in the alley and went back to my hotel. Then, just as I was about to open the door to my room, I heard someone moving around inside. I went quietly down to the end of the hall, out the window, then eased along the balcony back toward my room. Inside it was dark, but I could make out someone bent over my luggage, searching it. I edged across the room. 
slowly. Then I lunged. Ah! Hello, Gloria. Johnny. Yeah, Johnny. Helping me unpack, maybe. Look, I, uh, I can explain, Johnny. You know something? That's just exactly what you're going to do. There'll be another exciting episode in our story of the Alvin Summers matter tomorrow. Tomorrow night, how to fall into a trap in one easy lesson. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. Yeah, remember me, sweetheart? Johnny, I didn't... I'm the guy you were making the big pitch for. Dancing, moonlight on the beach, the complete routine. Oh, I gotta hand it to you, baby. That was real nice acting. No, it wasn't acting, Johnny. I meant it, all of it. Oh, sure, Gloria, sure. That's why I catch you here and searching my room. That's all part of the big romance, huh? I can explain. And that's just what you're gonna do. Hey, look, Gloria, one guy has already wound up dead on this deal. I've got a strong hunch I'm number two man on the list. And this baby I do not want. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Santo Tomas, Mexico. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Northeastern Fidelity and Bonding, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of additional expenses during my investigation of the Alvin Summers embezzlement of $75,000. Item 9, $17.60. Business entertainment for one Gloria Harris. Believe it or not, I wasn't going to put that item on the account because I figured it might just possibly be a private romance. But when I caught Gloria searching my hotel room, I knew she tied into the deal somehow. That she could give me information on Summer's whereabouts. Johnny, please. Oh, no. You're not leaving, Gloria. Not yet. I'm not trying to get away. I... Oh, it's the use. You'd never believe me. Why should I? You lied to me. I lied to you once. Only once. When I told you I'm here on a vacation. I'm not. Surprise. The truth is I'm stranded down here. Stranded? Oh, sure. That's why you're staying at the Playa del Mar, the most expensive hotel in town. I don't mean no money. I mean no passport. Oh. It's true. You got a cigarette, Johnny? Yeah, here. Thanks. Yeah. I've been stuck in this ratty town for four months now. Just... Hoping every day that I could figure out some way or find somebody to help me get back to the States. How come you picked this town? Assuming I believe you. Because I heard that fugitives from the States sometimes came here. I've been drifting around for a year from place to place. I guess I thought my luck had changed here. Well, it hasn't. How'd you lose your passport in the first place? I'll tell you if you really want to know, Johnny. Personally, I'd rather skip it. It's a long story, not a very pretty one. And it's all in the past. 
Let's just say I've made a mistake about a guy. Okay, Glory, okay. But there's one little item you haven't told me. Why you were searching my room just now. Because I was trying to find out something about you, Johnny. The reason why you're down here. Why? So maybe I could make a deal with you. Deal? You help me get a passport. And I'll help you. How can you help me? You're looking for Alvin Summers, aren't you? Oh, am I? Six months ago, he embezzled $75,000 up in the States and took off. Go on. You came down here to find him. You're an insurance investigator. Keep talking. That's all. That's it. Now maybe you wouldn't mind telling me how you know all of... Oh, sure. That report in my suitcase. In the picture. Alvin Summers, I know him. I can help you, Johnny. Where is he? First, I've got to know if you'll help me. The passport? The passport. Well, what do you expect me to do about that? In your business, Johnny, you must meet a lot of people, all kinds. Maybe one of them has an extra passport or two for a price, maybe. All right, I'll see what I can do. That the best you can say? That's the best. Take it or leave it. All right, I'll take it. I haven't any choice. Now, about Alvin Summers. I'll take you there, to Summers' place. Where is it? Down the beach, about a mile below town. Then into the jungle a little way. How come you know where it is? I met Alvin Summers a couple of months ago. Here in Santo Tomas? Yeah. I went there once for dinner. Okay, you take me there, Gloria. First, I'd better go up to the hotel and change. The country's pretty rough on clothes. Okay, I'll meet you at your hotel in half an hour. Johnny. Mm. I only lied to you about one thing. The reason I was down here. The rest of it I meant... Last night, on the terrace and on the beach, I meant all of it. Really, Johnny, and I mean this. You know, I'm kind of glad you told me that. See you in half an hour. I stayed there a while after she left, going over the case in my mind. Maybe she was telling me the truth. But whether she was or not, I had to follow up any lead I could find because I was getting nowhere the way things were. Half an hour later, as I was starting out of my room to go pick her up, my phone rang. It was a long-distance call from the States. Fred Wilkins at Northeastern Fidelity, Johnny. Hi, Fred. Well, how's the fishing down there? Fishing? A matter of fact, it hasn't been so good so far, Fred. Ah, that's too bad, but I'll bet the swimming is all right, huh? Whoa there, what's eating you? I didn't send you down there for a vacation. Well, you got a great sense of humor. You should see this place, vacation. Then what have you been doing down there? Well, what do you think I've been doing? I've been looking for whoever it was that telephoned you and said he had information on Alvin Summers. You couldn't have been looking very hard. He called me again this morning. He what? That's right. He wondered if I'd sent anyone down there yet. Hey, look, Fred, this guy is not easy to find, believe me. And I think I know why. Obviously, somebody doesn't want him to talk, and that somebody could be Alvin Summers, about one jump behind him. Summers, you, you think he's around there? Could be. I'm leaving right now to find out. I've got a lead on where he lives. Uh, there's somebody at the door. I'll call you when I get anything. Do that. Brother, fishing. Oh, Lieutenant Gomez. Uh, well, look, I'm in sort of a hurry right now. Well, this will not take long. Okay. What is it, Lieutenant? Early this morning, one of my men found Senor Kraus in the alley. How is he feeling? He had been badly beaten. He would not tell us anything, but it was fairly obvious who had done this to him. So? So, the last time we talked, Senor Dollar, I warned you not to attempt to take the law into your own hands. Now listen, Gomez, if you think I'm going to take a pistol whipping like he gave me and not do anything about do it, you Do not gotta... misunderstand. I care nothing about Kraus personally or what happens to him. I'm thinking about something more important. For instance? You are looking for Alvin Summers, a man who quite obviously does not want to be found. So? So when you find him, it is quite possible that there will be trouble. Granted. But let's face a few facts, Lieutenant. You and your boys can't help me. You're in charge of the Santa Tomas Police Force, all two men. And I imagine you've got a few other things on your mind besides an ambassador from the States and an insurance investigator. That may so well that be means true. I've got to do it on my own. Very well, Senor Dollar. This morning I attended the funeral of Benito Inscanza, who was killed because he had information about Alvin Summers. If you find Summers and take the law into your own hands again, I fear I may have to attend another funeral. Yours. That's what I liked about Gomez. He was the cheerful type. 
Well, I picked up Gloria at her hotel and we headed for Summer's place. We walked down the beach about a mile below town. The beach kept narrowing as the jungle crowded closer and closer to the water. This place is in from the beach away. There's a little path pretty soon that leads in. You could walk right by it and never see it. Here it is. And that's just what we'll do. Hmm? Walk right by it. I don't want to lead anyone else here. There's nobody else on the beach. I'm not talking about the beach. That's a regular jungle in there. Twenty people could be watching us, so we'd never see them. Oh, I guess so. Okay. Now we'll go in here, then work our way back to the path. Brother, this is pretty thick in here. Yeah. Oh, you're walking through thick brush like this. You always feel like somebody's watching you. Imagination gets pretty strong sometimes. I think it's a little more than imagination. What do you mean? Stop a minute. Listen. I don't hear Shh. him. Johnny. Yeah. Somebody's tailing us again. Look. Keep moving straight ahead. I'm going to circle and see if I can intercept him. All right, but be careful. Gloria moved on and I started circling to the right. Every few seconds I'd stop and listen. Yeah, he was still there. I pegged the direction of the sound and started edging toward it slowly. Then my foot caught on the bottom. I scrambled to my feet and kept going in the same direction. There was a small clearing ahead. I reached it, stopped, and listened. Nothing. Whoever I was chasing seemed to know the country better than I did. He disappeared. I caught up with Gloria a couple of hundred yards farther along the trail. Any luck, Johnny? No. Whoever it is is pretty good at keeping out of sight. Are you sure it was a person? Might have been some kind of animal. Yeah, maybe. You can see a corner of Alvin Summer's hut from here. Past that big tree. Yeah, come on. And stay behind me. All right. If there's any trouble... You think there will be? Look, a guy who's this careful about hiding doesn't usually welcome visitors. Quiet now. No sign of life. Keep back against the wall. I'm going to open the door. Okay, Gloria. Nobody home, huh? Nobody home. Well, he seems to have a pretty comfortable place here. You like to live in jungles. Hmm. Yeah. What? Looks like he hasn't been around for several days. Oh? The food in these cupboards, pretty moldy. Yeah, I guess they've cleared out. They? Uh Uh-huh. He and whoever was here with him. What makes you think someone was? For one thing, two sets of dirty dishes over there. Maybe he just wasn't neat. He'd have to have been awfully neat to use two toothbrushes and two kinds of toothpaste and two people have been eating at this table. See the crumbs? Maybe there's something around here that could give you a clue to where he might be now. Maybe. If he's still alive. What do you mean? You think he isn't? Oh, I don't know. But if somebody else was living here, too, it could mean he had a partner in this deal. And it's a funny thing about that kind of playmates. Sooner or later, they start quarreling about who's going to hold the marbles. $75,000 worth in this case. Johnny, if he is dead, that leaves you nowhere. Maybe not. What? Yeah. Sounds like our shadow is somewhere outside. Keep talking, Gloria. Normal tone. I'm going out the back way and see if I can spot him. Why don't you look around the hut, Johnny? Gloria kept up a line of patter while I slipped out the back door and into the brush. I listened. Do you want me to do anything? Nothing but the sound of Gloria's voice. He had to be somewhere near. But where? I worked my way around to the front of the cabin, still under cover. No sign. I kept on around the other side. Then as I started to climb over a fallen tree trunk, I saw a shadow out of the corner of my eye. Hold it. Don't turn around. The voice was behind me. I could see the rest of the shadow now. A hand with a gun. And I knew it was zeroed in on my backbone. I said, hold it. I'm holding. Drop your gun. Kick it backwards, quick. Hey, look, whoever you are... Don't turn around. Okay. And don't try to move. Mind telling me... Keep your eyes straight ahead. Any move, any move at all, it'll be your last.
There'll be the final exciting episode in our story of the Alvin Summers matter tomorrow. Yes, tomorrow, how to find out what you've been looking for the hard way. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. I told you, that's my name. What do you want, an affidavit? I've got to be sure. Look, you've got me out here in the middle of the jungle with a gun in my back. Don't turn around. And I can't even see you. You think I'd be kidding you at a time like this? Any move, any move at all, and it'll be your last. Tonight and every weekday night... Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Santo Tomas, Mexico. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Northeastern Fidelity and Bonding, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of additional expenses during my investigation of the Alvin Summers embezzlement of $75,000. Item 12, two cents. Just what I figured my life was worth at the moment. Gloria Harris had taken me down the beach and into the jungle to show me the hut where Alvin Summers had been hiding out. There was no sign of him. But I heard a noise outside in the underbrush and went out to investigate. I didn't see a thing. But I felt something. A gun barrel pressing against the back of my neck. I want to talk to you, Dollar. Well, you've got a quaint way of arranging a conversation, believe me. I could do better if you take away that gun. Johnny! Don't answer. Who's answering? Johnny! Wait. Well? Be in your hotel room in exactly one hour. Look, what's this all about? You're looking for Alvin Summers, aren't you? Oh, am I? Johnny, where are you? I've got some information about him for you. Well, let's have it now. Not now. I've got to talk to you alone. Be in your hotel room in town in an hour, understand? Look. Do as I say and be sure you're alone. Alone. Okay. Now, just keep looking straight ahead. Don't turn around and don't tell anyone about this. Anyone. Understand? You make it pretty clear. I'll be watching you, Dollar. You won't see me, but I'll see you. I can believe it, mister. Johnny, please. Johnny, where... Oh, here you are. Yeah, here I am. Why didn't you answer me? I came out here looking for a guy, remember? How am I going to find him if I start shouting at you? But I got worried when you didn't come back to the hut. Yeah. That noise you heard outside, did you see anything? No, I didn't see a thing. Johnny, didn't you find anything to give you a lead on where Summers might be? I don't know. But you said if I helped you find him, you'd see what you could do about getting me a passport back to the States. Yeah, sure. Come on, let's get out of here. It suits me fine. This place gives me the creeps, all these trees and vines. Broad daylight, but you can't see a thing. I know. My imagination's still working over time. I've got that feeling we're being watched again. Funny, isn't it? Yeah, real funny. We kept on toward the beach. Gloria was fidgeting because she thought somebody was watching us. I was fidgeting because I knew somebody was. And I had a strong hunch he was the man whose long-distance phone call to the States brought me down to Mexico in the first place. 
We got back to the beach. I took Gloria up to her hotel and went down to mine in town. As I crossed the lobby toward the stairway to the second floor, out popped a familiar face. Hello, Frank. Oh, Carson. Lieutenant Gomez let you out of jail, huh? Oh, now let's get one thing straight, friend. I never was actually in jail. Well, you're lucky. I've seen the jail. Huh? Oh, well, I, I just had to pay a fine, and that judge they got in this burg read me the riot act, but then they let me go. Well, good. So now it's back to selling zippers, huh? Sure is, and I'm behind schedule, too. Checking out right now, as a matter of fact. A lot of territory to cover. Like I always say, half, half the world... Half the world's waiting to get zipped up. Yeah, you told me. All right, Dad. Say, Dollar, mm. I'd like you to do me a favor. Oh, that little trouble I got into last night up at the Playa del Mar Hotel, I'd sure appreciate it if you'd keep quiet about it when you get back to the States. You mean you don't want anybody to know you got plastered, grabbed a serape, and did the fandango? Now, Dollar... Broke a guitar over the musician's head? Now, can't we just forget about that? Believe me, that? I had until you reminded me. Now, Carson, I'm reasonably sure we don't know the same people and won't be seeing each other again. I'd say the secret of your lurid past was pretty safe. Well, I sure hope so, friend. But about not seeing each other in the States, I was planning on looking you up. Goody. Yes, sir, I got a deal for you. Sorry, but I have all the zippers I can use at the moment. No, that's not what I mean, friend. I've been trying to get you into a cribbage game, remember? How can I forget? Well, instead, I'm going to look you up in the States and let you teach me to play gin rummy. How could I be so lucky? Oh, sorry, I think that's my phone. So long, Carson. I'll sure look you up back in the good old USA, friend. Hello? 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 Hmm. Keep your hands on the table. What? Oh, my shadow again. Anybody follow you? Not that I know of. You're early. I know. And I searched your room. That's become an old Santa Tomas custom. To make sure you really were Johnny Dollar. So now you know. What about it? You can turn around. I don't know. Maybe you'll tell me what... Wait a minute. A decent shave and you'd match that photo I have in my suitcase. Alvin Summers. Yeah. I'm Alvin Summers. I don't get it. I had you figured for the man who made that long-distance call to the States that tipped me off to come down here. You're right about that, too. You put the finger on yourself? If you want to call it that. Well, what happened? Your deal goes sour on you, maybe? Yeah. yeah. Okay, sit down. Take it easy. Tell me about it. I'll turn on the overhead fan. Pretty stuffy in here. Dollar, that phone call you got just now... Hung up. Clerk downstairs must have rung the wrong room. Or somebody was checking to see if you were here. Could be... Okay, suppose you start from the top. What was that? Relax. What are you... Just one of the charming features of this room. You Why? turn on that big overhead fan, it slams the balcony door. Oh, well, turn it off, will you? I'm kind of edgy. Yeah, sure. You asked me if my deal had gone sour. It went very sour. Oh, I had it all figured out. I was planning it for a year. I was going to embezzle the 75000 and really live, live big. Yeah. Instead of that, I spent all my time hiding. Mexico City, Cuernavaca, Tampico, you name it, I was there. Always undercover, always hiding. Did you ever spend much time hiding, Dollar? No, not much. Oh, it's a great life. Great. Every time somebody looks at you on the street, you're sure he's after you, tailing you. You wake up in the middle of the night, you see a shadow outside... Turns out to be just a bush, but you spend the rest of the night sweating. Finally, I, I, I just couldn't take it anymore. The rest of my life that way... You know, Summers, a lot of guys figure that out before it's too late. Too bad you didn't. Yeah. So, finally, I owned the bonding company long distance. I knew they'd send an investigator. They sent you. I, I thought if I could talk to someone like you, see what could be done... There's only one thing can be done at this point, Summers. Come back with me to the States. Bring back what's left of the money. Sixty thousand. That'll help. But you know there can't be any deal. Yeah, I... I guess I always knew that. Here. Take the gun. Thanks. Now, what about the money? It's in a safe deposit box in Mexico City. Here. Here's the key. 
One thing I don't get, though, Summers. Yeah? You wanted me to contact. But you were sure playing hard to find. Well, I had to be careful. I got a look at you the first day you arrived. I wasn't sure you were the one, so I decided to come to your room that night. But then I saw somebody else coming here, so I gave up. Who was it? The bellboy. Benito? Hey. That'll be just before he got knifed. Oh, no. I wasn't the one who killed him, Dollar. I'm no killer. Just the fool who runs away with somebody else's money, remember? Anyway, I didn't have another chance to get to Idle today. I had to keep undercover so they wouldn't find me. Wait up. Hello, baby. Here, let me... Leave the gun right where it is, Johnny. Put that safe deposit key on the table. I guess you're calling them. Thanks. And it all adds up. You found out Summers here was planning to turn himself in. You didn't want that money to slip through your fingers. But Summers disappeared from his hideout. You couldn't find him, so you figured you'd let me find him for you. That's right. And it worked. And you're so right about that money. You think I'd give it up now? Gloria. Keep out of it, Alvin. If you want to go back and be a Boy Scout, that's your business. The money stays with me. Johnny. Yeah? This doesn't have to be the end of it for us. Oh. So now we get the pitch about making beautiful music, huh? I'm not kidding, Johnny. Sixty thousand's a lot of money. You know, you put on quite an act. Maybe I believed a little bit of it. But if I did, I quit the moment you walked through that door just now. Okay, Johnny, that's enough. I thought maybe you'd be smart, but if you won't, you leave me no choice. No, Gloria, don't. Gloria! <laughs> the balcony. Out on the balcony. Hold it! Carson. Stay right where you are, friend. Oh, shut up. She's dead. She crossed me. You and she were working against each other. She wanted me to lead her to Summers. You wanted to find him yourself. That's right. And Summers, you took a lot of fine. That's why you killed Benito the bellboy, to shut his mouth. Then you went up to the big hotel and clowned around so you'd get arrested and that way set up an alibi for the evening. I was pretty proud of that little idea, Dollar. And it's all worked out just the way I wanted it. You see, right from the start, I Carson was holding all the trumps. They were made out of lead, and I knew he was going to start dealing them any second. Then I remembered the overhead fan. The switch was right next to my elbow. The balcony door was open, and Carson had his back to it. What are you doing? Just turning on the fan. I need some air. Can you blame me? Yeah. You're sweating, aren't you, Dollar? What's the matter? You losing your nerve? Well, it really doesn't matter. What the... The door slammed. Carlson whirled. And I knocked the lamp off the table. By the time I hit the floor, my gun was out. I picked up the lamp and lit it again. Summers was crouched in a corner. Across the room, sitting on the floor, was Carson staring stupidly down at the red bullet hole in his side. I picked his gun up off the floor. Dollar! Summers, call the police station, Lieutenant Gomez. Yeah, all right. Help me, Dollar. It hurts. Yeah, it hurts. But not as much as it hurt Benito and Gloria. I, I... You finally got me into a game, didn't you, friend? And you lost. <laughs> Expense account item 13. Double the amount of item 1. $440. Transportation back to the States for Alvin Summers and me. And you know, I turned him over to the authorities as soon as we got back. That's the way he wanted it. Gloria? Well... Once in a while, I get to wondering if she really meant some of the things she told me. Not that it matters. Conclusion of report. Expense account total, $923. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, please, there'll be a new exciting story on Johnny Dollar beginning next Monday. Next week, the Valentine matter. And believe me, it's not the kind of Valentine you'd wish on even your worst enemy. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by Robert Reif. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Virginia Gregg, Marvin Miller, Don Diamond, Tony Barrett, and Parley Bear. 
Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Roy Vickers, New Britain Mutual, Johnny. Hi, Roy. How'd you like to try some Creole cooking? Okay, what's up? One of the bellhops at the St. Agnes Hotel in New Orleans had quite a time last night. He opened the safe and walked out with $7,500 in cash and a diamond necklace worth a cool $25,000. So help me, Roy. I didn't know bellhops had so much fun. That isn't all. He also stole a station wagon belonging to the hotel manager, not to mention the manager's wife. What do you want back? Mainly that necklace. It's the property of one of our clients. She was stopping at the St. Agnes and had it stowed in the hotel safe. Any line on the bellhop? Not a trace so far. The wife? Don't be funny. Can you hop a plane down there and see what's happened for us? Sure, Roy. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the New Britain Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Valentine matter. Expense account item one, $175 and no cents. Airfare and the incidental cost it takes to get from Hartford to New Orleans. Once there, I was more than surprised to discover the police had wound up the whole case. The prodigal bellhop, along with the $7,500 in cash, the diamond necklace, the station wagon, even the manager's wife had all been recovered. Everything and everyone tearful, but intact. I reported this development to all parties concerned, phoned the airport for a reservation back to Hartford, which they said would be the following afternoon, and then looked around for something to do. I found a spot on Burgundy Street that seemed to be less crowded than the others and settled down for the evening. That's where it happened. He was sitting alone, tall, gray-haired, rugged. A face full of some 50-odd years, I guessed, and full of some other things no one could guess. It was three drinks at the bar before I made out who he was, who he had been. A man who was once big, in a way that only prohibition made them big. This seat taken? No. Mind if I sit down, Mr. Valentine? Well, you can't be that old. How old? Old enough to recognize me. Recognize you from your picture. Long time ago. Time. Hmm. I guess I could tell you more about that than anybody. You a cop? No, I'm an insurance investigator. You were a cop once? Once. Can I buy you a drink, Mr. Valentine? Dan's enough. Sure. You're doing better than the boys in the force. I've been living in New Orleans for three months now. Nobody's calling me. Any reason why they should? No. No, there isn't. But then no one's ever figured out a way to stop a policeman from making a visit when he wants to. <laughs> That's true. That's a funny thing. There's a lot of policemen I've liked in my day. Visiting policemen. That is, on certain days. You're too young to remember much about it, Dollar, but a long time ago, a bunch of old women made a law called the uh, Balstead Act. Sure. Prohibition. Everybody heard about it. Including the old women who passed the law. You see, this law was supposed to be for the other guy. Not for them. Anyhow, a lot of people started bottling up violations of this Balstead Act. Tired? No, not a bit, Dan. Well, I got me a lot of money and a lot of trouble. Thirteen years for income tax evasion, finally. 
Ended just three months ago when I came here to live happily ever after. Funny. No. New Orleans is a nice, quiet place to live. Better still, no one's bothering you. That's the way I want to keep it. And they can pass a thousand stupid laws, and I'm not going to fall for any of them. Everything the book says, everything in order. How's that sound? Pretty good. You believe it? Yes, I do. Then I've got my point over. I'm flattered that you recognize me, Dollar. I paid back ten days for every one I took. Now, all I ask is that you don't ask the police to bother me. Okay. As far as I'm concerned, Dan, you didn't even have the dinner I'm about to buy for you. Dollar, it's nice to come out of prison and be recognized by a nice guy. Where we go, Jimmy Moran? That's where we went, and it was a swell dinner. Only Dan Valentine didn't eat much of it. He tried to smile and crack wise, but there was a sadness about him that stood in the way. I wanted to ask him more questions about those days back when, but I didn't. We dropped into a couple of other places. The Absinthe House, Joe Glorioso's. We listened to some jazz and drank Sazeracs and walked along Canal Street. Finally, we shook hands and said goodnight. Expense account item two, $26.26. Hotel, board, and miscellaneous. The next morning, I packed my bags, checked out of my hotel, and was about to take a limousine out to Mobile Eye Airport. Oh, uh, Mr. Dollar? Yeah. A message for you. Oh, thanks. It was from a police officer on the New Orleans force, an inspector de Baca. Could I drop by before I left town? I went right over and met de Baca, a tall, lean, gray-haired man with 30 years' service who... Kind of puzzled me at first. Thanks for coming by, Donna. Sure. Sit down. What's up? The bellhop take back his confession on that necklace theft? No, no. This is something else, Donna. Dan Valentine. Oh. You met him about 6.30 last night. You had two drinks with him, and you went over to Moran's and had dinner. You went to two other places. You left them at 11.30. Yeah. I also brushed my teeth when I got back to the hotel. But I bet you can't tell me what color my pajamas are. Now, take it easy. Just take it easy. Maybe I'm saying this bad. He doesn't know it, but we've been keeping an eye on Danny ever since he showed up in New Orleans. Just so happened you were with him last night, and you did business with us here yesterday afternoon. So? We want to know if you had any business with Dan Valentine. Don't be funny, Inspector. Okay, okay. Now, don't get huffy. Let me put it this way. Dan came to New Orleans three months ago, bought a house out in Jefferson Parish. He hired a housekeeper, bought himself a little car, took up fishing every afternoon or just walking. Nothing wrong with that? No, of course there isn't. We like it fine. The boys in the car drive by now and then, look at him, just look. No questions, no knocking on the door. When we see Danny in town, we turn the other way. Just look, you see? Sure. Now, he doesn't have any visitors. No old pals from Chicago or New York or Detroit come to see him. He lives alone. And he likes it. That's what he told me. You're his first visitor. Now, I just wondered... You wondered wrong, DeBaca. Okay, okay. I had to ask about it. You know how it is. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Right on cue. Your pal just stopped a couple of bullets. Huh? Danny Valentine. Come on. According to the uniformed officer who had put in the call, a newspaper boy had found Valentine lying on the sidewalk and roused the neighborhood. One of the residents had carried him inside. The ambulance crew stood by the bed as we came in. Valentine was lying on his back, the white chenille spread under him changing to a deep red. Two bullets had ripped ragged holes in one shoulder through flesh and bone. But he was just as self-contained as ever. I got the idea you were going to stay out of trouble, Dan. I didn't know I was in any trouble. Are you, Dollar? Okay. You went to the police after all? No. The inspector called me in. About you, Dan, but let's forget that for now. How'd this happen? This? Cleaning my gun. You're a loser, Dan. You're not supposed to have a gun. Oh, you know me in the law. We sometimes didn't hit it off. Odd, where is the gun? What gun? The gun you were cleaning when you were walking down the street and shot yourself. I swallowed it. Now, look. Somebody's taken a couple of shots at you, Dan. Nobody can tell us anything about it but you so far. We don't want you murdered. Well? Okay, boys. Get the ambulance back to... Wait a minute, wait a minute. You're hurt. You're going to the police hospital. No, no. I've served my time and I'm clean. 
Being shot at even in this state doesn't make you a criminal. Dollar. Yeah, Dan. Do me a favor. Would you phone a private hospital and have me taken there? Go ahead, Johnny. Take it easy, Dan. I did as he asked. A crew from one of the large private hospitals was out there in a matter of minutes. And an hour and a half later, Dan Valentine was operated on and the bullet successfully removed from his shoulder. I waited around until he was taken to a private room and Inspector DeBaca waited with me. Dollar? Yeah? Why don't you go back to Hartford? This isn't any of your business. I know. My plane takes off at four. I'll be on it. Well, why are you waiting around here? Oh, to see how he is, I guess. Your pal of yours? I just met him last night. You know that. But you're waiting around? Yeah. You want me to tell you why you're waiting around? You want to make sure he's okay. You met him last night, and outside of what you ever read or heard about him, you don't know him from a load of coal. But you want to make sure he's going to be all right. Well, so do I. Because in that room and on that bed lies quite a man. Well, that about summed it up. No matter what he had been or what he had done, Dan Valentine was quite a man. It was the same thing that had caused me to go over to him the night before and start a conversation. The same thing that caused me to believe his plans for living a quiet life in New Orleans. He came out of the anesthetic a half hour later and he sent for me. Hi. Hi. They say it's going to be okay. Oh, sure, sure. This is nothing. I just wanted to thank you for giving me a hand. DeBaca could probably help you more. All you have to do is tell him who shot you and why. I shot myself, and just for something to do. Look, Dan, I have a fair idea of how tough things were for you and how tough they can be now. But Inspector DeBaca understands it, too. He'll do everything he can to help you, but you have to help him, Dan. DeBaca's a good boy. You're right. You'll tell him who shot you? If there was any way he could help me, I'd let him know first. I'll handle this myself. Guess you'll want to be getting your airplane. Yeah. Good luck, kiddo. Same to you. I went back to my hotel, picked up my bags, and took a cab to Mobilant Airport. My plane had developed engine trouble, and there was going to be a five-hour delay. I killed time at the bar and in the restaurant and just standing around looking at the field at night. By that time, the newspapers carried the story of the attempt on Dan Valentine's life. It was as skimpy as the story Dan had told himself, and it troubled me. Uh, Mr. Dollar. Yeah? Long distance call for you from Hartford. Uh, you can take it right in there. Oh, thanks. Johnny Dollar. Roy Vickers, Johnny, at New Britain Mutual. Glad I caught you. Just waiting for my plane back to Hartford now. This story about Dan Valentine's and all the papers up here, have you read it? Yeah, I was in on it, in a way. Somebody shot at him today. He won't tell who. Says he'll handle it himself. Can you find out, Johnny? Well, I don't know. Why? We carry a $50,000 policy on him. If somebody's trying to kill him. We'd like to know all about it. You mean I can stay here and work on this? Yes. Okay, Roy. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Valentine matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, all the King's men that could be the New Orleans police force try to keep one man alive. And they almost do it. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for another exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Charlie DeBaca down at headquarters. You left a call for me? That's right, Inspector. Thought you went back to Hartford. What now? The company I represent happens to hold an insurance policy on Dan Valentine. They asked me to stay here in New Orleans and look into this attempt on his life. How'd they hear about it so fast? Well, it was in all the papers and on the wire services. Valentine's always been news, ever since Prohibition. Yeah, a guy like him would be. Well, you know as much as I do, Donna, no lead yet. He's still quiet about the whole thing? Just like a mouse who won't open up, except to say he'll take care of it himself. Maybe it'll help matters when he finds out the insurance company's interested. You know something? What? I don't think me, you, the whole force, the insurance company, or anybody else can keep that bird alive unless he helps us. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account, submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, to the New Britain Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Valentine matter. Expense account continued, item three, three bucks. One telegram to Roy Vickers in Hartford requesting a copy of the policy contracts between New Britain Mutual and Dan Valentine, plus the name and location of the beneficiary and any other debt on the case. After that, I walked over to the police station and looked up Inspector DeBaca. Sit down. Thanks. I don't quite get this, Dollar. What's your part? Well, the insurance company would like a full report on everything that's happened, that's all. You could give them that on the back of your thumbnail, couldn't you? Not quite, Inspector. Oh, you mean a separate report from what we have? Something like that, yes. Well, it's their dough. They can spend it any way they want to, I guess. If there's any reason for them canceling the policy on Valentine, they'll do it. The fact that somebody shot at him a couple of times and came near killing him is one thing. The fact that he won't open his mouth about it is another. They're looking for a way out? I didn't say that. They just want to make sure about everything, that's all. An insurance policy is a contract, mutually beneficial to both parties. Both parties have to keep the line of that contract. They don't figure Danny Valentine's run around shooting himself insurance money. <sighs> Inspector, they don't figure anything. Well, now that you've been official, be unofficial. What's your idea? Well, Valentine's got a legitimate policy with the company. They don't want to see him kill. They tell me to investigate the shooting. Actually, they're telling me to see to it that he stays alive and well. Well, that makes sense. Good luck. If you'll sort of let me tag along on the case, I'd appreciate it. Well, we'll see. Oh, what's the matter now? It just occurred to me. Valentine bought a house out in Jefferson Parish three months ago, a couple of days after he was released from federal pen. He's lived there quiet, minding his own business, keeping his nose out of trouble. Yeah. Well, as long as a man does that, even a man with a background like Valentine's, as long as a man does that, we don't bother him, and he doesn't bother us. Well, so? So what happens? Yesterday, you meet him and have a couple of drinks with him. Hello, goodbye, boom, boom, he gets shot twice by somebody, somewhere. You a bad news boy? Now, that's as wild as you can get. We had nothing together except the drinks. You sure? I'm sure. Well, I'm thinking about it just the same. Here. Be back in a minute. The bulky, thick folder Inspector DeBaca shoved across the desk at me was marked Valentine Daniel. It started in 1915 and was fat with yellowed clippings all the way through 1942. It was a pretty good history of Dan Valentine and the age he lived in. He was born in Ireland and had fought in the Irish Rebellion. He was regarded as both hero and scoundrel. For his own good, he came to America. Somehow, he started out in the wholesale drug business. And understandably, it was an easy step to making prohibition alcohol. And an even easier step to make prison on an income tax evasion charge. The folder mentioned a wife and a daughter who seemed to have successfully avoided most of the newspaper headlines that had involved Dan Valentine. There was one picture of Mrs. Valentine taken in 1928. That's about as far as I got when DeBaca came back into the room, not alone. Interesting stuff? Very, Inspector, very. Well, here's something more interesting. My men have been covering the neighborhood where the shooting happened yesterday afternoon. 
This man's a witness. This is Mr. Dollar. He's an insurance investigator. It's Willie Blakely. Oh, how, how do you do, sir? Hope you can help us, Willie. Well, I can try, hmm? I, I really didn't see too much. See, I was on my milk truck, and I saw this fellow, this, this big fellow, walking down the street. Uh, what's his name? Dan Valentine. Yes, sir. Well, he was just walking, like for an early morning walk, and then I saw this car come around the corner, and there were a couple of men in it. What kind of car? I think it was a Buick sedan. I'm not sure. It was a black car. You happen to get the license number? No. All right, go on. Well, sir, this Mr. Valentine, he looked up when he saw it coming, and he stopped. You know, kind of funny? No, I don't know. Tell me. Well, you know, like he was surprised. Do you think he was surprised at who was in the car? Yes, sir, that's it. He, he sort of smiled. Not a hello kind of a smile. Hmm? Sort of a sad smile. Didn't wave, just stood there. I couldn't see the men in the car by then, so I don't know how they were looking at him. Did you see them as they rounded the corner? Yeah, just a couple of fellas, dark coats and hats. Would you know them if you saw them again? Uh, <laughs> I don't think so, Captain. Okay, two men. Yes, sir. So this, this Mr. Valentine stopped and, and looked at him and, and gave him this kind of smile. He recognized them, you think? Oh, yeah. And then I heard a noise, you know, something like, whack, whack. And Mr. Valentine fell down and a car drove off. Did Valentine go for a gun? No, sir. What did you do then? Well, I got out of there. Why? I didn't know what was happening. I didn't want to get hurt. You didn't even try to help him? No, sir. I was scared. I didn't know what that whack whack was, sir. And it took you all this time to tell us about it. Sorry, Captain. Ah. Dollar. Yeah. You got something to worry about. Hmm? That noise he was talking about didn't sound like regular gunshots, or he would have said so. Silence, sir. What else? Inspector DeBaca continued to question the witness, trying to ascertain more details about the shooting, the car, and the men inside the car. Four hours later, when I left, he was still at it. Some more expenses, item four, two dollars and a half, cab fare from police station to hospital. I thought I'd drop in and take a chance on Dan Valentine coming across with some information. Sorry, no visitors. It's pretty important. I'm a friend of his. I'm sorry. When can I see him? It's hard to say. Mr. Valentine's condition is not too good. What? Well, nothing to be alarmed about. He lost so much blood that he's in a weakened condition. The doctor's ordered a transfusion. Oh. You can phone in later if you like. Excuse me. Yes, ma'am? I should like to see Mr. Valentine, please. I'm sorry. I was just telling this gentleman that's impossible. How is he? He needs rest. The doctor feels he'd be better off without visitors at the moment. Thank you. I had a feeling about the gray-haired, well-dressed woman, and I hurried after her down the long corridor outside the hospital. I was just in time to see her take a cab that had been waiting at the curb. I managed to hail one myself, and we tagged along Canal Street behind her until she paid off the driver in front of the Roosevelt Hotel. I was right behind her when she stopped in the lobby and got a key to room 1016. I gave her five minutes, then I knocked on her door. Yes? Hello, Mrs. Valentine. My name's Johnny Dollar. Anne Valentine looked at me for a long time. I had to hand it to her. There were no tears, no frowns or screams. Just a wide, frank look from a woman who, by any man's standards, had once been beautiful. I haven't been called by that name for many years. You're a reporter, of course. No, I'm not. I'm an insurance investigator. In a policeman's office today, I saw one of the few pictures ever taken of you. At this hotel, I'm registered under the name of Ann Ward. Ward is good enough for me, Mrs. Valentine. May I come in? Yes. Now, what is it you want, Mr. Dollar? Possibly the same thing you want. To keep your husband alive. I believe that's up to the doctors, isn't it? Not quite. If he was shot at once and he won't help the police find out who did it, there's a reasonable chance he'll be shot at again. Do you know who did it? Well, who it might be. Look, the police have found a witness who describes two men as having done the shooting. Can you add anything to that? Mr. Dollar, I haven't seen Dan in over 13 years. I haven't written to him, talked to him, or contacted him in any way, either while he was in prison or these last few months he's been out. I see. It was his idea. But he must have had a reason. He did. Our daughter. Oh. 
She believes that Ward was her dead father's name. Do I make myself clear? Yeah. I read about the shooting. I caught the first plane here because I thought I might help Dan. My daughter thinks I'm on a little vacation by myself. You don't believe me, do you? Well, in view of what you've just said about not having written to him for 13 years... That was the way he wanted it. I was never ashamed of Dan, never. He was ashamed of himself and how his activities might affect us. He gave me everything I ever had out of life. In New Salem, that's where we live, and live very well because Dan saw to that part of it before he went to prison. We are considered very proper people, Teresa and myself. Dan sacrificed a great deal for that consideration. I think that you sacrificed a great deal yourself, Mrs. Valentine. When I go back to the hospital to see him tonight, he'll probably tell me to pack my bag and go home that there's nothing to worry about. But there is something to worry about, isn't there, Mrs. Valentine? He won't talk about it, and you won't talk about it, and both of you know all about it. Oh, Mr. Dollar, you're a very young man. I'm sorry if I sound like I could help you. I can't. Please go. I went back to my hotel and had some dinner. Then after a while, I put in a phone call to the hospital and found out I could talk to Dan Valentine between 7.30 and 9. About then, a special delivery came for me. It contained the information I wanted regarding the policy on Dan Valentine. I noticed that the beneficiary was a jewel affair, wife and daughter, Anne and Teresa Ward. I had to check with Inspector DeBaca just once more. No luck. He had been unable to identify or locate the two killers described by the witness. He was trying to trace the car. 7.30 on the dot, I was at the hospital. The reception desk seemed reluctant to talk and referred me to the head nurse who happened to be out to dinner, who referred me to the surgical nurse who took me aside and told me to find a crystal ball. Mr. Valentine's gone. We have no idea where. How could he be gone? We started to give him a transfusion. He jumped up suddenly, knocked down one of the male nurses, grabbed his clothes and ran out of the hospital. Just as simple as that. I thought he was in a serious condition. Shh, keep your voice down. He was in a serious condition. And it's going to be critical pretty soon. Running around town, bleeding from two bullet wounds. If you want to keep him alive, Mr. Dollar, you better find him and find him fast. I thought over what Dan Valentine had told me in the hospital earlier. About taking care of the matter himself. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized he was going to do just that. Even if it killed him. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Valentine matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, what happens to a 30-year-old grudge when somebody explains it with bullets? Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for another exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Ann Ward. Mrs. Valentine. Have you heard anything about Dan? Nothing, Mrs. Valentine. The police are looking everywhere for him. I went to the hospital tonight and they told me he walked out. He might die, Mr. Dollar. I know, Mrs. Valentine. Did you tell anyone I was here in New Orleans? If you mean did I mention it to the police, no. 
Thank you, Mr. Dollar. That was very kind of you. But it makes me mad that I didn't, Mrs. Valentine. I know you don't want anybody to find you're related to him because of your daughter. But I also think you could help the police in this situation. You could help them find Dan and put him back in a hospital. Mr. Dollar, would you come over and talk to me, please? Please. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the New Britain Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut... The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Valentine matter. Some more expense. I believe this is item five. Yeah, four bucks. Four drinks for myself. When an next big shot of the Roaring Twenties, like Dan Valentine, carries a $50,000 life insurance policy and walks down the street one day and gets himself shot and refuses to disclose who fired the bullets, I have to do the worrying for the insurance company. When he decides to leave a hospital bed minus a pint or two of blood, I have to worry some more. I needed those drinks. You can just say I liked what I'd seen of the guy, and I didn't want him to walk around New Orleans bleeding to death. In here, please, Mr. Dollar. The wife, who hadn't seen or heard from him for 13 years, looked pale and wan. It was obvious that the strain was beginning to tell on her, although she tried hard not to show it. Doesn't it ever cool off in New Orleans? Sometimes. But I'm not here to talk about the weather, Mrs. Valentine. You know that. Yes, I know. Well, don't just stand there and give me the tears, then. If you've got anything to say, say it. If you know anything that'll help, let me know about it. You're perfectly right in being angry with me. Mr. Dower, I honestly don't know where Dan is. Well, do you know why he'd get up out of a hospital bed and endanger his life? I have an idea he might have wanted to see somebody. Who? I don't know. The two men who shot at him? Perhaps. I just don't know. We aren't getting anywhere, Mrs. Valentine. Look, I'm going to talk to you frankly. Why did he come here to live in New Orleans? Well, I... You live in New England with your daughter, Teresa. Obviously, Dan thinks a great deal of you and her. He's given you everything, provided for you, with all of his troubles. Spent 13 years in prison. I can imagine his thoughts about you and her while he was in there. And yet he comes out and lives 2,000 miles away from you. He didn't want to interfere with Teresa in any way. Sure. But it seems to me he'd want to look at you, at her, certainly. Even if it was a matter of living in Boston and taking a bus to New Salem and standing on a street corner one day to watch the two of you cross the street. That sound reasonable to you? If you put it that way. Well, look, there's some reason he picked New Orleans. Some reason he didn't give himself the little gratification of just looking at you and Teresa. Why? Why here? I'm sure I don't know. And why is he running around now? I can't answer that either. But it must have something to do with you and your daughter. Obviously, you're the only ones he ever cared about. Well? I honestly don't know. Well, and I I can't help you, and I can't help myself or him. You mentioned his having a reason to be in New Orleans. Maybe... What? There was a man named Webster... Conrad Webster. He was a member of the Illinois Bar once, in those days. Did a great deal of work for Dan and friends of Dan. I think he lived here. Wait a minute. I've seen that name... Yeah, on copies of the insurance policy. A man named Webster had the power of attorney. He bought the insurance. There's a trust in there for your daughter. Yes, Conrad Webster was an old friend of Dan's. I don't even know whether he's alive now or not. Drank a great deal later on, I think he lived here. Was he the kind of friend Dan would go to if he needed help? Yes, I think so. All right. What are you going to do? It's just something to look into. I'll try and find Webster, and maybe I can find your husband. Thank you for coming by. I needed somebody to talk to. <laughs> what? I hope he stays alive, Mrs. Valentine. <laughs> Item seven, sixteen dollars The money it cost me to find out the location of Conrad Webster. I started at his last known address, followed a series of bars, and finally got information from a bartender that led me to the crummier half of a decaying duplex on Gentilly Street. Everything was quiet for Gentilly Street. Huh. Young man, the drugstore delivers what I need most. 
The telegraph office what I dread most. Obviously, you represent neither, and therefore you are no concern of mine. Wait a minute. Are you Mr. Webster? Conrad Webster? I am he, and I am drunk and disheveled, and it is three o'clock in the morning. I'd like to talk with you. May I come in? You may not. This isn't exactly the hour for making calls, but I did stop by and pick up something to take the edge off. Ted. Huh? It's bonded. Oh, inside, inside. Now then, you uh, were going to apologize. Here you are, Mr. Webster. Oh, well. Now then, as long as this lasts, you will last. All right. I'm looking for a man. (laughs) <laughs> the entire world is looking for a man. Just one man. A man they blindly presume will break off these shackles that bind us and lead us forth into eternal justice. Yeah, yeah, sure, but that's not An I'm... ironic anticipation. I'm talking about Dan Valentine. You are? Yes, I'm a friend of his. No. No, you don't come from that place. The pallor is not with you. You lie. I didn't say I was in jail with him. And where else would he have made friends these long years? He's out of prison now. He's been out for three months. And I'm aware of that. Did you know he was shot at yesterday? Three hours ago, he left his hospital bed? I thought he might have come to you. Is he here? He is not. Do you know where he is? I do not. Mr. Webster, if Valentine isn't back in the hospital pretty soon, he'll die. (laughs) Why is the phenomenon of death so persistently alarming? So he will die. They all die, usually from a bullet. And that's what's going to happen to him. Two bullets he stopped yesterday. Do you understand me? Acutely, acutely. You've impressed me with the urgency of his situation. But Dan Valentine is not here, nor has he been here, nor has he contacted me, nor do I know where to contact him. All right, Mr. Webster, all right. I guess I believe you. Your your concern for him is a distressing irritation. What what is the reason for it? I'm an insurance investigator, and it's my job to keep him alive. More than that, I like him. I told you I was his friend. I think he deserves to live. You his friend? No. You are too young to be his friend. His friends, for the most part, are gone. Like the long years... Like Hamburg hats and the Charleston and Lime Ricky. The ones who are left are broken and tired and faded. With old faces, faces like mine, like his. And we should be gone too. Another age is here. (laughs) This is my sadness. As for yours... Dan Valentine should never have lived in that age or this age. He was meant to be an explorer, a pioneer who conquered a wilderness, not a racketeer who conquered a west side. Are you sure you're his friend, Mr. Webster? I once thought so. (laughs) He once thought so. Now, I haven't strength enough to be anyone's friend. What's your name? Johnny Dollar. Good night, Mr. Dollar. The look in Conrad Webster's eyes held the same sort of sadness I had seen in Valentine's eyes. But they were different, too. They held a weakness. The strong, sad eyes were somewhere else in the city, walking alone, probably looking for two gunmen, and the lifeblood was slowly draining from the body that sparked them. I went back to my hotel and tried to sleep, but sleep wouldn't come. I was still rolling and tossing at 7.30 the next morning when orange juice coffee in the morning paper came up. A nationwide syndicate had picked up the new development in the Valentine shooting and gone to work on it. Among other names they mentioned in giving a resume of Valentine's career were his wife and daughter, living in New Salem under the name of Ward. Hello? This is Johnny Dollar. I just read the morning paper, Mrs. Valentine. Oh, yes. I'm sorry it broke for you this way. That's very kind of you to say so. Maybe it's for the better, anyhow. For years, I've been wanting to tell Teresa who her father is, what he's like. I'm going to call her later today, tell her where I am, explain why I'm here. 
I think she can take it. You're doing pretty well yourself. <laughs> Thanks again. Any word yet? No. No, we still can't find him. Mr. Webster, did you find him? Yes, he wasn't much help. The New England paper said that Mrs. Ward was out of town. Sooner or later, they'll find out what town Mrs. Ward is in, I'm afraid. Well, maybe you'd better get another hotel. Use another name. Yes. All right, I'll wait to hear from you. Mr. Dollar. Yes? Thank you. I put in another call to Inspector DeBaca and asked him about developments. Valentine was still unlocated. They were covering drugstores and doctor's offices where he might seek assistance. The two unidentified men who had shot him were still unidentified. The police weren't able to dig up any more witnesses or get any line on the car. By four in the afternoon, Mrs. Valentine had still not called me to report a new address. I got worried and went over to the Roosevelt to see what was what. I was surprised to see Inspector DeBaca in the lobby talking to the bell captain. All right, son. If you remember anything else, call me here. Yes, sir. I sure will. Hi. Hi, Dollar. Well, you want to talk first or you want me to? All right, I'll talk first. Mrs. Valentine's been staying here under the name of Ann Ward. You knew that. Yeah. Why didn't you say anything to me? She asked me not to. Doesn't make any difference now, anyhow. That boy over there called us a little while ago. He said that Dan Valentine came in here this afternoon, went upstairs, came back down 15 minutes later with Mrs. Valentine. They both left together. Yeah, he must have seen the story in this morning's paper and guessed she was in town. That's the way I see it. Well, we're right back where we started from, and I'm about sick of it. We're a little better off. Two people are easier to find than one. We found them, all right, at 7 o'clock that night, and it was easy. Three squad cars were already drawn up in front of the little hotel, and I noticed with a sinking heart that a hearse was there also. Dan Valentine and his wife were dead. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Valentine matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, proof that the murder of Dan Valentine and his wife aren't the only murders to be solved. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for another exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. What is all this, Johnny? Who's this? Roy Vickers, New Britain Mutual. What happened to Valentine? He was gunned down last night, going into a hotel with his wife. No. The police here are turning the city upside down, trying to get a line on two unidentified gunmen. Well, couldn't you keep him alive? I couldn't even find him. Well, uh, well, this is no time to be yelling at each other. I just left his daughter. Huh? She filed claim already? Through that lawyer Webster? No, no, she didn't even know anything about him until the papers broke the story. Well, I... I'm sorry I got annoyed for a second. Do what you can, Johnny. They'll want a full report. Sure, Roy, sure. Tonight and every weekday night, 
Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the New Britain Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is a further accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Valentine matter. Item 9, $7 for dinner. I had it with Inspector Charles DeBaca, New Orleans Police. He was a haggard, tired-looking man about that time. All of us were. You want some more coffee? No, no thanks. Two men, both about six feet, wearing dark suits and hats, medium to slight builds. One possibly 35, the other possibly 40. Well, that about ties up with the description of the two men who plugged Valentine earlier and earned him a place in the hospital. Yeah. We got more of a chance this time, though. There'll be some other witnesses. Somebody has to tell us what kind of a car they had and what direction they went. One thing, they weren't using silencers anymore. No, but they did a professional job. I think Valentine knew him, climbed out of that hospital bed to go out looking for him. Sounds reasonable. How do you figure the rest of it, Inspector? Well, Valentine saw the newspaper story and knew his wife was in town. He went over, got her, and I take it they were going to check into a new hotel when their friend showed up. She just happened to get in the way, huh? Sure. Why'd anybody want to shoot her? Why would anybody want to shoot him? Well, because no matter what he was now or how he was playing it, he still lived pretty hard way back then. A man who has lived the kind of life he has and done the things he has is bound to make few enemies he'll remember. No, I think it has something to do with his family. I agree with you that Valentine probably made enemies all over. But he wasn't the kind of man to get excited about any of those kind of people. He pretty well knew how to take care of himself and handle trouble. That's why he was out looking for them. You sound pretty certain. It seems to me that if Valentine had been expecting trouble from some of the old-timers, he'd have carried a gun. You got a point. But then again, he was pretty gentled up. You know how he spent most of his time? Painting. Huh? And that house he bought out in Jefferson Parish is covered with pictures he's done since he's been out. Oils. Pretty good, too. When he wasn't painting it, he was listening to music. <laughs> You'd hardly think of Danny Valentine taking up the arts. Hardly ever. Well, I've got to make a call and get busy. Yeah. Inspector. Yeah? Any objection to me going out and looking around that house? It's your privilege. Personally, I'm going to look around town for a couple of gunmen. Anyone out there now? His cook, name's Yachino. Nice woman. Okay, I'll keep in touch with you, Inspector. Do that. Uh, Dollar. Now what? You forgot to tell me you looked up the old family lawyer, Conrad Webster, the other night. Oh, I was trying to find Valentine, the same as you. Well, if you happen to run into Webster again, you tell him to drop in and see me. Hmm? Huh? He's missing. I didn't know what to say to that, so I left him standing there and went back to my hotel and shaved, changed clothes, and tried to go over the whole thing in my mind. I did phone into the police station and find out that the slugs that had killed Valentine and his wife were from an Italian-make pistol, a rum barrel, 37.5 caliber, so far untraced. Expense account item 10, cost of cab, from my hotel to Danny Valentine's house in Jefferson Parish. How do you do? Are you Mrs. Iacchino? Yes, sir. Who are you, please? My name is Johnny Dollar, Mrs. Iacchino. I'm from New Britain Mutual Insurance Company. I'd like to talk to you, if I may. About uh, Mr. Valentine? Yes. Not right now, Mr. Dollar. Some other time, huh? Well, if you prefer it that way, Mrs. Iacchino, but... It's uh... Uh, been a hard day here. I, I mean, Mr. Valentine's death and his wife being killed with him. All of these policemen in and out of here now. Miss Ward and all... Miss Ward? His daughter? Yes, she's here. Arrived two hours ago. She's... Stay here. Could I see her? You come tomorrow, Mr. Dollar, please. Huh? Tomorrow... Mrs. Yachino. Uh, yes, Miss Ward. Who is it? Uh, uh, Mr. Dollar. He's from the insurance company. I'd... Insurance company? Yes. I'd like to talk to him, Mrs. Yachino. Teresa Ward stood at the base of the iron grill stairway, tall and dark-eyed. And I saw that, like her mother, she had a quiet intensity about her face that made it beautiful. At the same time, ageless. She smiled politely at me. I could only stand there without speaking for a long moment, looking at her. Then Mrs. Iacchino excused herself, and we were alone. I wanted to talk to someone who might be able to give me a little more information about all this. It's all quite new to me. I'll tell you what I can, Miss Ward. 
My name is Valentine, isn't it? Really, Valentine? Yes, it is. Well, suppose we correct that mistake right now. Sure. There's nothing wrong with Valentine. From what a Mr. Vickers from the insurance office in Hartford told me, I'm to be quite well off because of this man that was murdered. You mean Dan Valentine? Yes, Dan Valentine. They tell me he was my father. Who told you? Oh, reporters at home and your insurance company. Mother told me my name was Ward. Poor thing. Must have been difficult for her over the years, keeping the secret from me. Yes, she told me she thought it was the best thing. She, uh, well, the same as he did. Tell me about my father. Was he a bad man? Oh, as good or as bad as the Volstead Act made people. I only met him a couple of times. To awaken one morning and discover that you're the only daughter of a famous racketeer who's been murdered. Look, Miss Ward, if he had anything to do with the way you turned out, uh, with what you seem to possess within yourself, I'd say offhand that whatever he was or did, he thought of you. Are you flattering me? I'm not trying to. You seem like a very nice person. And so do you, Mr. Dollar. Will you tell me all about this, please? Well, let's see. Uh, You're 21, isn't that right? Yes. Just about 15 years ago or so, your father was on trial for income tax evasion. Just before he was convicted, he set up a trust fund with my insurance company to provide for you. It's been paying money for your support and education ever since. According to the terms of the trust, all of the money becomes yours now that your mother and father are dead. It comes to well over $50,000. That's all there is to it? Mm Mm-hmm. I suppose I'm grateful to him. I suppose I should be grateful. I can't say that I'm particularly sorry about his death any more than I would be if any other human being died violently somewhere. But about Mother's death, I... I miss her very much already, Mr. (laughs) Dunn. She was holding up pretty well until that point. Then she let go. I held her in my arms and I talked to her. I told her what I knew of her father's life and death. She told me how she'd been reared so far removed from anything that might have connected her in the least way with the Valentine name. Altogether, it was a revealing conversation for both of us. Mrs. Iacchino brought us some food and wine. How long will you be in New Orleans? Until all of this is straightened out. You mean until they find out who killed my mother and father? Yes. How about you? Oh, I really don't know. After the funerals, I suppose I'll go back. But I wanted to see him, to see what he looked like, what kind of life he led. He was just an ordinary man, wasn't he? You seen these pictures before? No, this is my first time in the house. Looked like Italian landscapes to me. Very good. Mm -hmm. Must have been something he had with Mother. Hmm? She was from Italy. May I ask you something? Yes, How do you feel about him now? Is this for your report? For myself. Since you've been here, these last two hours, I've begun to think of him for what he was. My father, I mean. I'd like to know why he was killed and who did it. Will I see you again? I hope so. Terry. Yes? I hope so very much. So do I, Johnny. I left her at the door that night with a warm sensation inside of me. Something I certainly hadn't expected in the business at hand. The next morning I was back at the house talking to Mrs. Iacchino. She gave me all the information she could remember about Valentine's activities... All of it accurate, but lacking in any possible clue as to the identity of the two men who had killed him and his wife. I had breakfast with Terry there and helped you with funeral arrangements. Then I spent a solid 12 hours with Inspector DeBaca, who had still not located or identified the two mysterious men. However, there were other developments. This may be something, Johnny. Oh? Conrad Webster's been found. Huh? Up by Lake Punch Train. Just identified him. He was shot to death with a 37.5. Italian gun? Yeah, just like the one that killed Dan Valentine and his wife. (laughs) 
It later developed that the slugs taken from Webster's body when compared with those that had killed the Valentines were fired from the same weapon. The case took on proportions. Every available bit of information regarding the two ex-big shots of the 20s was located, read, and reread. It meant activity in cities like St. Louis, Chicago, Detroit, and New York. But no new information as to the identity of the killers. I went back to the house. Johnny. Here, here, here. What is this? You're shaking. Oh, me, please. Sure. I suppose I'm being a terrible fool about it all, Johnny, but they've been after me all day. Cheap little things. Newspaper syndicate wants me to write my exclusive story as the shadow daughter of Dan Valentine. Fairy princess of a racket. Take it easy. Take it easy. Even Hollywood called some producer. Oh, Johnny, I shouldn't have come here at all. Then what would I have done, Terry? What would I have done? Make yourself a drink, Johnny. I'll go put on a new face. It had become apparent to me in the short time I'd known her that she'd grown to love the memory of her father. Also, that the pressure of all that had happened was beginning to take its toll on her. We were walking down the gravel path away from the house. She was quieted down. I suppose I was thinking how nice it would be to kiss her. I twisted, trying for the gun inside my pocket, but there was nobody to shoot at. The two men who had fired the guns were already out of sight. I was alone with Terry Valentine, who was hanging on the gate... I caught her before she fell. Why me? Why me, Johnny? She was dead before I could answer. There'll be the final intriguing episode in our story of the Valentine matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, a sober lesson in how long, how far, and how deadly one man's hate can be. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for another exciting episode of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hey, what are you doing at the Valentine house? Get a car out here quick, Inspector. Terry Valentine's just been shot. Two guys showed up... slow down, slow down. When did all this happen? A few seconds ago. Ambulance? No good, DeBaca. She... she died in my arms. Oh. What, do you think they're still around there? They must be. I'm going looking. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is a police matter. You stay put. I'll have a car then. Five minutes and you can... Johnny, I heard that. Your gun. Now, look, you're all wound up. Don't do anything. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the New Britain Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of further expenditures during my investigation of the Valentine matter. 
Dan Valentine, ex-gangster, and, of course, your policyholder. But then his wife was killed, too. Then his lawyer. Then his daughter. The girl that I... Thirty seconds after Terry Valentine died in my arms, I was stumbling down the gravel path that led from her house to the road. It had all happened so suddenly, I can't say that what I did from there on or what I felt was entirely rational. All I know is I hadn't heard a car leave the area, which meant the two killers were still somewhere nearby. Then, in the dim light, I saw the car. A man was climbing into it. Hey! Hey, stop! Stop or I'll shoot! Stop! Get out of there. Get out of there and get your hands up. I'm a hit. I'm afraid to move. Come on. Get out. Come on. I'm coming. I'm coming. You two. Come on. Come on. It's no use on him, mister. He used up. You've got him real good. (laughs) I need a doctor. Help me get to a doctor. Stop right there. Doctor. Stand still. You pretty tough fella. What's your name? Sisto. Sisto what? It's good enough for you. I need a doctor. Bad. <coughs> Listen. <coughs> tell it to me. Tell it to me right now. If you don't tell it to me now, you'll never tell it to anybody. Tell it. No. Tell it. I need a doctor. Tell it. I die first. Johnny. Johnny. What is this? Who's he? He's going to kill me. He's going to kill me. Now, you better give me that gun, Johnny. The state will take care of him. Thanks. I should have done it. I wanted to do it. I know, son. Come on, let's get out of here. But I didn't get out of there. I waited around while they dug the body of the other man out of the smashed-up car and while they carried the still limp form of Teresa Valentine away. She was the third member of the family who had died violently within three days. Sorry about it, Donna. Inspector, I was hoping I might have been wrong. That she wasn't dead. Oh, you weren't wrong. Which one shot her? Huh? The dead one? Or the one we still got in the hospital? Oh, I don't know. Both of them, I guess. You don't feel like talking to it. I'm just trying to pin it down. Well, what about him? Can't get much out of him so far. He's in pretty bad shape. Let me ask him some questions, Inspector. I'm no police officer. I don't have to obey any rules. Take it easy, kid. You were about to do that once, and we'd be holding you for murder if you'd gone ahead. I know how you feel about Teresa Valentine. (sighs) Has he said anything at all? Nothing. We found papers on him and the other one that makes him brothers, Sisto and Darby Chianti, from New York. So far, there doesn't seem to be any connection with the Valentines. Uh, But people like Valentine make a lot of enemies. That girl doesn't figure. Yeah. I know you talked to her a lot these last couple of days, Johnny. What'd you say? Oh, nothing that had anything to do with this. You know yourself, she didn't even know her name was Valentine until her father got shot at. Yeah, that could have been an act. And you could have been 20 feet tall. Just trying. Try with that punk you got upstairs in the hospital. We will, Johnny. We will. Just... Pardon me. Johnny, hmm. you bad news. Maybe I spoke too soon. Why? Sisto Chianti died five minutes ago. Expense account, item 10, 10 bucks, car rental. I went out to the Valentine house once more. Oh, Mr. Dollar. Hello, Mrs. Hitchino. Please, come in. So many police and so many reporters... I've been trying to close the house. Sure. I know how you must feel. I mean, about her. What of these uh, Chianti brothers? Well, we don't know much about them yet. The New York police are still doing a rundown on them. Uh, Don't let me stop you, whatever you're doing. I'll just look around if you don't mind. All right. Oh, well, one thing. Yes? Did Mr. Valentine make any provision for you? Yes. He thought to me. A thousand dollars. Whatever he was, 
The man I knew was kind and good. And his sins had been forgiven him. I spent two hours of better going from room to room, looking at the oils that Dan Valentine had painted. Pastoral scenes, happy scenes, gay scenes, all of them with colorful Italian backgrounds. I was thinking about that when I walked into Inspector DeBacca's office late that afternoon. I don't get it, Johnny. Don't get what? Here. This came from New York on the Chanty Boys. Oh, they came to this country when they were 18 and 21. Both of them were naturalized citizens, lived with their father. Records? Not a thing. No trouble ever. What else? That's about it. New York police can't seem to locate their old man. Disappeared about a week ago. Lived on the east side. What's about him? Well, that's another funny thing. He's taken out his papers and was due for an examination with the immigration people this week. They're looking for him, too. Hello, Mr. We went out and had dinner together and talked about the case. It had been a strange one. The deaths were useless. The motives unknown. I parted company with Inspector DeBaca and went back to my hotel to trouble it out with sleep. About 11 o'clock, I had a phone call. Johnny Dollar. This is DeBaca. Old man Chianti just showed up at our city morgue and wants to take his two sons back to New York for burial. Twenty minutes later, I was standing in the coroner's office while Inspector DeBaca led a small, wizened old man into the room and sat him down on one of the chairs. Mr. Chanty, this is Mr. Dollar. How do you do? Mr. Chanty. I read about you. You killed my boys. Is it so? Yes. They'd killed four other people. I know, I know. But... Why did they kill the Valentine family, Mr. Chanty? Why did they kill Conrad Webster, the lawyer? Do you know why? She... I know. Then tell me. They're all dead now. I'm... I'm still alive, Mr. Dollar. He refused to talk about his sons or any of their activities. DeBaca held him to answer to the immigration officials... He remained in his cell, silent and noncommittal to all visitors, including the chaplain. I appeared before the coroner's jury the following morning and was cleared of any charges. Pietro Chianti still had said nothing. And he looked at me as though he was going to keep on saying nothing. Uh, Mr. Chianti? I see you, Mr. Dollar. More questions? Dan Valentine's wife was your daughter, wasn't she? Wasn't she? All right, you don't have to admit it. I have a copy of the marriage license right here. It came from New York this morning. She was my daughter. Is that all you have to say now? I no talk. Then I will, Mr. Chunty. Because your daughter, Mrs. Valentine, had a daughter herself, Teresa. A lovely, wonderful girl that your two sons killed. I happen to know that girl. I might have been in love with her, I don't know. But I do know... She had to die, too. What? This uh, Conrad Webster, Mr. Valentine, and my own daughter and granddaughter, they had to die. All bad. You? See, I order it. You ordered it? And who are you? God? I am the father. When a daughter... Mary is a bad man. Only bad can come from it. The granddaughter was then bad. He come to our village many years ago. Take her away. He and the man Webster help him. It, it lived with me. The stealing of my own flesh and blood. All this time it grow inside of me. I am old. But they keep on living. Only so I can come here and find him and destroy him. And her. And the daughter. And the lawyer man who help him. And I destroyed them through my sons. A whole family. Vendetta. Was that it? <laughs> if you like. Vendetta. He was a bad man. Who did bad things. 
Batman. I, I smoke now. You have a cigar, eh? The disposition of old Pietro Chianti is up to the immigration department. I didn't stay around New Orleans to learn the results of all the extensive examinations that would have to be completed to test his sanity. I'd had enough of the town. Expense account, item 11, $140.20, hotel and board. Item 12, $28, car rental miscellaneous. That includes flowers to the Valentine family. Item 13, same as item 1, $175, transportation back home. Expense account total, $1,290.38. Remarks? Whenever I close my eyes, I can see a lovely girl standing at the bottom of a long, curving stairway. Smiling. Because I'm in the room. That's all. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, please, there'll be another exciting story for you beginning next Monday night. Monday, the Lorco Diamond Matter, in which a trip to Algiers makes Come With Me to the Casbah sound like an invitation to a Sunday school picnic. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Lillian Baeff, Betty Lou Gerson, Barney Phillips, Will Wright, Forrest Lewis, Marvin Miller, Jay Novello, and Jack Boyles. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ben Tyler, Johnny. Transworld Fidelity. Oh, hi, Ben. Are you free at present? If the price is right. I mean, are you on a job? It's beginning to sound like it. Can you be on a plane for Algiers in two hours? Sure. Who's the client? Uh, Lorco Limited, Amsterdam. You know, they're the... Diamond Cutters, an old firm. Big-time deals all over the world. Check. What happened? Oh, one of their couriers just dropped dead in the Algiers airport. Oh, too bad. He was carrying a briefcase with $100,000 worth of set stones. Top-grade diamonds. Don't tell me, Ben. Let me guess. That's right, Johnny. The briefcase is missing. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Transworld Fidelity Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during investigation of the Lorco Diamonds matter. Item 1, $324.60, transportation. A routine plane flight to North Africa and the city of Algiers. (laughs) 
It was an easy trip, and I felt relaxed and comfortable. A feeling that was rudely terminated about ten seconds after I got off the plane. Do I miss you, Dollar? Are you not? Yeah, that's right. I am Inspector Marcus of the Algerian Customs Police. Oh, how are you, Inspector? Oh, quite well, monsieur, and vastly reassured now that you have arrived on the scene of the crime. Oh? You see, I have implicit faith in special investigators. I have encountered them in the past, so I have no doubt, but this little affair will prove most simple to you, monsieur. I see. I feel that in a mere matter of hours, voila, you will produce the guilty culprit like un lapin out of a chapeau. Inspector, I'm beginning to feel a cold wind from the north. That's odd for this time of year, isn't it? A mere passing breed, monsieur. I shall now assume my official attitude. And that is? Extreme courtesy, complete cooperation, and the devoted service of my meager talents. On orders, you understand, from my superiors in Paris. And now, monsieur, if you will accompany me to my office. Delighted to. After you, Alphonse. My name is Pierre. Oh, sorry. Just a whimsy. Oh, yes, yes, I know. I have heard the joke. Both jokes. Uh-huh. Uh, this way, monsieur. A man from the local diamond firm is waiting for us. A special representative, so he informs me. And so, since you yourself are a special investigator, I could perceive a certain advantage in letting him give you the facts, as I believe you say it in the States. Tie our tails together, sit back, and watch the fur fly, is that it? Well, he is a trifle excitable, but your metaphor, however, escapes me. Oh, I doubt that, Inspector Marcus. In fact, I doubt if much of anything escapes you. You are too kind. Except, of course, a hundred thousand dollars worth I of I spoke too hastily. Vanished, disappeared, right under your nose. Oh, uh, well, but there the were extenuating circumstances. Oh, I'll bet there were. Uh, tell me something confidentially. Did your superiors in Paris really blow their tops? Monsieur Dallin, if I may borrow one of your more colorful expressions, they said I had probably goofed. <laughs> I'd met that same attitude before with local officials. To them, sending in an outsider implied they couldn't do the job themselves. And Inspector Marcus was on an even hotter spot. The air terminal was a port of entry to Algeria, under his jurisdiction, Customs Police. As he said, he goofed. Maybe. It is a matter which hath entire pass all apprehension. But he was right on one thing. Hans Zeindorf, the Lorco representative, was a trifle excitable. In Amsterdam, it is unthinkable such thing have happened like this. Even in your New York, mein Herr Dollar, it cannot have happened. But here, in Algiers... It have happened. Yeah, yeah, this beautiful diamond gone. All gone. Ah, It's like barbarians. This Africa is no place for diamonds. Maybe you ought to tell them that in Kimberley. It's differently there. It's entire different. All right, Mr. Zeindorf. Suppose you tell me just what happened. Who can know, my dear? Fifteen years, this courier has worked for Lorco Company. We are thinking he is trustworthy. Entire trustworthy. Well, even a trustworthy man could die a heart failure. Ah, but he has never had this heart failing before. All right, but... Perhaps it would be better if I were to, with your permission, of course, Monsieur Seindorf. Yeah, 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 you tell. I am not talk this English much good. Uh, precisely, precisely. Uh, these are the facts, Monsieur Dollar. The local courier, a man named Paul Gruber, arrived on the plane from Amsterdam yesterday morning. Yeah, yeah. Did you know he was arriving? I did not know, but the point is a very clever one. So, a short while before landing, Monsieur Gruber was taken suddenly ill. A doctor met the plane, and the stricken man was removed by stretcher and taken to the emergency clinic. In 20 minutes, monsieur, he was dead. Diagnosis, heart failure. Mais c'est la vie. Was there an autopsy, Inspector? Ah, another excellent point, monsieur Dallaire. Thank you. Yeah, do not mention it. An autopsy is being performed this afternoon. Good. So the courier died. And then the briefcase? It was delivered along with his other personal effects, unopened to the customs property agent here at the airport. And his name, the property agent? André Jordin. He was very busy at the moment, left the briefcase lying on his desk, intending at the first opportunity to register and place it in the vault. But the opportunity didn't come, is that it? Ah, precisely, precisely. Only a few minutes later, I heard a gunshot. Monsieur, he was lying on the floor in a pool of blood. He had been struck on the head. The briefcase was gone. All gone. This beautiful diamond gone entire. Yeah. When did you find out what was in the briefcase, Inspector? Uh, Almost two hours later. I radioed the local firm in Amsterdam, informing them of the death of their employee. 
They replied immediately and stated that the briefcase contained a hundred thousand dollars worth of diamond set pieces. Works of art. Beautiful. One brooch, one uh, necklace, uh, two bracelets. Uh, precisely, precisely. Uh, yes, yes, yes. The jury was being flown here on approval for examination by a prospective buyer. Name of the buyer? The Countess Maria de Tolia. What do you know about her? Ah, uh, Monsieur Dallar. If you had seen her, you would not ask. She is exquisite, lovely, chic, charming, spirited, full of the joie de vie. And no doubt loaded with potatoes. Uh, with a woman like that, who would ever inquire? I would. Since it looks as though she might be the only person in Algiers who knew that a hundred grand worth of jewelry was coming in on that plane. Uh, may we, may we. But she could not have known that the courier was going to drop dead in the airport. Uh... A good point, Inspector. Uh, merci, monsieur. What about that property agent, André Jourdain? Any chance of talking to him? Uh, but of course, if he is yet able to talk. Then I guess I'll... Talking is not enough, my dear. Relax, Herr. Mr. Zeindorf. You're covered by insurance. Insurances is money. It's not my diamonds. Oh, well, if you don't want the money, you can always waive your claim. Waive my... Wait. My dear dollar. Are you think that I am crazily? That I am entire crazily? I talked to the plane crew who'd come in on the flight with a dying courier. I talked to Inspector Marcus's men who'd been with him when he found the property agent lying on the floor of his office. I didn't expect much, and I got just that. But it didn't matter. I figured I may have had my man spotted already. The same old story. An ambitious and underpaid government agent opening a briefcase to register its contents and seeing the diamonds there for the taking, hiding them quickly, then a fake slugging and firing a gun at a non-existent thief. Yeah, an old, old story. Expense account item two, three dollars and forty cents. Transportation into town and taxi fare to the hospital of Our Lady of Sorrows. Inspector Marcus had phoned ahead to authorize my visit. One of the sisters led me down the corridor to the door of Andre Jardine's room. She motioned silently and then turned away. I stepped inside and closed the door. Monsieur? You're Andre Jardine? Uh, me, oui. But yes, what do you want? My name is Johnny Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. My company is the underwriter on the Lorco Diamonds. Why have you come here? Well, to ask a couple of questions. Of course, if you'd like to consult an attorney before... I have nothing to conceal, monsieur. What do you wish to know? Just exactly what happened when that briefcase disappeared. I have told it already to Inspector Mark. Yes, I know. So now would you mind telling it to me? But there is no... Bien. I was working at the files when someone entered my office. I turned around and saw a man standing there, pointing a gun at me. Ever seen it before? No, monsieur. What did he look like? Well, he was quite tall. Heavy set? No. Very thin. Tall and thin. European, I believe. All right. What did he do? He ordered me to turn around, stepped up behind me, struck me with the gun. I fell against my desk. He grabbed the briefcase and ran to the door. You were still conscious? Oui, monsieur, but in terrible pain. I fumbled for my gun in the drawer of the desk and fired one shot. It is all I can remember. Uh Uh-huh. You hadn't by any chance opened that briefcase? I had been too busy. And you didn't know what was in it? Not until they told me today. Andre... I wonder if you'd mind if I lifted a corner of that bandage and took a look at that wound on your head. If you are careful, it is very painful. Oh, sure, I'll be careful. Uh, Lie still now, please. It'll just take a second. I'll lift this edge and... I think I am lucky to be alive. Mm. Yeah, very lucky. Okay, thanks. It is nothing. Andre, do you happen to know the Countess Datolia? The Countess... Oh, monsieur, she is unquestionably... Yeah, I know. She's lovely, exquisite, charming, chic. Well, thanks for your cooperation, Andre. A pleasure, monsieur Dollar. Take care of that head. It's the only one you've got. (laughs) You Americans are so whimsical. Oh, yeah, we're all crazily, entire crazily. My pet theory was starting to limp. That slugging wasn't phony. It had taken 14 stitches to close the cut in Andre's head. Whoever hit him hadn't been kidding. They meant it for keeps. I walked down the corridor and stood waiting for the elevator, thinking it over, trying to figure it out. 
But no go. I needed more facts. And a moment later, I got more facts. Monsieur Duller, I thought I would find you here. Ah, a clever piece of deduction, Inspector. Merci bien, monsieur. Don't mention it. What's on your mind? There should be something. Well, there's got to be some reason for that smug grin. What happened? Did the thief confess? Uh, Au contraire. I was on the point of asking what progress you were making on the case. You will be happy to hear... None at all. Oh, that is too bad. Uh Uh-uh, Inspector. Eh? Extreme courtesy, complete cooperation, the devoted services of your meager talents. Remember? Touché, touché. Actually, I came to tell you that I now had the report of the autopsy. The courier who died of heart failure. Ah. Only, he did not die of heart failure, monsieur. Except, of course, in a very literal sense. Well, what did he die of? Poison. Well, that was the end of a good theory. The courier had started to get sick on the plane, so the robbery and the murder had been planned well in advance of his arrival. By somebody who'd known, he was bringing in diamonds. And so far, only one person fit the bill. As lovely, charming, and chic a suspect as you could ever hope to meet. The Countess de Talia. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Lorco Diamonds matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, a lovely woman lies beautifully, and a sinister whisper drifts out of the casbah. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is the Countess Tatolia. Oh, yes. My maid tells me that you were trying to reach me by telephone. That's right, Countess. I want to talk to you. Where are you now? Well, at my residence, of course. Did you think I might come running immediately to your hotel, Mr. Dollar? Not after hearing your description. I'm seldom that lucky. What is it exactly that you wish to talk about? A hundred thousand dollars worth of diamonds and a dead man. I'm a special investigator. I for know the... who you are. I investigate before I call you. Well, not only beautiful, but clever. This ought to be interesting. I'm afraid I don't entirely understand your uh, flippancy. Then suppose I come over and explain it to you. Say around 8 o'clock? I'll make a definite effort to be here. You know something, Countess? I think it's about time somebody built a small fire right under that lovely little complacency of yours. I'll be there at 8 with matches. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Algiers, North Africa, to the Home Office Transworld Fidelity Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Larco Diamonds Matter. Expense account continued. Item four, six dollars and eighty cents. Dinner and appetizers. I'm never any good trying to spar with a lovely female suspect on an empty stomach. I was finishing up on black Algerian coffee and white Algerian brandy when a slightly green-eyed Algerian police inspector sauntered up to my table. 
you, Monsieur Dunner. You special investigators really do live well. In the lap of luxury. Pull up a chair, Inspector. Join me in a sarsaparilla? It is on your expense account. Be my guest. <laughs> Merci, Monsieur. Ah, bon, bon. My favorite brand. Help yourself. Merci. Anything new? Mm, nothing at all. A complete impasse. Allez, votre santé. Mm-hmm. What about the man who sat next to that courier on the plane? Find out anything about him? No, I'm still working on it. Which is to say, of course, my men are working on it. Ah, uh, you police inspectors really do live well. I have to do my own legwork. Ah, but the glory, Monsieur Dollar, to come into a mysterious affair which has all the local police baffled, and to solve it immediately in one brilliant feat of deduction, to leave everyone gasping with admiration, to make one's exit to the sound of great applause. Not so fast, Mm. Inspector. I'm still back there with that brilliant feat of deduction. You have not yet found the solution? Uh, just on the verge. Ah. Then I will drink to your success. Uh, With your brandy, of course, and with your permission. Go ahead. Drink up a storm. But I'm afraid I'll have to leave you pretty soon, but you can still go No, 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 monsieur. I suggest you change your plans. You will learn nothing which has any bearing on this matter. Which plan do you mean? That of questioning the Countess d'Artelier. Now, who found that out? As a matter of fact, she phoned me and inquired about you. Ah, so that's how she investigated me. Went straight to headquarters. Ah, mais oui, mais oui. Ah, remarkable woman. Talented, beautiful... Et cetera, et cetera, and so on. And along with it, it's nine to one. She's in it right up to her pretty neck. Ah, no, 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 no. She's really not the type. Mm, this is an excellent brandy, monsieur. Uh, an Algerian brand, I noticed. All right, Inspector. Let's bypass the byplay and lay them out face up. I huh? think I prefer it to cognac. I don't know how she does it, but she's got you hypnotized. Just mention of her name and you go into a tailspin. Every cockeyed one of you. Exquisite. Love Maybe so. Look. But in my book, she's a real suspect. Elucidate, monsieur. Well, it's simple enough. She's the only person in Algiers, that we're sure of at least, who knew that a shipment of diamonds was coming in on that plane. Why? Because she's the one who ordered them. Uh, Monsieur, it is even simpler. She could not have poisoned the courier because she was not on that plane. She could not have stolen the briefcase from the customs property agent because it was done by a man. So, where is your case? An accomplice, a man, with the countess calling the shots for him. What man, monsieur? Well, you got a good point there. <laughs> Merci bien. Don't monsieur. mention it. But from the influence she seems to have, it might be any man in Algiers. Inspector, it wasn't you by any chance. Hmm. You raise a very interesting point. Now, suppose the Countess should ask me to kill someone for her. I wonder what I would do. Page boy came into the dining room looking for me. I followed him out and took the phone call in the hotel lobby. It was the American consulate with some information I'd asked for them earlier. I hung up finally and looked at my watch. I was already late for my appointment with the countess. So I walked out the door of the hotel and flagged a taxi to the apartment of the countess de Tolia. She lived in the swank Gentil Bois de Loué, a residential district favored by top government officials and wealthy French businessmen. But the building she lived in was a little frayed around the edges. And the maid she'd mentioned was nowhere in sight. The pieces were starting to fit together. Good evening, Mr. Dollar. Countess? Since you are here, won't you come in? Thanks. This way, please. I'm rather surprised that you came. I was really not expecting you. Yes, I know. Did uh, Inspector Marcus find you? Uh, look, suppose we get it straight right now. You seem to have a lot of influence with the inspector, and probably with his superiors, too, from what I hear. Sit down, Mr. Dollar. Thanks. Well, do we play cat and mouse for a while, or do you want to give up right now, hand them over, and, as they say, throw yourself on the mercy of the court? I would like a cigarette. You could always claim that you fell in with evil companions, or that a man led you astray. They're in the box there by your elbow. A tall, thin man, for instance, with his collar turned up and his hat pulled down, carrying a gun when last seen after slugging a customs agent at the Algiers airport. Mr. Dollar, are you opposed to smoking on moral grounds? No, but I'm opposed to murder. Have a cigarette? Thank you. Light? Is there any other way of smoking, then? (laughs) 
Mr. Dollar, I expected you to come here and be annoying. But I didn't know you were going to be insulting as well. That's just my mean personality. You seem to be under the ridiculous impression that I actually had something to do with this crime. I think you had plenty to do with it. A sort of uh, arch criminal, perhaps? Well, what is it you call them in the States? Uh, big shot? Oh, God, as you're a scream. I'll bet that courier died laughing. If you have a reason for these opinions, or believe you have a reason, I think you'd better tell me about it. Otherwise, good night. Oh, I, I have more than one reason. In the first place, I'm not certain that anyone besides you even knew the diamonds were being sent here. Except for the Lorco Company, of course, and they wouldn't be likely to advertise it. Mr. Dollar, all of my friends and most of my acquaintances have known for three weeks that I'd ordered that jewelry. Oh? Uh-huh. Well, I have a copy here of a letter that was sent to you by registered airmail from the Lorco Company in Amsterdam a week ago today. According to post office records, you received it two days later. Remember it? Yes, I remember. It states the name, flight number, and time of arrival of that courier who was murdered. I said I remember. And it cautions you specifically not to give that information to anybody. So even if other people did know, you're the only one who knew the exact time the diamonds were coming in and exactly who was bringing them. All right. Perhaps I am at fault in a way. There was a cocktail party at the government club the same evening I got the letter. I forgot it for a moment and told someone about it. Who? Just a girl I happened to be talking What's to. What's her name? It doesn't matter. She was just stopping over on a world cruise. Anybody else here? I don't know. The place was packed. Government men, business people, army, navy officers. Anyone might have heard. Uh-huh. Was Inspector Marcus at the party by any chance? Yes. I spoke with him during the evening. Mr. Dollar, I'll admit I was wrong, but there is hardly grounds for... All right, let's get to point three. The Countess Maria D'Atalia, Italian by birth, title inherited, old family, goes back through one line, in fact, to Lucretia Borgia. I did not poison the courier. Your family estates were confiscated by Mussolini. Family migrated to Bizerti, and then to Lisbon for three years. You left them there and went on to London. Since the war, you've lived in Paris, on the Riviera, back to London, Mallorca, and finally here. Have you been following me, Mr. Dollar? The consulate was pretty thorough. Anyway, you're well known in the international set, accepted everywhere, and apparently able to get along fine on your title and your looks. It is not very pleasant to be dissected while one is still alive. As a matter of fact, your flat broke. You've been living on credit for the last four months. I think you have gone about far enough. And yet three weeks ago, you ordered $100,000 worth of jewelry sent to you on approval. How did you plan to pay for it? Get out. Or did you know you wouldn't have to pay for it because it was never going to be delivered? Get out of here. I don't have to listen to this. I don't have to answer your insulting questions. My private affairs are my own concern. The ice finally melted, and now you're going to blow your top. Get out, or so help me, I'll kill you. You mean me, too? You... Oh, hey, put that down. Don't throw that. Why, you little devil. Stay back. Let go of me. Settle down, then. And stop throwing things. I will do as I please. It is a my house. So far as... <laughs> oh, good Lord. A woman who can even cry beautifully. Oh, leave me alone. Oh, you're unbelievable, baby. The boys were right. You're everything they said you were. Oh, it's too bad. Go away. All right. But before I do... Where are you going? No, don't, don't. Why did you kiss me? It beats me. Just call it a sudden impulse. Then you have changed your mind? You don't really think I'm guilty? Oh, honey, I still think you're in this up to your ears. And I'll still bring you to trial if I can. And I still want to kiss you. You figure it out. Why figure, Johnny? I liked it, too. (laughs) You ought to be locked up. If for no other reason, just to protect the guys who... What is it, Johnny? What are you going... That cigarette in the ashtray. Put it out fast. Get the windows open, all of them. Where's your kitchen? Back through the hall... Johnny, what are you going to do? Stay alive, if I can. It was gas fumes, one of the bottled gases they use for cooking in the higher-priced apartment districts. The concentration had been building up and finally seeped into the drawing room. 
If we'd lit another match, we'd have been blown to bits. The kitchen was dark, but I didn't dare snap a light switch. One spark would do it. So I held my breath and followed the sound, and finally found the range. Every burner valve was wide open. I could vaguely make out a glass chain door opening onto a terrace. I grabbed a breath of air and moved toward another door that looked as though it might open into a hall. It didn't. It opened into a closet, and on the closet floor there was a body. Why the happy, Johnny? Why did you go... Johnny, who's that? He's a man from the Lorco Company. Name is Zeindorf. Zeindorf? But where did you find Out him? Out there on the floor of a closet. But why? What was he doing here? You tell me. I don't understand it. He has no business here. He... What is wrong with him, Johnny? Well, right at the moment, he seems to be a little bit dead. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Lorco Diamonds matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, a desperate fight in an Algiers alley, a killer is named, and a lovely lady confesses her shame. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hello? Who is it? Hello? Hello? Johnny, who is it? I don't know, Countess. Maybe they weren't expecting a man to answer. Or at least not me. I would not know about that. What about this guy who was lying unconscious in your closet? Would you know anything about that? No, Johnny. I didn't think you would. I'll give him another shot of those smelling salts. I think he's coming, too. Good. Maybe he'll know about some of these things. Yes, he will. Some of them. And, of course, he will tell you. I was hoping it would not be brought out. I did not want you to know. Murder is usually brought out sooner or later. Not murder, Johnny. It is not that simple. Tonight and every weekday night... Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Algiers, North Africa, to the Home Office Transworld Fidelity Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Lorco Diamonds Matter. Expense account continued. Item six, nine dollars and thirty cents. Smelling salts and a bottle of scotch. The smelling salts were needed for a double-talking fellow named Zeindorf, who'd managed to get himself gassed half to death in a closet. A representative of your client, who suffered the hundred thousand dollar loss, Lorco Diamonds of Amsterdam. The scotch was for me. Johnny, he doesn't like it. Should I go on holding them under his nose? Yeah, sure. Keep shoving them at him until he's strong enough to fight you off. That's how smelling salts work. A person has to come to and sheer self-defense. Nein. Nein, stop. It's more to plenty already. My nose is killed dead. 
No more. Or maybe even poking it into the wrong places. <laughs> what were you doing in that closet, Mr. Zeindorf? <clears throat> it's nothing. I can tell you the entire thing in two words. Use more if you need them, but make it good. <clears throat> Nobody has found this beautiful diamond. Nobody has do anything. So I come looking for my own self. In that closet? Nine is only for hiding. I am wait for everybody going away, going at sleep. Then I am going to look in. In my apartment. What made you think they would be here? You are pleased to forgiving me, Fräulein. But I am not taking the chance. I am think to looking every place. Who turned on the gas out there? Do not ask it. I, I know nothing. I... I think I have sleeping some, maybe, and when I have waking, I am died almost. Yeah. Well, apparently somebody was out to get one of us, at least. Hey, what about that maid of yours, Maria? Or is the one? Of course. She... You know, that is strange. She disappeared about the time you arrived, slipped out without a word. Does she live here? I think she lives up in the Casbah. I hire her through the agency. I see. Do you think she did it? Oh, the more I find out, the less I'm sure of. Maybe Mr. Zeindorf did it, trying to commit suicide over his missing trinkets. Nine. Suicide is, is one thing I am not. And I, I desist to listen no more. I, I am to leave here immediate. Oh, uh, by the way, Mr. Zeindorf. Yeah, what is it? As I understand it, you boys in the international jewelry business are ordinarily pretty cautious in your dealings. Yeah, you are the prudence, my dear. Always the entire prudence. That's what I mean. You always investigate a new client thoroughly before you take any chances, is that right? It's entire correct. Johnny, no. Then why did you send $100,000 worth of diamonds here to Algiers at the request of a woman who doesn't have a cent to her name? Ach, why it is to me these things are always happen. My dear dollar, I am the highest ethic of business. I cannot give you answering. Well, one of you better give me an answering. Oh, it is all right, Mr. Seindorf. Please... Please, you tell Contessa. All right. What he is trying to say, Johnny, is this. It did not matter about my financial standing because I was not actually a client. What do you mean? You ordered the stuff? Yes. Several pieces on approval so I could make a selection. Anything up to $20,000. Somebody else was paying for it. It was being given to me as a gift. By whom? A fellow countryman of yours, a man named Charles Barrett. He's been here three months, lives on his yacht. Mr. Seindorf, how did you know this man Barrett would pay for the diamond? By the letter, my dear. What letter? When I wrote to the local firm, I took the liberty of enclosing a letter written to me by Mr. Barrett. His own authentical signings be investigated immediately. What sort of a letter was it? He promised to pay for a gift of jewelry up to $20,000 of my own selection in return for certain considerations. What considerations? Romantic, mine hair. It is a little present of the engagement. Is that what it was, Maria? An engagement present? Yes. I see. I, I think I go now. It's too much has happened in this place. Is it all right to smoke now? Yes, yeah, sure. The gas is cleared out. Here. Thank you. I wish you hadn't kissed me, Johnny. I thought you said you liked it. I did. That is why I wish you hadn't. Are you trying to say that... Oh, relax, Johnny. I am not a child. No, I have not fallen in love with you any more than you have with me. But I could, very easily. Well, what about this man, Barrett? What's he like? Oh, an overbearing, spoiled, middle-aged little boy. The price sounds kind of high. What else is there? Ever think of working? Where? At what? In Italy, yes. But you know what's open there for an impoverished countess. Yeah, I know. And I suppose you can't get a work permit anywhere else, is that it? Oh, forget it, Johnny. All I know how to do is be highly ornamental, say the right things to the right people, do the right things at the right time, and eat by stealing caviar at cocktail parties. You go hungry a lot that way. Yeah, I guess it's rough. Well, don't let it throw you, honey. 
You're not the first girl who married for money. What? I guess you don't understand. Nobody has said anything about a marriage. Oh, I see. Well, Johnny, I imagine you will be leaving now. So, good night, Johnny. Goodbye. For all the progress I'd made in the case, I might as well have stayed at home. Another fish off the hook. Logical suspect number one had been the customs property agent, Andre Jardin. But the blow on the head that sent him to the hospital hadn't been faked. And that, plus the fact the diamond courier had shown symptoms of poisoning before the plane even landed, seemed to leave Andre in the clear. And now number two, Maria Catastatalia, was apparently able to supply another answer every time she needed one. And her answers were backed up by Hans Zeindorf, Lorco's own representative. We were shortcutting through the harbor district when I began to realize that the same car had been behind us ever since we'd left Maria's. It was a low-slung English job, expensive and easy to recognize. Driver. Oui, monsieur? Hit the gas a little harder. See if you can shake that car behind us. Ah, mais oui. The other car picked up speed to match ours and still held the same distance. Hey, try a couple of fast corners. I want to make sure. Yeah? The next place where the street narrows down. Stop fast. Swing crosswise. Block off the road. I want to stop that guy and have a talk with him. Hey, you understand what I mean? Mais oui, monsieur. It's just like in the movies. Yeah, well, something like that. And there's a place coming up. Let's, let's have a go at it. You do not worry. I will do it good. Yeah, I only hope we've seen the same movies. Now, monsieur... I was out of the cab fast and running back down the street. The other driver had jammed on his brakes and finally skidded to a stop against the curb. I reached for the handle, jerked the door open, and the man inside came out swinging. A big man, little on the beefy side, but plenty tough. I didn't know him, never seen him before. He fought silently and fought hard, but he was a sucker for a left. I knelt down on the pavement and started to go through his pockets. I hadn't even noticed the other car pull up. Huh? Do you merely plan to rob him, or do you also intend to cook him and eat him? Oh, you really get around, Inspector. A policeman must socialize, monsieur. It broadens the outlook. Come, we walk. My chauffeur will take care of reviving your victim. Do you happen to know the victim? Yeah, may we? He's Monsieur Charles K. Barrett of Chicago. Maria's ex-boyfriend. Mm, something of this sort, I believe. How did you happen to get here so conveniently? Oh, I was following you. Uh, Father back, of course. Then why didn't you pitch in when the fight started? And spoil such a remarkable display of fisticuffs? Okay, okay. It is true the footwork was mediocre, but the verb, the enthusiasm, the violence, superb, monsieur. I can't quite figure you, Inspector. Well, sometime we must talk about it. Uh, monsieur... You will be most happy to know that we have identified the person who occupied the plane seat next to the diamond courier. Oh? They shared a bottle of wine during the flight. Undoubtedly, that is how the poison was administered. And who is the person? A man named Bobo. Bobo? Oui. He is well known in the Kasbah. He is a thief, smuggler, dope peddler, and it is said he can be hired as a killer. Have you picked him up yet? Well, I have not tried to. Why not? Uh, why not? Monsieur, in the Kasbah, at the sight of a uniform, everyone vanishes, zzzt, like rabbits in their holes. The Kasbah, huh? Oh, another thing. The property agent who was struck on the head, André Jordine, he has disappeared from the hospital. Disappeared? How? His window was open, the room was upset. It was very odd. Yeah. Well, look, Inspector, uh, I think I'll get on back to the hotel and uh, get some sleep. No, as you wish. Yeah, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Maybe. Oh, there is one more thing, uh, Monsieur Dallin. Huh? I think perhaps I should warn you of something in the event you should call again on the Comtesse. Warn me of what? Well, two days ago, I installed a dictaphone in her apartment. You what? I must admit I found your conversation this evening most entertaining. Inspector, you are a rat. Oh, please do not concern yourself in the least. I am the soul of discretion. Maybe. Monsieur, I am a Frenchman. Twice tonight, the Casbah had been mentioned. 
a strange, mysterious native quarter on the steep hill behind the city. Maria had said her maid lived there, and now Bobo, who'd given poison wine to the diamond courier. I had an angle, and I had some ideas. The picture was finally starting to make sense, but I needed some more answers, and the trail led into the casbah. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Lorco Diamonds matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, a bungling fool, a tightening net, and a violent death in a crooked alley of the Casbah. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Abdul. Abdul? You don't know me. So? I have the little business. Well, I'm so happy for you. I hope it's doing well. (laughs) Not bad. Okay, what... You don't know me, but you're looking for me. Now look, Joe, Abdul... Uh, It it is a business to uh, get jobs for people, for servants. Oh, the employment agent. Ah. Have you got the address of that girl who worked for the Countess Dutalia? Oh, sure. You're very lucky. She's very pretty. You've got the wrong idea, Abdul. I just want to talk to her. (laughs) Sure. Where does she live? For $20, I will remember. I'll give you 10. No, she's worth more. Look, knock it off. I gotta find her and talk to her fast while I'm still alive. And while she is. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Algiers, North Africa, to the Home Office Transworld Fidelity Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Lorco Diamonds Matter. $100,000 $100,000 worth missing. Expense account continued. <laughs> Item 9, $15 even. Gratuity, tip, gift, bonus. Ah, why kid about it? It was a bribe. To a man named Abdul for the address of a girl named Chata. An address up in the native quarter, the Casbah. But the idea wasn't romance, no matter what Abdul thought. Four hours earlier in the Countess Datalia's apartment, somebody had turned on the gas and tried to kill one or both of us. It was nine to one that the somebody was Chata the servant. I wanted to ask her why. I'd put my coat on and was just on the point of leaving my hotel. I slipped a gun into my side pocket and moved over to the door. Yeah, who is it? Charlie Barrett. The guy you beat the daylights out of a couple hours ago, you know what I mean? No hard feelings, Dal. I just want to talk it over. All right, Barrett. What's on your mind? You object if I come inside? It's kind of personal, you know what I mean? Probably. All right, come on in. Much obliged. 
Hey, I didn't know who you were, but when we when we got in that little fracas, that their cop told me about it afterward. Man, you really got a well upon you. You make a fella know he's had it, you know what I mean? Is that why you're here, a post-mortem on the fight? No, 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 it's done and over. You whip me, fair and square, as far as I'm concerned. Hey, Barrett, if you've got anything to say, let's have it fast. I'm in a hurry to get out of here. Oh, well, I sure don't want to take up no more of your time than necessary. I know how it is. Of course, I'm on vacation now, but back in Chicago, I'm in a meat business. Look, Barrett, will you uh, please... At least in a way I am. I'm in uh, byproducts, actually. You know what they say? Use everything but the squeal. Well, I'm the fellow that cans a squeal, you get it? No, oh, brother. What I come here for was maybe to get it straightened out about that dame. Do you mean the Countess D'Atelier? Countess, Countess, them titles are a dime a dozen. I can buy them, sell them like sausages. Well, what about her? Now, look, neighbor, I was figuring to come here and put it to you man to man. You know what I mean? I know what I'm beginning to think you mean. I figure when you've seen my position, you'd want to do the square thing. Like anybody on the right side of the fence would. You with me, neighbor? You better drop that neighbor business. I've moved. Well, Dollar, the thing stacks up like this. Now, I already had my claim staked there before you even got in town. I got a lot of money invested in that dame. Barrett, so help me. I've been taking her around places, you know, feeding her, buying her, one thing and another. Why, I was even going to kick through for a 20 grand chunk of ice for her. Well, she and I had that fight last week. You what? That dame's got highfalutin what ideas. What fight? What are you talking about? Well, I just put it to her, cold turkey. I told her she had to quit Jenny flipping around with all those other fellas. Or I just wasn't going to have nothing more to do with her. Well, that made her mad, you understand? She lit into me. Man, you ought to hear that dame talk when she's mad. You'd, you'd think hey, that look, she... Hey, look, when was this fight? Was it before the diamonds were sent here? Well, sure. Sure, I said if that's the way she was going to act, she could forget about them diamonds. Well, I ain't seen a sense of talk to her, but I just can't... I just can't seem to get her off my mind. Now, look, Dolly, you was in her apartment there for two hours and 40 minutes tonight, and I don't like it. It bothers me. Strictly business, Barrett. And I got to get going. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Dolly. Wait a minute. We we still got something to settle here. Like I told you, I I got I'll bear it. Get out. You better hold your horses. I don't know if you know the the name, C.K. Barrett, if that means anything to you. But I got influence back there in them United States. So what's the hard way, huh? Look, you just work for that company of yours. You're nothing but an employee. And if you think you can talk to me like you can to some of these foreigners, then... Here, now! Still a sucker for a left. Hello, room service. This is Johnny Dollar. Some drunk just wandered in here and passed out. Would you send up a couple of boys to drag it out in the hall? Expense account, item 10, $5.30. A tip to the bellboys and taxi fare to the Casbah. The taxi dropped me off at the end of the causeway, and from there on I walked. It was late, well after midnight. But the narrow, crooked alleys were teeming with life. Some of it out in the open, some of it undercover. Small groups of people met together here and there along the cobbled streets. Men of two dozen tongues and dialects. And women, too, slipped silently in and out of the dark doorways, crouched over tables in the dim-lit cafes and coffee houses. Groups usually fell silent when I passed and stared with hostile curiosity. The Casbah, backwash of North Africa. Little known, seldom bothered, and scarcely policed. And for an outsider, especially at night, more dangerous than dynamite. The address Abdul had given me turned out to be a coffee house, but it could still be legitimate. And there was only one way to find out. What do you want? I want to see Chata. What for? Private reasons. Chata's not here. Where can I find him? Take a seat. Table in the corner. Maybe she come. I took the seat, ordered coffee, and waited. A wrinkled old Arab squatted on a rug in the middle of the room and played strange, weird melodies. Gradually, the other patrons went back to their conversations, ignoring me completely. In fact, pointedly. Twenty minutes passed. The girl didn't show. You will, of course, not object, monsieur, if I take the liberty of joining you. No, sit down. Merci. So, you wish to see chat. Yeah, that's right. Do you know her? Oui. I know her very well. Now, where to find her? 
But naturally, monsieur, I always know where to find her. She's my woman. Ah, so you're the man they call Bobo. Oui, monsieur. The man who poisoned the diamond courier. Oh, monsieur, it is true that I gave him some wine. A little, not much. But I think perhaps it was a bad vintage. Yes, most unfortunate. It was for him. Well, perhaps it was for the best. Life is so uncertain. But I do not wish to think of such unpleasantness. Instead, uh, let us talk about diamonds. Let's talk about killing, or attempted killing. Is Chanda the one who turned on the gas in the Countess's apartment? It is possible that she did that. On whose orders? It was nothing personal, monsieur. I didn't even know that you were going to be there. I see. Then you really meant to... Diamonds, monsieur. That's enough of this foolish talk of killing. All right. All right, what about the diamonds? You were sent here by the company that has insured them. Is that not correct? Yeah, that's right. And this company would like very much to recover these diamonds? That's why I'm here. C'est bien. Now, I'm told that these companies sometimes give large rewards, agree to an arrangement of a sort. Make a deal, you mean, with no questions asked. Yes, exactly. Now, is this thing true, monsieur? Is it possible that you would... Do you have the diamonds, Bobo? Well, let us say that I'm able to direct you to their location. You could almost call that a confession. Hmm. What does it matter, so long as we are in the Casper? Oh, yeah, sure. I imagine you have men spotted all over the place. At least 30, right in this room. I am in no danger here, monsieur. Tell me something. You didn't pull off this job by yourself. Who else was in on it? I only wish to talk about the diamonds. Well, can we come to an arrangement? Bobo, I don't make deals with murderers. It is better that you do not use such words, monsieur. It's true, though, isn't it? That is not the question. It is only that I resent the insulting way. Bobo! Would you... Bobo, the gendarme! What? Why are you coming here? Bobo! Oui, oui, oui. Did you arrange for the police to come here, monsieur? I'm as surprised as you are, Bobo. Ah, consider this matter of the deal. We will talk more at some other time, eh? The patrons rushed for the doors, and in one minute flat, the coffee house was empty. Even the owner was gone. I was the only one left. Three minutes later, the inspector, with a flying squad of 20 men, came bursting in from the street. Well, Monsieur Deller, I'm happy to find you are still alive. Why don't you get lost somewhere? For you, I think it most fortunate that we arrive in time. Oh, sure, in time to foul up the only lead I had in this case. To lose a suspect is better than to lose one's life, Monsieur. Look, Inspector, I was holding a gun in my pocket, covering Bobo from the second he sat down at the table. But, Monsieur, For three I... men or not, if it had come to a showdown, he couldn't have done a thing. Because he'd have been the first one to get it, and he's smart enough to have known that. But I thought Let's that... face it, Inspector, you've done it again. You goofed. But I was only thinking that perhaps... Oh, dear, what is to happen next? The shooting was somewhere outside, but it hadn't been the police. All of the inspector's men were inside the coffee house. He gave them orders quickly, and they fanned out to search the area. The streets were empty now, dark and silent, not a soul in sight. We split up into pairs. I worked with Inspector Marcus for a while and left him and searched alone along a narrow side passage. And that's where I found him. He'd been shot three times in the back, and he was dying. Monsieur Dollar. Yeah, Bobo. You you can't forget that deal, I think. Yeah. It's a little too late for deals now. Who was in on it with you, Bobo? Look, you've got nothing to lose by talking. You know that, don't you? Except my honor, monsieur. As a citizen of the Casper. Who shot you? A dragon, monsieur. Twelve feet tall. With fiery eyes. All right, Bobo, all right. But just tell me this. Just one thing. Are you the man who attacked the property agent at the airport? The man who slug Andre Jordan? Oui, monsieur. I do it very good. No. Almost I kill him. It's too bad. I... I... A minute or two later, Inspector Marcus came up and we stood there looking down at the dead man lying on the stones of the alley. He was a short man, stockily built with wide shoulders and a deep chest. It was the body of a man of action, of accomplishment. But he'd chosen to be a smuggler, dope peddler, thief, and killer. And now he had become the victim of another killer. Did he say anything, monsieur? Was he able to talk? Yeah, enough. Eh? What is it you mean, monsieur? Do you know who is guilty of this? Yeah, that's right, Inspector. 
I know the whole story now. The whole filthy, rotten story. There'll be the final intriguing episode in our story of the Lorco Diamonds matter tomorrow. Tomorrow night, the odds are set. The last chip is down. It's the last spin of the wheel. And death is the croupier. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Johnny, this is Maria. Maria? Well, isn't it kind of late at night to call? You've got to help me, Johnny. I'm being followed. You're being... Aren't you at home? No, it's a little cafe on the waterfront. I came in here to phone... Why the devil did you have to go out? Everything was set up. If you'd stayed home, you'd have been safe. What are you trying to do? Get yourself killed? Johnny, this is no time... Where are you? What's the name of the place? The, the Marrakesh, number 41, Rue de la Mer... Go no, whatever you do, don't go outside. Stay right where you are until I get there. But Johnny, Take I'm... your choice, Maria. It's either that or wind up on a marble slab. What do you mean? You know what I mean. You know better than anybody. Now stay there. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Algiers, North Africa, to the Home Office Transworld Fidelity Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Lorco Diamonds matter. $100,000 in jewels stolen and a murder. Expense account continued. Item 12, $2.20, taxi fare to the waterfront of the Marrakesh Cafe. There was no time to lose and no time to get help from Inspector Marcus. A half hour earlier, he'd set a trap, and he and his men were staked out around Maria's apartment house waiting. But apparently, she'd gone to the cafe before he got there. So now the whole thing had blown wide open. The Rue de la Mer was a dead-end street close to the water, deserted at this hour of night. A couple of dim street lights and a light over the door of the Marrakesh Cafe. Everything else was in darkness. There was no movement, no sign of life. Over here, Johnny. Oh, thank heaven you got here. Yeah. No trouble so far. Huh? No. Except with that sailor over there. He finally passed out. Oh, you're probably I'm used to that kind of trouble. Cigarette? Yes, thank you. Now, what were you doing down here at this time of night? I, uh, was visiting a friend. Is that the friend's car parked out at the curb? Yes. Charlie Barrett, huh? The meat packer from Chicago who was going to give you the Lorco diamonds. Well, I figured he'd get over his man spell. How did you know about it? He told me just before I knocked him out for the second time tonight. He said you two had a fight over a week ago and that he told you he wasn't buying any diamonds after all. 
Well, it was just... For a while, I thought I had you tagged again. I wondered why you hadn't canceled the order when you'd been told he wasn't going to pay for the stuff. Johnny, it was just a talk. I knew he would come around. Yeah, well, that's about the way I figured it. Another explanation. So I let you off the hook again. Why, Johnny? Why have you been trying so hard? Trying what? To find some way of involving me in this. Well, the facts just seemed to turn up. I wasn't trying to find them. It made a big difference, didn't it? Learning about Mr. Barrett. Learning what about him? That I was accepting a $20,000 gift from him. Why should it? Your life's your own. It did, though. Before that, you were... Well, you seemed to be interested. Sure. You're a very beautiful woman. And that's all it was? What more did you want? All right, Johnny. Forget it. I don't blame you. Hey, tell me something. What about Barrett? Now that you've kissed and made up, is the engagement back on again? I haven't decided yet, Johnny. Ah. Well, come on. Let's get out of here. I'll take you home. Do you think it's safe? There was no sign of anybody around when I came in. Whoever it was probably got scared off. Oh, I was scared to death. When I saw the lights of the cafe, I jammed on the brakes and ran for the door. There, the car was right behind me. Get a look at the driver? No. How'd you get hold of Barrett's car? Borrow it? He gave it to me. Hmm. Not a bad night's work. It's a good car. Get in. You really play rough, don't you, Johnny? Sometimes. It depends on... Get down. Quick. Back of the car. It came from across the street. It's pitch black over there. What are you going to do? Look, Maria, you're safe as long as you're back of the car here. What about you? I can't get a shot from here. I'm pinned down. I'm going to make a run for that stone curb. Try to draw a shot and see where the flash comes from. Be careful, Johnny. Oh, don't worry, kid. I'm the carefulest guy you ever saw. All right, now sit tight. Here goes. Yeah, I think I got him spotted. Let's see just how close I get. Hear somebody running away. Yeah, so do I. Oh, why the devil? Why don't they get some street lights down there? That car that's starting up. Yeah, I see it. They're getting away. One lucky shot, my. Ah. Give me your keys. Wait here. I'm going after him. No, them. no, I'm going with you. Then pile in. Hurry up. Let's go. A few blocks away, I picked up the taillights of the other car and poured on the gas to keep hanging on. We roared through the empty streets along the waterfront, then swung into the coast road and headed out of the city. The model I was driving had been built for road racing, and barring accidents, I didn't figure the car ahead had much chance of shaking me. It was a narrow, winding road following the rocky edge of the headlands, and the curves were sharp and dangerous, especially at the speed we were traveling. Finally, it happened. The car ahead roared up a steep grade and missed the curve at the top, it rolled over and over, the headlights cutting crazy patterns in the blackness as it plunged down towards the beach. I finally braked to a stop about 30 yards from the wreck, jumped out and started toward it, and just then... The gas tank caught and burst, and the car exploded into a tower of flames. I caught a glimpse of the driver pinned in the wreck. Then the fire took over and covered him, and I knew one thing was certain. He'd had it. It's dying down. Yeah. The gasoline is all burned down. Oh, what a terrible way to die. What way isn't? I guess... Johnny, could I have a cigarette, please? Yeah, sure. Here you go. Thank you. Yeah, light up, Maria, while you watch him burn. What a horrible thing to say. It's quite a relief, though, isn't it, knowing you're safe now? Well, of course it's a relief when someone has just tried to kill you and now you know that they... That's true, but it's not what I meant. I don't think I understand you. What I meant was you're safe because now he won't be able to talk. Able to... Who won't be able? Do you mean you know who's in that car? Of course, and so do you. It's the customs property agent, Andre Jardin. Andre? Sure. Who else would have any reason to kill you since he was the only one left after... Oh, I guess you haven't heard about it yet. Bobo's dead, too. What? Who is Bobo? Your other partner. Andre shot him in the back earlier tonight, up in the Casbah. So you're doubly safe now, Maria. They're both dead. And for everything else, you've got an explanation. 
with just one exception. I don't even know what you're talking oh, about. Oh, no, don't be modest. Actually, it was quite a scheme, whether you thought it up or Andre oh, did. Oh, you are out of your mind. The idea was to make sure the Diamond Courier died, either on the plane or at least before he got through customs. That way, the courier's briefcase would be sent to Andre's office. Then Bobo was to help Andre fake the stick-up. But Bobo turned out to be a tough cookie. This may be true, Instead but Instead of I... sticking to plan, he decided to go for broke. When he slugged Andre, he tried to make it stick, but Andre managed to reach his gun, so he ended up in the hospital instead of the morgue. What has all this got to do with me? Then Andre got the idea of a double cross. He left the hospital, went into the Cosmo to look for Bobo. He found him, and he killed him. I still don't see His what... next step was a natural, to knock you off and keep the whole take for himself. We expected it, and we were ready for him. Inspector Marcus is staked out right now at your apartment house, waiting for Andre to show up. We didn't know you'd already gone out earlier. Well... All of this may be true, Johnny. But why do you insist on trying to fit me into the picture? Because that's where you belong. I mentioned the fact that you'd been able to come up with an explanation every time you needed it. With just one exception. What exception? Both Andre and Bobo have tried to kill you this evening. Why? Unless you were in on this thing, what reason would they have? Well, I... I don't know. I... Of course. Why should I know? I don't know why they tried to kill me, Johnny. Oh, a good answer, Maria. And it'll probably work. Yeah, you figured that one out fast. I don't know what you no, mean. No, caution. Well. Who has the diamonds? I will, before morning. Johnny, why couldn't you Knock have... it off, kid. You got the wrong guy. It won't work with me. It could. It sure, could. I know. You're beautiful, charming, lovely. And you're rotten. Rotten right to the core. What are you doing, Johnny? Going back to town. Well, wait for me. Goodbye, Maria. Johnny, wait. Johnny! An hour later, I was out at the air terminal in the customs property office watching Inspector Marcus open a vault. Oh, Joe, what a nuisance. Always they make these combinations so difficult. That's the general idea, Inspector. Uh, true, but still one would think... Ah, uh, 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 there we are. Uh, now, if you are correct, Monsieur Dallaire, we shall soon have our hands... There, and... that briefcase in the corner. Uh, ah, may we? Oui. It is the one. Good. Let's have a look at it. It will be necessary to force the lock. Here, try it open with this. Looks like an easy one. It is merely a matter of... Voila! Beautiful, no? Yeah. Too beautiful. Hmm. Tell me something, Monsieur Dollar. What made you know that Andre Jordine was guilty? Something Bobo said, just before he died. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He confessed he was the man who had slugged Andre. But Andre had described his assailant as tall and thin. Bobo was short with a stocky build. Andre had lied. Mm. And all this time, the diamonds were right here in this vault to which Andre, as property agent, had access. Can you think of a safer place? Hey, Inspector, what about Maria Datoria? Mm, well, I, I, I am inclined to agree with you, Monsieur Dollar, but... Uh, uh, well... Yeah, I know. Nothing but suspicion. Yeah, yeah. Precisely. If I were to file charges and bring her to trial on such evidence as this... Well, it, it, she would cry a little, perhaps, and look very beautiful. And, monsieur, the court would hang me, not her. Yeah, you're right. You could never make it stick. Yeah. C'est la vie. Expense account item 13, $624.80. Hotel, meals, and incidentals in Algiers, and transportation back to the States. Expense account total, $1,214.60. End of expense account. End of report. Remarks? Social item. To be circulated widely. The Countess Maria Datolia was married yesterday to C.K. Barrett, a big tycoon in the meat business. The happy couple will make their home in Chicago. All companies in that area who may be asked to underwrite insurance on the life of C.K. Barrett, don't. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) 
Remember, there'll be a new exciting story on Johnny Dollar beginning next Monday. Next week, the Broderick Matter, an exciting chase after a charming, beautiful girl. After all, who wouldn't? Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Lillian Bayef, Jack Moyles, Victor Perrin, C.K. Barrett, Lawrence Dobkin, Forrest Lewis, and Jay Novello. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. My name's Steele, Mr. Dollar. Claims Division, Eastern Trust Insurance Company. Steele? You don't know me, Mr. Dollar. People of Universal Adjustment suggested I contact you. Thought you might be interested in helping me pay off a claim. Okay, tell me about it, Mr. Steele. One of our policyholders passed away last month, and we can't seem to locate his beneficiary. She just doesn't seem to be around. Maybe she doesn't want the money. Everybody wants money, Mr. Dollar, especially insurance money. Be there in an hour. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Eastern Trust Insurance Company Claims Division, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Broderick matter. Expense account item one, 25 cents, bus fare. My apartment to the Eastern Trust Insurance Building in the office of Robert Steele. He was a big sandy-haired man in a tweed suit. We shook hands, looked each other over, and then got down to business. Now, Mr. Dollar, the deceased policyholder was named John Smith. John Adam Smith, age 67. Died in City Hospital, Charity Ward, 22nd of last month. Death certificate. Mm Mm-hmm. Pneumonia. And other things. What other things? The intern who signed that certificate said Smith was pretty run down. Evidences of malnutrition, possible TB history. Not noted here, Mr. Steele. Doesn't make any difference. Smith was able to stand the exam for the policies when they were issued in 1943. Uh Uh-huh. You got him there? Yes. 1,500 total. Beneficiary, Lorraine Broderick. She the one you can't locate? She's the one. Any other possible heirs, uh, family or anyone? No, Smith was all alone. No problems there. Any other material that might help to find Lorraine Broderick? Well, this stuff here, it might help you. I don't know. I just don't know. You sound discouraged, Mr. Steele. Fifteen hundred dollars isn't a lot of money, and the chances are Lorraine Broderick won't even remember John Adam Smith when you do find her. But I hope you do. I... I'm explaining this badly. Look here. You see? Mm-hmm. And here. And here. It's the same all through the book. Smith was absolutely religious about his payments. Never missed a one. Never let it slide one day. Now, I bet I've got the record of 20,000 policy buyers. But none of them reads like that. I'm impressed, Mr. Steele. Can you tell me why Smith died in a charity ward if he was this conscientious? He didn't have any money or friends or home. He made his living selling papers. We wouldn't have known about his death except for the fact that the coroner's office called us. What can you tell me about his beneficiary? 
Well, Lorraine Broderick was just someone who stopped and talked to him one day while he was selling papers. She was 11 years old at the time. She... What? Yes. The agent who sold the policies used to buy his papers from the old boy. One day, Smith stopped him and said he wanted to do something nice for a nice little girl named Lorraine Broderick. So he began taking out the policies. The agent have any more background on that part of it? No. Lorraine Broderick met Smith that one afternoon and helped him sell his newspapers. Smith never saw her again after that. Hmm. 1943, she must be 23 or so now. Well, I hope she grew up to be the kind of person he thought she was then. Oh, hardly any of us fill out the promise we have at 11 years, Mr. Steele. Then that isn't what I mean. I mean, if he met her that one day when she was a little girl and he made this gesture toward her, and it was tough for him to make those payments all those years. I hope she deserves it. The money doesn't mean anything, but that kind of endorsement from somebody, even an old bird who sells papers on a corner, is worth more than all the money in the world. Uh, does that sound foolish, Mr. Dollar? Not a bit, Mr. Steele. Not a bit. Expense account item two, two dollars. Cab fare to Lorraine Broderick's last known address. 1485 Cushing Street, a broken down apartment house that had probably never seen better days or better neighbors. The owner and manager of the building recalled that Paul and Mary Broderick, parents of Lorraine, had been killed in an automobile accident in 1948. The manager did not know what had become of Lorraine. She had moved out of the apartment two days after the funeral. No forwarding address. Expense account item three, four bits, more cab fare. This time, seven blocks away to Pulaski Street. And a dingy cluster of red brick buildings that were yielding slowly to time and wear. I arrived at three on the dot. I don't think high schools ever change much. At least this one was no different than the one I'd been in way back when. The persistent smell of pencil sharpeners, ink, discarded lunch bags. Sister Mary Regina? Yes, may I help you? Good afternoon, sister. My name's Johnny Dollar. I wonder if I could talk to you a moment. Uh, Dollar? Yes. Are you sure you shouldn't be speaking to Sister Amadea in the grade school? I don't believe we have any students named Dollar. Oh, no, sister. I don't have any children in school here. I've been hired by Eastern Trust Insurance Company to locate a beneficiary on one of their insurance policies. I thought perhaps you might help me. Well, I'll try, Mr. Dollar. I took a chance and came here because it was the nearest high school to the girl's address. Her name is Lorraine Broderick. Lorraine Broderick? Yes. The last trace I have of her was in 1948. She was about 17 then, possibly still in school. Possibly this school. Lorraine Broderick. Mm Mm-hmm. Sound familiar, sister? Uh, in a way, yes. Oh, there are so many, so many, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, I just met about 3,000 of them out in the hall. (laughs) Yes, I know. 1948. Uh, Benson, Brady, Broderick, Lorraine, Mary, Broderick. Oh. Yes, Mr. Dollar, your guess was very good. She was here in St. Charles from 1945 to 48, yes. I wonder if there's an address listed there, home address. Um, 1120 Seaton Place. Oh, my, that's quite far from here. Uh, parents, deceased, guardian. Oh. Anything wrong, sister? Why, I remember Lorraine now, Mr. Dollar. Her parents were killed in an automobile accident in her senior year. Yes, and she went to live with her uncle, James Broderick, at this Seton address. Oh, yes, yes, I remember that lovely girl. She was in Sister Hildegard's class. That ties up with what I know about her so far, sister. Oh, I remember her so clearly. I can even see her face. Perhaps that was it, her face. Like an angel's, gentle and fresh and wonderful. The man who left her the insurance money must have thought the same as you do, sister. He saw her one day when she was 11. Oh, I have an annual from that year, Mr. Dollar. Would you like to see Lorraine? Yes. Uh, Right here. Yes, here we are. That's Lorraine Broderick. Beautiful, isn't she? Sister Mary Regina pointed to a group picture on one of the pages. It was labeled Girl Sodality. Lorraine Broderick was in the first row, one of 30 or 40 self-conscious little girls wearing identical self-conscious expressions. Her hair appeared to be deep brown or black, her features soft and slightly cherubic. Undeniably, Lorraine Broderick had been a beautiful young girl. In all probability, she was a beautiful young woman. 
wherever she was. By five o'clock, I'd been to her uncle's address on Seton Place. There I learned that Uncle James Broderick had died of a heart attack in 1950. The people at the address reported that Lorraine had lived with him up until the time of his death. She had worked in a dentist's office, they told me. As far as they knew, she still worked there. I made a phone call. Yes, sir? Johnny Dollar, Mr. Steele. Oh, how are you going on Lorraine Broderick? Well, I might need some help. Have you got a man? Uh, sure. I've got her traced up to 1950, Steele. She worked for a dentist here in town. Uh Uh-huh. Probably got her job in his office right out of high school. That meant she pretty well had to get it through a professional agency. That sounds reasonable. I got a man to check the agencies in town that specialize in that. Let me know. The next day, I was back in St. Charles High School making up a list of names and addresses belonging to students who had been in Lorraine Broderick's graduation class. Out of the ten names I chose at random, I was able to locate only two. Both girls, both married. Both remembered Lorraine Broderick. Neither of them had seen her since graduation. Neither of them was able to furnish any helpful information. Expense account item five, ten cents, one phone call. Steal again. You want to take this down, Dollar? Yeah, okay. David Pollard. That's Dr. David Pollard. 2950 Tremel Lane. Lorraine Broderick went to work for him as a receptionist in 1949. Got it? Got it. What's his office address? Suite 210, Majestic Building. I got there about a quarter of six. There was no receptionist on duty. As a matter of fact, no reception desk. A stern-looking nurse in a rumpled white uniform knew nothing of a Lorraine Broderick who might have worked for Doctor. Doctor was working with a patient. If I cared to wait for Doctor... Yes, yes, what is it? My name's Dollar. I'm with the Eastern Trust Insurance Company. I don't need any today, Mr. Dollar. I'm not looking for a sale, Doctor. What? That's right. I'm trying to find a friend of yours. Who are you talking about? Lorraine Broderick. Oh. How is Lorraine these days? I don't know, Doctor. I'd like to meet her and find out. Well, you're looking in the wrong place. I can't help you. She hasn't been around here for a couple of years. Goodbye. Oh, wait. Well, what now? Well, you've got an awful big chip on your shoulder, Doctor. You won't even let me explain my business. I'm not interested in your business. I can tell you mine's been going on since 8 o'clock this morning, and I'm pretty tired. You finished now? Well, yes. Can I take you downstairs and buy you a drink? Sorry. What is it you want to know? Where I can get in touch with her. I don't know. She quit without notice a couple of years ago, just didn't come back. Too bad, too. Do you have any idea where she might have gone? Just what is this for? To pay her some money we owe her. We can't locate her anywhere. Well, I'm sorry, but neither can I. Are you still trying? Not anymore. All I know is she just left one day about two years ago. She had a little apartment over on the west side. The manager told me she'd pulled out bag and baggage, and I haven't heard from her since. Were you on, uh, good terms with her, doctor? Doctor? I'll take the drink. Don't misunderstand me, Dollar. She was a real sweet girl. But there was, there was something about her. I don't know. I hope you find her. Or maybe I don't. What are you talking about? She had plans of her own, plans she never told me about. Look, I was in practice three years when she came to work for me, fresh out of high school. With all of it, she still made me feel like a little boy in knee pants. That smile of hers you could take two ways. And the look that went with it. I'm sure she's met a lot of men since she walked out on me, and I'll bet all of them have found out the same thing. What's that? That they've been taken. You mean money? Oh, it wasn't the watch or the necklace or the loans every now and then. It was being taken worse. You know, being used and knowing you're being used. I don't quite get it. And I'll make it clear. That sweet, fresh, beautiful little girl was out to do everything and everybody for all she could get. She's rotten, you know, just plain rotten. There'll be another intriguing episode of the Broderick Matter tomorrow. Tomorrow? The expense goes way up. Yeah. It costs money to prove how wrong one man can be. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Carl Walden. There's a message here for me to call you. Oh, yes, Mr. Walden. I'm with Eastern Trust Insurance Company. We're trying to locate an insurance beneficiary named Lorraine Broderick. Understand she lived in your apartment building up until 1953. Well, who told you that? A doctor she worked for here, Dr. Pollard. I don't know where she is, Mr. Dollar. I haven't seen her for two years. We're trying to pay off a claim, Mr. Walden. Didn't she leave a forwarding address or give you any idea of where she... No, no, not a thing. You've got a job in your hands, pal. Huh? I don't think that baby wants to be found. Got a couple of minutes? Yes. I'll be right over. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Eastern Trust Insurance Company Claims Division, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures incurred during my investigation of the Broderick matter. Lorraine Broderick, that is, missing. Expense account continued. Item 6, $14 even, Photographs. The photographer who had taken the pictures of the 1948 graduating class at St. Charles High School still carried the proofs in his files. Among them, four poses of Lorraine Broderick. I'd stopped by to get them on my way out to see Carl Walden, apartment house manager. He hadn't changed his mind about anything since our phone conversation. No, sir, she doesn't seem to want anybody to know where she is. She'd have left a forwarding address or something like that. Instead, she pulled out in the middle of the night, bagging baggage, and that's the last we ever saw of her. Just when was this, Mr. Walden? About the middle of December or so, 1953. Yes, it was a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Oh, you want one of these? No, no, thanks. I don't smoke. Can you think of any place she might have gone, Mr. Walden? New York City. Oh, why New York? Well, it's the closest place to go, isn't it, for somebody like her? I'm not so sure I know what she was like. I've had several different versions, Mr. Walden. Say, you talked to that doctor she worked for? Yeah. Boy, I'll bet his version was a pip. How do you mean? Well, she walked out on him. That poor guy was around here several times asking if we'd heard from her, if she'd written us a change of address. He didn't say it, but I think he had it real bad for her. Oh? Oh, yeah. And I didn't tell him about the other guy, either. Well, suppose you tell me about the other guy, Mr. Walden. Well, why not? Well? Well, about a week before she left, I saw her in the hall a couple of times with this other guy. Big, gray-haired man, wore Hamburgs and things like that. An older man, is that what you mean? Oh, no, not old. Forty-five-ish, maybe. You know, expensive-looking character. Drove a caddy the size of a freight train, New York plates. You buy and sell this place with his pocket money. Happen to know his name? No. He never came around again after she moved out. But they were sure chummy while he was here. At least a couple of times I saw them together. Can't blame them. She was okay. Did she owe you any rent when she left? Nope. Did she give you a notice she was vacating? Nope, just left. A note or anything? A $50 bill on the desk in an envelope addressed to me. That's all. That's it. Well, uh, was she friendly with anybody else in the building? Well, not that I know of. 
People here keep pretty much themselves. You know, it's a funny thing. What's funny? That old boy with the Hamburg. I wonder why he never came around looking for her. Good question. Expense account item seven, $22, advertisements. I placed ads in the personal columns of every New York paper. Anyone knowing the present whereabouts of Lorraine Broderick, please contact. I spent the rest of the day interviewing the Cadillac dealers in town on the off chance that one of them might have serviced the Cadillac with a New York plate sometime in December of 1953. No one remembered the man Walden had described. I even tried the service records. Impossible to check. The case was stalemated that way for five days. Last Tuesday, things picked up. Johnny Dollar. Uh, hello? Hello, who is this? Uh, Johnny Dollar? Yeah. Can you hear me very well? Uh, Johnny, I'm calling from New York. Hey, who is this? Why, it's Lorraine. Lorraine? Yes, yes, I saw your advertisement in the papers, Johnny. I wondered what you wanted. Johnny? Why, yes, that's what I always called you, isn't it? You never met me before in your life. Hey, what is this? Why, I... Just a moment. Go ahead, Mr. Dameron. Uh, Mr. Dollar? Yeah. Just what is your business with Lorraine Broderick? I want to find her to pay off an insurance claim. Now, who uh, are you... I see. I'm sorry. I asked my secretary to say she was Lorraine. I've been listening on the extension. I'd like a little more explanation than that, Mr. Uh... Dameron. William Dameron. 424 East 47th Street. I know how all this must sound to you, Mr. Dollar, but I'm not trying to confuse you. Well, I am confused. Do you know Lorraine Broderick? Yes. Then let's take it from there, Mr. Dameron. Expense account item eight, $15. Transportation and incidentals, Hartford to New York for the purpose of seeing Mr. William Dameron, whoever he might be, and trying to gather further information concerning Lorraine Broderick, wherever she might be. 424 East 47th was a 30-story job that housed, among other things, the Union Brokerage Company. This happened to be located on a ground-level suite. It also happened that Mr. William Dameron was president of SAME. He looked about the way I expected. Of course I knew Lorraine Broderick, Mr. Dollar. I apologize again for that awkward subterfuge on the telephone. You say you represent an insurance company? That's right. May I see your credentials? Well, sure. Here you are. Investigator. Thank you. We're trying to pay off on a policy, Mr. Dameron. A man named John Smith left Lorraine Broderick a small estate of $1,500. I see. Can you tell me where she is right now? I'm afraid I can't. Oh, sit down, Mr. Dollar. Sit down. Please. Oh, thanks. I take it you knew her in Hartford. That's right, I did. She came here to New York with me. Oh, let me assure you, there was nothing improper about it. I met Lorraine when she was working for a dentist there, a doctor, or whatever it was. I happened to have had a little dental trouble on a trip there. I found the dentist and I met her. When I suggested she drive to New York with me, I did it with the understanding that we were to be married here. Uh-huh. You, uh, you couldn't have known her very long, Mr. Dameron. A week. No one could have been more surprised than myself at my own conduct. And still more surprised when once we arrived here, Lorraine disappeared. Yeah, that seems to be a habit of hers. Uh, tell me about it, Mr. Dameron. Look, you're talking to me, not the insurance company. Very well. It was Christmas Eve of 1952. Lorraine was staying with my sister Pauline up in Westchester County. I picked her up about six o'clock that evening to go to a party out on Long Island. Between here and Long Island, we stopped for gasoline. I left the car for a moment, and when I came back, Lorraine was gone. And, uh, well, that's it. Did you see her or hear from her after that? No, I didn't. Did she leave a note in the car, a message of some kind? No. I don't quite get this, Mr. Dameron. You were going to be married after you knew her only a week. You brought her here to New York, and a few days later, she just stepped out of your car in a filling station and disappeared. It's quite reasonable from her point of view, I suppose. But not from mine. It doesn't make sense. Did you have a fight, an argument or something? Oh, no. Well, no. What was it? Nothing, nothing. I don't think I would ever have argued with Lorraine. Lovely, gentle, sweet. Yeah, I know. What about her things? What things? Well, her clothes out at your sister's. 
Didn't she send for them, or what? Uh, No, she only had two small bags. They're still there, as far as I know. Well, what did you do? Did you call the police? No, no, why? Well, I would if a girl I was going to marry disappeared like that. No, I'm afraid a call to the police would have been, well, rather awkward, a man in my position. Let me ask you this. Do you have any idea why she walked away? Yes. Perhaps it's of no practical value to you, though. Any information I can get will be helpful, Mr. Well, all right, then. I think Lorraine was frightened. Of what? Of life, Mr. Dollar. Not people or circumstances, but but life. Yes. You say that with a lot of conviction. Yes. Lorraine had always been, well, a poor girl. She lived with a rather decrepit uncle for a time after her parents were killed in an accident, an automobile accident, she said. And I think that I... I offered her the happiness and security she had always longed for... But I also think she was not mature enough or adjusted well enough to accept it. (laughs) This is of no value, is it? It might be. Can you tell me if she ever spoke of any ambitions? Maybe maybe she wanted to go on the stage or become a nurse. Lorraine simply wanted to be my wife and live here. I can see you find that difficult to believe when I'm almost old enough to have been her father. That is not the reason Lorraine walked away from the car that night. Believe me, Mr. Dollarness, I'm terribly mistaken. She was very much in love with me and wanted to marry me. Have you tried to find her, Mr. Dameron? No. No, I have not. I waited around the filling station that night hoping she'd return, but I didn't report the matter to the police, as I said before. I intended to hire private detectives to locate her, but then I gave that up, too. I'm afraid I don't understand this. If you loved her... Would this make it more understandable... Lorraine was a rational, normal human being when I left her in that car. No one forced her away from it, or me. The man at the filling station said she merely stepped out and disappeared down the street. She left of her own free will, for her own reasons. Hmm. I think I see your point. Thank you. I have hoped that one day she would appear at my door, contact me, come to me. But she hasn't. The most matchless woman I've ever known... Is there any way I can help you more concretely? If you could tell me the exact location of that filling station. Yes, I believe I can do that, but why? Last place she was seen alive. Ooh, that word alive. Just a word, Mr. Dameron. Have you spoken to many people who knew her? A few. The dentist she worked for, an apartment house manager, principal in her high school. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think they all told me the truth. The, the what? The truth. You know, how it actually was. What really happened? Oh, I... Uh, Mr. Dameron, I... She would have run out on you in Westchester, taken a cab from your sister's place with her luggage, or she could have come to you and called off the marriage. Mr. Dollar... Now, looking at you and talking to you, anyone would be impressed by the fact that you're a reasonable and understanding man. I am. She could have left you a dozen easier ways, Mr. Dameron, but it doesn't stand to reason that she'd step out of a car on Christmas Eve on the way to a party and disappear. With no luggage, with the clothes on her back, and no more. Women don't do things like that. They want an overnight bag, a change of clothes, somewhere to go to. It doesn't make sense. But that's exactly what she did. They don't do it that way unless there's a mighty good reason. A real guilt edge reason, Mr. Dameron. Something that says what's ahead is better than what's being left. How much did she swipe? What? What did she take? How much? Close to $6,500. Sixty-five hundred. Lovely, sweet, gentle. She took it from the wallet in my overcoat while I was talking to the filling station attendant. I would have given it to her gladly. All of this, everything. But she had to steal it from me. She had to steal it from me like some common little thief. (laughs) There's truly no fool like an old fool. Is there, Mr. Dollar? There'll be another intriguing episode of the Broderick Matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, when the trail really gets hot and goes right down on a police blotter. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. 
Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Bob Steele, Eastern Trust. How's New York? Fine, but I haven't found Lorraine Broderick yet. How about your lead? What was his name? Dameron. He hasn't seen her since Christmas Eve a couple of years ago. She walked out on him with 6,500 bucks. Ah, what now? You, uh, want to keep on with it, Mr. Steele? Sure, we have to pay her off, even if it is only $1,500. But you sound like this was all the farther you want to go. Eh, it might be at that. Oh, what did you say? Look, a sweet old man left a nice little girl, $1,500. Apparently, I'm looking for a grown woman who isn't very nice anymore. Beside the point, isn't it? Yeah, I guess so. Okay, Steele, I'm still on the case. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, New York City, New York. To the Eastern Trust Insurance Company Claims Division, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenditures during my investigation of the Broderick matter. Subject, Lorraine Broderick. Object... To locate her and pay off claim. Results? Disillusioning. More expenses. Item 9. Three bucks. Cab fare. From the plush offices of William Dameron to a filling station out on Long Island. To check his story of Lorraine's disappearance. A major oil company owned and operated the filling station where Lorraine Broderick had last been seen. Their payroll records named three attendants on duty. Christmas Eve, that is, in 1953. Item 10. $28. More cab fare. And don't squawk about it. I located and interviewed all three. Enclosed fine statement of Edward Quinlan. Sure, I remember that chick. Better looking than this picture, I'll tell you that. She drove in with this old guy, uh, Dameron, you said? Yeah. Well, he hadn't been away from the car 20 seconds before she was out walking down the street as fast as she could, long dress and all. When he come back and asked what had happened to her, I told him. So he went and sat in his car for maybe a couple hours waiting for her to come back. I knew she was gone for good. He knew it too, must have. But he waited. I felt sorry for him. Poor old geezer, even if he did drive a kid. She shouldn't have run out on him like that, Christmas Eve and all. Pauline Dameron Whitfield, sister of William Dameron, living up in Westchester County, verified her brother's story. Lorraine Broderick had left all of her clothes and bags at her house. Mrs. Whitfield had not heard from her or seen her since Christmas Eve, 1953. A check of the luggage revealed no information that would be helpful in locating Lorraine Broderick. The following morning at the New York Police Department downtown, I requested a missing persons investigation on Lorraine Broderick. She was booked in under an alias, Jane Brown. When I got to court, she gave her right name, Lorraine Broderick. What was the charge, Sergeant? Misdemeanor, drunk, disturbing a piece. Twenty-five bucks a night court, April 25th, 1953. That the only time she made the blotter? Yep. What's the address, Sergeant? 1346 Yardley. 1346 That's two Yardley, years ago. Thanks. At the address on Yardley, I learned that Lorraine Broderick had moved 18 months before. Again, there was no forwarding address. But the landlady turned out to be quite talkative. 
I'm glad she moved away from here, Mr. Dollar. I'd like to help you find her, but I'm awful glad she moved away. Why do you say that, Mrs. Gaines? Noisy. Parties all the time. I run a quiet place, you know. Yeah, I'm sure you do. When she first come here to rent the apartment, I thought she was the quiet type. Nice. She looked like she was just out of finishing school or something like that. Oh, she couldn't have been more than 20 years old. Well, maybe a little more, 22. She told me she was a secretary and she worked in Manhattan. Well, I let her have the apartment, of course. She paid her rent in advance, in cash. But once she was in, it was a different story. Yeah, yeah. Did, uh, did she tell you where she worked in Manhattan? No. No, she never quite got around to mentioning that. Anyway, she couldn't have worked very hard. All the dates she had, night after night, honestly. Do you happen to know any of them, Mrs. Gaines? I do not. Big, noisy parties. Well, uh, did she go with any particular man? A smart little girl like that sticking to just one man? I don't know whether she was very smart at all. Was she friendly with anybody in the building? Nope. Any idea where she might have gone from here? Nope. All I can say is I'm glad she don't live here no more. I went back to police headquarters. It had occurred to me that hardly anyone is ever arrested for being drunk and disturbing the peace alone. I was right. The night court files revealed that Lorraine Broderick had been arrested with five other people. Three men and two women. I took down their names and began to check them out. Number three down the line was a man named Tyler in the hosiery business. Yes, he remembered Lorraine Broderick very well. No, he hadn't seen her for six months, but he could tell me where she lived. He'd seen her going in and out of an apartment on 61st Street several times. He gave me the address. The boy will take your bags. Will he? Yes, sir. May I help you? I'm looking for a Miss Lorraine Broderick. Broderick? Yes. I'm sorry, sir. We have no one by that name registered here. That's funny. I thought at first you were going to say Lorraine Bradley. We had a Mrs. Bradley here at one time. Oh. Did Mrs. Bradley look anything like this picture? Yes, that's Mrs. Bradley. Bradley, huh? How long ago did she move out? Uh, four months ago, anyhow. Do you have her forwarding address? Uh, no, sir, I don't. I wish I did. Huh? Mrs. Bradley wrote us a bad check for her rent. We've been trying to locate her. Did you report it to the police? Yes, sir. I understand she's been quite active along those lines. They're looking for her, too. For the third time in one day, I was back at police headquarters, this time inquiring about a Lorraine Bradley. There were five wants on her for passing bad checks. Gave it up about four months ago here in New York, looks like. Then we got a buzzer from Chicago. She was there for a couple of weeks. Wrote about $600 in wallpaper. San Francisco people are looking for her, too. Uh, here's something came in yesterday. Last job in Santa Barbara three days ago. Expense account item 11, $4.05. One long-distance phone call to Mr. Steele at Eastern Trust in Hartford. Using the name Bradley, huh? Yeah, it's probably just a phony. No record of a marriage in New York City to anyone that name. I looked. What's wrong with her, anyhow? I don't know. Well, you better get out to the coast and find out. Item 12, $38, hotel, board, and miscellaneous while in New York City. Item 13, $258.60, New York to Santa Barbara. A little town by the Pacific that impressed me is not caring one thing about the rest of the world. Sun, sea, a pleasantly crowded harbor, some sprawling hotels, two lush green golf courses, and acres and acres of smug, expensive homes. At the police station, a Sergeant Martin was out, so I went over to the harbor inn to meet the latest victim of Lorraine Broderick's talents, a hotel operator named Harrington. Tall, gray-haired, slack, sports shirt, suntan, and sandals. I, uh, I suppose I'm avoiding this business and your questions because I still feel quite chagrined about this whole thing. Pretty understandable, Mr. Harrington. On the face of it, you, you'd think I'd been in the hotel business 30 seconds instead of 30 years, the way she took me. Well, if it's any comfort, she's done the same thing in several cities and as many hotels. <sighs> no comfort, thank you. She was that good, huh? Brother, she was the best. She pranced in here as big as life. Probably didn't have a nickel in the purse. What's more, for the whole four days she was here, she didn't break stride once. Only the best of everything. Uh-huh. I see, she, uh, she gave you a check for $813. Is that right? Painfully right. <laughs> and I took it. No questions. <laughs> Every night in the dining room, she'd order champagne, special dishes... Give you some idea of how she carried on? Yeah, I get the idea. 
I've seen my share of grifters and bad check artists, but she tops them all. Perfume, clothes, luggage, conversation. Can I ask you a question? I'm humiliated already. Go ahead. She checked in here alone, registered as Mrs. Lorraine Bradley, Beverly Hills, right? That's right. Well, now, didn't it strike you as odd that a woman would check in a place like this, a resort hotel, alone, stay four days and uh, meet no one, see no one? You're wrong. She didn't keep to herself. Became friends with at least half a dozen guests in the place. And the way she was throwing my money around, why not? She picked up all the tabs. She threw me off right from the start. Let's talk about that. Start at the top, please. Well, she showed up last Wednesday night in a cab loaded down with luggage. Probably wrote a bad check for that someplace. Probably. She, uh, she came swinging into the lobby with the cabbie following her. Told the night clerk she wanted to see me. When I came down the stairs, she yelled, Harry, ran up, kissed me, asked me how my wife was. <laughs> you beat that. No. One of those tricks that your mind plays on you, I suppose. I, uh, I actually thought I did remember her from somewhere. Pretty good. What was her story? Uh, she said she was on her way back from Lake Tahoe. Wanted to rest up. Something about just getting a divorce, being awarded 3000 a month alimony. That impressed me. It would impress anyone, Mr. Harrington. Did she make up any kind of a story about where she'd met you before? No, no, no story. But I got the impression, and of course she saw to it, that she had stopped here before. I wasn't altogether a boob. I, I did check her home address in Beverly Hills. There was a Robert Bradley listed there, same address she gave Later on, I found out that he's in Europe with his wife and children. But his name was in the book. Oh, yes. Say, so getting back to that part about her being familiar. That's just a good trick on her part, Dollar. I did think I'd known her from somewhere, and, well, she also arranged it so that I was too embarrassed to ask her specifically. <laughs> and, all honesty, I, I suppose I wanted to have known her. Can you explain that? She was about the most beautiful thing I ever saw. She walked through that door right now and told me none of this was true. I probably believe her. Mm -hmm. Do you have a copy of her hotel account? I'd like to look it over. Why? Oh, well, the phone calls mostly. Maybe she contacted someone we can trace. Mm -mm. No, no phone calls. Here. This check was drawn on a bank in Beverly Hills. Was it personalized? No. <laughs> Maybe I should have thought something of that. Huh? No, not particularly. Well, here's this much. I, I can't stand to look it over. It makes me kind of sick. $813. I spent another hour with Mr. Harrington as he distastefully covered the items on the bill she'd paid for with that bad check. Later that afternoon, I met with Sergeant Martin, Santa Barbara Police, who reported that a woman answering Lorraine's description had passed bad checks in Burlingame, Santa Maria, and Ojai, California. Expense account item 14, $102.85. Transportation to Monterey and Santa Cruz, where I interviewed two other hotel managers who had filed complaints. Their stories were pretty much the same as Harrington's, down to the pretended familiarity, the divorce, and alimony details. Item 15, $4.15, long-distance phone call, Steele again in Hartford. That you, Johnny? Yeah, Mr. Steele. I've been hopping around all over the state. Policeman in Santa Barbara called here trying to find you, Sergeant Martin. He says he's got a line on her. Huh? He's done it again. Hop down to Malibu Beach. The man who runs the seaside in there found out her check was bad 15 minutes after she left. Now get started. You shouldn't be more than an hour behind her. Mr. Steele, I'm on my way. There'll be another intriguing episode of the Broderick Matter tomorrow. Tomorrow... A long look at what seven years can do to a woman's life. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by John Dawson. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dollar, my name's King, Malibu Sheriff Station. Did you leave a message here? Oh, yes, sir. I understand you're looking for Lorraine Broderick. Broderick or Bradley, whatever name she's using. We want her. I'm looking for her, too. Well, what's your connection? I'm an insurance investigator. We've been trying to find her all the way from Hartford. We have to pay off a claim that's due her. Claim? Yeah, that's right. An old man left her $1,500. Uh, she doesn't deserve it, not that one. I can't tell him that. He's dead. I'm expecting a little action on it pretty quick. like to be in on it. Come on over. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, Malibu Beach, California. To the Eastern Trust Insurance Company Claims Division, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Broderick matter. More expenses, item 15, $38 even, more transportation. My trip here to Malibu Beach, where I didn't even bother listening to another disgruntled hotel proprietor repeat a bad check story I knew only too well. I went directly to the sheriff's station and Deputy King. Well, that's about the picture, Mr. Dollar. Lorraine Bradley was at the end of four days and checked out this morning. Use the name Bradley. Lorraine Bradley. She can't be too far ahead of you now. I hope not. This has been a long, rough chase. While she was at the inn, she took up with one of our local residents, a man named Joe Tappan, who lives over in the beach colony. We know this much. He drove her into town this morning when she checked out of the inn. Have you talked to this man Tappan yet? He hasn't come back yet. When did she leave the inn? Oh, about ten this morning. Uh Uh-huh. After two now. Uh, It gives him just about time. He has a house over in the colony. We've got a man there. Colony? Uh, Down the road a piece. They call it that because a lot of movie stars built beach homes there 25 or 30 years ago. Movie colony, right in the beach. Oh, this Tappan, is he an actor? Yeah, when he gets work, which isn't very often. Mainly, he keeps suntan. Excuse me. Sure. Yeah, this king. Oh. Good, right away. Tappan just drove up to his house. Let's go. I went with Deputy King to talk with Joe Tappan. He turned out to be a healthy, muscular man in his mid-thirties. By the time we got there, he was in trunks and sunglasses, sitting on a porch at the front of his house. He was a little stunned by the news we brought him. What? The rain of phony. Are you sure about this, Sheriff? That's the man at the seaside inn. Oh, no. No, I don't believe it. Is this Lorraine? Go ahead, look at it. Well, that... Looks like Lorraine. Yes, but I can't be sure. She's older. Well, I mean, the girl in this picture's pretty young. It's her, all right. Mr. Dollar's been looking all over the country for her. Hartford, New York City, up and down this coast. Well, come on. Let's go up to the house. I thought I knew her pretty well. How long did you know her, Mr. Tappan? Well, not long, but I knew her. I really did. When did you meet her? The first night she checked into the seaside inn. Four days, then. Yeah. Uh, want something to drink? No. No, thanks. Well, I think I'll have... No, 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 I, I don't want to talk about her. We have to talk about her, Mr. Tappan. But I'm sure there's some explanation of, about the check. She'd have to explain quite a few checks. Right, Dollar? Yeah, that's about it. Mr. Tappan, I understand you drove her into Los Angeles this morning. Uh, that's right. I took her to the Beverly Glen Hotel. Did she check in there? No, she just dumped her luggage. She told me she didn't know whether or not she'd have to go to Chicago tonight. Something about a house she owned there that had to be rented or sold. Uh Uh-huh. Did you leave her there at the Beverly Glen? Uh, No. She made a phone call and said that she had to meet her lawyer. Did she say where? A bar in Hollywood. Uh, The Topper, I think it was, on Coinga Boulevard. I drove her over there and left her. When was this? A couple of hours ago, I guess. About noon. How was she dressed? Black, strapless... Wore a first stole. Did she mention any names, tell you anything about herself? Oh, yes. She told me that six months ago, a little boy was killed in an automobile accident. He was only two years old. She said that was the thing that broke up her marriage to this Bradley. Uh-huh. And she told me that she needed to believe in something again. Uh, someone. And that she needed someone to believe in her. 
Well, there wasn't any little boy or any husband, Mr. Tappan. There have been a couple of men I've talked to, a dentist in Hartford, a businessman in New York, who felt the same way as you do about her. Well, even with what you told me, I believe what she said. Why, why she cried a little when she was telling me. Oh, I, I don't care how you look at me. I, I don't think that anyone could invent a story that tragic without some sort of basis. A good liar can see a story in a newspaper like that one and adapt it for his own needs. But I am an actor, sir, and I can tell when other people are acting. She wasn't. She... She... Well, go on, Mr. Tappan. Look, I've got a suggestion for you. Uh, what's your name? Dollar. I've got a suggestion for you. Try believing what people tell you sometime. It'll do something for that habit you have of bearing down with your eyes. Okay, the next time I have two weeks off. What? See you, Mr. Tappan. I drove into Hollywood with Deputy King. At the Beverly Glen Hotel, a worried clerk was still wondering what to do with the 14 pieces of luggage Lorraine Broderick had deposited there earlier. No, she was not registered at the hotel. No, she hadn't phoned in and given him any instructions. Deputy King made arrangements for a man to cover the lobby in case she showed up to claim her things, and we went into the topper. What with me, gentlemen? Police. I'd like to talk to the man who was on duty here at noon today. Oh, that's me, sir. Is anything wrong? Now, this is Mr. Dollar. We're trying to locate a woman who's been using the name Lorraine Bradley. We were told she was in here around noon today. Nope, I don't recognize that name, sir. About 5'5", five, five, dark brown hair, brown eyes, 24 years old, wore a black strapless summer dress and a stole. Ah, uh, the 24... No, no, nobody like that in all day. No, sir, noon is a pretty slow time, sir. I'd have noticed if anybody like that came in, I think. Have you been on duty all that time? I came on at 10, that's when we opened. Are you sure this is the right place, the topper? Now, this is the place. Well, I wish I could help you, sir, but I'm sorry. Excuse me, will you? Yes, sir, will you? Well, we struck out. One thing. What's that? That luggage is the Beverly Glen. Yeah. We'll keep an eye on it. Lorraine Broderick did not return to the Beverly Glen Hotel that day to claim her luggage. The lobby was watched around the clock. Her description was on the Daily Bullet, and every policeman in Los Angeles was on the lookout for her. I spent my time thinking about the little girl who had helped an old man sell newspapers one afternoon years ago. A little girl with a face like an angel. I didn't feel good about this case. But Joe Tappan felt worse when I went to see him again. Well. Hi. Mind if I come in? What now, Mr. Dollar? Your girlfriend. What about her? I've been thinking about what you told us. So? So maybe you didn't understand what I told you. Now, look I'm here. not pushing my weight around, Tappan. But it seems to me you're a little stubborn in what you want to believe about her. How old did she tell you her baby was that she lost in a car accident? Two years old. All right. Two years ago, she was working for a dentist in Hartford, Connecticut. He was pretty much in love with her. She left him flat to take up with a man in the brokerage business in New York. She left him flat. Took $6,500 when she did it. There wasn't any baby in her life then. Her name was Lorraine Broderick. It still is. Now, would you like to see my file on her? I brought it along. No, thanks. I thought I'd better prove that part was a lie. So you proved it. Mind if I sit down? Help yourself. Thanks. Do you have anything else to tell me? I suppose I do, Mr. Tappan, since you don't seem to want to tell me anything. Now, just sit down, please. I've heard every man who knew her describe her. And I think I can understand why they feel the way they do. All I've got is a picture from a high school annual taken when she was 17. That was pretty good. She's 24 now. She must be seven years better. Anyhow, you're my only hope now. What? Lorraine Broderick can get away from the police for a while. Oh, yeah. She's smart and clever, and she can go right on doing the same thing she's been doing all along. Stealing, writing bad checks. But that's police business. My part is to find her and give her something one man left her, an insurance bequest. But it's become more than that now, to find her and stop her, maybe. Look, they'll get her eventually, Tappan. Do you know what five years in prison can do to a woman like her? Do you? Well, because I know her and she passed a few bad checks doesn't mean that I'm responsible in any way. You're right, it doesn't. But you're involved just the same. Oh, you're different from just some hotel man who's been tilted. You're a boyfriend... True, just a four-day boyfriend. But a woman like Lorraine Broderick can do a lot of damage in four days' time. Why are you here? 
What do you want? I'm here to disillusion you, Tappan, because I don't think you're disillusioned enough. Now, just You're a perfect stranger to me. I don't know you from a Grand Rapids chair, but I'm doing you a favor talking to you about Lorraine Broderick. I'm doing you a favor telling you she's a crook and a thief and a forger, and everything she ever told you was a lie. Now and then, a woman walks into a man's life that he'd sell his soul for. But all she'll do in return is write you a bad check for it. She's trouble in a great big way, Tappan. You know it as well as I do. Well, what do you want me to do? Apologize for meeting her? I'll be satisfied if you tell me where she is. What? And stop lying. Now, now, now look here. I've listened to all Lorraine I want to Lorraine Broderick never went to that bar in Hollywood you were talking about yesterday. You didn't drop her off there. No one there has ever seen her. And she's the kind who could walk around the polo grounds with 50,000 other people and still be seen. Now, where did you take her? Where is she now? Uh... Could it, um, could it be fixed so she wouldn't know I told you? I suppose so. She's at the Wentmore downtown, registered under the name of Evelyn Brady. Oh, this, this beats me, Dollar. I just don't understand it. What do you mean? How what you told me is true, I know that. But an hour ago, she called me up here and she said, Joe, I love you. Now, that sounded true, too. And I told her that I loved her. Now I'm turning her in. <laughs> what kind of crazy world do we live in? Expense account item 16, $14. Cab fare from Malibu to downtown Los Angeles in the Wentmore Hotel. A second-rate old-timer on Figueroa Street. A little different from the swank spots where Lorraine Broderick had lived so gaily. The clerk told me she was in 1302. I walked down the hall to Lorraine Broderick's room. The door was standing partially open. All of the lights seemed to be on. Hello? Hello? Hello, anybody? Oh, huh? Get out of this room! What? Get away! You're out, John! I'd found Lorraine Broderick at last. Only she was standing on a ledge outside the window, all ready for a leap into eternity. There'll be another intriguing episode of the Broderick matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, the end of the trail. For me... And for Lorraine Broderick. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Room 1302. This is the desk clerk. I have a call here. Never mind the call. You call the police. You call the what? Call the police and tell them to hurry. There's an attempted suicide up here. Who is this? Shut up and do as I tell you. Now, just a minute. It won't do you any good. It won't do you any good at all. Wait a minute. Police. You, who cares? I'm going to jump. Anyhow. <laughs> Anyhow. 
Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, Los Angeles, California. To the Eastern Trust Insurance Company Claims Division, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Broderick matter. An old man in Hartford died and left $1,500 insurance money to a little girl who had been nice to him one afternoon back in 1943. My job, get the money to her. Even if she might take it and jump off the 13th floor ledge of a building. Don't. Don't come any closer. I'll jump. Lorraine. Don't come any closer. It's cold out there. Don't you think you should come inside? I'm going to jump. Stay away now. Don't try to grab me. All right. All right, I'll do anything you say, Lorraine. Okay. What are you doing? Taking off my coat. Standing out there, it must be cold. Here. You take my coat. Don't come close. I'm not. I don't want your coat. All right, Lorraine. I never saw you before in my life. How do you know my name? I've seen you. No, you haven't. I remember people. Watch out. Just going to light a cigarette. I can light a cigarette, can I? Do you want one? No. Can I have one? Suit yourself. Are you a policeman? No. Where did you see me? In a picture. In your high school annual at St. Charles. St. Charles? What do you know about St. Charles? What's your name? Johnny Dollar. Are you from Hartford? Yes. Let me see your face in the light. Over there. Don't come near this window. Don't come near I'll jump right down there. That's right there. No, you aren't from Hartford. I never knew you. You're lying to me. No, I'm not. As room clerk of this hotel, I'm entitled to know... Oh. Go away! Get out of here! Get out of here, I'll jump! What? Get out. Go on, go on, go on, get out. Yes, yes. Did you call the police? Uh, no, uh, but I will. I heard you tell him about the police. I don't care. They can't stop me. Nobody can stop me. No. no I suppose not, Lorraine. You can jump any time you want to. I can't stop you. I wanted somebody to call the police. I want them all down there. When the crowd's big enough, I'll jump. And I'm not afraid to do it. I'm not afraid. I know that. Lorraine, why don't you come away from the edge? I won't hurt you. Everybody hurts me. You would, too. Why do you want to jump, Lorraine? I have my reasons. Look! Look! There's a couple of people down there who see me. They're looking up here. They'd like to see me jump. Look, they're stopping other people. They'd all like to see me jump. I don't think they'd like to see that at all, Lorraine. Oh, yes, they would. Those people down there would love to see it happen. You'd like it, too. No. No, I wouldn't. I want you to live, Lorraine. You're afraid, aren't you? Yes, I am. Why? Why? Dying is something all of us face. If you die here tonight, it makes me a little afraid of dying. I don't like to be afraid of anything. Neither do I. You must be afraid of something. I'm not afraid of anything. I've never been afraid of anything. I'm going to jump down there, and that proves I'm not afraid. I don't believe you, Lorraine. I think you were afraid to love Dr. Pollard in Hartford. I think you were afraid to marry William Dameron in New York City. I think you've been afraid of everything and everybody that was good for you for a long, long time. Don't come closer. Would you like to talk to a priest, Lorraine? No. Look, sometimes a priest can help you when you're, you're all mixed... I'm so worried I'm going to jump off here any minute. You'd say anything or try anything. I don't even know what you're doing here, why you came here. I told you, Lorraine, I've been looking for you. Tell him to go back. Tell him to go back or I'll jump. Go back, go back. Go on back. Tracy, pulls it back. All right, they aren't coming. I don't want anybody here. A lot more people down there in the street now. Oh, they're getting the big lights up here. Golly. Lorraine. 
Look at me. Look toward me. What? I want to help you, Lorraine. Nobody wants to help me. Nobody's ever wanted to help me. You're wrong. Then why did Mama and Daddy die? Why did they have to die? Why did Uncle Jim die? Why was I left alone? Why didn't I have anybody? You did have somebody. You had Dr. Pollard if you wanted him. You had William Dameron. Did you meet William? Yes, sure, last week. He's still very much in love with you, Lorraine. After I stole money from him and, and walked out on him? Oh, the money meant nothing to him. He still loves you, Lorraine. He told me so. I don't love him. I never loved him. He thought so. He was just nice. Why did you leave him that way? I'm no good. I never have been. You know. I've never been any good to anybody. You're lying to me about him. Would you like to talk to Dameron? I can get him on the phone. No. I don't want to talk to him or to anybody I know. But after I jump, you can tell him something for me. Sure. Tell him I meant to send the money back to him. I didn't... You can tell him I loved him. He'd feel good if you told him that, I think. All right. Go back! I don't care who you are! Go back or I'll jump right now! Wait! Close that hall door. If you want to see me jump, you'll have to watch from the street. Down there with the others! Close it! Was he a policeman? I suppose so. I don't know. He looked foolish. Oh, Lord, he looked foolish. Yeah, well, uh, we all look foolish at one time or another. It passes. Do I look foolish? Yes. Yeah, you look foolish. You're not going through with this. You know that for the first time in my life, I know exactly what I want to do. How I want to do it. I'm going to jump. Somebody's on the roof out here. They have a net. A big net. From what I know about you, I thought you always knew pretty much what you wanted to do in life. Oh, that's funny. Oh, that's very funny. I knew what I wanted in life. I never knew anything. And it's all botched up. Mom and Daddy died. I should have died, too. I should have been with Mom and Daddy when they were killed in the car. Well, it won't be long. I'll be with them. I won't be tired anymore pretty soon. Those men with a net up there. Lorraine, wait. Wait for what? You said you talked to people who've known me, who know what I was and what I am. Well, I didn't turn out the way they wanted me to, did I? I didn't even turn out the way I wanted to be. Look at me. Why should I wait? One man had more faith in you than anybody else. To try no more than that. He was an man. old man named John Smith. He sold papers back in Hartford. Old John Smith. Lorraine, I think I, I better... you met him one day when you were a little girl. You helped him sell his papers one afternoon. It meant a lot in his life, an awful lot. Do you remember him? No. You were 11 years old. You lived on Cushing Street. Yes. I, I went downtown after school one day to look in the windows. I had a nickel and I bought a paper from that old man. He had tobacco juice on his lips. I talked to him. He told me all about selling papers. He said I was a very nice little girl. He asked me my name and where I lived. We talked about school and about growing up. He told me I'd grow up someday and be a lovely woman. He said, lovely woman. He was very nice. He was the nicest man I ever knew. And I only knew him that one afternoon. Where is he? He's dead, Lorraine. Dead? He left you all his money. Insurance money. It comes to $1,500. You're lying. No, Lorraine. He wanted you to have it. He worked very hard and sacrificed a great deal to make sure you'd have it. You're making all this up. It's all a lie. Only that afternoon. It was an important afternoon. Here, look. What? Don't come closer. 
These prove I'm from the insurance company. Here, here's the check. Throw them over. All right. Go ahead. Pick them up. I won't make a move. What do you think now? That old man. That poor old man. That poor old man. Easy. Easy. Expense account item 17, 550, martinis. I needed them. It was my first and I hope my last half hour with an intended suicide. Attach find insurance check payable to Lorraine Broderick for $1,500. The psychiatrist who examined her believed that she will make a complete recovery in time. Until such time, she's not classified as a responsible person. I notified two parties of the events at the Wentmore Hotel. One, Mr. William Dameron in New York City, who arrived in Los Angeles yesterday morning. Two, Joseph Tappan, who has already secured legal counsel for Lorraine Broderick when she answers the bad check charges against her. As you know, in matters like this, restitution is usually preferred to prosecution. Expense account item 18, $185, transportation back to Hartford. Total, $1,132.14. Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. Remember, please, there'll be another intriguing story for you beginning next Monday night. Next week, the Cronin matter. A matter of keeping a sweet old lady from carefully and deliberately losing her life. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Eleanor Audley, Barbara Eiler, Virginia Gregg, Carlton Young, Harry Bartell, Herbert Ellis, John Daner, Marvin Miller, Tony Barrett, Frank Gerstle, Chester Stratton, and Lawrence Dobkin. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. George Atkins at Northwest Indemnity. Oh, hiya, Georgie. How'd you like to go to New York, Johnny, and get into the game mad world of the theater? Thanks a lot, Georgie, but no thanks. I'm not the grease paint type. I know, but Amy Bradshaw is. Amy Bradshaw? Yeah, we wrote a policy on her a couple years ago. Look, if it's her autograph you want, why send me? It's not that simple. Anyhow, she's got all the fans she wants. I know. I'm one of them. I think she's great. Johnny, looks like somebody's trying to kill her. Georgie, I'll be right over. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dalton.
Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Northwestern Indemnity Alliance, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Amy Bradshaw matter. Expense account item one, $16.50. Transportation and incidentals to New York City. I checked in at a hotel and then went over to the Criterion Theater on West 44th, where Amy was starring in a play called The Unguarded Hour. David Coleman, the director, was standing in the wings watching the third act on stage. David Coleman? Yes? I'm Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator, sent over by Northwestern Indemnity. Oh, uh, yes, Mr. Dollar, I called them. Uh, let's go over here where we can talk. Okay. How's the play going? Well, 22 weeks now. I've been going along just fine until this business came up. How did it start? Last evening, just before curtain time, I dropped by Amy's dressing room. She looked, well, strange. How so? Pale, trembling. She was staring at a note in her hand that sounded like some sort of crank note. Do you know, uh, you are an evil woman. You will be punished by sudden death, unquote. Have you reported this to the police? Oh, no. Uh, I was afraid that if I did, it might get into the papers, and we don't want that kind of publicity. I see. How about if I talk to Amy after the show? I told her you'd be down, and she'll talk to you. All good. Well... Uh, Mr. Dollar, the strain of this whole thing's beginning to show up in her performance. She's making mistakes, and it rattles the cast, especially the young ingenue, or Sheila Mitchell. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll see what I can do. There's always the possibility that it is just a crank note and that Amy will never hear any more of it. Well, that's what I'm hoping. But we might as well face another possibility. That somebody close to Amy is using the crank note as a cover. Has that thought ever occurred to you? Why, no. No, it hasn't, Mr. Dollar. We will continue with the Bradshaw matter in a moment. Friends, how'd you like to thrill your favorite youngster with some of the most exciting toys of the year? Picture the breathless excitement of any child surrounded by six gaily colored balloon-like giant animals up to three feet long, and all for the low, low price of just one dollar. Now, first you get Bounce-O the Clown with round pot belly and funny nose. Next comes Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo. Third, there's Roscoe the Roller Skating Bear. He's two feet tall and looks almost like real. Fourth, there's Whitey the Fat Indoor Snowman. And fifth, Mortimer the Giant Mouse, 18 inches long and sure to scare the whiskey off any cat. That's five different giant animals. But now, hold your breath for the most sensational toy of all, the star of the whole Christmas season, the jolly giant talking Santa Claus, guaranteed to make everybody's Christmas a merrier one. He's a big roly-poly happy Santa. He stands erect on two legs, is actually over three feet tall and 32 inches around. Best of all, he actually talks. Just pull the tape and he says, Merry Christmas for all to hear. He's the biggest, merriest talking as Santa ever. Sure to please your youngsters and spread good cheer. Yes, Giant Santa proves there really is a Santa Claus. That's a total of six giant animals made of brightly colored, preformed, sturdy latex, which the kids can easily inflate. And the cost? Just one dollar, not for each. Just one dollar for all six of these lovable giants who'll turn your home into a circus parade. And here's a surprise. Mail your order today and you'll also receive absolutely free Peter the Rabbit, actually over two feet tall with big red ears almost nine inches long. But you must send now. Rush one dollar plus ten cents for packing and mailing for each set you want to Giant Animals Box 1580 Grand Central Station, New York City. If not delighted with every one of your seven giant animals, return them to the Super Animals Company for a full refund. But keep the giant talking sat as our gift. Order now. Supplies are limited. Rush $1.10 for packing and mailing for each set in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 1580, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's $1 plus 10 cents with your name and address. Mail to Giant Animals, Box 1580, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's Giant Animals, Box 1580, Grand Central Station, New York City. I waited for Amy Bradshaw in her dressing room at the theater. Fifteen minutes later, after the final curtain, she swept in. Oh, there you are, Mr. Dollar. I'd never seen her from closer than the 15th row before, and needless to say, I was impressed. But I didn't have a chance to say so. I didn't have a chance to say anything. Oh, well, that's the way it goes. If you'll just give me a minute to get some of this makeup off. Now? Now. Hi. Hi. I knew it was only a question of time until you ran down. Oh, I'm sorry. I guess I get a little overcharged out on the stage. Sure. Listen, it's nice meeting you, Mr. Dollar, and I know why you've come down here, but I think you're wasting your time. Oh? Yeah. 
This whole thing's really pretty silly, you know. I hope so, Miss Bradshaw. You mean Amy. Okay, Amy. Say, look, uh, how about having a drink with me somewhere? We can talk about it. I'd love to, but I'm afraid I have a date tonight. Could we make it tomorrow, maybe? Sure, okay, any time. Excuse me. Come in. Oh, Mike. Oh, hello, Amy. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't know you had company. That's all right. This is Johnny Dollar. Johnny, Mike Pomeroy, my agent. Mr. Pomeroy, how are you? What would you think of it tonight, Mike? Well, they seem to like it okay. Oh. Uh, tell you what, Amy, I'll see you tomorrow, eh? Uh, tomorrow, Mike? I've got a few things I've got to take care of tonight. Uh, contracts to go over, you know, th- things like that. I... Oh, of course. Well, glad to meet you, Dollar. Uh, night, Amy. Is that offer of a drink still good, Johnny? Well, sure, but I thought you said you have... Oh, oh, sure, let's go. Thanks for understanding. Anywhere in particular? There's a little place right down the street, small and quiet. Good. Oh. What's the matter? Would you mind if we crossed the stage and went out the other door? Oh, no. Why? I think someone's waiting for me outside this exit. Oh. It's sort of a friend of mine, Porter Kane, but he can be a little wearing, and I'm rather tired. Sure. I could see him through the open door. A thin-faced, rather elegant-looking man in a black Homburg. We went out the other side and down the street to a bar a few doors away. Item two on expense account, four dollars, drinks. After the first one, Amy relaxed a little. I wanted to get her talking about herself, and it wasn't too tough to do. There's not really much to tell about me. I've been acting a long time. Sometimes it seems too long. I've come a long way. Some people would say up. I hope it is. (laughs) You make it sound pretty simple, Amy. I guess we do what we have to. All of us. I had to act, so. So, just like that, huh? (laughs) Just like that. You've always gotten everything you wanted, haven't you? I think so. Hasn't anyone ever gotten in your way? No, Johnny, that's never happened. If it did... It looks to me like somebody's standing in your way right now. What do you mean? That threatening letter you got the other day. I told you. The whole thing's silly. There's nothing to it. Now, that's what you told me, but I don't think you believe it. Okay. So maybe I have worried a little about it. I, I wouldn't have if it hadn't been... No, it was probably only my imagination. What was, Amy? Well, last night after the show, I felt like walking a little. I went west on 44th Street to Times Square, and as usual, it was crowded. I stood on the curb waiting for the light to change, and suddenly I got shoved out into the street. Oh? Right out into the traffic. I jumped back just in time. You see who did it? How can you tell in a crowd like that? I know. It was probably only coincidence that it happened right after I got that note, but... Oh, Johnny, I, I still just can't believe anybody is really trying to do me harm, but... I guess... What's been making me nervous during the performance is staring out at that blackness past the footlights, wondering if there's somebody out there who hates me. Uh Uh-huh. I guess I can't stand being hated, Johnny. I've got to be loved. Look, Amy, did it ever occur to you this might not be a crank out in the audience, that it might be someone closer to you? What? Johnny, that's impossible. Is it? I don't have many friends. They've mostly to do with the play, but those I have are good ones. Who else besides your agent, Pomeroy? How about the director? David Coleman. He's a very old friend and one of the best. How about the producer? Emery's the last person in the world who'd wish me harm. On a dollars and cents basis, if nothing else, he and Dora both. Dora? His wife. I like her very much. Does she like you? Why shouldn't she? What about this man you wanted to duck tonight, the one who was waiting outside the theater? Porter Kane. Oh, he's... A sort of a fan, I guess. A little eccentric, maybe, but he's been very good to me. Johnny, really, it couldn't be any of them. Maybe, maybe not. Look, Amy, I was sent down here because Northwestern Indemnity holds a policy on you. I know. Now, who's the beneficiary? William York. Who's he? My husband. You're... Oh, I didn't know you were married. We separated six months ago. What I wanted, he didn't. What he wanted, I didn't. It's as simple as that. Well, where is he now? Here in New York somewhere, I guess. I don't know. He's a writer, sort of. Johnny, I'm tired. Oh, yeah, sure, you must be. I'm sorry I kept you so long. Oh, no, I didn't mean that. It's been nice. Very nice. It's funny. 
I seem to relax a little when I'm with you. We left that one lay and went outside. Item three on expense account, two dollars, taxi to Amy's apartment. There was a car parked two doors down with a man just sitting in it. I saw Amy give it a quick look. Then as she said goodnight to me at the door, I noticed that she slipped the catch on it. I sauntered across the street and stepped into the shadows. A moment later, the door of the parked car opened and her agent, Mike Pomeroy, got out and went into the apartment house. Then I realized I wasn't the only one watching this. Half a block down the street, I could see a figure in a shadowy doorway. I ran toward him, but he took off around the corner. When I reached the corner, he was nowhere in sight. Amy might have been taking this thing only half seriously, but I was real serious about it now. She said she had some very nice friends. But I had a strong hunch that one of these very nice friends was out to kill her. Johnny Dollar will be back in a moment to tell you about tomorrow's episode. Friends, send for your set of some of the most exciting toys of the year. Six giant inflatable toys for only one dollar. Some up to three feet tall. You get Bounceo the Happy Clown, Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo, Roscoe the two feet long roller skating bear, Whitey the fat indoor snowman, Mortimer the giant mouse 18 inches long, and last but not least, the great giant talking Santa. A roly-poly giant over three feet tall and 32 inches around the belly that actually says Merry Christmas out loud when you pull the tape. That's six sensational giant toys for only one dollar, made of sturdy, gaily colored latex that the kids can easily inflate. Send one dollar for each set to Giant Animals, Box 1580, Grand Central Station, New York City. And if you order right now, you get Peter the Rabbit over two feet tall absolutely free. If not delighted with your giant animals, your money refunded immediately. Order today, you may never hear this offer again. Rush $1 plus 10 cents for packing and mailing in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 1580, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's $1 plus 10 cents for each set with your name and address to Giant Animals, Box 1580, Grand Central Station, New York City. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of the Amy Bradshaw Matter. Tomorrow, the Criterion Theater again, and a third-act curtain that wasn't in the script. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by Robert Reif. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station. For the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Al Sintella down at Precinct Headquarters, Johnny. Oh, hi, Al. Sorry I missed your call a few minutes ago. What's on your mind? An actress named Amy Bradshaw. Amy? One of my favorites. Me too. But right now I seem to be looking for a guy who doesn't feel that way about her. Huh? Al, it looks like somebody's trying to kill Amy Bradshaw. Better come down here and tell me all about it. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, New York City. To the Northwestern Indemnity Alliance, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Amy Bradshaw matter. The threat of an attempt on her well-insured life. Expense account item 5, $1.75. Cab from my hotel to precinct headquarters to talk to Detective Lieutenant Al Centella. Al looked about the same as the last time I'd seen him. Rugged, competent, maybe a few pounds heavier. Sit down, Johnny, sit down. Thanks. 
Something about Amy Bradshaw, you said. Yeah. Didn't know you were a friend of hers. Northwestern Indemnity holds a $25,000 life insurance policy on her. Here, take a look at this note. Amy got it several days ago. You are evil. You will be punished by sudden death. Oh, come on now, Johnny. A couple of nights ago, after the show, somebody shoved Amy off the curb and out into the traffic over in Times Square. Well, the same thing happens to me almost every time I'm around Times Square. You know what I smell in all this? Oh, sure. You probably smell a publicity stuff. I sure do. You think I'd fall for a thing like that? You know Amy Bradshaw very long? No. I'd seen her in a few shows, but last night was the first time I'd ever met her in person. If I didn't know you pretty well, I'd say you might be getting a little stage struck on her. Uh Uh-huh. What about the man who trailed Amy to her apartment last night? Oh? Who? I don't know. I chased him, but he had too much of a lead on me. I still wouldn't go jumping to any conclusions. Who you got to work on, for instance? Well, for one, David Coleman, her director. Then there's the producer, Emery Taylor, and his wife, Dora. From what Amy said, I gather Dora doesn't like her very well. Anybody else? Then there's her agent, Mike Pomeroy. She seems to be pretty wrapped up in him. Old stable fool, huh? Yeah, looks like it. Also, a fellow named Porter Kane, who was usually hanging around the theater waiting for Amy. And finally, the man I really came to talk to you about. Who's that? Name is Bill York, her husband, but they're separated. Oh? She doesn't know where he is. You figure he might tie in somehow? He is the beneficiary of Amy's insurance policy. Well, I'll see if I can turn up an address on him for you. Okay, thanks, Al. In the meantime, I think I'll pay a call on this Porter Kane. See if I can find out just how good a fan he is. We will continue with the Bradshaw matter in a moment. Friends, how'd you like to thrill your favorite youngster with some of the most exciting toys of the year? Picture the breathless excitement of any child surrounded by six gaily colored balloon-like giant animals up to three feet long, and all for the low, low price of just one dollar. Now, first you get Bounce-O the Clown with round pot belly and funny nose. Next comes Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo. Third, there's Roscoe the Roller Skating Bear. He's two feet tall and looks almost like real. Fourth, there's Whitey the Fat Indoor Snowman. And fifth, Mortimer the Giant Mouse, 18 inches long and sure to scare the whiskers off any cat. That's five different giant animals. But now, hold your breath for the most sensational toy of all, the star of the whole Christmas season, the jolly giant talking Santa Claus, guaranteed to make everybody's Christmas a merrier one. He's a big roly-poly happy Santa. He stands erect on two legs, is actually over three feet tall and 32 inches around. Best of all, he actually talks. Just pull the tape and he says, Merry Christmas for all to hear. He's the biggest, merriest talking as Santa ever, sure to please your youngsters and spread good cheer. Yes, Giant Santa proves there really is a Santa Claus. That's a total of six giant animals made of brightly colored preformed sturdy latex which the kids can easily inflate. And the cost? Just one dollar, not for each. Just one dollar for all six of these lovable giants who'll turn your home into a circus parade. And here's a surprise. Mail your order today and you'll also receive absolutely free Peter the Rabbit, actually over two feet tall with big red ears almost nine inches long. But you must send now. Rush $1 plus 10 cents for packing and mailing for each set you want to Giant Animals, Box 1730 Grand Central Station, New York City. If not delighted with every one of your seven giant animals, return them to the Super Animals Company for a full refund, but keep the giant talking Santa as our gift. Order now. Supplies are limited. Rush $1.10 for packing and mailing for each set in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 1730 Grand Central Station, New York City. That's $1 plus 10 cents with your name and address. Mail to Giant Animals, Box 1730. That's Box 1730, Grand Central Station, New York City. Giant Animals, Box 1730, Grand Central Station, New York City. Expense account item six, 225. Cab to the apartment of Porter Kane in the East 70s. It was an expensive looking place. I got there about noon, but Porter Kane was just finishing breakfast, accompanied by Chopin. May I offer you a cup of coffee, Mr. Dollar? Oh, thanks. A blank, please. Yes. Now, you uh, came to see me about Amy Bradshaw, I believe. That's right, Mr. Kane. I represent Northwestern Indemnity Alliance. They hold a policy on Miss Bradshaw. You perhaps want some sort of character reference on her? You, uh, might put it that way. Well, in that case, you couldn't have come to one better qualified than I. You see, Amy is my career at present. Afraid I don't understand, Mr. Kane. Well, some years ago, I was relieved of the sordid but customarily necessary task of working for my bread and butter. The result is that I have been able to devote myself to a fascinating hobby. What kind of a hobby? I collect things. Oh, 
The objects of my interest vary, but uh, they all have one thing in common. Oh? Uh, this signet ring I'm wearing, for instance. Yes, I noticed it. Very unusual. The crest is that of the Medici family, Renaissance Italy. The only ring of its kind in the world, so far as any of the authorities on that period are aware. Uh, that uh, vase on the table. The painting on the wall. Uh, that sculpture. One of a kind, huh? Precisely. Which brings us quite logically to Amy, who is clearly one of a kind. So? So I plan to add Amy to my collection. Just like that, huh? I'm certain Amy will see it my way in time. And I have time. Now, if you'll excuse me, I must dress for the matinee. Uh, will I see you again, Mr. Dollar? Yes. You probably will, Mr. Kane. I was glad to get out of the hothouse atmosphere of Kane's apartment. Real weird, this character. And I had a hunch I'd better keep an eye on him. Item 7, $1.65, cab fare that evening to the Criterion Theater. I arrived half an hour before curtain time and headed for Amy's dressing room. Then as I approached her door... You listen real careful. I'll give it to you once again. You've been tossing wrong cues to Sheila for three nights now. You've been doing everything you can to upstage her and make her look bad. Mike, it's just that I've been nervous lately. Maybe I have made a few mistakes in my life. Amy, but... you know I've got plans for Sheila, and I don't want her looking bad in this play. You've got plans for Sheila. What about us? Amy, we can talk about that some other time. But for now, I just want you to understand. You're to lay off Sheila. I mean it. Is that a threat, Mike? Take it any way you like. It sounded like Pomeroy was coming outside, so I ducked around behind a piece of scenery and waited a moment. Then I went back to Amy's door. Oh, Johnny. Hello, Amy. You look tired. I am. I just had a little go-around with Mike. Pomeroy? Uh-huh. I've been fluffing some of my lines lately. He seems to think I've been doing it deliberately to make Sheila Mitchell look bad. But he's wrong. You found out anything yet, Johnny? No, not much. I still can't believe there's anything to it. It's so silly to let it upset me. It's silly even to give it a thought. Well, try not to, Amy. Let me worry about it. All right. Did I ever tell you it's nice having you around, Johnny? I left the dressing room and started for the alley door, but somebody stepped out in front of me. It was Mike Pomeroy. Hello, Dollar. Oh, hi, Pomeroy. I was just talking to Dave Coleman, the director. He told me uh, he was the one who sent for you. He told me why. You didn't know about the threatening letter Amy got? No, no, I didn't. Look, uh, Dollar, every actress I've ever known has gotten at least one note like that during her career. You don't think this should be taken too seriously, then? No. Amy's pretty nervous these days. And as long as you're around stirring things up, she'll be worried about it. If there's anything to be done about it, I can handle it. In other words, you want me to mind my own business, is that it? You said that, Dollar. I didn't. It might not be a bad idea. Funny thing. When somebody tells me to lay off a case, my interest in it always doubles. After the final curtain, I went backstage to wait for Amy. The stage door was open, and I could see Porter Kane waiting in the alley outside. So I went over to him. Well, Mr. Dollar, good evening. Hello, Kane. On duty again tonight? Perhaps that's one way of putting it. I thought I might have a little chat with Amy after she's changed. I'm afraid she has a date. Oh? Do you happen to know with whom? Yeah, me. Uh, Mr. Dollar, are you suggesting that I'm to regard you as some sort of rival? Not at all, Kane. I'm just suggesting that I'm a friend of Amy's. I see. Good night, Mr. Dollar. After Kane left, I stood beside the stage door and tried to figure out some of the angles on this case. There were too many of them. By the time I went in, the theater was dark, except for a dim light bulb over the stage, and everyone had gone. Everybody, that is, except Amy. I ran into the darkened theater. She was standing horrified next to the stairway by the dressing rooms, her eyes fixed on something that lay on the floor. Johnny! I was on my way out to meet you. I heard a swish through the air. This heavy sandbag, it barely missed me. Oh, Johnny! Stay back against the wall, Amy. You'll be okay there. I climbed the long ladder up to the catwalk above the stage where they sometimes use the sandbags to balance hunks of scenery. It was dark up there. 
I started edging along the catwalk. Suddenly, my foot hit a loose board. I almost lost my balance. A loose board that could have been left for me. And it was a long, long drop down to the stage. Whoever had been up there knew the theater pretty well. Finally, I went back down to Amy. She was trembling. Johnny. It's okay, Amy. It's okay. Johnny. Maybe I didn't take it seriously before, but I do now. Somebody dropped that sandbag from up there deliberately. Somebody is trying to kill me, and I'm scared, Johnny. I'm scared. Johnny Dollar will be back in a moment to tell you about tomorrow's episode. Friends, send for your set of some of the most exciting toys of the year. Six giant inflatable toys for only one dollar. Some up to three feet tall. You get Bounceo the Happy Clown, Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo, Roscoe the two feet long roller skating bear, Whitey the fat indoor snowman, Mortimer the giant mouse 18 inches long, and last but not least, the great giant talking Santa. A roly-poly giant over three feet tall and 32 inches around the belly that actually says Merry Christmas out loud when you pull the tape. That six sensational giant toys for only one dollar, made of sturdy, gaily colored latex that the kids can easily inflate. Send one dollar for each set to Giant Animals, Box 1730, Grand Central Station, New York City. And if you order right now, you get Peter the Rabbit over two feet tall, absolutely free. If not delighted with your giant animals, your money refunded immediately. Order today, you may never hear this offer again. Rush one dollar plus ten cents for packing and mailing in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 1730, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's one dollar plus ten cents for each set with your name and address to Giant Animals, Box 1730, Grand Central Station, New York City. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of the Amy Bradshaw Matter. Tomorrow, a man steps onto the stage from out of the past and into a role he doesn't want to play. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Al Sintel at police headquarters, Johnny. Yeah. You hear what happened at the Criterion Theater after the show last night? I was off duty when you called, but Sergeant Rogers gave me a fill-in this morning. So somebody tried to drop a sandbag on Amy Bradshaw, bank stage. Yeah, a real near miss. You still think these attempts on her life are publicity stunts? No, uh, looks like your hunch was right. I'll have a couple of my boys keep an eye on Amy. Thanks. Johnny... You wanted to know the whereabouts of this guy, Bill York, the husband Amy separated from... What have you got on him, Al? 768 West 4th Street, down in Greenwich Village. Thanks. I'll check it. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. New York City, expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Northwestern Indemnity Alliance, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Amy Bradshaw matter. Expense account item 8, 275. Taxi from my hotel to Greenwich Village to try and locate a writer named Bill York, who had separated from Amy six months ago. Amy was a good actress, but she couldn't hide the fact she was plenty scared by the attempts on her life in the last three days. My hunch was it was someone close to Amy, and Bill York was very much on my list. After all, he was the beneficiary on her life insurance policy. 
I hadn't been to this part of the village in two or three years, but from the looks of it, it hadn't changed a bit. Defiantly shabby and run down. A few beards here and there, a few gals with long, straight hair. Bookstores and bars, side by side. I checked at the address Al Centella had given me. It was a beat-up old rooming house. You come down here to interview the famous riders, something like that? Not exactly. Too bad. Here I thought you wanted to carry my message to America. No, I'm afraid that's a little out of my department, Mr. York. Amy did mention that you were a writer. I can tell you exactly what she said. She said, you know, uh, Bill's a writer, uh, sort of, right? (laughs) Well, as a matter of fact... Amy always felt it necessary to apologize for me. That was one thing about our marriage that was always so charming. Well, look, I didn't come here to discuss your marriage, York. I don't know what you're so bitter about. It's none of my business, but... Well, darling, what do I have to be bitter about? Here I am, an artist, living an unfettered life of freedom in Greenwich Village. What more could I ask? I guess I haven't read any of your books. Don't worry about it. You're in good company. You and the publishers. Oh, that's too bad. Must make a little problem in the grocery department. Oh, that doesn't worry me. You see, one can always manage to live comfortably in huck. Oh? And if one is willing to huck his soul, of course the returns are much greater. I don't get you. That's not surprising, because nobody else but me would call it my soul. It's just the manuscript for an unpublished novel. Three years of work and sweat and pain... But my clever pawnbroker, Mr. Pomeroy, has a fair idea what it means to me. Mike Pomeroy? Amy's agent? Charming chap. Quite shrewd. In other words, if you could raise some money, you could get this brainchild of yours out of hock from him. Tell me, how long has it been since you've seen Amy? Several months. Why? You haven't been uptown near her apartment the last few days, huh? No. You sure? Of course. Anything else? No, not for now. We will continue with the Bradshaw matter in a moment. Friends, how'd you like to thrill your favorite youngster with some of the most exciting toys of the year? Picture the breathless excitement of any child surrounded by six gaily colored balloon-like giant animals up to three feet long, and all for the low, low price of just one dollar. Now, first you get Bounceo the Clown with round pot belly and funny nose. Next comes Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo. Third, there's Roscoe the Roller Skating Bear. He's two feet tall and looks almost like real. Fourth, there's Whitey the Fat Indoor Snowman. And fifth, Mortimer the Giant Mouse, 18 inches long and sure to scare the whiskers off any cat. That's five different giant animals. But now, hold your breath for the most sensational toy of all, the star of the whole Christmas season, the jolly giant talking Santa Claus, guaranteed to make everybody's Christmas a merrier one. He's a big roly Holy happy Santa. He stands erect on two legs, is actually over three feet tall and 32 inches around. Best of all, he actually talks. Just pull the tape and he says, Merry Christmas for all to hear. He's the biggest, merriest talking as Santa ever. Sure to please your youngsters and spread good cheer. Yes, giant Santa proves there really is a Santa Claus. That's a total of six giant animals made of brightly colored, preformed, sturdy latex, which the kids can easily inflate. And the cost? Just one dollar, not for each. Just one dollar for all six of these lovable giants who'll turn your home into a circus parade. And here's a surprise. Mail your order today and you'll also receive absolutely free Peter the Rabbit, actually over two feet tall with big red ears almost nine inches long. But you must send now. Rush one dollar plus ten cents for packing and mailing for each set you want to Giant Animals, Box 1870, Grand Central Station, New York City. If not delighted with every one of your seven giant animals, return them to the Super Animals Company for a full refund. But keep the giant talking Santa as our gift. Order now. Supplies are limited. Rush one dollar and ten cents for packing and mailing for each set in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 1870, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's one dollar plus ten cents with your name and address. Mail to Giant Animals, Box 1870. That's Box 1870, Grand Central Station, New York City. Giant Animals, Box 1870, Grand Central Station, New York City. I was getting nowhere in my attempt to find out who was gunning for Amy Bradshaw, and I knew it. I called Mike Pomeroy, her agent, but he was out, so I took the next name on my list, the producer of Amy's play, Emery Taylor. Expense account item 9, 175. Cab fare to Taylor's apartment in the mid-50s near the Museum of Modern Art. Taylor wasn't in, but his wife Dora was. She was sleek-looking and a little on the brittle side. 
She was sitting behind a small bar in the den, and she looked quite at home there. Drink? Thanks. Will your husband be back soon, Mrs. Taylor? Who knows? Here. Oh, thank you. What do you want to see him about? Amy Bradshaw. What about Amy Bradshaw? I wanted to ask him if he knew of anyone who might want to harm Amy for any reason. Oh, I could answer that better than Emery. There is someone? There certainly is. Who? Me. Why? Would you like it if your husband was knocking himself out for your... Well, for a younger woman? Well, now, isn't that part of the business? Is it? That's not all. Amy's hurt plenty of people getting where she is. You think your husband's one of them? I hope not. Who has she hurt, Mrs. Taylor? Do you know Dave Coleman? Her director? He was very much in love with Amy a few months ago. Oh, I see. I don't like to see someone I like get the way he was. One night here, he had a couple too many. He said, uh, if he couldn't have her... Uh... Oh. Funny. How quick he got over it, though. Never says anything about it anymore, huh? Not a word. What about Porter Kane? Oh, you've met him. Is he one of them that Amy's hurt? No, no, he's not in that category. Whatever happened to hurt him must have happened at about the age of five. What do you mean? Oh, isn't that when most of our troubles start? <laughs> I wouldn't know. I once paid a psychiatrist $500 to tell me that's when mine started. Your troubles? Sure. Can't you tell, Mr. Dollard? I'm the mixed-up type. Aren't we all, Mrs. Taylor? I left her still sitting behind the bar, and somehow I felt sorry for her. But she had given a new lead, David Coleman, Amy's director, who'd had it bad for Amy just a few months ago and had now completely recovered. Maybe. I made a mental note to have a little chat with Coleman that night, then I put in another call to Mike Pomeroy. This time he was in, and I finally talked him into meeting me at a little bar on West 44th near the theater. But when I got there, I could see that he wasn't feeling very cooperative. Look, Dollar, I suggested once before, nice and polite, that maybe you should try minding your own business. I got the message, all right, Pomeroy, and now I've got one for you. I am minding my own business. Hmm? This is what I was hired to do. The insurance company I represent holds a pretty hefty life insurance policy on Amy. And if she's in any danger, they want to know about it. But I told you before, I think this whole thing's pretty silly. I had a talk with Bill York, the writer, this morning. Even though he and Amy are separated, you know, he's still the beneficiary on her policy. So? So he says he's in hock to you. He's a bum. He wasn't doing Amy any good. She was worrying about him. When they split up, I told him as long as he stayed away from her, didn't try to see her, I'd keep him in groceries. I see. But naturally, I wanted some security. The manuscript of his book, for instance? <laughs> Great unborn American novel. Well, apparently that manuscript means a lot to That's him. That's why I figured it'd be good security. What's the matter, Dollar? You look like you uh, smelled something bad. Do I? What am I supposed to be? A philanthropist? Let me make one thing clear, Pomeroy. As far as the kind of loans you make, I agree with you. It's none of my business. But maybe I just got a sensitive note. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, now I want my dough back. Is there anything wrong with that? Not a thing. I've got a play lined up I know will go over big. I want to produce it. York's tab has run up to several thousand bucks now. I could use the money. I see. The stupid part of the whole deal is that York could pay me back within a couple of months if he wanted to. Oh. Sure. There's a lot of dough floating around to be made in television these days. But that prima donna thinks he's way above that sort of thing. This play you want to produce, Pomeroy, will it star Amy? No. Sheila Mitchell. Oh. Well, thanks for the information. Be seeing you. I doubt it. On my way over to the Criterion Theater, I thought about Pomeroy. A rugged customer. And I felt he was one more who wouldn't let anyone stand in the way of anything he wanted to do. After the show, I picked up Amy backstage and took her back to her apartment. She looked very tired and didn't say much. We said goodnight at the front entrance and I started walking along the sidewalk. Then I spotted somebody in the shadows across the street again, watching. I could tell from his hat and coat he was the same one who'd been there the night before last. I kept on walking until I reached the corner, then circled halfway around the block to an alley and edged up on him from behind. He didn't see me until I dove at him. Well, Bill York. 
What are you doing here? So you haven't been near Amy for a long time, huh? Except tonight and the night before last, watching her apartment. <sighs> Darling, Come on, but... York, start talking. And it better be good. Johnny Dollar will be back in a moment to tell you about tomorrow's episode. Friends, send for your set of some of the most exciting toys of the year. Six giant inflatable toys for only one dollar. Some up to three feet tall. You get Bounceo the Happy Clown, Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo, Roscoe the two feet long roller skating bear, Whitey the fat indoor snowman, Mortimer the giant mouse 18 inches long, and last but not least, the great giant talking Santa. A roly-poly giant over three feet tall and 32 inches around the belly that actually says Merry Christmas out loud when you pull the tape. That six sensational giant toys for only one dollar, made of sturdy, gaily colored latex that the kids can easily inflate. Send one dollar for each set to Giant Animals, Box 1870, Grand Central Station, New York City. And if you order right now, you get Peter the Rabbit over two feet tall, absolutely free. If not delighted with your giant animals, your money refunded immediately. Order today, you may never hear this offer again. Rush $1 plus 10 cents for packing and mailing in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals Box 1870, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's $1 plus 10 cents for each set with your name and address to Giant Animals Box 1870, Grand Central Station, New York City. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of The Amy Bradshaw Matter. Tomorrow... I find I have even more of a reason for keeping Amy alive than I'd realized. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Al Sintel at police headquarters, Johnny. Better get over here to my hotel room, Al. I've got company. Who is it? Bill York. Amy Bradshaw's ex-husband? Right. I caught him watching her apartment half an hour ago, and he's the one who was watching it the other night. This time, I had better luck catching him. Has he opened up yet? No, but he will. Johnny, take it easy with him. I think he's got plenty to tell us. Looks like he's the boy we're after, Al. I'll be right over. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. New York City. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Northwestern Indemnity Alliance, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Amy Bradshaw matter. Amy, star of a Broadway play, and somebody was out to get her. Expense account item 10, $3, repairs to one coat sleeve, torn in the process of inviting Bill York up to my hotel room. Look, Dolly, you've got no right to drag me up here to your room this way. York, you're going to sit right here until you open up and tell me all about the attempt on Amy Bradshaw's life. What? Here, come in. Oh, Al. Hi, Johnny. York, this is Detective Lieutenant Al Sintella. Now look here, Lieutenant. What's this all about? Well, I kind of thought that's what you'd tell us, Mr. York. But this is crazy. Why would I want to kill Amy? You're aware that you're still the beneficiary on Amy's insurance policy. What? Oh, even if also, I am... Also, you need money, and you need it bad. You're several thousand bucks in debt to Mike Pomeroy, Amy's agent. 
He's been pressing you for it lately. Look, Dollar. And you know you can't get the manuscript of your novel out of hock from him until you pay off. You've got two strikes against you, York. Motive and opportunity. Opportunity? Sure, but motive? No, Dollar. I've never had any reason to kill Amy. It's true she and I couldn't make it together, but I guess that was more my fault than hers. Go on. You see, Amy's never let anything stand in the way of what she wanted. What she wanted, I didn't. I guess we just lived in two different worlds. What do you mean? She's always been a success, and I've always been a failure. You still haven't explained why you lied to me, York. Why? When I talked to you this morning, you told me you hadn't been near Amy for a long time. But when I caught up with you in front of her apartment tonight, I realized you were the same one who was watching it night before last. How about that, York? You fellas don't leave me much. What do you mean? Sure, once in a while I go stand outside her apartment house, look up at the light on the window, maybe think a little about how things might have been. That's all. Uh, maybe you better come downtown with me, York. We'll check your story further. If you're clean, you got nothing to worry about. All right, Lieutenant. Sergeant, take Mr. York down to the car and wait for me there. Johnny? Who else have you talked to? Oh, everybody close to her. But the one who interests me most is her agent, Mike Pomeroy. He can be a pretty rough customer when he wants to. And he thinks Amy's standing in the way of a career for an actress he's currently interested in. Let's talk about somebody else for a moment. Who? Oh. You, Johnny. I think you're getting a little bit out of line. What do you mean? Down at police headquarters, we got a little black book. It tells us what to do and what not to do. It doesn't say anything about insurance investigators dragging possible suspects to their hotel room to question them. Listen, Al, when I'm assigned to a case, I usually try to break it any way I can. I know. It's just that I think you're taking this case pretty big. Meaning? Yesterday I told you that if I didn't know you better, I'd think you were falling for Amy a little yourself. Think it over, Johnny. We will continue with the Bradshaw matter in a moment. Friends, how'd you like to thrill your favorite youngster with some of the most exciting toys of the year? Picture the breathless excitement of any child surrounded by six gaily colored balloon-like giant animals up to three feet long, and all for the low, low price of just one dollar. Now, first you get Bounce-O the Clown with round pot belly and funny nose. Next comes Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo. Third, there's Roscoe the Roller Skating Bear. He's two feet tall and looks almost like real. Fourth, there's Whitey the Fat Indoor Snowman. And fifth, Mortimer the Giant Mouse, 18 inches long and sure to scare the whiskers off any cat. That's five different giant animals. But now, hold your breath for the most sensational toy of all, the star of the whole Christmas season, the jolly giant talking Santa Claus, guaranteed to make everybody's Christmas a merrier one. He's a big roly-poly happy Santa. He stands erect on two legs, is actually over three feet tall and 32 inches around. Best of all, he actually talks. Just pull the tape and he says, Merry Christmas for all to hear. He's the biggest, merriest talking as Santa ever. Sure to please your youngsters and spread good cheer. Yes, Yes, giant Santa proves there really is a Santa Claus. That's a total of six giant animals made of brightly colored, preformed, sturdy latex, which the kids can easily inflate. And the cost? Just one dollar, not for each. Just one dollar for all six of these lovable giants who'll turn your home into a circus parade. And here's a surprise. Mail your order today and you'll also receive absolutely free Peter the Rabbit, actually over two feet tall with big red ears almost nine inches long. But you must send now. Rush $1 plus 10 cents for packing and mailing for each set you want to Giant Animals, Box 1907, Grand Central Station, New York City. If not delighted with every one of your seven giant animals, return them to the Super Animals Company for a full refund, but keep the giant talking Santa as our gift. Order now. Supplies are limited. Rush $1.10 for packing and mailing for each set in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 1907, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's $1 plus 10 cents with your name and address. Mail to Giant Animals, Box 1907. That's Box 1907, Grand Central Station, New York City. Giant Animals, Box 1907, Grand Central Station, New York City. <laughs> Expense account item 11, $4, drinks, for me. I thought about what Al Sintel had said. The possibility I was falling for Amy Bradshaw. Thought about it for two hours. Finally, I decided I had to find out if he was right. I went over to Amy's apartment. 
It was good of you to come over, Johnny. I just can't seem to sleep lately. Yeah. I noticed there's a policeman on duty down in the lobby. Lieutenant Centella arranged for that. It's funny. It should make me feel better, but it doesn't. It just keeps reminding me of it. Threat on my life. I'm glad you're here, Johnny. So am I. Awfully glad. Maybe I shouldn't say that, but... Do you hear any objections? Well, who could... Excuse me. Yeah, sure. Hello? Yes? Oh, Porter. What? No, I'm sorry. No, really, Porter, it's out of the question. No, I... Good night, Porter. Kane, huh? Yes, I suppose he means well. But he can be rather annoying. Do you have a cigarette, Johnny? Here. Thanks. You seem rather quiet tonight. Oh, just thinking, I guess. It's funny. Mm. Our meeting like this. Yeah. Just a few days ago, I didn't know you at all. And now... And now what? I don't know, Johnny. I don't know. Amy... It's a mistake, Johnny. I'm sorry. Was it? Yes. Johnny, I'm afraid I've hurt a couple of people in the past. I don't want to hurt you. Don't worry, you won't. And that's the wonderful thing about being an actress. You play so many parts. The kiss. That was playing a part, huh? Even if it weren't, Johnny, it'd be no good. There'd always be something between us. It's right over there on the mantel. The clock? Yes. We can't turn it back. If I'd met you a long time ago before, Mike, or... But I didn't. No. So? Is the clock so bad, Amy? It is to an actress. Sometimes I pretend it isn't there. You ever do that, John? No, it doesn't do any good. But you can try. You can live a whole life trying. Isn't that really what we all do? I don't know. We go along playing our parts, doing what we have to do, pretending the clock isn't there. But all the while it is. And though we keep on fighting against it, we know we can't turn it back. We can't even stop it. One thing I'd accomplished, I guess. I'd decided I wouldn't be seeing Amy anymore after this case was wound up. Winding it up, though, was another question. And I was still as far from home as ever on it. But I couldn't seem to get Porter Kane and his quaint little hobby of collecting things out of my mind. Why, good evening, Mr. Dollar. Hello, Mr. Kane. Come in, come in. Thanks. I know it's late. I'm sorry. Not at all. As a matter of fact, I was hoping I'd see you again. I don't want to keep you. I see your hat and coat. No, I'm not going out. I've just come in. Oh. Uh, you said you were hoping you'd see me again? Yes, I enjoyed our other little chat very much. I, um... I suppose you came to talk some more about Amy Bradshaw. Matter of fact, Mr. Kane, I came to talk about you. Splendid. And about your hobby. Collecting. A fascinating hobby, Mr. Dollar. You take it pretty seriously, don't you? I've devoted most of my life to it. And I may say that I've succeeded rather brilliantly with it. Each item in my collection is incomparable, without equal. Yeah, one of a kind. And that, of course, is precisely why Amy is necessary to complete the collection. The crowning and final edition. Final? Yes, uh, for your information, Mr. Dollar, when I've acquired Amy, I intend to cease my hobby. Oh. She will complete my collection. Without her, though, it is still incomplete. Mind if I ask you a couple of questions, Mr. Kane? Not, not at all. You seem to have been pretty successful with your collection. Have you ever run up against an item you wanted but couldn't get? Of course not. <laughs> that just doesn't happen. Has it ever happened? Well, I can't remember that it ever... Yes... Yes, it did happen once. When? When I was nine years old. A playmate of mine had a lollipop that I admired greatly. He wouldn't give it to me, and he wouldn't sell it to me. What did you do? 
I, I did the only logical thing there was to do. I smashed the lollipop, Mr. Dollar. Johnny Dollar will be back in a moment to tell you about tomorrow's episode. Friends, send for your set of some of the most exciting toys of the year. Six giant inflatable toys for only one dollar. Some up to three feet tall. You get Bounce the Happy Clown, Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo, Roscoe the two feet long roller skating bear, Whitey the fat indoor snowman, Mortimer the giant mouse 18 inches long, and last but not least, the great giant talking Santa. A roly-poly giant over three feet tall and 32 inches around the belly that actually says Merry Christmas out loud when you pull the tape. That six sensational giant toys for only one dollar, made of sturdy, gaily colored latex that the kids can easily inflate. Send one dollar for each set to Giant Animals, Box 1907, Grand Central Station, New York City. And if you order right now, you get Peter the Rabbit over two feet tall, absolutely free. If not delighted with your giant animals, your money refunded immediately. Order today, you may never hear this offer again. Rush one dollar plus ten cents for packing and mailing and cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 1907, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's one dollar plus ten cents for each set, with your name and address, to Giant Animals, Box 1907, Grand Central Station, New York City. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of the Amy Bradshaw Matter. Tomorrow, well, it's the wind-up, and a pretty rough one. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by Robert Reif. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. It's Amy Bradshaw, Johnny. Amy, it's 1 a.m. Anything the matter? Yes, can you come over right away? Sure, your apartment? No, I'm in my dressing room at the Criterion Theater. At 1 o'clock in the... Amy, there's a policeman assigned to you. Is he with you? No, I... I went out the back way. I came over here alone. But why? He's supposed to be protecting you. Johnny... I can't explain now, but I think I finally know who's been trying to kill me. I want to talk to you right away over here. Hurry. Please hurry. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. New York City, expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Northwestern Indemnity Alliance, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Amy Bradshaw matter. Expense account item 12, $5. Taxi from my hotel to the Criterion Theater on West 44th. Two bucks for the fare, three bucks for getting me there in five minutes. Amy had sounded plenty scared over the phone. The cab skidded to a stop in front. I caught a glimpse of somebody at the other corner of the theater. It looked like Porter Kane. I couldn't be sure, and I didn't have time to find out right now. Backstage, it was quite dark, and I had to feel my way through some... The shot came from the direction of Amy's dressing room. Mike Pomeroy, her agent, was lying on the floor, dead. There was a gun on the floor, too, just inside the door. Johnny! Oh, Johnny! What happened, Amy? Amy, stop it! Tell me what happened. The door. Door? The, the shot. It, it came from the door. I ran outside the dressing room across the stage into the alley. No one in sight. Back inside, I found a light switch. So I phoned Al Centella at police headquarters, told him what had happened. Amy was quieter now. Johnny. Amy, look. Look, I know it's tough for you to talk right now, but you've got to try and tell me. I know. 
bathroom. A little after midnight, Mike called me at my apartment. He said he wanted to talk to me about something important. His office is nearby, and he asked me to meet him here in my dressing room. So I came over right away. Go on. Mike and I started talking. Suddenly, I saw the door opening a crack. A hand with a gun. Mike. Mike! Easy, easy. Mike saw it too. He, he dove in between me and the door. And collected the slug. He, he fell against the door and it slammed on the hand. The gun dropped. And the next thing I remember, you were in the room. You didn't see who was holding the gun? No, just the hand. Amy... And, there was something on one of the fingers that I recognized. A large signet ring? Yes. Yeah. It belonged to the guy out on the sidewalk. Porter Kane. We will continue with the Bradshaw matter in a moment. Friends, how'd you like to thrill your favorite youngster with some of the most exciting toys of the year? Picture the breathless excitement of any child surrounded by six gaily colored balloon-like giant animals up to three feet long, and all for the low, low price of just one dollar. Now, first you get Bounce-O the Clown with round pot belly and funny nose. Next comes Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo. Third, there's Roscoe the Roller Skating Bear. He's two feet tall and looks almost like real. Fourth, there's Whitey the Fat Indoor Snowman. And fifth, Mortimer the Giant Mouse, 18 inches long and sure to scare the whiskers off any cat. That's five different giant animals. But now, hold your breath for the most sensational toy of all, the star of the whole Christmas season, the jolly giant talking Santa Claus, guaranteed to make everybody's Christmas a merrier one. He's a big roly-poly happy Santa. He stands erect on two legs, is actually over three feet tall and 32 inches around. Best of all, he actually talks. Just pull the tape and he says, Merry Christmas for all to hear. He's the biggest, merriest talking as Santa ever. Sure to please your youngsters and spread good cheer. Yes, giant Santa proves there really is a Santa Claus. That's a total of six giant animals made of brightly colored, preformed, sturdy latex, which the kids can easily inflate. And the cost? Just one dollar, not for each. Just one dollar for all six of these lovable giants who'll turn your home into a circus parade. And here's a surprise. Mail your order today and you'll also receive absolutely free Peter the Rabbit, actually over two feet tall with big red ears almost nine inches long. But you must send now. Rush one dollar plus ten cents for packing and mailing for each set you want to Giant Animals, Box 1918, Grand Central Station, New York City. If not delighted with every one of your seven giant animals, return them to the Super Animals Company for a full refund. But keep the giant talking Santa as our gift. Order now. Supplies are limited. Rush $1.10 for packing and mailing for each set in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 1918 Grand Central Station, New York City. That's $1 plus 10 cents with your name and address. Mail to Giant Animals, Box 1918. That's Box 1918 Grand Central Station, New York City. Giant Animals, Box 1918. Box 1918 Grand Central Station, New York City. Lieutenant Centella arrived at Amy's dressing room, and Amy repeated her story to him. He sent a couple of his boys out to pick up Porter Kane. Al and Amy and I went down to headquarters. We left her in one room while we went into another to question Kane, who had been picked up at his apartment. See here, Lieutenant, I don't know what this is all about, but I certainly object to being routed out Just of... hold it, Kane. You know why you're down here. I certainly do not. You don't know that Mike Pomeroy's dead, eh? Amy's agent? Really? Really. Well, I never did like that chap. Quite an insensitive person. Well, he's real insensitive now, Kane. He's dead. How did it happen? Mike was shot by mistake. The real target was Amy. Good heavens, no. When's the last time you saw Amy? The night before last. I spoke to her briefly after the show. You haven't talked to her on the telephone? No. You're lying. Now, see here, Dollar. You phoned her at her apartment about 11 p.m. I was there. All right. I did telephone her. I suggested she meet me somewhere. I I told her I'd wait for her outside her apartment. Go on. I saw her come out later by the alley, so I followed her to the theater, thinking she meant for us to talk there. But then I I heard a shot. So you admit being in the vicinity. Well, yes, but I definitely did not go into the theater. Didn't you? Kane, Amy got a look at the hand holding the gun. 
There was a ring on one of the fingers. Ring? Your ring. But she's completely mistaken. That's a very distinctive ring. It's not one that anybody be mistaken about. See here, Lieutenant, all of this, this wild supposition is based on the assumption that I had a motive for wanting to kill Amy. You told me what your motive was when I talked to you last evening in your apartment. What do you mean? I asked you what you'd do if you wanted something for your collection and couldn't get it. You told me a story about what happened when you were just a kid nine years old. But I, I Another say... Another kid had a lollipop you wanted. He wouldn't give it to you, so you smashed it. And that's what you were trying to do tonight in Amy's dressing room. You couldn't have her, so you tried to smash her. There wasn't much point in my hanging around. So I got Al Sintella's permission to take Amy back to her apartment. We could wait there for any new developments. Amy didn't say a word all the way. When we got there, she sat in a chair staring at the wall. When she finally spoke, it was more like she was talking to herself. He's dead. Amy. He's dead because of me. Stop talking that way. Mike Pomeroy jumped in the way of a bullet. If he hadn't, you'd be dead. It would have been better that way. Stop it, Amy. Johnny. Yeah. I think... You think what? Oh, just a minute. I'll get it. It was Al Centella down at police headquarters. When he finished talking, I didn't say anything. There wasn't anything to say. After I hung up, I stood there a moment, staring out the window. It had started to rain. I felt old and tired and empty and sick. I went back into the other room again. Amy was sitting there, looking at me. Johnny. Yeah, Amy. Was that call for me? No. Who was it? Lieutenant Centella. Oh. The gun that killed Mike Pomeroy. There were no fingerprints on it. You said you saw a bare hand with a ring on it holding the gun. A bare hand would have left fingerprints. You killed him, didn't you? Yes, Johnny. The attempts on your life, you faked them, didn't you, to convince people you were in danger so you could kill Pomeroy and we'd think the shot was intended for you. Why, Amy? You know why. (sighs) Yeah, I guess so. You loved Mike. You knew he was growing away from you. So fast. So very fast. You saw him get interested in a younger actress. You knew she was taking your place with him. To Mike. I was dead. I couldn't stand that. I really couldn't. So I started making it look like I was in danger. It wasn't very hard, Johnny. I'm a good actress. Yeah. After a while, I almost began to believe I was in danger. Something was after me. It was hunting me. It finally caught up with me, and I did what I did. Which of us is the hunter, Johnny? And which is the hunted? Amy. Yes. I think one of Lieutenant Centella's men is waiting for you out in the hall. All right. Just one thing, Johnny. What is it? I'll need something now. Something. Don't forget me, Johnny. Give me that. That you can count on, Amy. She walked out of the room, and she didn't look back. I'm glad she didn't. Expense account item 13, $16.50. Transportation and incidentals from New York back to Hartford. Expense account total, $185.20. End of account, end of report. Remarks? Amy repeated her confession to Lieutenant Centella. Her trial's coming up soon. Sweet case. Well, tomorrow's another day. So they tell me. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar will return in a moment to tell you about next week's intriguing story. 
Friends, send for your set of some of the most exciting toys of the year. Six giant inflatable toys for only one dollar. Some up to three feet tall. You get Bounceo the Happy Clown, Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo, Roscoe the two feet long roller skating bear, Whitey the fat indoor snowman, Mortimer the giant mouse 18 inches long, and last but not least, the great giant talking Santa. A roly-poly giant over three feet tall and 32 inches around the belly that actually says Merry Christmas out loud when you pull the tape. That six sensational giant toys for only one dollar, made of sturdy, gaily colored latex that the kids can easily inflate. Send one dollar for each set to Giant Animals, Box 1918, Grand Central Station, New York City. And if you order right now, you get Peter the Rabbit over two feet tall absolutely free. If not delighted with your giant animals, your money refunded immediately. Order today. You may never hear this offer again. Rush $1 plus 10 cents for packing and mailing and cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 1918, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's $1 plus 10 cents for each set with your name and address to Giant Animals, Box 1918, Grand Central Station, New York City. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's exciting story. Next week... A case with a great big question mark. Accident? Suicide? Or just plain murder? Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Virginia Gregg, Florence Walcott, Don Diamond, Larry Thor, Vic Perrin, and Carlton Young. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Deller. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Deller. Tim Connors, John Boy. Congratulate me. Congratulations, Tim. What for? I just had another boy. Seven pounds, twelve ounces. Hey, you like cigars? Sure. Well, come on down and pick one up. Oh, maybe you better pack a suitcase, too. I got one for you out in Culver, Montana. Where is that? I just told you. Out in Montana somewhere. We have a dead policyholder there named Henderson. Henderson, huh? Yeah. Now, we don't know if he was murdered, committed suicide, or had an accident. What does it look like? All three. Okay, Tim, be there in an hour. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Paramount Insurance Adjusters, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Henderson matter, whatever it's going to be. Expense account item one, dollar and a quarter for a detailed map. I had an idea that Culver, Montana was a place that only Rand McDally might know about. They did. I found it tucked up in the high northern corner of the state near Great Falls. Hey, where's your bag? Home. I told you to pack it. Now, look, Give me a cigar, Tim. Tell me about the new boy in the new case. Okay, have a chair. There you are. I wouldn't smoke it if I were you. Terrible. Cost me two bucks a box. Hey, you know something? I'm thinking of naming the new boy Johnny. Oh, tough case, huh? Yeah. Hmm? Look, look. We're in the same sweet old spot, Johnny. Same old problem. One of our policyholders is dead, and for looking into the circumstances of his death, The insurance company is no longer a friend of the widow and orphan, but a big, bad monster trying to weasel out of a just claim. All claims are just claims, or are they? Well, of course they are. No one ever tried to pull a fast one on an insurance company. Well, the world's full of nice, honest, straight-playing people. Uh Uh-huh. Now tell me about getting sandbagged in a poker game. Look, I want to get this out of the way and get back over to the hospital and see my wife. Now, John, this claim came into the insurance office yesterday afternoon, airmail special. 
The insurance company turned it over to me today. What company? Western. The policy's worth $25,000 face value, double indemnity if death was by accident. No payment for suicide. Uh Uh-huh. You say the man's name was Henderson? Yeah, it says here, George Walter Henderson, Montana rancher. Last Thursday, he fell four stories out of a hotel window in Culver and died instantly. At least that's what we have in this report here. Somebody could have shoved him, or he could have taken the leap. Now, we have to know for certain. What's on the claim report? Accidental. There was no inquest, no police investigation, and that's not good enough for us. Uh Uh-huh. This Henderson prominent? Well, he was big enough, Johnny. Cattleman, rancher. He was also a major stockholder and the only newspaper in Culver, so I doubt if his paper would suggest suicide or anything else. Do you? I don't know, Tim. I never met the editor. Well, meet him if you like. Talk to him. Talk to anybody in Culver. Find out what was what. <laughs> this is a lousy cigar. Johnny, you know how to handle these things. We have to have more information than this. Have you tried to do anything on it at all? Yeah, I phoned the sheriff's office long distance and talked to a man named Holton, Eve Holton. He said he'd be happy to cooperate. Uh, what else? I've phoned the beneficiary to get some information. Name's Pauline Henderson, his widow. Is she going to cooperate, too? I don't think so, pal. Huh? She hung up on me. We will continue with the Henderson matter in a moment. Friends, how'd you like to thrill your favorite youngster with some of the most exciting toys of the year? Picture the breathless excitement of any child surrounded by six gaily colored balloon-like giant animals up to three feet long, and all for the low, low price of just one dollar. First, you get Bounce-O the Clown with round pot belly and funny nose. Next comes Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo. Third, there's Rusko the Roller Skating Bear. He's two feet tall and looks almost like real. Fourth, there's Whitey the Fat Indoor Snowman. And fifth, Mortimer the Giant Mouse, 18 inches long and sure to scare the whiskers off any cat. That's five different giant animals. But now hold your breath for the most sensational toy of all, the star of the whole Christmas season, the jolly giant talking Santa Claus. Guaranteed to make everybody's Christmas a merrier one. He's a big, roly-poly, happy Santa. He stands erect on two legs, is actually over three feet tall and 32 inches around. Best of all, he actually talks. Just pull the tape and he says, Merry Christmas for all to hear. He's the biggest, merriest, talking as Santa ever. Sure to please your youngsters and spread good cheer. Yes, giant Santa proves there really is a Santa Claus. That's a total of six giant animals made of brightly colored, preformed, sturdy latex, which the kids can easily inflate. And the cost, just one dollar, not for each. Just one dollar for all six of these lovable giants who'll turn your home into a circus parade. And here's a surprise. Mail your order today and you'll also receive absolutely free Peter the Rabbit, actually over two feet tall with big red ears almost nine inches long. But you must send now. Rush one dollar plus ten cents for packing and mailing for each set you want to Giant Animals, Box 90, Grand Central Station, New York City. If not delighted with every one of your seven giant animals, return them to the Super Animals Company for a full refund, but keep the giant talking Santa as our gift. Order now. Supplies are limited. Rush $1.10 for packing and mailing for each set in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 90, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's $1 plus 10 cents with your name and address. Mail to Giant Animals, Box 90, Box 90, Grand Central Station, New York City. Giant Animals, Box 90, Grand Central Station, New York City. Expense account item two, $185.65. Airfare, Hartford, Connecticut to Great Falls, Montana. The nearest point I could make to Culver by air. Item three, three bucks. I took the train to Culver. Sometimes when I'm having nightmares, I dream about the smelter stack standing up against the cadaverous hills that lie to the south of town. Everything, including the three or four feet of snow covered with a uniform dinginess, made Culver an ugly little town set in an ugly notch between two ugly mountains. The only hotel in town was the Butte. It happened to be four stories high. It also happened to be the place where George Henderson had met his death. Okay, just a minute. Dollar? Yeah. I'm Eve Holton, sheriff here. Huh? You're from the insurance people, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. Been expecting that you'd be in sooner or later. Well, I'm glad to meet you, Mr. Holton. Call me Eve, son. Everybody does. Uh, hey, uh, got a drink on you? And uh, No, I haven't. Well, I got one on me. <laughs> nice and chilly, too. <laughs> well, I'll see if there's some glasses around here, Sheriff. You didn't waste any time looking me up. 
No, I guess I didn't, son. Thought it'd save a little time this way. Knew you'd be looking me up sooner or later. Really thought we ought to have this drink together. Private. May not have any more together while you're here. Uh-huh. Well, health and happiness, boy. Uh, same to you. <clears throat> now, this drink we're having. This is in your room, and I'm just a fellow welcoming you to Culver. In my office or on that street out there, I'm a sheriff. And I'm going to be real official. All right, go on. I want you to notice I'm not asking any questions of you, son. I'm just answering anything that you might want to ask me right now. All right. You're going to have to plow ahead yourself on this one pretty much alone. And let me tell you what kind of plowing you got in store for you. Excuse me. <sighs> now, first off, this is a little burg like you ain't used to. We got 3,500, 4,000 people living here. Some of them work in that mine you've seen on your way into town. Others hire out to work on the ranches around here. Some in business. Uh-huh. Very tight little place. We hardly ever fool around with anybody else. Sure. Now, you're here because your insurance company don't like to pay off on a policy without knowing whys and wherefores. They don't like the word accident without knowing some of the details. No, they don't. There's a lot of people here, most people, who don't care about those details. As a matter of fact, son, they'd all just as soon put old George Henderson down in the ground and say it was an accident and let it go with that. Well, maybe it was, Sheriff. I don't know. But I'm going to find out. Yeah, well, now, let me go on. Those people who don't like the details don't like detail getters. You understand? Uh, yeah. Scare you any? Not yet. <laughs> you do all right, son. So, maybe you'd kind of like to get your coat on and come to your funeral with me. Starts at three. Henderson's? Yeah. Give you a chance to look around, get the lay of the land. Okay, good idea. I wondered what kind of bull workers insurance companies turned out. I like you, Dollar. You're all right. You ain't bothering with any questions till you got some worthwhile asking. You tired? A little. Well, this won't take too long. A half hour later, I was standing beside Sheriff Eve Holton on a flat-top hillside that served as a cemetery. The snow was white and gleaming under the winter sun of the mid-afternoon skies, the air cold and crisp. To thee, our Heavenly Father, who knoweth all things, we commit the body of our beloved to thy eternal care. Thy will be done. Trusting ever in thy mercy, we invoke the consolation of thy sheltering wing. Earth to earth. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And sure and certain hope of resurrection into eternal life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Here. Here. Oh, that's that. Yeah. Poor George. Eve. Hmm? Which one is Mrs. Henderson? There. That's Pauline Henderson? Yeah, that's her. Well, she can't be more than 25. 26, to be exact, Dollar. I went to her birthday party two months ago. Well, how old was George Henderson? 59. Went to his party, too. Yeah. Pretty thing, hmm? Very. Any other family? Nope. No other wife, huh? Nope. Want to meet her? No, not right now. Mm hmm. Well, suit yourself. Kind of thought you might start thinking when you got a look at her. Hmm? Well, I just keep on the way you're doing. You're doing fine. When there's something you got to know, you'll find out. Well, Eve, I already know one thing. Yeah? What's that? I'm going to ask for a coroner's inquest. Just from seeing her? Just from seeing her. Mm-hmm. You're a sly one, Johnny. Johnny Dollar will be back in a moment to tell you about tomorrow's episode. 
Friends, send for your set of some of the most exciting toys of the year. Six giant inflatable toys for only one dollar, some up to three feet tall. You get Bounce the Happy Clown, Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo, Roscoe the two feet long roller skating bear, Whitey the fat indoor snowman, Mortimer the giant mouse 18 inches long, and last but not least, the great giant talking Santa, a roly-poly giant over three feet tall and 32 inches around the belly that actually says Merry Christmas out loud when you pull the tape. That's six sensational giant toys for only one dollar, made of sturdy, gaily colored latex that the kids can easily inflate. Send one dollar for each set to Giant Animals, Box 90, Grand Central Station, New York City. And if you order right now, you get Peter the Rabbit over two feet tall absolutely free. If not delighted with your giant animals, your money refunded immediately. Order today, you may never hear this offer again. Rush one dollar plus ten cents for packing and mailing in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 90, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's one dollar plus ten cents for each set with your name and address to Giant Animals, Box 90, Grand Central Station, New York City. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of The Henderson Matter. Tomorrow, I find out how hard it is to believe what I see. And I see plenty. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Keith Holden. How are you this morning? Oh, pretty good, Sheriff. How about yourself? Oh, I'm fine, Danny. You were over at the city hall this morning, huh? Yeah, that's right. I requested the coroner to conduct an inquest into the death of George Henderson. Yeah, I know. The coroner left it up to me. Huh? Yeah, came into my office and asked me if I had any reason to conduct an inquest into the death of George Henderson. I told him I didn't have any reason, but I'd do it if I was ordered to. Well, what happens now? Well, somebody will have to decide whether there's going to be an inquest or not. Who? Mayor, I guess. I don't know. Anyhow, you stirred up some action, and you'll be getting it. Yeah, where? Just stay where you are, son. My guess is it'll come right to you. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Paramount Insurance Adjusters, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Henderson matter. The death of George Henderson of Culver, Montana, where I am today. A casual certification announced the death is accidental, having been received by a fall from a hotel window. No one in Culver seemed to be too worried about any of the details. But details are my job. That's why I requested the coroner's office to conduct an inquest. I took Sheriff Holton's suggestion and waited to see what my request flushed up in the dingy-colored mountains of Culver. An hour later, my first bird winged up to my hotel room. He was a tall, gray-haired man in a Stetson, earmuffs, and the western version of a Chesterfield. His honor, Mayor Newton. Mr. Dollar, I want to talk to you about this request you made for an inquest into George Henderson's death. Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. You are aware, of course, that George's death, and he was one of my beloved and personal friends for many, many years, was a great blow to the entire community. No, I didn't know that, Mayor Newton. Huh? 
Only the smallest part of the community were at his funeral yesterday afternoon. His widow and I'd say not more than half a dozen other people. Uh. <clears throat> well, I understand that your insurance company is not quite satisfied with the certification. Is that correct? Uh, more or less. What would they need to be satisfied, sir? An exact knowledge of how Mr. Henderson fell out that hotel window. I would rather no inquest were held into Mr. Henderson's death. Why? Why, sir, George Henderson is dead and buried. It should remain that way. If an inquest were to be held, it would only prove that George fell out of a window. I beg you to consider that, Mr. Dollar. You seem very certain that an investigation would prove that death was accidental. Man. It was accidental. George fell out the window. Well, no, I can't just tell that to my insurance company, can I? Mm. <clears throat> Uh, we are a small community with a rudimentary police force, not equipped in any way for an exhaustive investigation, nor for the financial burden of such an investigation. I strongly urge you to reconsider this request for a coroner's inquest. You do? I do indeed. His untimely death was an unfortunate occurrence, outside the pale of any of our poor abilities to foresee. A terrible, terrible accident. I'd like proof of that. Proof? An inquest, Mr. Mayor. An inquest. All right. We will continue with the Henderson matter in a moment. Friends, how'd you like to thrill your favorite youngster with some of the most exciting toys of the year? Picture the breathless excitement of any child surrounded by six gaily colored balloon-like giant animals up to three feet long, and all for the low, low price of just one dollar. First, you get Bounce the Clown with round pot belly and funny nose. Next comes Hoppy the Australian kangaroo. Third, there's Roscoe the roller skating bear. He's two feet tall and looks almost like real. Fourth, there's Whitey the fat indoor snowman. And fifth, Mortimer the giant mouse, 18 inches long and sure to scare the whiskers off any cat. That's five different giant animals. But now hold your breath for the most sensational toy of all, the star of the whole Christmas season, the jolly giant talking Santa Claus. Guaranteed to make everybody's Christmas a merrier one. He's a big roly-poly happy Santa. He stands erect on two legs, is actually over three feet tall and 32 inches around. Best of all, he actually talks. Just pull the tape and he says, Merry Christmas for all to hear. He's the biggest, merriest talking as Santa ever. Sure to please your youngsters and spread good cheer. Yes, giant Santa proves there really is a Santa Claus. That's a total of six giant animals made of brightly colored preformed sturdy latex, which the kids can easily inflate. And the cost, just one dollar, not for each. Just one dollar for all six of these lovable giants who'll turn your home into a circus parade. And here's a surprise. Mail your order today and you'll also receive absolutely free Peter the Rabbit, actually over two feet tall with big red ears almost nine inches long. But you must send now. Rush one dollar plus ten cents for packing and mailing for each set you want to Giant Animals Box 46 Grand Central Station, New York City. If not delighted with every one of your seven giant animals, return them to the Super Animals Company for a full refund, but keep the giant talking Santa as our gift. Order now. Supplies are limited. Rush one dollar and ten cents for packing and mailing for each set in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals Box 46 Grand Central Station, New York City. That's one dollar plus ten cents with your name and address. Mail to Giant Animals, Box 46, Grand Central Station, New York City. Giant Animals, Box 46, Grand Central Station, New York City. My interview with Mayor Newton had convinced me that I'd get no real help from him in the Henderson matter. Quite the contrary. Expense account item three, 20 cents, coffee. Myself and Sheriff Eve Holton. Well, you got it. Huh? At the direction of Mr. Jackson. That's our coroner. He deputized me temporarily to conduct an inquest. It's going to take place tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock, City Hall. Tomorrow, Sheriff? Room 207. Well, Eve, you won't have time to do anything. No, I guess I won't. Not much, anyhow. Oh, brother. The mayor pitched me pretty hard for not having the inquest. Knew he would. Any idea why? Nope. You think somebody asked him to stop it? Yep. Who? Don't know, Johnny. Honest. The next morning, I struggled my way against a belligerent north wind to City Hall and the inquest, if you could call it that. I sat in the back of the room and listened while a Dr. Horace Nam assured the six-man jury that George Henderson was quite dead 
when he was called out of his office and examined him on the street. Dr. Nam reckoned George had died from a broken neck. An ancient bellhop, a desk clerk, and a chambermaid gave their versions of what had happened the day Henderson fell out the window. Now, you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, so help you, God. I do, Sheriff. I'm the acting coroner today, Miss Cubley. Uh, Sit down. Now, when did you see Mr. Henderson last? Last Thursday morning. Where was this, Miss Cubley? At the Butte Hotel. Mm Mm-hmm. You know what time of the morning it was? About ten o'clock. I went in to make his bed and straighten up his room. I see. I made his bed while he worked on some papers there, and then I left. Did you see him after that? No, sir. You didn't see him come downstairs for breakfast or anything? No, sir. Do you know if anybody went up to see him? I believe I saw Mrs. Henderson in the lobby after that. Do you see Mrs. Henderson in this room? Yes, sir. I, I believe that's Mrs. Henderson over there. No, that's Mrs. Henderson. Now, do you know if Mrs. Henderson visited Mr. Henderson in his room? No, sir. I don't know that. Miss Cubley... Did you happen to notice if anyone else went up to Mr. Henderson's room that morning? No, sir. It went on all morning long. Sheriff Holton, acting in the coroner's position, questioned person after person. All had more or less the same vague knowledge concerning George Henderson's death. I was most interested in Pauline Henderson's testimony. Now then, Mrs. Henderson, when did you last see your husband? Thursday. I went to see him about noon, maybe a little before. Where did you see him, Miss Henderson? At the Butte Hotel, in his room there. The same room he occupied prior to his death? Of course. The same room from which he fell? Yes. Were you alone when you went to see him, Mrs. Henderson? Yes. I must have left before 12.30. I had an appointment at the dentist. And that was the last time you saw your husband alive? Yes. I was still in the dentist's chair when they told me he'd fallen out the window. What uh, what did you and your husband talk about, Mrs. Henderson? Must I answer that? Well, we're trying to determine something here. I'd appreciate it. George and I discussed our divorce. Could you tell us about that? George and I decided to part about a month ago. He moved out of the house and moved into the hotel. Mm Mm-hmm. Outside of the divorce, were you on good terms? Oh, yes. We've always been on good terms. Mrs. Henderson, do you think there's a chance that he might have thrown himself out that window? Yes, sir. Mrs. Henderson, do you think he might have thrown himself out that window? No. At least not over us, if that's what you mean. As far as you knew, was your husband in good health? Yes, he was. You happen to know when he was examined last? Oh, a month or so ago. He was in perfect health. Uh, One more thing. Did Mr. Henderson drink? Yes. Did he drink that morning with you? I think he had a couple of drinks. Yes, yes, he had a drink or two while we were talking. He could have stumbled at that window. The clothes were New York, the perfume Paris, the jewelry Tiffany's. The look you might expect it on the Riviera, where everybody tries to act bored with too many good things in life. Her dress, black for the occasion of death, was cut too well and too carefully for her to pass as a grieving widow. She answered the questions without hesitation or emotion. Fifteen minutes later, the jury brought in the expected verdict. Therefore, it is the opinion of this jury that the said deceased George Walter Henderson came to his death as a result of injuries incurred in a fall from the fourth floor of the Butte Hotel at or about 12.45 p.m. on the 19th day of this month. No evidence to the contrary. It is deemed and declared that the manner of death was accidental. Adjourned. And that was it. As far as Culver's people, its police, and its mayor were concerned. Yeah, the mayor. Well, Mr. Dollar, I hope you're satisfied. It was a pretty good inquest, Mayor Newton. I trust the official verdict of the jury will answer any questions your insurance company might have had on their minds and clear this whole matter up. Hmm? I'll forward it to them and tell them the circumstances under which the inquest was conducted, Mr. Mayor. Satisfactory, I trust. No, but it served a purpose. Now that everybody thinks it was an accident, everybody will breathe easier. Certainly. Yeah. If everybody's relaxing like that... Somebody's going to get careless. See you, Mr. Mayor. Johnny Dollar will be back in a moment to tell you about tomorrow's episode. 
Friends, send for your set of some of the most exciting toys of the year. Six giant inflatable toys for only one dollar, some up to three feet tall. You get Bounce the Happy Clown, Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo, Roscoe the two feet long roller skating bear, Whitey the fat indoor snowman, Mortimer the giant mouse 18 inches long, and last but not least, the great giant talking Santa, a roly-poly giant over three feet tall and 32 inches around the belly that actually says Merry Christmas out loud when you pull the tape. That six sensational giant toys for only one dollar, made of sturdy gaily colored latex that the kids can easily inflate. Send one dollar for each set to Giant Animals, Box 46, Grand Central Station, New York City. And if you order right now, you get Peter the Rabbit over two feet tall absolutely free. If not delighted with your giant animals, your money refunded immediately. Order today, you may never hear this offer again. Rush one dollar plus ten cents for packing and mailing in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 46, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's one dollar plus ten cents for each set with your name and address. To Giant Animals, Box 46, Grand Central Station, New York City. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of The Henderson Matter. People do get careless tomorrow, all over Culver, Montana. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Eve Holden, son. Hi, Sheriff. You put in a call for me, did you? Yes, I'm ready to go to work. Now that the inquest's been held and George Henderson's death is officially an accident, I might be able to move around your little town a little easier. What can I do for you? Help me to move around. Uh, case is closed, as far as I'm concerned. Eve, what's the matter with you? That inquest was a farce. For all I know, Henderson could have been pushed out of that hotel window. The attitude of different people in this town makes that whole oh, thing... Hold on now, son. Hold on. I meant to say it's closed as far as my office is concerned. Personally, I think it needs investigating. We can help each other, maybe, you and me. Can I come over? Oh, I better come there. You know how folks are around here. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Culver, Montana, to Paramount Insurance Adjusters, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Henderson matter. The question, accident, suicide, or murder? Expense account item four, $3.48. One day later to Tim Connors' office in Hartford explaining the situation in Culver. I'll, uh, I'll read it back to you, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Tim Connors, Paramount Insurance Adjusters, Hartford, Connecticut. Coroner's inquest into death of George Henderson, policy number EMP-19667, found death to be accidental. In my opinion, the inquest was not thorough. Have decided to stay on in Culver and conduct my own investigation. If any change, please advise via Western Union, Butte Hotel, Culver. Am forwarding copy of coroner's verdict this date. Best regards, Dollar. Correct? Okay. Oh, uh, Mr. Dollar. Hmm? Good luck. <laughs> yeah, sure. Expense account item five, 68 cents, postage. I mailed a copy of the coroner's verdict to Hartford Airmail Special. After that, I went back to my hotel to wait for the sheriff, Eve Holton. Come on in, Eve. I... 
Oh. Hello. Hello. Uh, Mr. Dollar, my name's Porter. I'm the manager of this hotel. Oh, well, come in, Mr. Porter. I I can't right now. I've got some other things to attend to. Well, anything I can do for you, Mr. Porter? I'm going to have to ask you for your room, Mr. Dollar. Oh? When? Uh, Today. Any particular reason? We're all filled up. Uh, the, The room's been reserved for six weeks. By whom? What? Who reserved it? Why, uh, a man from Bozeman. It's a sort of convention. Sort of convention. What kind of convention is that, Mr. Porter? Look, Mr. Dollar, you'll have to leave this room today. The man's coming in tonight. Uh Aha. And there's no other hotel in town. That's the way it is, Mr. Dollar. No other place to stay? No. So I have to pack my bags and get out of town, is that it? I must have the room, Mr. Dollar. Who asked you to say you wanted the room, Mr. Porter? Who asked you to come here and kick me out? Why, no one, I... Well, you go back to no one, Mr. Porter, and you tell no one that I'm staying right here in this room here in Culver until I finish what I have to do here. You tell that to no one, will you? Mr. Dollar, I'd I'd hate to call the police. Go ahead, Mr. Porter. Be sure and tell them about the sort of convention you're having and how all the rooms are sold out. Tell them about Mr. No One and tell them I called your bluff. Anything else, Mr. Porter? I was at the stage where I was beginning to take notes for myself. Note one, the mayor didn't want to have an inquest into the death of George Henderson. Note two, when they did have an inquest, they didn't want to really find out anything. Note three, Mr. Hotel Manager wanted me to keep on not finding out anything by getting me out of town. I explained all of this to Eve Holton when he showed up a half an hour later. Well, kind of of tight, isn't it? I don't know what that means, Sheriff, but it's pretty stupid. (laughs) Yeah, it's stupid, son, but it could be effective. Now, I'll tell you what. If Porter calls the police, I'm the police. So don't worry about that. I'll hem him and haw him. All right, thanks. Now then, uh, tell me how much your insurance company's stuck for. $50,000 if Henderson's death goes by as an accident. The good book says that's what it was. I know, I know. There's a chance, too, he had a heart failure and fell out of that window. No, sure. Always a chance. We might have to dig him up and find out, Sheriff. Oop. No, hold on. Autopsies and digging people up is one thing you'd have a hard time doing around here. I might insist on it. I don't know. Well, let that go for now. Say, tell me about Mrs. Henderson. Where's she from? Here. Right here in Culver. Now, she didn't get that mink coat and those diamonds she was wearing at the inquest in Culver. More important, she didn't get that continental look here either. So what's the story? Well, her name was Pauline Underwood before she married George, born and raised right here in Culver. Of course, she went to school in the East, and she's been in Europe a couple of times, but most of her life's been right here. She is a mighty pretty widow. And a mighty rich one, too. Henderson had it. I know. This divorce she talked about at the inquest yesterday. Well, everybody in town knew they weren't getting along, never did get along. How could they? Pauline's 26 and George is 59. He could have been her father. As a matter of fact, he almost was. Well, tell me about that. You got a drink? Hmm? Oh, yeah. Well, George raised Pauline from the time she was 14. He paid for all her schooling and growing up. She didn't have any folks after her old man died. George was pretty good to her. He sure was. <laughs> was he a friend of her parents? Well, Tom Underwood worked out at the ranch for George. When he died, there was Pauline standing there. Oh, yeah. Oh, thanks. And she eventually married him and his money, huh? Well, I, I wouldn't put it that way exactly. I, I think she liked him. Now, I, I've gone over what you're thinking, son. Those two were talking about divorce for some time. The papers had been drawn up for a settlement. She'd have got a lot of alimony and so on. Oh, Pauline had no call to push him out that window or have him pushed out. At least not for money. All right. Suppose he didn't want a divorce. Suppose he loved her and she came to the hotel room that morning and he pleaded with her to try all over again. Suppose she said no. Suppose she said no in a great big cold way. And George Henderson sat there and thought about it after she left. And he got sick all over and he walked over to that window and... Suicide? What do you think? You know him. Uh, He wasn't a suicide type. Oh, nobody's the suicide type until they come to the end of the line, Eve. Then it's too late to interview them and ask them how they got there. Everybody seems to think it was an accident, so I'm just throwing words around. Well, you have a right to do that if you aren't satisfied, son. Hey, getting back to this hotel again. Who might want me to get out of town and not ask any questions? Anybody. Well, who? 
No idea. But it's somebody who has some feelings in this. Hey, who owns this hotel, Eve? Noah Baxter. Who's Noah Baxter? Rancher. Got a place about 15 miles from here. Pretty big man. Uh Uh-huh. Friend of Henderson's? Yeah. Hmm. Let me put that question a little different. Baxter, a friend of Mrs. Henderson's? I don't know. Can you find out? I can try. Well, find out about him and any other friends, Eve. Friends that might be younger, that might have gone to Europe or school in the East. Yeah. Sure. What are you thinking now, son? Well, now, if I were Mrs. Henderson and my husband fell out of a window in this hotel and killed himself, I'd hire a lawyer and I'd sue the hotel for damages. If the insurance company didn't pay off my claim, I'd hire a lawyer and insist that they pay that claim. I'd do those things right away, Sheriff, especially if I thought it was all legitimate. Yeah. Yeah. Two hours later, I received a wire from Tim Connors. He requested me to look up a man named Thurber, an insurance broker living in Great Falls. Expense account item six, $4.92, tank of gas. I borrowed Sheriff Holton's car and drove the 80-odd miles to Great Falls that afternoon. Mr. Thurber bought lunch. My Lord, I hope there isn't anything to all this, Mr. Dollar. I just hope there isn't. George Henderson. Yeah, well, there isn't anything to anything yet, Mr. Thurber. I'm still trying to find out the facts. Oh, I knew you were over in Culver. I tried to call you there a couple of times. You were out both times. Finally, I put in a call to the home office in Hartford. I talked to this man, Connors, with the adjustment agency. Yeah. You see, Mr. Dollar, it's like this. I've been over in Jackson Hole for five days now hunting duck. We were way in, and I didn't hear about Henderson's death until I got back yesterday. Uh Uh-huh. Now, uh, look, Mr. Dollar, I don't know what reflection this will have on your attitude toward this case... But two days before I left, Mr. Henderson telephoned me here in Great Falls. He said he wanted to change the beneficiary on his policy. Oh, in other words, he was going to cut his wife out? Yes, I suppose so. I know they weren't getting along. There'd been talk of divorce. Yes, I guess so. Uh Uh-huh. Did he name a new beneficiary? Yes, a schoolteacher in Culver named Matilda Knickerbocker. Everybody calls her Maddie. What was his connection with her? None that I know of. I think it was just a name for him to throw in until he could decide on another beneficiary why he didn't have Wait a it. minute. Matty Knickerbocker. Just a school teacher. Everybody knows her. He was awful mad when he talked to me that day. I could tell it in his voice. Now, here's what might interest you just a little more. The day I left in my hunting trip, Mr. Henderson phoned me again. He said to never mind. Mrs. Henderson was still his beneficiary. Had you changed the policies yet? No. Are you sure it was Henderson who telephoned you? Well, yes, of I think it was him. Do you remember when you got the call? Oh, somewhere around noon, a little later, I guess. He died between 12.30 and 1. And it must have been just before he fell out the window. He phoned you long distance from cover, huh? Yes, sir. Well, he was supposed to have been in the hotel all morning, so he had to phone from his room. Well, you can check that, can't you? <laughs> You'd be surprised how hard it is to check simple things like that around the Butte Hotel. Did you know Henderson very well, Mr. Thurber? He was a customer. I wrote a lot of insurance for him. Know his wife? Oh, yes. Well, tell me about them. Go ahead, Mr. Thurber. Uh, Now, look, accidents rarely have reason behind them. Suicides and murders always do. You don't think it was an accident? Well, let's say I've heard enough and seen enough to make it a draw so far. Go ahead, tell me about them. And I wish I was married to Mrs. Henderson. I mean, I wish she could see me. I think most any man who's ever met her hoped the same thing. Young men, old men, any kind. But she picked George. George was as tough and leathery as these mountains around us, exactly her opposite. But Pauline married him. He raised her. He was close to her all her adult life. Yes. But Mr. Dollar, you know and I know she didn't have to marry him. She could have married anybody here in Culver or anybody in London or Paris. You see what I mean? And not quite. Well... I always had the idea that after she married him, she kept letting him know she could have had anybody else she wanted. Go ahead, Thurber. I think she married him for his money. I think she would have killed him for his money. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Henderson matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, the whole affair becomes a town issue, and I become the town goat. Incidentally, let me take a moment to say thanks for the many kind letters you've sent. We appreciate them more than you know. 
And I only wish it were possible to answer them all personally. Again, thank you. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Mrs. Henderson. You asked me to call, Mr. Dollar? Yes, Mrs. Henderson. I'm with Paramount Insurance Adjusters. Oh, yes. You probably know we asked for the inquest into your husband's death. Yes, I know. We're trying to clear up the entire matter as quickly as we can, Mrs. Henderson. I'd like to talk to you. Oh? Hate to trouble you at a time like this. Well, that's all right, Mr. Dollar. When do you want to talk? May I come out to the house this afternoon? There's a nice restaurant called Big Horn Lodge on the highway. How about meeting you there at, say, uh, four o'clock? Good. I'll be there. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Paramount Insurance Adjusters, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Henderson matter. Expense account continued. Item 7, 5 bucks. One pair of galoshes, believe it or not. It snowed in Culver, Montana during the night, all night. By morning, 14 inches of fine new snow covered everything in sight. After my phone call to Mrs. Henderson, I spent the morning trying to rent an automobile. There was none to be had, so that afternoon I dropped over to see Eve Holton, my sheriff friend. Well, son, you're going to catch your death unless you start wearing this car. Yeah, I'll remember that, Eve. But maybe I won't need one. Oh? Yeah, I think I'll be leaving Culver pretty soon. Well, I hope you don't mean that, son. I'm afraid I do. I'll have to tie this case up one way or another pretty quick. Why? My company wants me to get back home. I got a letter this morning. Oh, well, how can I help you? Well, for one thing, you can lend me your car again. I, uh, I have a date with a lady out at the Bighorn Lodge. <laughs> Pretty fancy. You can have the old thing anytime you want it. You know that, son. Who's the lady? George Henderson's widow. Yeah. Oh. Now, I know what you're going to say. Why go after her? Why bother her until I have something to go on? Well, I got to do something, Eve. I'm no nearer now to knowing whether Henderson was pushed out that hotel window, fell, or jumped. I think I have enough of an idea of Henderson and his wife to pick up some valuable information from her. Any objections? Nope. Johnny, a couple of days ago, you asked me to look up people who might have been especially friendly to Mrs. Henderson. You still want to know about them? Yeah, sure. Well, I'm working on it. Anyone so far? Nobody I'd put in that category. What time do you have to be at the Bighorn? Four. It'll take you a while. Wouldn't hurt to start right now. He's, uh, she's parked out back. Okay, thanks, Eve. Good luck. And don't let her rang dangle you, son. She could do it if she wanted to. Goodbye, Eve. Ten minutes later, I was on the road to Bighorn Lodge, which also happened to be the same road I'd traveled two days before to attend George Henderson's funeral. As I drove past the graveyard, white and stark against the blue winter sky, I noticed a car parked along the side of the road, a little Chevy Coupe, about 
there was the figure of a woman all alone standing by George Henderson's fresh grave. Her head was bowed. She didn't notice me as I walked up. A gray-haired woman, about 45, slight, delicate, gentle. <gasps> oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to start it. Oh, that's all right. Must be getting late. Dear, it is. Uh, do I know you? Why, I don't know. I'm Maddie Knickerbocker. The name had startled me. The day before, an insurance broker in Great Falls had mentioned her, told me that George Henderson had named her his beneficiary, then changed his mind a few minutes before he died. Your name's not Campbell, is it? No. Johnny Dollar. Oh, Johnny Dollar. You remind me of a boy I had in one of my classes once, Tory Campbell. Oh, you're a teacher, Miss Knickerbocker? <laughs> yes, yes. Everybody knows me, I think. Or at least I flatter myself that way. <laughs> well, I should be going. I, uh... I knew Mr. Henderson, too. Oh? He was a wonderful man, George. He was very dear to me. I'll find it difficult getting used to the fact that he'll never be around anymore. George had a wonderful laugh, didn't he? Yes. Yes, he did, Mrs. Knickerbocker. I never really thought that he ever grew up. Of course, you knew him in a business way, and I'm sure he was very, very grown up in business. But it doesn't hurt to think of him this way now, does it? I don't think so, Miss Knickerbocker. I didn't come to his funeral. I didn't think I could bear it. I thought I'd just drive out this afternoon and say goodbye by myself. Well, I apologize for interrupting you. Oh, not at all. Please. <laughs> Funny little things. Hmm? The birds in the snow. Oh. Such tiny, wonderful little things. A little bit of God in each of them, Mr. Dollar, wouldn't you say? Yes, ma'am. I don't know why... I think George would like to know they're here, near him. Miss Knickerbocker, I have to tell you... No, that... you don't, Mr. Dollar. I know who you really are. Everyone in town knows. You seem like a nice young man. Was it curiosity that made you stop your car? Yeah, I suppose so. I apologize. Oh, you needn't. I'm just an old friend of George's. Saying goodbye to him. Good afternoon, Mr. Dollar. Goodbye. Talking to Maddie Knickerbocker, I felt that for the first time, somebody, namely Maddie, had talked frankly and truthfully about George Henderson. I was still thinking of the frail, drab little woman with the nice blue eyes when I met Pauline Henderson at the Bighorn Lodge. these matters you want to clear up, Mr. Dollar? Oh, just some doubts in my mind about your husband's death. What do you drink? Perno. Perno. I learned to like it in France. All right. Uh, one Perno, bourbon, a little water on the side. Yes, sir. You sound like George when you order. Hey, I like your Bighorn Lodge. And I have to say, when it's elegant in the West, it's elegant. I'd like a light, please. Oh, sir. Sure. Thank you. Mrs. Henderson... Do you mind if I don't stall any longer with the drinks, the smokes, and the compliments? I'm surprised you've stalled this long. I've heard you're a very blunt and impulsive man. I spoke to an insurance agent named Thurber yesterday in Great Falls. Your husband's agent. Mr. Thurber told me that your husband wanted to name a new beneficiary last week. Really? Yeah. He named Matilda Knickerbocker. Matty Knickerbocker. I'm not surprised, I suppose. Matty's a lovely woman. I know George was very fond of Mr. her. Mr. Thurber also told me that Mr. Henderson changed his mind about that the day he died. In fact, he phoned Mr. Thurber in Great Falls and told him to leave the policy as it was. He did that a few minutes after you left his hotel room, a few minutes before he died. Can you explain any of that, Mrs. Henderson? Why don't you ask Maddie Knickerbocker? Because I don't think she'd know. I ran into her this afternoon and I talked to her. Or not about this, just about other things. I'll look her up again if I have to. But it's you I want information from now. Then why don't you ask what you mean, Mr. Dollar? All right. Did something happen in that hotel room that made him change his mind about you? That's better. 
I do wish that ridiculous little man would bring our drinks. He will. Don't misunderstand what happened in the hotel room. George and I were going to be divorced. He moved out of the house a month ago. We went to his attorneys and drew up a tentative property settlement. You mean... Dunlap, Edder, Reardon, and Blake, Great Falls. They have a copy of that settlement. George was quite generous to me. So I didn't kill him for his money, if that's what you're thinking. Here we are, sir. Colonel Bourbon. Thank you. I didn't see George for mm, three weeks or so after we made the settlement. Then we happened to meet one day in Culver, and... Well, we had a rather bitter argument. It was one of those ridiculous things. We quarreled and parted very angrily. The whole thing was childish. My first impulse was to go right back to the lawyers and demand every unreasonable thing I could on the divorce settlement. I guess George's first impulse was to cancel me out as his beneficiary. Did you go to a lawyer, Mrs. Henderson? No. No, I cooled off. I cooled off considerably, Mr. Dollar. After all, George had been everything to me most of my life. I was truly sorry we never got along as man and wife. I'm glad that we made it up before he died. That morning. He apologized when I came by the hotel. I apologized. After I left, he fell out the window. Then I can assume that this business with the policies had to do with the argument. Assume what you like, Mr. Dollar. I can understand why you're annoyed by me and my questions. It's just that it's kind of hard for us to believe that a man involved in divorcing his wife would still name her as his beneficiary. I say that because of past experience. Oh, it's happened, but as usual. I could have told you that we were reconciled that day in the hotel, that we were going to drop the whole divorce matter, and that George was coming back to the house to live. Yes, you could have told me that, Mrs. Henderson. Mr. Connors in our home office in Hartford called you a few days ago. You hung up on him. Why? Well, I was very upset. I've never been a widow before. Uh-huh. I believe you, Mrs. Henderson, sitting here like this. You're a lovely person, and I know it. And you know it. And this is a pretty nice place to conduct business. Why didn't you ask me to your home? I preferred to talk to you here. That's what I thought. I saved all the, did your husband have any enemies, and did he seem depressed questions for another time. But before I went to bed that night, I read and reread Mrs. Henderson's testimony given at the coroner's inquest. The next morning, I interviewed all of the people at the Butte Hotel who'd been on duty the day Henderson fell out the window. After that, I dropped in to see Eve Holton. Here, here it is, Johnny, right here. Personal effects of the deceased included four suits of men's clothing, 14 shirts, five pairs of holes. Was there a bottle in that room, Sheriff? Liquor? Yeah. No, no bottle. Nothing like it, son. All right. He didn't call down and have a bellboy bring him a bottle or send him any drinks. The chambermaid swears there was no liquor in his room all the time he lived at the hotel. You say he was a light drinker. Now, what light drinker takes a nip before he has his breakfast? Who said he had a drink that morning? Mrs. Henderson. What? On the witness stand, under oath at the inquest. She testified that her husband had a drink before she came up to the room and while she was there. Now, mind you, she didn't say he was drunk, but she did say he had been drinking. You read over that transcript. So? So I think she threw that in, made sure it got in, because it's sometimes hard to believe that a cold, sober man will walk out of a hotel window and kill himself accidentally. A drunk or a drinker might do it. You and I and everybody at that inquest somehow got the impression that Henderson was slightly tipsy that morning. And Mrs. Henderson saw to that. Now then, if Henderson had a drink, I want to know where he got it. Tell me, Eve, no bottle in the room, no bottle brought up to the room. Where did he get that drink? That's a pretty good question, son. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Henderson matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, the wind-up. Yeah, the whole case blows sky high. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. 
Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. I have a call for you from Hartford. Go ahead, please. Johnny? Right here. Connors at Paramount Adjusters. Say, what was this wire, Johnny? You serious about denying liability to Mrs. Henderson? I sure am. I think it'll bring the whole thing out in the open. This is pretty serious. Have you got any concrete evidence that death wasn't accidental? Jim, I have a copy of the coroner's inquest. Concrete evidence that Mrs. Henderson lied under oath. She said her husband was drinking the morning he died. Everybody here believed he was a little crocked when he fell out that hotel window. I've got proof that he didn't have a drink that morning. What proof? No bottle in his room. No bottle brought there. Nothing. What do you say? Don't make a move, kiddo. I'll get the first plane. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Paramount Insurance Adjusters, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Henderson matter. Sheriff Holton agreed that there was enough of a doubt about the circumstances prior to George Henderson's accidental death to warrant an official re-examination of all the facts. He promised me the police would start an immediate investigation. That was all I needed. I knew Mrs. Henderson would be re-questioned and that the pressure would start to build up. Fourteen hours later, when Tim Connors arrived in Culver, I had some pressure of my own. Well, Johnny, what? Well, the best thing we can do now is move in. Deny liability on the grounds that the accident is not proved. I suppose Mrs. Henderson sues us. All right, let her. Then the burden of proving that her husband's death was accidental would be on her. Look, Tim, contrary to her testimony under oath, Henderson didn't have a drink that morning he died. All right, she made a mistake. He had a heart attack, got dizzy, and tumbled out of the window. He wasn't drunk. Oh, don't talk nonsense, Tim. Listen to me. Mrs. Henderson was ready for the coroner's jury a couple of days ago, and she was ready for my questions when I saw her yesterday. The only one she wasn't ready for was you a few days ago when you phoned her long distance. You said she hung up on you. Well, she half apologized to me for that, but it was because she couldn't think of anything to say. Well, maybe you're right. But suppose he did die accidentally, and suppose it is a just insurance claim. I tell you it isn't. Now, the fact that she made a mistake testifying about him having a drink and... Hey, Johnny, do you have anything else? Three things. Instinct, experience, and statistics. Pauline Henderson's a young woman. She married a wealthy older man. With him out of the way, she has all his money and all her youth. All right, I'm going to phone the company as soon as I can find a phone. Tell them I'm working for evidence, and the best way to get it is to bring Mrs. Henderson out in the open. File a complaint against her. What charge? Suspected murder. Oh, no, Johnny, that'd get us in all kinds of trouble. Remember the drink, Tim. Henderson didn't have the drink. Now we'll have to have more than that. I'm sorry, Johnny. All right, I'll get you more. An hour later, I was with Sheriff Holden comparing notes. He reported that after questioning Mrs. Henderson, she admitted she might have been mistaken about Henderson drinking the morning of his death. She wasn't sure. But Eve Holton said what we both were thinking. He went in front of the coroner's jury and gave a misleading impression, son. Made us think that George was drunk and stumbled out the window. Well, we better find out who helped her pull this off. 
Sheriff Holton had every man in his office working on the case by then. It was a long, tedious job of combing over everything in Pauline Henderson's background to find a possible accomplice. About five in the afternoon, I drove to the Henderson Ranch with Holton. Mrs. Henderson was out, but we interviewed one of the servants. That's right, sir. Once, twice a week. Uh Uh-huh. You know where she drove to on these trips? I have no idea. Mrs. Henderson get up early in the morning, be gone all day. How do you know she went out of town? Well, she generally take a small suitcase with her, change her clothes. You don't take those when you're visiting a friend in town, do you? Tell us what car she'd use on these trips. A Cadillac. Always come back covered with mud and ice. Always have to be washed up. Mr. Henderson used to complain about that. About the car being dirty? Uh, about the trips, mostly. He and Mrs. Henderson had some pretty good arguments about him. He'd say Mrs. Henderson shouldn't visit that man. What man? Just that man. I never knew who it was they argued about. You've known Mrs. Henderson quite a long time, huh? Yes, sir. Know her when she was a little girl, when she first came here. Saw her grow up, go away to school, go away to Europe, come back a little more grown up, a little different every time. Were you surprised when Mr. Henderson married her? Well, no. Well, yes, guess I was. Because she was so much younger? Not that so much. I mean, well, Mr. Henderson, he had something about the plains and cattle and mountains about him. When he moved, it was as big as all them things. Mrs. Henderson was different. She didn't fit in here? Is that what you're trying to say? I think she fit. Not like him, though. Before they were married, they were sort of like good friends. I mean, they'd ride horses and go hunting and laugh and talk about different things. Mrs. Henderson, she traveled Europe, saw so many things and places in the world. She fit here, but then she didn't belong here. I feel awful about Mr. Henderson's being dead. If there was anything wrong with the way he died, I'd like to be fixed. Mrs. Henderson would probably fire me for talking like this, but I don't care. This house isn't the same no more. By the time we got back into town, Sheriff Holton's boys had discovered the names of three men who had been seen at various places around Culver in the company of Mrs. Henderson. Rod Tyler. Oh, who's he? Mining engineer. He's been away from here for over a year now. now, Here's another one, Sam Pollard. Sam died six months ago. Hey. What? Noah Baxter. Noah Baxter. That name's vaguely familiar. Yeah, he owns a hotel you're staying in. A couple of ranches, too. Well, he might have been the one who tried to have you thrown out. He also owns the mayor. Young man? About 30, 35. Let's go see him. Another drive. This time north of Culver to the Baxter Ranch. We found Noah Baxter busy with his help shoring horns on cattle. A lean, tall man with thin features. If you're trying to find out if I've been seeing Pauline on the sly while she'd been married to George, why didn't you come right out and ask? All right, have you? No. Not on the sly. There's nothing between us. George knew any time she came over here to see me. He was a good friend of mine. I'm sorry he's dead. Pauline's a good friend of mine, too. I'm sorry you people are thinking what you are about us. Let's go up to the house. It's getting cold. All right, Stan, that's enough for today. No, I got to ask you this. Where were you last Thursday? The day George died, Sheriff? Yeah. I was right here. Can you prove that? <laughs> sure. Ask anybody. You boys want a drink? No, thanks. No, thanks. No. Well, I do. Mac! Mac! Let me get it myself. When was the last time you were in cover, Mr. Baxter? Three, four weeks ago. My cook and the others handle what supplies we need. Do you mind if we talk to some of your help around here? No. What do you want to talk to him about? About last Thursday, about what happened when Mrs. Henderson came here to visit? It wouldn't look good if she came here to visit me, would it? Well, that depends on the circumstances, no? She'd come and sit there and read and look at some of those paintings. We'd talk when I had time. Anything wrong with that? No, no. Mr. Baxter, I think I ought to tell you. I've asked my company to file a complaint against Mrs. Henderson. Suspicion of murder. Oh. I'd like to tell you something. 
She didn't kill him and she didn't have him killed. She loved him a lot more than George loved her, I think. Both of you know her. Her dad was a drunken cowhand. When he died, George took her over, gave her everything. So you see, you're wrong. She loved George for giving her what he gave her and mostly for being the kind of a man he was. I lied to you a couple of minutes ago. There was something between us. It was bound to happen sooner or later. She'd come here to cry on my shoulder, and I... I let her. Cry? About George. He wanted to divorce her. Didn't you know that? I had the idea it was the other way around. <laughs> You're all wrong. George raised her, educated her, made her into a woman, and then he married her. And she wasn't what he wanted at all. Do you know who George wanted to marry? Matty Knickerbocker, the schoolmarm. Go on. Oh, there was nothing between George and Matty, but there would have been if he'd lived. What about you and Mrs. Henderson? Yeah. The thing that was between us was that I wanted her. She didn't want me, but I wanted her. I was glad when she told me about the divorce coming up. I really think she would have listened to me. But she wanted to be married to George. She really loved him. Sure you don't want one of these? No. No. And I really loved her. I went to see George last Thursday at his hotel. You know why? To tell him to go back to Pauline. Yeah. Because I knew what he meant to her. <laughs> You can talk to my people around here. They'd lie for me and say I was here last Thursday all day. They'd tell you that Pauline never came to see me. They'd lie right down the line for me. But, Mr. Dollar, I can't let you get out that complaint and take her in. One of my trucks was taking some beef to the hotel last Thursday. I rode in with the driver and went in the back way. I went right up to George's room to talk to him. Pauline had just left. I wanted to talk to him about the same things I've been telling you. I didn't want to hurt him. I loved him, the same as everybody loved him. When I got to his room, he wouldn't let me talk at all. He was mad that I interfered, and he tried to swing on me. I shoved him once. He went out the window. That's all. I killed him. <laughs> Expense account, item 8, $58.15, hotel and food while in Culver, Montana. Item 9, same as item 2, transportation by train and plane back to Hartford. Item 10, $88, miscellaneous. Expense account total, $802.50. Remarks? We still had to pay double indemnity. Maddie Knickerbocker, Pauline Henderson, Noah Baxter, they'll pay another way. With the hurt that comes to nice people. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another exciting story beginning next Monday night. Next week, a real mystery complete with plenty of action, a beautiful blonde and a killer lurking in the shadows. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Lillian Bayef, Irene Tedrow, D.J. Thompson, Herb Ellis, Marvin Miller, Forrest Lewis, Bob Bruce, and Russ Thorson. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Joe Parker, Johnny. Shorty Mutual. Oh, hi, Joe. What's on your mind? A gorgeous doll named Dolly McLean. Remember her? Sure. The champagne dream girl. Yeah. Dancing darling of the roaring 20s. Uh, finally married Barnaby Cronin, didn't she? Right. And for a wedding present, he bought her the Circle of Fire. Oh, yeah. One of the five most beautiful necklaces in the world. Diamonds and emeralds. Worth a half a million. It's been lying in a bank vault for the last ten years since Barnaby died. We carry the insurance. So? She's coming out of seclusion, Johnny, giving a party. Just like the old days, she says. May go on for a week. Her last fling. And she's going to wear the circle of fire. Uh-oh. Get the picture? Gallons of champagne, everything mixed up, crazy. And that old lady with a half million bucks around her neck. Target. You've got a problem, Joe. Johnny, we've got a problem. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Surety Mutual and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during investigation of the Cronin matter. Item one, $14.80, transportation to New York and to the apartment of America's one-time dream girl. One time, a long time ago. How do you do? I'm Johnny Dollar. I believe Mrs. Cronin is expecting me. I'm Mrs. Cronin, and yes, I am expecting you. Won't you come in? Oh, thanks. I did have butlers and maids and such for years, scads of them. But since Barnaby passed away, I've just hibernated, you might say. Oh, in here, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. Ten years now in this same little apartment. As you can see, I've just been living like a little mouse. It looks very comfortable. Oh, I suppose it's comfortable enough, but... Oh, Sylvia, I'd forgotten you were still here. Mm Mm-hmm. But not for long, Mrs. Cronin. Oh, no. Please stay. We'll have some tea or sherry or something as soon as... Oh, you two, do you know each other? No, I'm afraid we don't. Oh, but of course not. How could you? Uh, Sylvia, this is Mr. Dollar. Miss Blake. How do you do, Miss Blake? Hello. Mr. Dollar's here to talk to me about, uh, well, something or other. I'm not quite sure what, as a matter of fact. It won't take but a few minutes... If uh, Miss Blake would excuse us. Sure. Go ahead. Have at it. Well, if you'll come this way, Mr. Dollar. Don't you leave now, Sylvia. Not a chance. I just spotted your bottle of tea. I'll have one or two with soda, if you don't mind. With soda? Oh, I see what you mean. You young people. In here, Mr. Uh, Mr. Dollar. You by any chance, Johnny Dollar? Yeah, that's right. Uh, Why, Miss Blake? Just wondered. Well, he's looking at you. And, brother, I wouldn't be in your shoes for a million dollars. No? How about half a million? That, I'll admit, might interest me. Well, shall we... After you, Mrs. Cronin. Thank you. Wonderful girl, a born comedian. Yeah, she's a scream. What is she, an actress? Oh, no, no, she writes things for magazines and things like that. Uh, Sit down, Mr. Dollar. She came to interview me one time. That's how I met her. I see. She wrote a piece about my necklace, the Circle of Fire. Sylvia Blake, oh, sure. Articles about gems, famous stones, jewel robberies. That's her. Oh, she's fascinated by the subject. She's coming to my party. Oh. Uh, Why don't you come to my party, Mr. Dollar? Fine, I'd love to. In fact, that's why I'm here. Oh? Uh, Joe Parker over at Surety Mutual is kind of worried about this party, Mrs. Cronin. He's afraid you might invite people like me... What? I mean, people you don't know. You're a detective. Um, in a way. I told Joseph how I felt about that. He's not going to send any detectives around snooping into things, spying on my guests, wearing the hats in the house. Huh? Oh, not that you're like that, of course. But it's the principle of the thing. Well, wouldn't you have a better time at your party if you knew you were safe? Mr. Dollar, it was at a party that Barnaby gave me the Circle of Fire. Our wedding reception. There were over 2,000 guests, a 1,000 of them invited. 
and we danced. Oh, we danced all night. And the necklace was beautiful. And I was beautiful back then. True, but... And then afterward, at four o'clock in the morning, we drove through the park in a hansom. Just the two of us. And the driver, of course. And I wore the circle. And I was safe, Mr. Dollar. I was perfectly safe. Maybe you were just lucky that night. Barnaby was so wonderful. And he could make living so wonderful. Well, I don't doubt it. He was probably a man who could manage things pretty skillfully. He was running two railroads in a bank all at the same time. Then I imagine he had no trouble arranging for your safety without even letting you know about it. You mean guards all around? It's possible. Yes, it is. He was like that. He never wanted anything to worry me. All right, Mr. Dollar. You win. Good. But it's only because of one reason. I like you. And I want you at my party. Thank you, Mrs. Cronin. Oh, you're going to love every minute of it. It's up in the Adirondacks. Our old summer place. Uh, Joseph told you, I suppose. Yes, he did. Mrs. Cronin. And the people I have invited. Hundreds, literally. People I knew in the old days. Of course, a lot of them won't come, but... You know, it was strange. So many of the letters came back undelivered. Mrs. Cronin. Oh, Sylvia, I didn't hear you come here. I'm the sneaky type. You've got a visitor. Says he's an old friend. Really? Well, I suppose I'd better see you. Uh, you'll excuse me, Mr. Dollar. Sure, go ahead. You and Sylvia talk to each other. I uh, brung the bottle in case you're interested. Short on the soda. Right. She's on a cloud by herself. Of course, some of the invites to the party were undelivered. Those beautiful people had a habit of dying young. Say when. When? Who's the visitor? I'll guess with you. Looks like an overgrown leprechaun. Said his name was Shorty Weber. Shorty Weber? You know him? I know of him. An old-time song and dance man, among other things. He probably worked in a show with him back in those dear, dead days. Anyway, he's got an invite clutched in his sweaty little palm. Another free loader, I suppose. Aren't we all? I am, yes. Not you, though. You're working your way. Isn't that what you're doing, one way or another? Meaning? A magazine article, just in case. Written right on the spot. Attempted theft of the circle of fire. Clever jewel Why do you say attempted? I'm working my way, remember? Sure, I remember. But it won't be attempted, Johnny. Somebody's going to get that necklace before the weekend is over. I'll bet on it. Would you care to name any names? Pick a name off the guest list. Any name. Suppose I pick Sylvia Blake. You're the detective. You've dug up and written up every big-time jewel theft over the last 50 years. You're bugged on the subject. Obsessed with beautiful gems. Fits my personality. I'm rather beautiful, too, in a brittle and glittering sort of way. Don't you think so, Johnny? I think you work pretty hard at that tough act. Maybe. And I think you'd give your right arm to own that necklace. Going after that would really be going for the big one. Going for broke. And somebody will do it, Johnny. Wait and see. She left a few minutes later with the bottle under her arm and a chip on her shoulder. With the girl gone and the scotch gone, there seemed to be no point in me hanging around any longer. So I went looking for Mrs. Cronin to say goodbye. I didn't find her, but I did find her caller, Shorty Weber. He didn't hear me come into the room. He was too busy. He was hunched over Mrs. Cronin's writing desk going through her mail. You won't find it there, Shorty. Who's Hold it, Shorty. Don't try to reach for it. I, I, I wasn't going to. I, honest, I wasn't. Turn around. Put your hands up against the wall. You, you got me all wrong. I okay, wasn't going to do Okay, relax. I, I was uh, just 38, coming... stub barrel, clip holster. Nice gun. It belongs to a friend of mine. Bad business, Shorty. An ex-con packing a gun. Oh, I guess you're Johnny Dollar. She said you was here. And I, I, I know what you're thinking, Mr. Dollar, but you're wrong. Why, Dolly, uh, Mrs. Cronin... She's an old friend of mine. I tried to get her to marry me once over 30 years ago. A lot can I... happen in 30 years. Does she know you've served time in prison? Yeah. She thinks I was on tour, Europe and Australia. She never reads a paper or hears anything. Don't tell her, Mr. Dollar. Please don't. You know, it's quite a coincidence, Shorty. It was Jules that time. A big affair in New Orleans. And you were hired as an entertainer. A diamond bracelet, wasn't it? And you were caught cold. It's the only time in my life I've ever done anything like that. And I went again. Not, especially not to her. 
Why, I, I, I'm planning to look out for it at this party. That's why I bought the gun. And is that why you were going through a mail there? Yeah. I wanted to see who was coming. I learned things while I was doing time. I know how the word gets around in a big deal like this. There's a lot of wrong guys in this world. No argument, Shorty. Yeah, well, you met her. You, you, you know how she is. She's a babe in the woods on something like this. Did my ears be burning? Or is it some other babe, you mean? Not for me, Dolly. You're the only babe I ever could see. Oh, Shorty, you never give up. Oh, uh, do you two know each other? Uh, Not exactly, but we found we had a mutual friend. A certain state prison warden. Oh, how nice. Shorty's always doing benefits at those places. Uh, Dolly, yeah, uh, yeah, that was it. He did a benefit there. Oh, well, I'll bet you weren't over big. (laughs) Well, you know... You're too modest, Shorty. Why they loved him, Mrs. Cronin. Hated to let him leave. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, speaking of leaving, uh, I got a shove now. Don't take any wooden nickels. <laughs> it was crazy and corny and sad. The whole idea. I guess the sadness of it hit me when I was saying goodbye to Mrs. Cronin at the door. The gaiety slipped for a moment, and suddenly she was old and tired. And at the same time, she was a scared little girl. And then she said something strange, and the shivers ran up my back. Do you believe in premonitions, Johnny? Well, I have a hunch now and then. Well, whatever it is, it's the reason I'm doing this. Having this party. One last fling, you might say. Before it's too late. Oh, come now. You're still a young woman, Mrs. Cronin. No. I'm old, Johnny. I've been old for years. Since Barnaby died. We loved each other so, but that's not what I mean. I've had this premonition lately. What sort of a premonition? That something awful, something terrible is going to happen to me. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Cronin matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, a man who's afraid of his shadow, a girl who's afraid of nothing, and a stranger who strikes in the dark. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar, this is Jason Prell. Jason I Pre- manage Mrs. Cronin's trust fund. 
Oh, sure. We haven't met, of course, and I know that I'm overstepping the ordinary bounds of propriety, but I simply have to talk to you immediately, if possible. Well, can't it wait until train time? You're going with us up to a party in the Adirondacks, aren't you? Yes, I am, but it'll be too late then to make very much difference. Well, uh, maybe you could tell me the general idea of what you want. I understand Mrs. Cronin has authorized you to obtain the circle of fire from the bank and to keep it in your possession until she wears it at the party. Yeah, that's right. Don't do it. Leave the necklace where it is. Why? It's a long story, Mr. Dollar, and it goes a long way back. The whole thing is a lot more complicated than you realize. Well, I'm beginning to realize it. Just exactly what is it you're worried about? I'm worried about Mrs. Cronin's sanity. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, New York City, to the Home Office, Surety Mutual and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Cronin Matter. Expense account continued. Item four, a dollar and eighty cents. Taxi to the offices of the Daily Times Courier for a look at the morgue files on Mrs. Cronin. The clipping started with the year 1916, when a bright-eyed, wide-eyed kid named Dolly McLean danced her way out of the chorus lines of a two-bit musical and straight into the limelight of Broadway. One hit show after another. Hits just because she was in them. And parties, balls, social affairs. The dancing darling. A critic tagged her with a name in her first write-up, and the name stuck. So she danced. Danced away the mad, crazy years that followed World War I. And like everybody else, she lived it up. There were rumors of engagements, love affairs. The Baron this, count that, one after another. Shorty Weber was mentioned a few times. And Jason Prell was in from the beginning, as a promoter, though, a business manager, not as a lover. Her friends were mentioned, hundreds of them. Then Barnaby Cronin came into the file. Boy wonder of the business world, the golden prince. Engagement, marriage, and Barnaby's fabulous gift to his new bride, a half-million-dollar necklace of diamonds and emeralds, the circle of fire. Then Barnaby's sudden death, Mrs. Cronin's seclusion. End of file. Expense account item five, $24.30, transportation, hotel, and incidentals. And a taxi to the railway station to find the special coach Mrs. Cronin had chartered to haul her guest to the Adirondacks and to her Roaring Twenties weekend party. I purposely got there early, but one of the guests was even earlier. Mr. Dollar, wait. Hmm? You are Mr. Dollar, aren't you? That's right, but I don't Prell, think... Prell, Jason Prell. Oh. I thought you might come down early to meet the bank messengers. Thank heaven you did. Well, I'm afraid I don't... Dollar, so... I've known Dolly McLean and Mrs. Cronin for over 35 years. All that time, I've managed her business affairs, arranged her personal contacts, been like a father to her. Yeah, I've read the newspaper clippings. Well, uh, newspaper stories can be misleading sometimes. They build things up. Sensationalism. It's true, of course, that Dolly and I had some quarrels. Who doesn't? In spite of everything, I was still her best friend. Go on. I know Dolly, nor better than anybody else in the world. I know how she's gone downhill since Barnaby died, especially in the last year or so. And I know this whole idea is the worst possible thing she could do. Have you tried talking to her along that line? She won't listen. She's dead set on it. I'm hoping you can help. How? Point out to her how dangerous it is to go off into that isolated place with a piece of jewelry as valuable as a circle of fire. It's worth a fortune. Somebody's bound to try to steal it. I still don't get what you're driving at, Mr. Prell. But I just told you. It's the risk that's involved. To whom? Why, Mrs. Cronin, of course. She knows about the risk. She's willing to take it. She doesn't know what she's doing. Hey, you said something on the phone about her sanity. Are you trying to imply that no, she's... No, 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 no. Not, not yet. But she's not well. She burned herself up back in those early years. And she hasn't much left. The only thing that keeps her going is... has a crazy kind of belief. Belief? Dolly believes in people. So do I, Mr. Perot. Well, yes, yes, of course. But Dolly's whole thinking hinges on it. All the people she knew back in the heyday, the people she calls her friends, in her book, they can do no wrong. She lived in a dream world, still does, like a fairy princess. But it never really existed. Things weren't like that back in those days, Mr. Dollar. So I've heard. Most of the people she thought of as friends were only trying to use her. Barnaby and I would block them off, take care of things when things had to be done, and let her go on living happily in her never-never land. And now, that's the only land she has to live in. 
Is that what you mean? Exactly. Why, some of those friends would cut their mother's throat for a tenth of the value of the circle of fire. Those are the guests she'll have at their party. Well, I've already been told once that somebody will steal that necklace before the weekend is over. Do you want to add your prediction? I think somebody will try. And that's all that's needed to start that dream world of hers falling apart and to make her face things the way they are. May I ask you a question, Mr. Prell? Oh, yes, of course. This trust fund you're managing that her husband left for her, just how big is the setup? Barnaby Cronin was a wealthy man, Mr. Dollar, but he had his ups and downs like every business investor. The capital is adequate for her support, but not much more. Is the necklace a part of the trust capital? It's her own personal property. Otherwise, I could have prevented it from being taken from the bank. You have complete control of the trust, then? Yes. Barnaby knew that she had no understanding of business matters. I see. He's old, Mr. Dollar. Older than her years. And tired. All that keeps her alive is her belief in the past. Yeah. Her dream world. Where everybody loves her and protects her. Where she's still a dancing darling. And if that dream world is destroyed, she'll be destroyed along with it. Now, phone the bank, Mr. Dollar. Ask them not to bring that necklace here. I'm afraid they think I was crazy. Why? Because I've got it with me, Mr. Prell. I picked it up myself two hours ago. Then heaven help us all. The convention coach Mrs. Cronin had charted for the run to the Adirondacks was arranged with a long aisle of individual staterooms and a main lounge area at one end. It could accommodate 50 people. But when the train pulled out, there were only six of us in the coach. Six. Out of the hundreds of friends she'd had in the old days when she was in the big time and on top. And even out of the six, three of us were new acquaintances. People who hadn't known her back when. I was there, of course, because I'd been hired to be there to protect her fabulous necklace. And Sylvia Blake, still playing it tough and cynical, was probably hoping for a magazine article. Or hoping for something. But the third newcomer, there was the question mark. It's just too exciting for words. Don't you think it's too exciting for words? Well, I... I know who you are, of course. You're Mr. Johnny Dollar, and you're supposed to protect those fabulous jewels. And I'm Laura Dean. And I think we ought to call each other Laura and Johnny, because after all, it's a party, isn't it? Up till now, I was having doubts. You're, uh, obviously not one of Mrs. Cronin's friends from the old days. Oh, no, I just met her back there at the station. You what? Well, I talked to her on the phone, of course. She sent an invitation to my aunt, who was a very dear friend of hers. Only they hadn't seen each other for years, and she didn't know my aunt had passed on over a year ago. So I phoned her and told her. Told Mrs. Cronin, I mean. And she said for me to come to the party, she'd like to meet me. And I wouldn't have missed it for anything. Yeah, well, uh... Johnny, do you think they'll really have champagne in bathtubs like they used to back in her time? If they do, it'll get awful wet out. There are only six of us to drink it. Oh, gosh, I don't see how you can call six people a party. Well, the thing is, we'll all be in there trying hard. <laughs> now you're joking me. I'll bet you're fun at a party. Oh, where do you see the act I do with a lampshade? Who did you say your aunt was? I don't think I said who. When do they start serving the champagne, Johnny? When they see the whites of your eyes. Oh, that's cute. I like that. Thanks. Now, about your aunt. Oh, poor old soul. She'd have loved this, too. You ought to hear about some of the parties she and Mrs. Cronin used to go to. Yeah, I imagine. They well, used to go every place together back in those days. The newspapers called them the Siamese Twins. The Siamese... Siamese Twins. That was just an expression. Fritzy like... Morell. Is that what you're saying? That you're Fritzy Morell's niece? Sure. Did you know her, Johnny? No, I never met her. Oh, you'd have liked her. She was a lot of fun. Loved a party. Gosh, I thought there'd be no people at least. She kept babbling on, and I listened to her and tried to figure her out. The chatter was smokescreen. Underneath it, she was cool, sharp, and shrewd. I didn't know what she was up to, nor why she was here. But I did know one thing. Fritzy Morell had died about a year ago, true enough. But she'd left no surviving family and no niece. Laura Dean was a liar. I hadn't seen Mrs. Cronin since we pulled out of the station. She'd greeted us, then gone right to her stateroom and stayed there. And when I saw Jason Prell come hurrying from that direction, I could read the look on his face even before he reached me. Mr. Dollar, please. Mrs. Cronin? Yes, go to her at once. What is it? What's wrong? She was suddenly taken ill, very ill. Hurry. Mrs. Cronin. Right now. Oh. It was just nerves. I've had it before. My doctor in New York gave me some tablets to take whenever... Are these the tablets? This bottle here? Well, yes. You 
know what they are, Johnny? Uh, yeah, I know. All right. So he does say it's my heart. But he's wrong. It's just nerves. Yeah, sure. That's not why I sent for you, Johnny. You have the necklace. Yeah. Want to see it? No. I'll wait until it's time to wear it. Johnny, I've written something here. I'm going to sign it, and I want you to sign as a witness. Well, uh, all right. Unless you'd rather have Jason Pro. Mm, Jason would argue about it. There. Now you sign. There you are. Keep it for me. <laughs> Do you mind if I know what I've signed? Oh, of course not. Read it if you like. In the event of my death, I, Dolly Cronin, being of sound mind, bequeath the necklace known as the Circle of Fire to Sylvia Blake. Sylvia loves jewels. She'll appreciate it. Yeah, I imagine she will. And she's not to know about this, you understand, because, of course, it'll be years before she gets it. Oh, sure it will. Now, you'd better try to get some sleep. I'm going to. And thanks, Johnny. There was nothing. You know something? I was heartbroken when they didn't show up at the station. All my old friends. But I've been lying here thinking, and I've finally figured it out. Oh? They all went on ahead. They'll be waiting at the house. They're trying to surprise me. Don't you think so, Johnny? I said, yes, I thought so. But I was lying because I didn't think so. But she was still a dancing darling, and she had that way about her. You wanted to protect her. I didn't go back to the lounge. I walked down the corridor to my stateroom. It was night by then, and the corridor was only dimly lit. My stateroom was dark. When I opened the door, I caught a bare flash of movement too late. Oh! When I came to, minutes later, I was lying on my stateroom floor, blood seeping from a cut in my head. I felt in my inside pocket for the bulky leather case that had held the necklace. It was gone. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Cronin matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, an old love and an old hate. And violence breaks out at midnight. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hello. Dollar? You're the Mr. Dollar that's been trying to phone me? Is this Dr. Bigby? That's exactly who it is, and I'm very busy right now. Look, Dr. Bigby, I want you to come out here just as soon as possible. It's the old Cronin Summer Place, about five miles up the river from where... Oh, I know where it is, I know. What are you doing up there? The house has been closed for years. Mrs. Cronin opened it up for a party this weekend, but she was taken ill on the train coming up, and I want... Is Dolly out there? Yes, she's the one I want you to look at. So she's back. After 
after all these years, she's come back. She had a prescription from her doctor in New York, but she's taken the last of it. It's apparently her heart. I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar. I'm very busy tonight. Oh, what? Much too busy, and then there's a storm coming up, and I have a patient someplace, I think. Now, wait a second. If you're a friend of Dolly's, uh, Mrs. Cronin's, do one thing. Take her back to New York. Now. Tonight. Get her out of here. Fast. Before it's too late. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar at Wells Falls, New York, to the Home Office, Surety Mutual and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Cronin Matter. A half-million-dollar necklace. Expense account continued. Item 7, $5.40, taxi. I figured I'd find Dr. Bigby in one of the local pubs, but I covered them all in about 30 minutes. No sale. And unfortunately, Bigby was the only doctor in Wells Falls. Worse, the local druggist couldn't fill Mrs. Cronin's prescription. The nearest chance was Tupper Lake, 25 miles away. Back out at the Cronin place, I turned the taxi over to Jason Prell, Mrs. Cronin's business advisor, and he took off for Tupper Lake to look for the medicine. Then I went looking for Mrs. Atherton, a village woman who had been housekeeping on the estate since the place was built. I found her in the kitchen. Storm's brewing up, coming out of the mountains. It'll hit us before morning. They always come in the night. I guess you've seen a lot of storms in these hills, Mrs. Atherton. Lived here all my life, never been out of them. It's Miss Atherton, not Mrs. Oh. She's the Mrs. up in the bed, even if she is a widow. Little Dolly, Mrs. Cronin, till death do us part. Did you know Barnaby Cronin, Miss Atherton? Yes, I knew him. Of course I knew him, I worked here. Oh, yes, you were here then. What kind of a man was he? Like any other man. And according to Dolly, Mrs. Cronin, she apparently worshipped him. Still does, in fact. Dolly's always worshipping something. Everybody was always worshipping her. She had us all dancing to her tune and without even trying. You knew her back then? She was born and raised here in the village. I thought everybody knew that. No, that's what I missed. Well, we used to work together, waiting tables at the summer hotels around here. That's where Jason Prell saw her. Told her she ought to be on Broadway. She left the town the next week. Didn't come back again till after she and Barnaby was married. And she got him to spend a fortune to build this place for her. Well, I guess he had the fortune to spend. Oh, yes. She married well. Count on Dolly for that. Always got whatever she wanted and never even had to ask. Things were just given to her, always. Yeah, probably so. But she's been pretty generous herself. Like uh, keeping you on here, for instance, when the house has been closed up for years with nobody using it. Oh, she's the dancing darling, all right, right to the end. Well, now, if you'll excuse me... Uh, there was something else I wanted to ask you, Miss Atherton. I'm not one to talk ordinarily, but you got me started. Well, this is not about Mrs. Cronin, at least not directly. She was taken ill on the train. I don't think it's serious, but I wanted a doctor to look her over. The only one in the village seems to be a man by the name of Bigby. Bigby? He's the coroner here, but he's not a doctor. No? No, not anymore. Still calls himself one, but he lost his license ten years ago. He's a drunken sot. Yeah, I kind of figured. But he sobered up fast when I told him on the phone that the patient was Mrs. Cronin. He refused to come out, told me to get her away from here fast, and then he hung up on me. Forget him. He couldn't do her any good. But I'd I'd like to know why he acted that way. Do you happen to know any reason? Bigby is a drunk. Who knows what his reasons are? I thought you might. Better ask him. What difference does it make anyway? He can't help her. Nobody can. What do you mean? She's come back, finally. For the first time in all these years. Took sick on the train. That wasn't any surprise to her. She knew it was going to happen. Well, I guess she halfway knew. She knew. It's like with an animal. When it's hurt or sick and it comes home to die, and that's what she's done. She's come home to die. No, I think you're wrong there, Miss Atherton. I don't think she's anywhere near that sick. Barnaby didn't think so either. When he came back here to die. 
Barnaby died here? Yes, in this very house. A heart attack, it was called. He came up on the afternoon train and... Hmm. That's strange. It was the same kind of night. A storm like tonight. Strange how things move and patterns. Were you here with him, Miss Atherton? Barnaby died alone. And the doctor? Bigby? Miss Atherton was the doctor. Um, um, I'm sorry, I was thinking. The bridges were washed out. Bigby didn't get here till the next morning. Wouldn't have mattered. He couldn't have done anything. Nobody could have. When it's time for a thing to be done, it's done. Nobody can stop it. Nobody. It was a strange evening. Ominous and oppressive, with a feel of violence in the air. Even the house itself added to the feeling. Furnished lavishly in a style 30 years forgotten, it seemed garish now, old and tired and lonesome. Like Mrs. Cronin herself, who'd planned a grand party for all her old friends and instead lay ill and alone in the bedroom upstairs. The queen gave a party and nobody came. All dressed up, no place to go. Yeah, gloomy evening. Jason Prell came back from Tupper Lake with a medicine. Miss Atherton served a dinner of sorts, served it in silence, and we were left to our own devices. Five guests in a mansion built for a hundred. Prowl stayed pretty much to himself. Lovely Laura Dean, with that air of knowing innocence, and veigled Shorty Weber into teaching her some of his old dance routines. And they cranked up an old phonograph in the music room. And me, I just stood at an open window and watched the rain come down and tried to think. That's the perfect touch. It's exactly what the evening needed. That music? Ah, Sylvia. Really cornball, isn't it? <laughs> no, no, Johnny. I, I meant the thunderstorm. An isolated old mansion, fabulous necklace of diamonds and emeralds, a weird housekeeper, a hostess lying ill, and now rain, shades of a house of usher. That'll make a good lead for your magazine story. I should have stayed in New York and just written it, not lived it. Oh, I thought you were the big take-a-chance girl, Miss Blake. Danger, mystery, adventure. Don't those things appeal to you? Maybe. Is there any of that lying around somewhere? There may be, before the night's over. Well, all I can see at the moment is sheer boredom. You have to know where to look. In the bottom of that scotch glass, for instance? Oh, it's just killing time. Oh. Uh, I've been wanting to uh, ask you, Johnny. How'd you get that cut on your head? Uh, it's a long story. It happened on the train, I know that. You didn't have it when we left. A sudden stop. I fell over my suitcase. Sure you did. Backwards. Huh? It's on the back of your head. Somebody made a try for it, didn't they? On the train coming up. Well, I don't know what they were trying for. It wasn't time to ask. Maybe they even got it. That's the way you were betting, wasn't it? That it wouldn't be just an attempt. That somebody was going to get it and get away with it. Did they? Is that what happened? Is it gone? All right, just stand there and grin, then. Oh, rain. I'm going back to the city tomorrow. You are? Well, don't smother me with your pleading. (laughs) No, stick around, Sylvia. Things may get better, including the music. You know, in a way, I hope somebody did get the circle of fire. Why? What good is that fabulous necklace doing her now, lying up there? She's had everything she ever wanted. Life's been too easy on her. She doesn't deserve it. She ought to lose it. Her life or the necklace? The necklace, of course. You know, for reasons I can't go into, I think you'll be sorry you said that someday. Sorry? Why? She's a woman who's had everything. You're pretty bitter, aren't you? Hurt and afraid. Am I? You feel something big may have passed you by, and you put up that tight, bright front for protection. But inside, you're tied in knots. And what is your recommendation, Doctor? A man, perhaps? That's the usual advice. Now, you said it. I didn't. Well, you're a man, Johnny. Why don't you smooch with me? It'd be a way of passing the evening, killing time. All right. What are you... Johnny, Wait! Johnny, what? Why did you do it? Because you wanted me to, and because I wanted to. Adventure, mystery, danger. Who's bored? Who's going back to the city? Those doctors are right.
Mr. Dollar, could I talk to you for a minute? Why not, Shorty? What's on your mind? I don't know exactly why you call us all together in it here. It was Mrs. Cronin's idea. She set it up with me earlier. Well, it ain't got nothing to do with what I want to say. You, 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 you seen me in a bad light there yesterday at Dolly's apartment. Well... Well, you found a gun in me. You know about my record. It made it look bad. I, I know it did. But say, help me, Mr. Dollar. Everything I told you was the gospel truth. Yeah. I'd break my arm before I'd do anything to harm Dolly in the least bit. You see... I've been in love with that woman for 35 years. I'd like to have broke my heart when she married Barnaby. But I always knew I didn't have no chance right from the start. She was up there, big, somebody. Me, I was a nobody. But I'd still die for her any time. That's all, Mr. Dollar. I just wanted you to know. They were all there, gathered around the big dining table, watching me and waiting. Mrs. Cronin had asked me to arrange it. She said that was the main reason they'd come, and she didn't want to disappoint them. I told them that. And then I took the circle of fire from my pocket and laid it on the table. They all reacted in different ways. Laura Dean gave a gasp, and her eyes opened wide. And Sylvia... Look at it. Just look at it. Sylvia Blake was fascinated, hypnotized. Yeah, you should have seen it on her back in the old days. It sparkled even twice as much. Hmm. So that's what this is all about. It's only jewelry. I've seen it before. But there was one special reaction I was looking for, and I got it. Jason Prell's face went white. Who could imagine anything so beautiful? Mr. Prell, you seem surprised. I wasn't carrying the necklace in its case, the case you stole from me on the train. What? I was carrying it loose in my pocket. What did you do? Throw the case off the train without even bothering... It's running away! Prell! I went after him, but he'd already disappeared somewhere down the hall. He knew the layout of the house, and I didn't. I searched the different rooms quickly as I passed, but there was no sign of him. He couldn't have reached the floors above, but he might have gone down toward the game room and lower halls. I eased my gun from its holster and started slowly down the stairs. And at that moment, every light in the house went out. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Cronin matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, a white lie, a bullet from the darkness, and death comes in out of the rain. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hello, Sheriff. I can't hear you for the storm. We were cut off before. Hello? Is that you, Sheriff? I said... Hello? You get cut off again, Mr. Dollar? Not this time, Shorty. Somebody cut the wire. The phone's dead. Then we got no way of getting white out. No way of getting help. No, not at the moment. And he's out there in the dark somewhere. He's got a gun and there's no telling what he may try and do. Shorty, get away from that window. Well, we know where he is now and what he intends, because he just made a try at it. What are you going to do about him? Only thing I can do, Shorty, go get him before he gets me. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. 
America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar at the Cronin Estate, Wells Falls, New York, to the Home Office, Surety Mutual and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Cronin matter. Protection of a half-million-dollar necklace. Expense account continued. Item 10, $135. One tweed sport jacket to be purchased on my return. Both lapels and one shoulder ripped by a bullet. Also one pair of slacks to match. Destroyed a few minutes later in the mud, slush, and underbrush in the grounds of the Cronin place while pursuing a suspect who'd already tried twice to kill me and who made a third go at it when I stepped out of the side door of the house. Johnny, away from the door, quick. Whew, boy, that was close. Yeah, we can see the door opening, but he can't see us, not in this mess. Oh. He's desperate, he's shooting blind. Look, Shorty, yeah. why don't you go on back in the house? There's no reason for you taking chances like this. You're taking them? With me, it's a job of work. I get paid for it. I told you earlier how I felt about Dolly, I mean. I don't know what Jason Pearl's game is, Mr. Dollar, but if it's against her, then I'm against him. I'm staying. All right, it's up to you. Thanks for giving me the gun back. Emergency, that's all. You've got a prison record, Shorty. You know what it means if you're caught with a gun. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> hey, Good. I figured Prell would give himself away if he kept that up. I got him spotted now. Where? At the base of that tall pine, a little to the left. Watch for it, the next flash of lightning. There, yeah, yeah, now I see it. I know the one you mean. Then stay here and keep him pinned down. It's a good spot. You've got cover from the wall of the terrace there. What are you going to do? Circle around and come up beside him. Just throw a shot at the base of that pine tree now and then. Keep him tied down. Keep him busy, you got it? Right. And good luck. I left the shelter of the house and started edging through the shrubbery. The undergrowth was a regular jungle. It would have been impossible to slip up on Prell without his hearing if it hadn't been for the storm. Shorty Weber fired now and then at the pine tree. And twice Prell fired an answer. Jason Prell, so-called friend of old Mrs. Cronin, knew I had him tagged. At first I'd been guessing mainly, but he didn't know it. And he'd lost his head and made the guess prove out. And now he was apparently ready to risk murder or death rather than face a prison term. I was within 30 feet of him. He hadn't heard a sound. He was still firing at Shorty over on the terrace. His back was turned partly toward me. He didn't know I was near, so I leveled my gun. Get your hands up, Prell. Drop that gun. You covered. He whirled, peering into the darkness of the bushes, trying to see me. He knew I was close, but he couldn't tell where. He raised his gun, started to turn, and... I'm not quite certain what happened next. The light was bad, and I could hardly see him. Whether he stumbled accidentally or... Or what is something I'll never know. All I know is that when I walked over to him, he was dead. He was no good, Mr. Dollar. I always thought so, but Dolly swore by me at her fool. What about Barnaby, her husband? He couldn't stand Prell at first. Later, they got us tickets, thieves. Yeah. Well, it's a mess, Shorty, a real mess. All things that should have stayed dead and buried on the bottom, they're all coming to the surface now. Tell me something, Mr. Dollar. Yeah? What about Dolly? Is this thing going to kick back on her? Will she get hurt by it? Yeah, Shorty, I'm afraid she will. Pretty badly. It was deep into the night, edging toward dawn, when I got back to the house. I changed out of my wet clothes, went to the game room, and got Dolly's necklace from under a chair cushion. I'd stuck it there when Prell had pulled the main switch and put the lights out. Then I went upstairs to look in on Dolly Cronin, quietly, just to check... But it didn't work out that way. Johnny, is that you? Yeah. I didn't mean to wake you. Oh, you didn't. I've been awake most of the night. Come on in, Johnny. All right. How are you feeling? Oh, just fine. There's nothing wrong with me. I feel fine. Good. Isn't Laura Dean a nice girl? Huh? Yes, she is. I'm glad she came. Company for you, Johnny. Oh, yeah. Quite a storm we had, wasn't it? Oh, it was beautiful. All that lightning, wind, and the thunder. Oh, I haven't seen such a beautiful storm since I was little. Johnny, thought I heard shots a while ago. Shots? Outdoors. Off toward the woods somewhere. Oh, it might have been lightning, thunder. Sounded like a gun. Like somebody shooting. 
Well, sound plays funny tricks up here in the mountains. Uh, I guess so, but... Well, I've been thinking back over the past so much that makes the present a little unreal. I'm afraid the past is about all I have left now. Now, don't be so quick to sell this future of yours short. You've got a lot of years yet, good years. Well, I had a lot of good years. Good friends, good times, a good life. And best of all was Barnaby. You loved him very much, didn't you, Mrs. Cronin? I worshipped him. He was perfect. He never did a wrong thing in his life. Now that he's gone, is the one fine memory I always cling to. Oh, if I didn't have that, well, I, I just couldn't go on. Well, then let's hope you never lose that memory. Of course, there were other good friends, too, over the years. Like Jason Prell. Hmm. He is so quiet. And withdrawn, it takes a long time to get to know him. But he's been such a good friend to me. So patient with all this silly ignorance of mine about business problems. Yes, I'm sure he has. I just don't know what I'd do without him. Yeah. Now, don't you think you'd better get some sleep? In a little while. You know, Johnny, it's funny how things work out. In what way? I was born and grew up Right here in this village. Yes, your housekeeper, Miss Atherton, told me the two of you were girls together. We were inseparable. Like I said, I grew up here and then I went away. And Barnaby and I came back and built this house. And we went away again. There were always so many places to go, new things to do. And now I've come back. The place where I was born. Everything finally comes home, doesn't it, Johnny? Yes, nearly always. I'm very tired. I think I will sleep now. Be good for you. The necklace, Johnny, do you have it with you? I sure do. Here you are. So beautiful. And so many memories. All so long ago. Put it on me. Will you, Johnny? Of course. Raise up now. Just a little. There. How do I look? Sweet enough to kiss. Well? Nice. You go to sleep now. Yes, sir. I'll only look at the necklace for one minute only. Then I'll take my pills and go to sleep. And then I'll dream up a dream. Great big dream. Good night, dancing darling. It's been a long time since anyone called me that. A long, long time. Good night, Johnny. Thank you. I left her and went downstairs and rustled myself a pot of coffee. I sat down by an east window and drank it cup after cup and watched the morning sun come up. Dream a big dream. Well, before many more hours, she was going to need a big dream. There was no way of keeping it from her, all of it. The fact that Jason Prell was dead, shot, that he'd attempted murder and tried to steal a necklace. And worst of all, that her beloved Barnaby had probably been as big a crook as Prell. Is it all right if the girl who can't sleep sits this one out with you? Sure. Pull up a chair, Laura. Like some coffee? Just black, thank you. I guess it wouldn't do much good to ask you what's been going on around here all night. Something has? Like I said, I guess it wouldn't do much good. Here's your coffee. Oh, thanks. That's how I found you. Just followed the smell of this coffee. Mm, Good. I guess if I said I heard somebody shooting up the place during the storm, you'd just say, really? Never use the word. And I guess if I showed you that broken window over there, you'd say maybe a pigeon flew in. Might, if I happen to think of it. I'm sorry I always kept you awake. Oh, don't apologize. I probably wouldn't have slept anyway. Why not? Guilty conscience? Don't be silly. I didn't even do it. Do what? Whatever it is I'm supposed to feel guilty about. 
Lying is what I had in mind at the moment. Oh, I do that all the time, but I never feel guilty about it. I just call it making up things. Like claiming you were the niece of Fritzy Morell, <laughs> Mrs. Cronin's oldest friend. Gosh, well, don't my windpipe. Like claiming you're Fritzy Morell's niece. Mostly I drink tea, but you already had the coffee Like made. claiming you're Fritzy... All right, all right. How'd you find out? Nothing very spectacular. She just didn't have a niece. I wasn't sure, but I thought she must. Everybody her age has at least one niece. What was the idea? Well? Well, I lived in the same rooming house she did. She liked me, talked to me a lot before she died last year. So when the invitation came last week, I got the idea of going as her niece. I didn't mean any harm by it. I just wanted to go to the party. All right, relax. That's about the way I figured it. Well, it turned out to be quite a party, didn't it? I hope I never see another one like this as... Johnny. Johnny, what's wrong with her? It was Miss Atherton. I got up slowly from my chair as she walked toward us and then stopped a few feet from the table. Her eyes were fixed on something far away and the look on her face was strange and grim. I think I knew even before she spoke. Mrs. Cronin is dead. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Cronin matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, the questions and the answers for the living and the dead. The final payoff. And fate itself plays the last trump. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dr. Bigby here. Dr. Bigby, I'm asking you for the second time now to come out to the Cronin place. I told you last night, Mr. Dollar. The circumstances are different now, a lot different. We don't need a doctor, we need a coroner. A coroner? Where are you calling from? The operator told me the phone out there was out of order. It is. I'm at a forestry station a mile down the road. Jason Prell cut the wires last night before he was killed. Jason killed? Shot to death during the storm. So that's how he ended up. It took a long time, but everything finally comes home. Yes, Mrs. Cronin said the same thing an hour or so before she died. Dolly, too. Her heart, Mr. Dollar? In a way, maybe. The dancing darling. Finally at rest. She... What do you mean, in a way? Dr. Bigby, Mrs. Cronin was murdered. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar at the Cronin Estate, Wells Falls, New York, to the Home Office, Surety Mutual and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Cronin Matter. 
Expense account, final page. Item 13, 10 cents. A half pack of cigarettes I left with a farmer who gave me a lift back from the forestry station. The price of my own feelings at the moment would have been lower. About eight cents lower, in fact. I brewed another pot of coffee and sat down to wait for Bigby. But this time I laced the coffee with brandy. The sun was up by then, clear of the horizon, bringing a bright new morning and a brand new day. The storm was long over. The world sparkled and danced. But too much of the night was still with me, and the past still too much alive. And yet, maybe Dolly Cronin was better off. She was a part of that past now, where friends were always true. Every minute of life was even more wonderful than the last one. And where she was still, and forever, the dancing darling. Good morning, Johnny. Oh, hi, Sylvia. I'm in the coffee business this morning. How about it? Please. Mm. Having yours with cream, I see. Yeah, bad night. Shall I make yours the same way? Right. I had a bad night, too. Thanks. Hmm. You look real beat, John. Couldn't be any beater. Something pretty terrible happened last night, didn't it? Yes. Jason Prell is dead. Oh. And Dolly Cronin is dead. Oh, no. I loved her, Johnny. I didn't mean what I said last night about life always having been too easy for her, and you were right. It was just being frustrated, tied in knots and covering up. I loved her. She was sweet. Yeah, she was quite a girl. She had something, I don't know. She had love. She loved people, and they loved her in return. Maybe so. Anyway, I guess this belongs to you now. The necklace? The circle of fire? What do you mean it belongs to me? She made a will last night. I witnessed it. She left the necklace to you. I just can't believe it. Johnny, can I... Can I put it on? Why not? It's yours. She wanted you to have it. You look good in it. I just can't believe it, Johnny. Well, before you get carried away too far, maybe you'd better brace yourself. Oh, it's not mine after all. Oh, it's yours, all right. But it's not real. What? It's a good copy, worth maybe four or five hundred dollars, but that's all. Well, I, I... I don't understand. It's so well known. The, the circle of fire, it's been written up over and over. Yeah, from old records. But nobody's really examined it for years, since before Barnaby Cronin died. It's been locked up in a bank vault until I took it out. Was there ever a real one? Yes, originally. But it was broken up and disposed of years ago. Jason Prell knew it, was in on the substitution, I suppose. That's why he was so desperate to steal it from me and get rid of it before I found out it was a copy. He knew that if that deal came to light, it would call attention to some of his other activities, worse ones. What do you mean? Prell had complete charge of Mrs. Cronin's estate. He told me it was worth practically nothing. But according to records I saw in New York, it amounted to over a million dollars in the beginning. He was stealing her blind all these years. Oh, it was easy. She was alone in the world, knew nothing about business. She trusted him, thought he was her friend. She trusted everybody, much too much. Well, she sure trusted the wrong ones, including her husband. Barnaby? Sure. What do you think disposed of the necklace and slipped her a copy after making such a big deal out of his fabulous wedding gift? A phony. And she worshipped him. The king. In her book, The Man Who Could Do No Wrong. Well, in the business book, he didn't do much else but wrong. According to the records, most of his deals were pretty shady. Especially after he and Prell teamed up. Yes, Miss Atherton? Dr. Bigby is here to see you. All right, show me. Mr. Dollar, I wouldn't believe too much of what he says. He's a chronic drunk. Yes, I remember you telling me. Show him in. Yes, sir. Well, I was just thinking, Johnny. Mrs. Cronin didn't know any of this, I assume. No, she was safe in her dream world. And she thought she was giving me the real necklace. That's right. It's crazy. And kind of wonderful, isn't it? Just like that, she gave me something she thought was worth a half a million dollars. Just because I was nice to her and liked her. You know something, Johnny? What? I'm just as glad it is a copy. It's beautiful, and and I love wearing it. I'd have been scared of the real one. And I'll always remember that, like that dream world of hers, she thought it was real. 
One more question left, but a big one. The question of murder. And I already had the answer. I was sure of it. And I knew there was nothing I could do about it. Dr. Bigby was a man under 60, but he looked years older. A harried man, tired and worn. He sat down for a moment and we talked. And I began to realize that here was another man who had been under Dolly Cronin's spell. And who was shocked and hurt by her dying. It was a remarkable thing and a difficult one to explain, Mr. Dollar. Like many another, I suppose, I often wondered why I felt the way I did about her. It was a, a sort of magic she had. Yeah, I know. Even as a girl here in the village, she had that same power and had it without knowing it. Everybody loved her. No, not quite everybody. At least one person didn't. Yes, you mentioned on the phone the word murder. That's right, Dr. Bigby. Who killed her? A man we can't touch because he's already dead. Jason Prell. Well, he's done about everything else, I guess. I wouldn't put it past him. What do you base it on, Mr. Dollar? A bottle of pills. Prell supposedly went to Tupper's Lake last night and got a prescription filled for Mrs. Cronin. She took some of it this morning, an hour and a half before she died. There it is. I'd seen the bottle on the train coming up with a few tablets left on the same prescription. And these are different. Well, you're right on one count, Mr. Dollar. Those aren't what the prescription calls for. What do you mean, one count? I talked to the druggist at Tupper's Lake on the phone last night. He told me about Jason being in. All right, it still stands. He had the prescription filled and then changed the tablets, substituted these. It's possible. Would you happen to know what they are without having them analyzed? I've got a pretty good idea, but I'll wait until I've examined her before I'll say positively. Uh, Mr. Dollar... I'd like to explain why I wouldn't come out when you called me last night. Yeah, I wish you would. I'd been drinking. So I gathered. I'd been drinking that other time, too, and I'd made a mistake. I didn't want to make another one. Just what do you mean? When Barnaby Cronin died here, I signed the death certificate. Yes, I know. I hadn't treated him. He was dead when I came out. I called it a heart attack. I was drunk. And I was wrong. Barnaby was poisoned. Go on. I didn't suspect it until later. And then I was afraid to do anything about it. I'd signed that certificate and I knew it would break me. So I kept still. And I consoled myself with drink. And finally, it broke me. So the same end result was achieved. Look, Dr. Bigby, if Barnaby Cronin was here alone, then how was he poisoned? Alone? He wasn't alone when he died. She was here with him. Mrs. Cronin? Of course not. Why do you think he was always making trips up here, always by himself? I didn't know he was. For years, every week or two, the whole village knew about it. She was here with him that night. She's the one who called me, asked me to protect her good name. She's the one who poisoned him. And now she's had another try with the same poison. But why? Ask her why. Ring for her and ask her. That won't be necessary. <clears throat> well, I'll go on up and make my examination. Well, Miss Atherton, I'm asking, why? He was planning to break off our relation. He told me that night. She'd finally won. That silly little fool had finally won. But I didn't let her win. I killed him. You're confessing to murder, you know. It doesn't matter now. I've accomplished everything I meant to accomplish. So it was you who changed the tablets in her prescription bottle and substituted the poison. Of course. It was so easy. For once in my life, things were just as easy for me as they'd always been for her. Will you have the sheriff come out, Mr. Dollar? I'd like to make my confession. <laughs> It's odd how things work out sometimes, Mr. Dollar. Yeah. Mrs. Cronin said something like that last night. I was pretty certain when you showed me the tablets, but I wanted to make my examination first. What do you mean? After Barnaby died and I started to suspect Miss Atherton, I managed to steal the poison from her in order to analyze it. I substituted harmless tablets of the same general appearance. And those are what she's kept all these years? What she gave to Mrs. Cronin? That's right. They were perfectly harmless. In that case... Dolly Cronin died from a heart condition. The tablets had nothing to do with it. In a sense, Dolly died the same way she lived. From natural causes. 
Expense account item 14, $83.90. Incidentals and transportation from Wells Falls back to Hartford. Expense account total, $263.30. End of account, end of report. Remarks? The insurance angle here seems a little muddy. Premiums were paid for years on an item that didn't exist. And yet, no claim was filed and none will be. So, well, I leave it to your legal eagles. Me, I'm beat and tired. Maybe a little sad. I've come out of this with a kind of nostalgia. And for a time and place I never even knew. And I'm halfway in love with a girl back in that time and place. A girl I've never seen. <laughs> oh, sure, I know. It's a dream world and a dream girl. And none of it exists. But it's too bad. I wish it did. Because she must have been a honey. A real sweetheart. A dancing darling. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, please, there'll be a new exciting story on Johnny Dollar beginning next Monday. Next week, the story of a man worth $50,000 who didn't have a cent to his name. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Virginia Gregg, Shirley Mitchell, Vivi Janis, Barbara Fuller, Benny Rubin, John Daner, and Parley Bear. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hi, kiddo. Carter at Universal Adjustment. Jim, how are you? In a rush. I have to catch a plane to Tucson, Arizona. Lucky you. Nice there this time of year. No, no, listen. One of our brokers out there wrote a 50,000 straight life policy on a man named James Lansing. Lansing dropped dead two days ago. Uh Uh-huh. And you'll never guess why. I'll bite. Why? Mr. Lansing starved to death. What? With a 50,000... Honest. He died of malnutrition. Got the coroner's report from Tucson right in my hand. Well, if a man could buy a $50,000 policy, he ought to be able to buy himself a square meal. Yeah. Johnny, flight 203 leaves at 1045. You interested? See you at the airport, Jim. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account. Submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lansing fraud. Expense account item one, $178.13. Cost of plane ticket, Hartford to Tucson. I shaved, showered, packed, and got out to the airport in time to have breakfast there. Jim Carter found me at the cashier's cage. Hey, kiddo, you won't need a coat out there in that desert country. As usual, Jim Carter was bigger than I thought. A man who stands six foot five always is. A little ruddier, a little more blustery, but as efficient as ever. 
I wrote a special delivery airmail to the insurance commission in Arizona this morning and explained it worldwide. They wrote the policy. We're holding up payment pending investigation. Well, you could have told them that in person. We'll be out there as soon as the letter. Well, I like to be formal on these things, especially with the state commission. Besides, I'd just as soon let them think we'll get around to a routine investigation later in a week or two. In other words, you didn't tell anybody we're coming. No, I didn't. Maybe we can work it better this way. The faster we move in and find out what's what and aren't bothered by anybody, the better off we'll be. Hey, give me your ticket, will you, John? Yeah, sure. Here you are, pal. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, Johnny, that commission is going to get formal sooner or later and ask a lot of questions. Mainly, why doesn't Worldwide honor the claim and pay off the beneficiary? So we'll have to skedaddle and get ourselves some good answers for him. Yeah, sir. Hey. You may board the plane. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, pal. Has anybody asked that question yet? Well, the beneficiary, sure. Uh, James Lansing's sister, named uh, Arlene Kennedy. She called the broker, and he referred her to claims division at Worldwide, and she called them long distance, and then they called me. I told him to put her off for a while, telling her it was just routine. I see. Is she going to be tough? Man, she could be, Johnny. I understand she has money of her own, and she has some influence in and around Tucson. Oh, a lot of money? Yeah, and trust. She's very comfortably fixed. Yeah, watch yourself, kiddo. Yes, uh, Mrs. Kennedy's pretty upset by the whole business. Can't blame her for that. James Lansing died on the street with no identification on him. By the time police found out who he was, a routine PM had already been performed to determine cause. You know, the county was going to bury this guy? With $50,000 worth of insurance? Yeah, <laughs> imagine that. Oh, excuse me, lady. Uh, the post-mortem never had happened unless Lansing dropped dead on a public street. Yeah, I see what you mean. Uh, I requested the coroner's office in Tucson to hold the body until we can get something done. Better fix your seatbelt, sir. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. First thing that occurred to me when I saw the PM findings was that it might not be James Lansing at all. Chronic heart condition, lung history, debility. Doesn't sound like anybody worldwide would insure. Lansing took a physical before the policy was issued, didn't he? Of course he did. Say, have you got any material on his insurance examination? Sure. Right here. Standard form. James Lansing was 100% okay when the policy was issued a couple of years ago. Malnutrition, lung history, chronic heart. How could he get in that bad shape in two years? (laughs) That's a pretty good question, Johnny. I bet the answer is going to be great. Yeah. What's the examining physician's name? Uh, I see. Examining. Oh, here it is. Uh, Dr. Carl Mayhood, Suite 932, Valley National Building, Tucson. He's our first job, Johnny. Hey, cute stewardess. Yeah. Well, back to business, kiddo. It was a long trip. And I spent most of it going over the material in Jim Carter's briefcase. By the time we circled Tucson Airport at 4.45 in the afternoon, I had the facts pretty well in mind. Expense account item two, 350, cab fare, Tucson Airport to the Pioneer Hotel. Jim Carter and I took adjoining rooms. I unpacked my clothes and got on the phone. A Sergeant Younger, Tucson police, had made the DOA report on James Lansing. Yes, he was in. Yes, he'd be glad to talk to me. I left Jim Carter contacting the state medical board. Glad to meet you, Mr. Dollar. How do you like Tucson? Well, I've been here two hours, Sergeant. Weather's certainly nice. About like this all through the winter months. It's a little warm in the summer, though. Yes, sir. Um, now this Lansing matter. Yeah. There isn't really much to tell you, Mr. Dollar. One of the cars answered the call. A man was found dead in the doorway of a jewelry store about four blocks down the street. Uh Uh-huh. This was the day before yesterday, Sergeant? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I went down to the scene and called the coroner's office. No identification on him, so we started to check him out. Took us a little while. By the time we got a make on him, the coroner had already performed an autopsy. Yeah, I understood that was about the way it was. Say, tell me, how did you identify him as Lansing? One of his prints matched up on our cards here. Lansing was booked on a traffic beef a year ago. Otherwise, we'd still be trying to make him. You're sure it's Lansing over in the morgue? Yeah, we're sure. His sister came down, identified him. Name of Kennedy. Yes. Well, what did Mrs. Kennedy have to say about the cause of death? Nothing. That malnutrition bit didn't do a thing for her. Not huh? a thing, no, sir. 
We all thought Lansing was some sort of a transient. You know, just some old bum until we identified him. Uh-huh. Any witnesses see him die? No, we haven't found any. According to the coroner, he'd been dead an hour or so before anybody noticed him at all. Happened early in the morning. I see. Say, did uh, Lansing have any other business down here other than that uh, traffic violation? Nope. All right. Uh, who do I have to see to get into the morgue? Well, I'll phone the coroner for you. Won't be any trouble there. You want to go over now? No, later on, maybe. Uh, Dollar. Yeah? Death was from natural causes. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. Then no matter how much you investigate, you people are going to have to pay off. Well, aren't you? Maybe. We just have to be sure of one thing. What's that? That we insured the right man. By the time I finished with Sergeant Younger, it was six o'clock. I phoned the hotel and Jim Carter, busy and efficient as always, had already gotten the vital statistics on Dr. Carl Mayhood. Northwestern University Medical School, 1940. Army Medical Corps, 1941 to 45. Dr. Mayhood's license to practice medicine in Arizona was issued in June of 1946. Married, two children, income and practice, according to Carter, was average. In person, Dr. Mayhood was a tall, blonde man in his late 30s. He looked like he needed a week's rest and a few laps. Day and night. You have an alarm clock around the house, Mrs. Gartland? Well, use that. Yes. Goodbye. Yes, sir? Dr. Mayhood, my name's Johnny Dollar. I'm from Hartford. I represent the Adjustment Bureau handling a claim for worldwide insurance. Well, what does that mean? I'm an investigator. So? July 14th, 1953, you examined a man I'd like to get some information about. I hope this won't take too long. Uh, was it an insurance examination? Yeah. The man's name was James Lansing. Do you happen to remember him? James Lansing. No, I can't say that I do remember him, Mr. Dollar. What about him? Well, I'd like to show you the standard examination form first. Is this your signature? Hmm. Is that your signature, Doctor? I suppose so, yes. I don't know. Aren't you sure? Well, how many people are certain of their signatures? It looks like my signature, Mr. Dollar. I can't say for sure if it is or isn't. All right, what about these? Are these notations on the form in your handwriting? I would think so. I don't know. It, it looks like my handwriting. I can't say. According to this form, you gave Mr. Lansing a complete physical and pronounced him sound. That's my job as a doctor on these insurance examinations. Anything unusual about that? Mr. Lansing died two days ago, Doctor. There's nothing unusual about that either. Did they send you all the way from Hartford so I could tell you to go back there and buy a book on heart disease? You can get them anywhere in the country. The simplest kind. Not even a doctor's book. Read it. Know it. And don't take up my valuable time. Now, let me have that. Sure. Hmm. This patient Lansing was 41 years old. If he had no heart condition when I examined him two years ago, obviously he didn't, according to my findings, it's entirely reasonable to assume that he could have developed heart trouble in a very short while, even the day after I examined him. You people gauge those things in your premiums. Why do you bother me? Are you finished? Huh? I take it you've had yourself a tough day, Doctor, and you don't want to be bothered with anybody. Now, look, I'm not here to bother you. You Just from what's on this sheet and what's happened, you're in enough trouble to get yourself involved in a police investigation. I'm here to try to avoid all that, for you as well as me. And please don't lecture me on heart trouble, incidentally. We know the statistics by age, race, color, climate, state, religion, occupation, geographical area, and sex. It so happens we don't have to go into that, Doctor. James Lansing died of malnutrition. Hmm? I said Lansing died of malnutrition. I'll be doggone. Coroner's report. Look for yourself. Hmm. Well, he should know. Now, was it possible for you to overlook that condition at the time you examined Lansing? If he'd been suffering from malnutrition in any degree, I would have discovered it and noted it. According to the coroner's findings, James Lansing had been ill several years. The lung and heart condition existed at least ten years. Can you explain how you were able to pronounce him physically fit, doctor? No, I can't. Well, how about this, the angina condition? I could have missed that, but it's unlikely with the degree of aggravation noted here on the coroner's report. Have you had much experience reading chest x-rays, doctor? 
Of course. The lesions reported by the coroner. If there'd been any lesions on Lansing's chest, I would have reported them. I can't explain that either. Well, now you understand why I'm here. Certainly. I wish I could help you. You can. Just let me see your file copy of the examination. And the x-ray you took at that time. I'll have my nurse look them up. I don't keep files over a year old up here. We have a place down in the basement. Okay. I'll have them for you tomorrow. What time tomorrow? As soon as possible. I'd like to have them first thing, Doctor. You're kind of on me, aren't you? That's right, Doctor. I'm kind of on you. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Lansing fraud tomorrow. Tomorrow, $50,000 is a good price for a killing. Most anybody will listen for that kind of money. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by John Dawson. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dr. Mayhood, I sent you a copy of Lansing's insurance examination this morning. Did you get it all right? Yes, I did, Doctor. Thank you very much. Just looked it over. And I take it everything's all right. It's an exact duplicate of the one sent to the insurance company, and that part's okay. But it doesn't straighten out matters on this case. I am not concerned with your case particularly. I just hope you're through bothering me, Mr. Dollar. Not quite. What does that mean? I want another hour of your time, Doctor. I want you to go over to the coroner's office with me and look at Mr. Lansing's body. What for? To identify it. I've got to know if he's the man you examined or not. About an hour? Doctor, I can get an injunction. All right. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, Tucson, Arizona. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is a further accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lansing fraud. Or was it a fraud? Expense account item three, $10, loan. To Jim Carter, who was working with me on the case. Thanks, buddy. I'll pay it back as soon as I can cash a check. Been so busy, I haven't had time. How's your doctor friend? Well, I'm going to pick him up pretty soon and go over to the coroner's office. I want him to look at James Lansing and see if he's the same man he passed on the insurance examination two years ago. Either we insured the wrong man or Dr. Mayhood examined the wrong man. I don't know which. How have you done so far? Well, besides what I told you yesterday about Dr. Mayhood? Yeah. Well, he's in healthy financial shape. Not good or bad, but, you know, healthy. His house halfway paid for. He owns one car outright and has eight months to go on another one. All of which doesn't mean anything if he phonied up an insurance examination. Yeah, that's true, kiddo. That's true. You know, I've been thinking. This would have worked, but James Lansing died on the street and the city performed an autopsy. Death, malnutrition. 
For a private physician, without an autopsy hanging over him, it could have been heart failure or most anything. Jim, I think we can do whatever we want around here. Step on anybody's toes, make any kind of noise we like. With this kind of situation to investigate, we don't have to be careful. Easy, Johnny. Lansing's body's in the morgue. There's no doubt that it's him, Exhibit A. But we aren't sure that his $50,000 policy was issued legitimately. What are you getting to? Call the state insurance commission, Jim. Let them know we think this is a bad one from top to bottom. Let them know that so that when the beneficiary starts to complain, they can tell her. It might scare her and whoever helped her into being more ridiculous than they've been already. I'm going to hold off, Johnny. Why? Until I see how you and Dr. Mayhood make out at the morgue. Expense account item four, two dollars, cab fare. From my hotel to the Valley National Building. I picked up a scowling Dr. Mayhood and we drove over to the coroner's office. Mr. Dollar, this is a waste of your time and mine. Sorry to inconvenience you, Doctor, but it's necessary. I suppose so. And I suppose you have a job to do. But I have a job, too. Mr. Franks, the insurance broker, telephones me and says he's sending over a man for a physical. I do the physical. It's immaterial to me whether the man I examine is qualified for insurance or not. My job is to examine him. It's up to the insurance company to determine... Yeah? Johnny Dollar, this is Dr. Mayhood. I believe Sergeant Younger phoned. Yeah, yeah, this way. Dollar, it's up to the insurance company to do what they want to about the examination. I understand all that, Doctor. Then don't ignore it with your high-pressure tactics. Because examination is the only part I have to do with this business. I examined a man named James Lansing two years ago. You have a copy of my findings on that examination. I stand on them. And don't forget it. I don't forget for one minute. Nor do I forget that what you found and what an autopsy surgeon found are completely different opinions on Lansing's physical condition. Here we go, boys. There's the body. Pull the sheet back, please. Yeah. Well, Doctor? I called my lawyer after you called me today. I won't be intimidated, Mr. Dollar. You aren't being intimidated, Doctor. You're being asked to cooperate. Then maybe I don't like the way you ask for cooperation. My attorney will be in my office to represent me if you bother me any more about this. You want to look at this body? Your attorney can't refute what's already been established, Doctor. You pronounced James Lansing in good physical condition two years ago. An autopsy report shows that when he died two days ago, he was in very bad physical condition. So bad that two years ago, he couldn't possibly have gone through a careful examination in your office without some of the symptoms being detected by you. Where is your medical degree and what responsibility? Oh, why don't you shut up and take a look and tell me if you've ever seen this man before? I won't be spoken to that way. Just a minute. I'll get an injunction and I'll charge malpractice and negligence if I have to. Oh? On what ground? You're being stupid, doctor. All you have to do is look at that corpse and tell me if he's the man you examined in your office two years ago. Well? I don't know whether I've seen this man before or not. Well, does he look familiar in any way? I can't say. I might have examined this man. I don't know. This is James Lansing, doctor. The name you filled in on your physical examination for the insurance. I know that. Is this the man you examined? I don't know. I honestly don't know. It was two years ago. If I see a man for three hours in the course of a physical examination, am I expected to remember his face or any details about him two years later? Is there any way you can determine whether or not this is the man you examined in your office? No. Not that I know of. Is there any way you can determine it? Believe me, Doctor, I can try. And I did try. That afternoon, over the protest of Dr. Mayhood... I took all of the personnel connected with his office down to the morgue. A nurse, a receptionist, the x-ray technician, and a laboratory worker. None of them recognized the body of James Lansing. Expense account item five, ten cents, one phone call to Jim Carter, who'd spent the day preparing the necessary forms for the insurance commission and gathering data on Lansing's beneficiary. You think Dr. Mayhood was in on it? He's too mad, too belligerent, Jim. You don't sound too sure. Well, and maybe he just strikes me as an inept doctor. Well, let's say Mayhood's way down on my list. He examined a man who said he was James Lansing. It could have been anybody. All right, we'll let it go that way for a while. Any ideas? I'm on my way out to Lansing's old address. He had an apartment on the other side of town. I want to see how he's lived out there. Still want me to go ahead with the insurance commission? Yeah, go ahead. (laughs) 
The manager at James Lansing's apartment house happened to be a woman named Anita Regan. She also happened to be willing to go back down to the coroner's office with me and view the mortal remains. There you are. Oh. Have you ever seen this man before, Mrs. Regan? Yes, yes, sir. That's, that's Mr. Lansing, apartment 34. You're positive? Oh, yes. I've seen him every day for almost two years. Okay. Want to smoke? I want to get out of here. Oh, sure. I don't know why I'm acting this way. He doesn't look any different now than he's looked before. I've seen him stretched out like that a hundred times. One? I mean, almost like that. Out, stony. Only I guess it's because I knew he was just drunk then, not dead. Oh, I see. He was crazy carrying on the way he did. <laughs> Feels good to be out in the sunlight again. Yeah. I'll take that smoke now, Mr. Dollar. Oh, sure. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Lansing used to get up around 10 every morning. He'd look awful, but he was always kind of nice, polite, you know. He'd be regular as clockwork. He'd walk past my door and tip his hat and go right down to the store and come back in a little while with a sack of groceries, a bottle of milk for his cat, some donuts for himself, and some booze. Uh-huh. And then he'd just lock himself up in his apartment and stay there all day, drinking. Real alcoholic, huh? Well, I'd say so. At least I wasn't surprised he starved to death. He can't live on whiskey. He was fried to the ears by noon every day, as long as I knew him. Mr. Lansing didn't work then. Well, I think he tried to sell real estate once, a long time ago. Oh? But how could he? I understand he was a retired engineer or something like that. He pays rent? Oh, yes. Always seemed to have enough money to get along. Did he have any family, Mrs. Regan? Well, I know he's got a sister living in town somewhere. What about his friends? They seem to do all his drinking alone. Say, you're from the insurance company. You should know about his family. Apparently, there are a lot of things we don't know. Hmm? A man named James Lansing moved into your apartment house two years ago. He didn't work, but he had enough money for his rent and his liquor. He also had enough money to buy some expensive insurance. Very expensive. Somehow, he passed an insurance examination, and then he suddenly died. No one, nothing. Just one beneficiary. Mr. Dollar, you don't suppose somebody just gave him enough money to get along so he'd drink himself to death, do you? That's one way of looking at him, Mrs. Regan. Oh, that poor man. That poor, poor man. I spent another hour with Mrs. Regan, gathering as much background as I could about the last two years of James Lansing's life. I also spoke to the janitor of the building and two of the tenants. They all verified the fact that Lansing had been drinking heavily for better than 18 months prior to his death. No one seemed to know why. Jim Carter had an answer. I talked to our man in L.A., Johnny. Lansing lived there before he came to Tucson. He had several arrests for drunkenness, never married. One time he made his living as an engineer. Finally, he got fired for drinking on the job. Yeah, just one of those chronic cases. First arrest was back in 1939. How's the beneficiary holding him? The sister? Yeah. Well, Mrs. Kennedy was pretty upset when the insurance commission notified her we were in town making an investigation, indignant, put out, things like that. She wanted to know how long it would take... This all comes secondhand from the insurance commission. Uh, Johnny, hmm? a broker named Hillary Franks sold a policy. What have you got on him? Hillary Franks has represented worldwide insurance in this area for 17 years. Uh, you're stalling, kiddo. Sure, I'm stalling, Jim. Because we're right down to the meat of it now, and it makes me sick. There's only one person who stood to benefit by having James Lansing insured. That's the beneficiary, his sister, Arlene Kennedy. So? Jim, you know as well as I do, somebody else had to take the physical examination in Dr. Mayhood's office. Someone had to help her arrange that. Someone had to help her get Lansing's signature on the policies. She couldn't have pulled it off by herself without gumming it up. She had to have expert help. Hillary Franks. Yeah, Hillary Franks. 17 years, broker, worldwide insurance company. Okay, the salesman's the first one to come under suspicion in a case like this, outside of the beneficiary, so let's get on with it. All right, Jim. Uh, One thing. What? Hillary Franks knows we'll be looking at him, and he knows he's under suspicion. That worry you? A little bit. After 17 years in the business, he should also know where we're going to be before we get there. 
If he did something as dumb as try to work a $50,000 fraud on his own insurance company, he might do something even dumber. If so... Well, what's the 38, Jim? Here. From now on, Johnny, you better carry this. There'll be another intriguing episode of the Lansing Fraud tomorrow. Tomorrow? Well, tomorrow there's a bit of excitement when a pair of thieves start a falling out. Matter of fact, a lot of excitement. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Arlene Kennedy. You called my home, Mr. Dollar? Oh, yes, Mrs. Kennedy. I'm with Universal Adjustment Bureau. We're investigating the matter of James Lansing's death. Your what? We're investigating your brother's death before we take action on your claim as his beneficiary. Under the circumstances, we have to do this, Mrs. Kennedy. I'd like to talk to you about it, if I may. How would you like to talk to my lawyer, Mr. Dollar? Sure, if you think it's necessary. I'd rather talk to you first. Why? Well, frankly, the insurance company isn't satisfied that this is a legitimate claim. You mean you're not satisfied? All right, then I'm not satisfied, and I represent the company in this matter. Look, we won't get anywhere this way, Mrs. Kennedy, if you'll just... (sighs) Tonight and every weekday night... Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Tucson, Arizona. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lansing fraud. $50,000 worth. Expense account continued. Item 6, $10, car rental. To get to Catalina Vista, where Arlene Kennedy maintained a $55,000 home. It was a warm, sunny day, incredibly clear. I enjoyed it in my drive. However, I can't say I enjoyed Arlene Kennedy. That's as far as you need to come. What? You must be the Mr. Dollar I spoke to on the phone. If you didn't get the idea on the phone, I'll tell it to you again. I don't want to talk to you. Now, please get away from my home. We'll have to talk sometime. I don't think so. I know so, Mrs. Kennedy. I must ask you to take your briefcase and get out of here, Mr. Dollar, now. I'm sorry you feel that way. Look, my brother Jim drank himself to death. I don't know why. I just know he did it. He's dead. I'm his beneficiary. Why don't you pay me what you owe me? We will, Mrs. Kennedy, if the circumstances are right. So far, though, we have reasonable doubt. Uh, And this investigation is for your benefit as much as it is ours. I can hardly believe that. When we've satisfied ourselves one way or the other, your claim will be settled. The whole situation's cut and dry. I'm afraid it isn't. Mr. Dollar, I've had enough of this. I'll turn the matter over to my attorneys. 
Mrs. Kennedy, I don't carry this briefcase to impress anybody, but I thought it might interest you. I have in it a copy of the physical examination your brother took two years ago when he applied for his insurance policy. I have a copy of the coroner's report and the results of the autopsy. I don't care what you have. Then maybe you'd just be interested in the conclusion. We have to discredit one item or the other. That's why we can't take any action on your claim yet. Goodbye. Wait. What is it you want to know? I haven't seen my brother in well over two years, three years. I can't tell you a thing about him. Were you on good terms with him? Of course I was. I was the only one he had in the world. He left me his insurance money, didn't he? Did he leave you anything else? He didn't have anything else. I understand there was a trust in the family. He spent his a long time ago. I understand you're a widow, Mrs. Kennedy. I don't see what bearing that Do you have any dependents? No children, that's what you mean. The money from the policy would have gone to you alone. Let me correct you. The money will come to me alone. I don't know what you people think you can do trying to weasel out of this payment, but I've already spoken with my attorneys, and they've advised me to sue for an immediate settlement and damages. Perhaps I can save you some fees and your attorney some time, Mrs. Kennedy. Where can I contact them? Never mind. You'll find out soon enough. I hope you won't allow them to go so far as a courtroom without speaking to me. We'll see about that, too. I don't need your advice. Now, look, I'm going to tell you exactly what I'd tell them. You can pass it on to them. Your brother could have died quietly in his bed one night, and any doctor would have pronounced him a heart failure, and your claim would have been honored without delay. But James Lansing made the mistake of dropping dead on a public street, and the police took over, and before he was properly identified, an autopsy had been performed. And I intend to sue the city for that kind of liberty. They had no right to... They had every right. An unknown man, dead on the street from unknown causes. Now, don't be childish. Because of that autopsy, we know your brother couldn't possibly have passed an insurance examination two years ago or ten years ago. Not with the amount of bad health he'd collected. But he did pass it. The insurance company accepted him as a client. They issued a policy, and you can't deny it. Jim came to me the day after he took out that policy and told me I was his beneficiary. You said he... You said you hadn't seen him for well over two years. He took the exam a year ago last July. All right, I saw him that one time. Look, I'll lay it right on the line, Mrs. Kennedy. We don't think your brother ever took that physical examination. What? Someone else went up to Dr. Mayhood's office and took it for him. Someone who could pass it. Mrs. Kennedy, we aren't fools, and we don't like to be fooled. Now, we're going to find out who that someone was and how it was done. We're used to all sorts of tricks in this business and all sorts of bluffing, too. You can sue us for a settlement. You can sue us all over the place. With what I have right now, I'd be willing to meet you in a courtroom. I'm talking facts to you, Mrs. Kennedy, and I wish you'd talk them to me. Get out of here. Get out of here, you cheap snooper, before I call the police and have you thrown out. Some more expenses. Item seven. Six dollars. Lunch. For Jim Carter and myself. We'll pass the cream, Johnny. Thanks. Well, what do you think, Jim? Mrs. Kennedy? Yeah. Well, it's hard to say. She's going to make it as tough as she can for us, judging from her attitude toward you this morning. How does the commission feel? Well, they feel very badly that something like this has come up. They've requested us to act with discretion and to act swiftly. There's certain the entire matter can be settled without legal action. You pass the sugar. Uh-huh. Right. Aren't they going to cooperate? They aren't going to do anything until we show cause. They did mention that their action will take place in ten days, so that means we've got ten days to write such a statement. Tell me what you've learned about Mrs. Kennedy. Well, she was widowed five years ago. Her husband was a lawyer. He left her $40,000 in insurance and $15,000 in debts. Her family, the Lansings, had money at one time. Enough so that she gets one half of one-tenth of one percent of an oil company out on the coast. It pays her about $750 a month. She managed to clear her house out in Catalina Vista and drive a Cadillac. But she could use $50,000. Of course she could use $50,000. Everybody could. Johnny, when are you going to start on the insurance agent? Hillary Franks, I've already started. If I know my Mrs. Kennedy, she won't call a lawyer or anybody else right now. She'll talk to her agent, Mr. H. Franks, and he'll have to come to us. I don't have to go to him. Johnny. When you buy a radio and it goes bad, you call up the store. They didn't manufacture the set, but you complain to them just the same. Same thing with insurance. You don't call up the company, you call up the agent who sold it to you. Hillary Frank has to call me, Jim, just to look legitimate. I hope you're right, kiddo. After lunch, I went back to my hotel room and opened up the file Jim Carter had collected on Hillary Franks. Hillary Franks, age 56, college graduate, married, two children, wife deceased, income good. No record of any kind for any offense. Highly thought of by worldwide insurance officials. The 17 years with the company sort of got me. He started as an agent when he was 39. This is Hillary Franks. Hi, Hillary. 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 Hi, H
This is Henry Franks, Mr. Dollar. Yes, sir. I understand you're in town on a little investigation for the home office. I wonder if we could have dinner. As a matter of fact, I was going to call you, Mr. Franks. The policy I'm working on was written by you. Yes, I understand that. Mrs. Kennedy, the beneficiary, called me today. Seemed very upset. I thought perhaps we could discuss it over dinner. Anything wrong with right now at your office? Why, nothing. I suppose you're Mr. Dollar. Yes. Maria, that's my secretary. She's already drawn for the day. I'm sorry you had to wait so long. Mr. Hillary Franks looked straight life insurance from the top of his iron gray hair to the tips of his polished brown shoes. He had a quiet manner about him and a pair of large brown eyes that looked wide open and honest. Come in. Come in, Mr. Dollar. Thank you very much for coming over. I was surprised when Mrs. Kennedy called me about this matter today. Surprised to learn that you were in town. Were you? Um, she said you'd been over to her home this morning. That's right. <laughs> well, just what is this all about? We have reason to believe Mrs. Kennedy is a party to an attempted fraud, Mr. Franks. I gathered it was something like that. I've been writing policies for worldwide insurance for 17 years, Mr. Dollar. And this is the first time anything like this has ever happened on one of them. I believe you, Mr. Franks, and your record. But there's a first time for everything. Uh, yes, I... I'm here to find out all I can about the circumstances under which you sold the policy to Mrs. Kennedy's brother. Nothing unusual about it, Mr. Dollar. I think there was. Eh? James Lansing was a bachelor. He lived in a fairly nice apartment on the other side of town. No dependents. Now, what made James Lansing a prospect for life insurance, Mr. Franks? Well, it's more of a personal thing, really, I suppose. My wife and I were interested in buying a home a couple of years ago. It was one we liked in Catalina Vista. The real estate agent happened to be James Lansing. That's how we first became acquainted. Uh-huh. Mrs. Franks and I saw Lansing, oh, two or three times. Had dinner together, you know. And I managed to sell him the policy. I understood he was an engineer. He had been at one time in Los Angeles. And he was only engaged in the real estate business here for a oh, very short time. Really a matter of a few months. I see. Did he do very well at it? I don't think so. I don't think he worked hard at it. You see, he had a fairly comfortable income from money left by his father. You uh, didn't buy the house from him? No. Too much? No. Mrs. Franks died rather suddenly about that time, and I had no need to buy a home. But out of the association, you interested Lansing in buying insurance from you? Yes. What kind of a man was he? What do you mean? Well, uh, just your opinion, Mr. Franks. Well, just a client, Mr. Dollar. I, I looked at him and treated him just... To... Same as any other client. But you saw him socially several times, had dinner with him. Do you do that with all your clients? I might. Uh, I remember he was trying to sell me something, too. Ah, sure. <laughs> How'd he look? What? Oh, pale, thin, emaciated, what? Oh, he looked fine to me. Did he drink much? Well, uh, I don't recall. Think. It's important. Well, uh... I don't recall. Then I'll recall for you, Mr. Franks. Lansing did drink a lot on those occasions. As a matter of fact, he was soaked up most of the time. Oh, well, that's not true, Mr. Dunn. You know as well as I do, he was an alcoholic in Los Angeles, and he was an alcoholic here in Tucson. He died of malnutrition, a direct result of his alcoholic condition. Well, uh, I'm not a doctor. I had no way of ascertaining that. You don't have to be a doctor to smell booze, Mr. Franks. Did you ever meet his beneficiary? You mean his sister, uh, Mrs. Kennedy? No, no, I, I think I told you she telephoned me today. Never met her at all? No. Mr. Franks, I'm going to leave you for a while, and I want you to think about all we've discussed. When I come back, I might ask you the same questions again. And I'll expect some different answers. Anything you say, Mr. Dunn. Hillary Franks, 17 years insurance broker, was a bad liar. He was worse than that. He was a stupid, awkward, unprepared liar with no idea of what he was up against. He knew I was going to get him and get him good. And he didn't know what to do about it. 
I almost felt sorry for him. There'll be another intriguing episode of the Lansing Fraud tomorrow. Tomorrow, a bad liar turns into a pretty good gunman. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Jim Carter, Johnny. Hi. How'd you make out with Hillary Franks? The agent who sold the policy? He's worried, he's scared, and he's already doing everything wrong. I left him about an hour ago to think things over. Ah, Mrs. Kennedy's fighting back. What do you mean? Her lawyer served notice on us an hour ago to pay up on the policy or else. Just a bluff. Yeah, but this wasn't. She got a court order and made the coroner release her brother's body. She took it right to the crematorium. Exhibit A is a pile of ashes by now. Uh Uh-oh. Her next step is to contact the state insurance commission and have them order us to pay off or show cause. We'll have to act fast. Maybe I'd better go back to see Mr. Hillary Franks. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, Tucson, Arizona. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lansing fraud. Fifty thousand. And by now, I was sure it was fraud. Expense account, item number eight, five dollars, stenographic services. I dictated a hastily composed letter to the State Insurance Commission advising them that Worldwide was withholding payment on the claim of Mrs. Arlene Kennedy pending a complete investigation of the circumstances of her brother's death. I enclosed copies of the original physical examination and the coroner's autopsy findings pointing out that in our opinion it was impossible for James Lansing to have successfully passed an insurance examination in the first place. I enclosed copies of statements from the examining physician, Dr. Mayhood, and the members of his office staff, all of whom were unable to identify the body of James Lansing. Expense account item 9, 52 cents, postage. I sent the letter to the state capitol special delivery in the hope it would arrive there before Mrs. Kennedy's lawyers took the anticipated action. After that, I drove back over to the office of Hillary Franks. He was the same as I left him an hour before. A little shaken, but still unable to realize quite what was happening. Yes, Mr. Dollar? Mr. Franks, I wonder if you've got anything to say to me. Nothing, Mr. Dollar. I was hoping you might want to make a statement. Oh? About what? Mrs. Kennedy's attempting to defraud your insurance company. I don't know what you're talking about, Mr. Dollar. I sold her brother an insurance policy. I don't even know, Mrs. Kennedy. There are a lot of things about this you say you don't know. Do you want me to lay it on the line? If you like. All right. Someone else had to take that physical examination for James Lansing two years ago. 
I think you arranged for someone to do it, or you helped Mrs. Kennedy arrange it. I think James Lansing was insured on that basis. I think he was insured with a clean intent to defraud. Lansing's health wouldn't permit that kind of insurance. Right now, our Los Angeles men are looking into Lansing's activities there. Somewhere along the line, they're going to turn up a medical history that'll show Lansing was already dying when he came to Arizona two years ago. Now, do you have anything to say, Mr. Franks? No. I think you're being very foolish. If it isn't clear how serious this can be with you, it's noted that you arranged for Lansing's physical examination. There's nothing incriminating in that. How well do you know Dr. Mayhood? Oh, slightly. The physician is supposed to be an impartial third party. When a client has to be examined by a physician for insurance purposes, I send him to Dr. Mayhood. That's all. Dr. Mayhood sends me a Christmas card every year. I sent James Lansing to him. Just like any other? Just like any other. Oh, you worry me, Mr. Franks. You don't object to my questions or get ruffled when you're caught lying. I've given you time to think and time to make a statement regarding your part in this matter. I resent all this, Mr. Dollar. I've been an insurance broker for a good long time, and no one has ever questioned my integrity. And I think that's what you've been banking on, Mr. Franks, your reputation. Well, I've been questioning it ever since I got here, and I still question it. You couldn't have known James Lansing without being aware of his drinking habits. I'm sorry for you, Franks, but there had to be collusion here with a beneficiary, Mrs. Kennedy. And you're the logical party. Uh, Dollar... You arranged for someone else to take that examination for Lansing. Somebody who could pass it. Now, I've given you a chance to talk to me, but you refuse. Now we'll see how you like talking to the police about it. What? I'm going to swear out a warrant for your arrest. Dollar, I'm going to charge you with attempted fraud and collusion. And I'm going to swear out a warrant for Mrs. Kennedy, too. You're going to... Oh! Oh! In the three minutes it took me to recover from the blow from the paperweight and get my breath inside of me and my feet under me, Hillary Franks was well out of the way and out of sight. About that time, Jim Carter walked in. Hey, what happened to you? Hillary Franks. He got scared, swung a paperweight at me and beat it. Well, if he's playing rough, I don't want to take any chances. No, I'll put that phone down. He hasn't admitted anything yet. Smacking you on the side of the head is admittance enough for me. No, I want a statement. I think I can get one. You have to find him first, and he's running. He won't run far, Jim. What makes you so sure? Hillary Franks doesn't know how to run. It was exactly 3 o'clock in the afternoon, then. At 3.25, I was back out in Catalina Vista knocking on a familiar door. And the same familiar things began to happen all over again. What do you want? I'm here to tell you about the trouble you're in, Mrs. Kennedy. Hillary Franks gave it all away. Gave what away? Who's Hillary Franks? What are you talking about? About that insurance policy that was written up and issued in your brother's name. You're the one who stood to gain most by your brother's death after having someone else take an insurance examination for him. But you had to have help to pull it off. Hillary Franks helped you. For what reason or how you got him to do it, I don't know. But I do know a man with a 17-year record as insurance broker is ruined. You're crazy. I don't know anybody named Hillary Franks. Now, get out of here. Oh, stop it, will you? I told him how he stood in this matter a half hour ago, and he socked me with a paperweight and beat it. I've had about enough of you, But he isn't going to run far. Principally because he doesn't know how to run, Mrs. Kennedy. He'll cool off, and he'll begin thinking about all this business in a new light. A few minutes ago, it dawned on him what he'd done. He kicked his whole lifetime right out the window. He'd been found out. He's lost all around. And he's going to be mad about that. And you're the one he's going to be mad at because you got him into it. I told you, I don't know anybody named Hillary Franks. That's the last time I'll say it. He'll probably want to kid you, Mrs. Kennedy. What? I said he'll think about all this and he'll probably want to kill you. Do we talk now? I don't see why. I've done nothing wrong. Who did you get to take that physical for your brother? I don't know what you're talking about. You got your brother drunk enough to sign the insurance papers, didn't you? I had nothing to do with my brother taking out life insurance and naming me his beneficiary. That was his business. Now that he's dead, it's my position to receive the payment. That's all. (sighs) Okay, Mrs. Kennedy. We'll get it all from Hillary Franks. Yes, why don't you do that? In the meantime, I hope you sleep well knowing what you've done. You'll never be able to prove any of these things you're saying. Never.
And for 24 hours, it looked as if Mrs. Kennedy might have been right. There was no way to involve her unless we had a statement from Hillary Franks. And he was still missing. I set up a watch on Mrs. Kennedy's house, and Jim Carter kept an eye on Hillary Franks' place. About 10 o'clock that night, Jim Carter drove up. Hiya. Hi. Any action? No. Mrs. Kennedy's been in all the night. No one showed up. Mm-hmm. How about Frank's place? No. No one there when I left an hour ago. You'd think he'd come back for a suitcase or some money or something. Yeah. Hey, Johnny. Mm-hmm. I call in the police. Oh. In the name of Worldwide, I filed charges of attempted fraud and collusion against him. They issued a warrant a half an hour ago. He's on an APB and all the local bulletins. Well, I suppose you had to do it, Jim. Yeah. We'll let the police handle this part from now on, huh? How about Mrs. Kennedy? We'll keep an eye on her, too. Did you file any charges against her? Not yet. We need a statement from Franks. Jim. Yeah? What would you do if you were Hillary Franks? Yeah, try to grab an airplane. Maybe go down on a gallus, cross the border. Look up a friend, borrow some money. They get out and keep traveling. <laughs> what? He won't do anything like that. Won't he? He'll find himself a place to sit down and think. In the end, the cops won't find him. He'll find us. Want to bet? By the next morning, the police had still been unable to locate Hillary Franks. I left Jim Carter in the room on a long-distance call to the insurance commission advising them of the events up to date, drove out to Hillary Frank's office. I noticed two police officers loitering across the street as I walked in the front door. Yes? How do you do? Are you another policeman? No, no, I'm not. Have they been bothering you a lot? If you aren't a policeman and you know all about this, what do you want? I want to help Mr. Franks if I can. I'm Johnny Dollar, Universal Adjustment Bureau. You're his secretary? Yes. How long have you worked for him? Twelve years. Do you like him? What? He's always been a fine man. I don't believe any of these things about him, and I don't see What's why... What's your name? I think he said Maria? Maria Vano. Maria, I'm not going to ask you any questions about Mr. Franks. I know enough about him now for my purposes. The rest he can tell me himself. Maria, I may be able to help him stay out of jail... I can do that if I talk to him. Well, how My do name's I... Johnny Dollar. I'm at the Pioneer Hotel. Remember that. But, Mr. I Dollar... I don't know whether he's phoned you yet or not. A man like that's going to need help, money. I'm not asking you if he's contacted you. But listen to me carefully. If he does phone you or contact you in any way, ask him to phone me. If you ever respected him or if you want to help him now, please ask him to telephone me. Thanks. I drove back to the hotel and waited for results. Another 12 hours went by. Hillary Franks was still missing, and Mrs. Kennedy was still refusing to admit anything. Finally, about 11 o'clock that night, my phone rang. Johnny Dollar. Hello. This is Hillary Franks. Where are you? Never mind. Dollar, they know all about me back at the home office, I suppose. Yes. I'd like to explain some things to you so you can pass them on. I'd like the people back there to know why I did it. And, well, before I leave town... You won't get far. The police are looking for you. Oh, I can get away, all right. Mr. Franks, worldwide doesn't want to prosecute. The notoriety would be bad for them. If you'd make a statement, sign it, I think I could talk them into dropping the whole matter. Maybe we'd better get together. Come on over. Oh, no. No, I'm not that crazy. Do you know how to get to the San Javier Mission? I can find it. In 15 minutes? Right. And Dollar? Yeah? It's right out in the open. If you bring the police, I'll use a gun. I bought one this morning. All right, Mr. Franks. Hello, 
There'll be another intriguing episode of the Lansing Fraud tomorrow. Tomorrow, $50,000 worth of murder. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Jim Carter, Johnny. Anything on Hillary Franks? He just telephoned me two minutes ago. What? I'm on my way to meet him now and try and make a deal. I told him if he'd give me a statement about the attempt to fraud worldwide on Lansing's $50,000 policy, I'd do my best to have them drop charges. Well, you didn't make any promises, Johnny. I couldn't make any promises, Jim. But I'll do my best to see that the charges are dropped if he gives me that statement. Well, if he gives you that statement, I'll help you. Where are you meeting him? At the... At a place near here. He knows every cop in the area is looking for him. Yeah. Be sure he doesn't give you a bullet, kiddo. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar in Tucson, Arizona to the Universal Adjustment Bureau Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is a further accounting of expenditures during my investigation of... Well, it was a case of 50000 insurance to one Arlene Kennedy. Unless I could prove my point in the Lansing fraud. Expense account item 10, 10 bucks, cab fare, from my hotel to the Mission San Javier to talk to Hillary Franks, the insurance agent with no future ahead. I used a taxi cab instead of my rented car because I didn't want to waste time searching around for the mission. It was a few miles outside of town over rough and broken desert roads. An ancient missionary church standing stark against the moon-filled night. Here we are, mister. Good. Here. Keep the change. Well, don't you want me to wait for you? No. I'll get back okay. Not many places to call a cab from out here. Yeah, I know. One of the Padres, your friend? No, no, I'm new around here. You all right, mister? Hmm? You feel all right? You're loaded or something? No, why? We're coming out here at midnight. Well, it's just a whim, friend. Don't worry about it. I bet you're what. Mister? Yeah? You gonna meet somebody here or something? Why? I just saw a guy standing over by the bell tower. Oh, thanks. Good night, man. Here, Mr. Dollar. Careful, Dollar. Hillary Franks had a thirty-eight pointed right at my chest. In the bright moonlight, I could see that he was still wearing the same clothes he'd had on two days before in his office. He needed to shave, and judging from the circles under his eyes, he hadn't slept much. He was pale and shaken. A gun wobbled in his hand. Anybody with you? I came along. Did you tell anybody you were meeting me? Jim Carter. He's been working the case with me. Did you tell him where? No. Look, you don't need that gun, Franks. Put it away. I just came here to talk with you. All right. Thanks. Want a smoke? Thank you.
Why did you talk to Carter? What did he say? He said he'd help me try and have the charges dropped against you if you give us a statement. Now, you have two of us on your side, Mr. Franks, if you want to cooperate. Do you? I want to straighten out what I can, Mr. Dowd. Well, now's the time to do it. What was your deal with Arlene Kennedy, James Lansing's sister and beneficiary? I met Arlene Kennedy right after my wife died. I guess I was very low. Oh, that's perfectly natural. I became interested in Arlene because we had a great many things in common. So I thought. I mean, she was a widow and had no one except her brother, James Lansing, in Los Angeles. And we went together, and eventually I asked her to marry me. But she laughed at me. Why? I guess I'm not an exciting man, a witty one, or even an interesting one, Mr. Dollar. Mrs. Kennedy made me feel as though my whole life had been hopeless, useless. Raising children, selling insurance. She made me feel as though I'd miss a great deal in life unless I married her. What is it? What do you want from me? What do you want from life, I'd ask her. And she'd only laugh. Laugh at me. Go on. I I just can't tell you how desperate it made me feel. I I loved her, Mr. Dollar. I, I wanted her. Did she ever answer your questions? Oh, many times. She pointed out that her trust funds pay her over $700 a month for life. And she knew that my commissions and salary as a broker came to about the same. Oh, Mr. Dollar, we could have lived very comfortably on that kind of income... But Arlene talked of traveling, of Europe, of clothes, and, oh, I don't know, things her family had been able to afford for her once, many years ago. And she said she wouldn't marry unless we could look forward to that kind of life. She wanted $50,000 in cash instead of money just trickling in every month. That's about it. When did she get around to the proposition, her brother's insurance? Her brother came here from Los Angeles one day. The doctors there gave him a year or two to live. Oh, yes, he was pretty shot. Been drinking for years. He'd used up all his money, oh, a long time before. He asked Arlene to help him. She paid his apartment rent and gave him enough money for liquor. And then one day, one day she came right out with it. She said she was investing in him. And he was a good risk. Because she knew he'd die. That's how she put it to me. Mm -hmm. Arlene said all I had to do was see to it that her brother had a nice, fat policy. He was going to die. Why not cash in on it? I must have been crazy to even think about it. How did you work it? I mean, how did Dr. Mayhood pass him? I paid a man $100 to go to Dr. Mayhood's office and take the physical for Lansing. What was the man's name? Oh, no, no, I wouldn't tell you that, Mr. Dollar. He's not involved in anything. All right, I'll let that go. Once you arranged for Lansing to become insured, you and Mrs. Kennedy just planned on waiting for him to die. That was the general idea in view of what the Los Angeles doctors had said. <sighs> Once I'd done it, I mean, gotten him insured, it was too late to turn back. Did you want to turn back? Yes. What did Mrs. Kennedy say about backing well, out? She thought I was weak and afraid. Oh, then things weren't so good between you. Oh, they never were, Mr. Dollar. The idea was to wait for Lansing to die, collect the 50000 and get married, huh? I suppose so, yes, but... But once he was insured, she talked less and less about our getting married. You're leaving something out, Mr. Franks. Huh? Didn't she tell you exactly what kind of a position you were in? Didn't she fix it so that you couldn't make a move? Legally, she'd done nothing wrong. It was you who had arranged for the physical, you who had made the application for insurance in the name of her brother. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, she was clear about all that. And she told me so every time she felt like it. When you write down what you just told me and sign it, we can hold it over Mrs. Kennedy's head to prove attempted to fraud and collusion. Now, would you do that, Mr. Franks? Yes. Then I guess we'd better get back into town. All right. Come on, Mr. Franks. We walked three miles over to the highway, flagged down a car, and got back to the hotel about 2.30 in the morning, got Jim Carter out of bed. Enclosed, fine, notarized statement of Hillary Franks explaining his part in the matter regarding policy 678JN23L. Before he was finished, Carter had already telephoned the Tucson police, telling them that the charges were being dropped against Franks and that he was no longer a fugitive. 
Then he placed a long-distance call to Worldwide's president in Hartford. Jim Carter, sir. I want to ask you not to prosecute Hillary Franks in this matter. Yes, sir, he's given us a complete statement about the whole thing. I don't think we have to go any farther than that. Well, look, the guy made one mistake. The first one in 17 years, he suffered enough for it already. Yes, sir. Dollar feels that way, too. Yes, sir. I think it's okay, Mr. Franks. All right. I thank you. What are you going to do, Mr. Franks? Well, sure, I'll never sell insurance again. I, I think I'll close up and just move away. Far away. Thank you. Poor guy. Oh, let's clean up the rest of this and get out of this town. Sure, Johnny. Hillary Franks pulled out of Tucson that afternoon. When Mrs. Kennedy was shown a carbon of the enclosed statement of Hillary Franks, she instructed her attorneys to withdraw the suit against Worldwide. Expense account, item 11, $75, hotel and board while in Tucson. Item 12, $402.15, plane tickets, Tucson to Hartford for Carter and myself. We were scheduled to leave at 1.30 in the morning. Two hours before plane time, I dropped by Mrs. Kennedy's house to have her sign a release of all claims on the insurance company. And for other reasons. Kennedy to the couch, and I did what I could for her. I phoned the police and told them to bring an ambulance. After that, I began looking around. I found a dark stain on the window still leading outside of the back of the house. On the floor, a blood-stained letter opener. There was no gun in sight anywhere. I decided if I had been stabbed with a letter opener, it would be easier to try to make it out the back way than risk the street that was bound to be full of policemen any minute. I was right. <laughs> Hillary Franks was on a ledge of rock that rose above the back of the house. I ducked behind some cactus plants. Get away from me! You know I won't. You know I wouldn't when I let you walk out this afternoon. Johnny Dollar! That's right. Now put that gun away and come on off that ledge. Get away! Go away! You missed by a mile. You don't know anything about shooting a gun. Come on down. Stay where you are. Don't do anything foolish. I'm coming after you. I'll, I'll shoot! Good shot, Dollar. Can you walk? No. Why did you do it, Mr. Franks? I came back to see her tonight. She laughed at me. Said if we had gotten the insurance money, she she was planning to run away with, with someone else. Oh. She just used me all along. Mrs. Kennedy was dead when the police got there. Hillary Franks died en route to the receiving hospital. Item 13, 15 bucks, hotel, one more night in Tucson. Expense account total, $1,121.13. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another exciting story beginning next Monday night. Next week, a quick trip to New York, to the bright lights, the glamour of Broadway with its theaters, its actors, and, uh, yeah, some very bad actors. You might even say killers. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Mary Jane Croft, Vivi Janice, Jean Tatum, Hi Everback, Barney Phillips, Russell Thorson, and Howard McNear. 
Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Dollar. This is Ed Porter, Mr. Dollar. You called my office? Yes, I'd like to see you as soon as I can, Mr. Porter. Well, of course. How long have you been in town? About a half an hour. Are you all squared away? I've got a room and I've had a bath, if that's what you mean. Well, then I guess you're ready to go to work. I will be as soon as I put on some pants. You sound in a rush. I'm always in a rush when I think somebody might be chipping us out of $100,000. Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Western Life and Trust Company, 826 Spear Boulevard, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Markham matter. Expense account item one, $143.69, air transportation from Hartford to San Francisco. Item two, $17 for incidentals along the way, including transportation from the airport to the St. Francis Hotel. I walked the eight blocks to the Commodore building where Ed Porter had his office on the fourth floor. He was a short, thin insurance broker with a face like a tight drum. He apologized for the clammy weather as though it were his fault. He asked me how things were out on the East Coast and invited me to sit down and looked as uncomfortable as he was. I uh, got the telegram you were coming last night. Investigator, I've never met one in all my years in the business. Must be very interesting work. Yeah, yeah. Look, I don't want to take up too much of your time, Mr. Porter, but I would like to get some information from you. Oh, certainly, Mr. Dollar. What can you tell me about a man named Floyd Markham? Markham? Well, he's the husband of a client of mine. I've met him, but I really can't tell you too much about him. My dealings have always been with Mrs. Markham. She's my customer. Then tell me about Mrs. Markham. Oh, certainly. I, uh, I'm not going to ask why. I'm sure you have a good reason for coming all the way to San Francisco. The home office thinks I have an excellent reason. Uh, Yes. Uh, Mrs. Markham. Well, uh, I've known her for 20 years as a customer. She's wealthy, always has been, and she handles her money well, and she lives rather well. Mrs. Markham's the one who has the money, huh? Uh, Mr. Markham is a salaried man, an industrial engineer. Frankly, I think he depends on Mrs. Markham for his livelihood. Oh, yeah. These two checks were issued to Mrs. Markham this year. Recognize them? Mm, Yes, yes. Uh, Full payments on two endowment policies, $50,000 apiece. And they've cleared the bank. Anything wrong with them? Nothing wrong with the checks. On payoffs like this, I always take it in person. It's a custom, of course, to call and make an appointment and deliver the check to the client. Mm -hmm. And try to sell a little more insurance in the bargain. Well, that's about the idea, yes. Anything strange about Mrs. Markham when you delivered either one of these checks? No. Before I left Hartford, I looked up her insurance records. Her premiums are always paid right on the button. Mrs. Markham doesn't have a business office or a business manager handling her affairs. The checks are always personal checks on her personal account. Now, can you explain why someone like that might forget a third endowment policy? Why, no. Well, there is a third endowment policy. It matured this month. I have the check with me for $50,000. 
Well, yes, but this business of forgetting... Floyd Markham called Hartford and spoke to the head of the endowment division. He explained that Mrs. Markham was ill and didn't know whether or not a third policy existed. He said he was checking for her. Uh-huh. Now, you say you've known Mrs. Markham over a period of 20 years. Well, is she the kind of person who'd forget $50,000? Oh, no one forgets $50,000. Did you notice that both of those checks were deposited in the Markham's joint account? Well, no. Hmm. So they were. Maybe Mrs. Markham's feeling generous these days. Why do you say that? Well, they have a rather strange relationship as far as I've been able to perceive. I mean, what money he makes is his and what she has is hers. Oh, yeah. I always like to get out of that house because they never seem to me to be a very close couple in, in any way. But this seems to make sense now. How's that, Mr. Porter? Well, now, I called up and made an appointment to deliver both of these checks. The first time I went over, Mrs. Markham was ill. And the second time, she had just stepped out for a few minutes. Well, who accepted the checks? Mr. Markham. Both times? Yes. As a matter of fact, now that I think of it, he made the appointment on the phone both times. When was the last time you saw Mrs. Markham? Last spring. A check with the bank revealed that Mrs. Markham had not personally made a deposit since June the 18th. The deposit slips were initialed by Floyd Markham. The checks were endorsed by Leslie Markham. There had been no unusual withdrawals. Expense account item three, thirty dollars stenographic and notary services for the attached statements. Mrs. Markham has been having her hair done here for nearly ten years now. Once a week, every Thursday morning. Then she just stopped. I called her home, and Mr. Markham informed me that she was away on an extended trip. Mr. Markham called us, uh, it was last June, and informed us that Mrs. Markham was resigning her membership in the bridge club. I telephoned the house twice to see what was the matter. Mr. Markham answered both times and said Mrs. Markham was out. Well, she used to come in here two or three times a month. Made us go over the car from top to bottom. She hasn't been around now for seven or eight months. I don't know who's taking care of the car. Expense account item 430 cents, three phone calls to the Markham residence. I didn't state any particular business. I simply asked to speak to Mrs. Markham. Each time I called, a male voice answered. Each time, the male voice told me Mrs. Markham was out, she was ill, and she was away on a short trip. Industrial Management Limited, Floyd B. Markham President, has a three-room office suite near the Embarcadero. Ten years ago, it had been sensationally new and glassy. When I got there, the carpet was a little too thin and the varnish a little too thin, too. The whole place smelled faintly of mildew. Yes? I'd like to see Mr. Markham, please. Do you have an appointment? No, no, not exactly. My name is Harris. I'm with the Cleveland Pump Company. Pump company? Yes, we're setting in 38 of our installations at the new plant in Valparaiso. Didn't you get my letter? Well, I'm sorry. I'm afraid... May I ask your name again? Harris. Stephen B. Harris. Cleveland Pump Company. Oh, yes. Well, Mr. Harris, I'm afraid Mr. Markham never received your letter. When did you mail it? Uh, 30 days ago. Maybe it was two weeks. Well, tell Mr. Markham I'm here and I'll... I'm sorry, Mr. Harris. Mr. Markham isn't in the office just now. Oh. Well, I'll wait. Uh, well... Well? Uh, he won't be in today. As a matter of fact, he won't be in the rest of the week. Where can I call him? Well, I'm afraid that's impossible. Can't I call him at home? No. Now, look, is he in business or isn't he? Mr. Harris, Mr. Markham hasn't been in the office for six months or more. He's... he's tied up on a rather long-range project. What's your name? I'm Miss Beidler. Why didn't you say that in the first place, Miss Beidler? Well, Who else uh, can I talk to here? No one, I'm afraid. You mean that's all there is in this office? Just you and him? When he feels like coming in? I'll tell Mr. Markham you were here. The Markham house was on Fiera Della Street, about six blocks from the Fairmont Hotel. Stone walls, iron grill work, tangling ivy. An old house that had been built by rich people for rich people to live in. The kind of shabby-looking place that only New Yorkers and San Franciscans can get by with and still be called wealthy. I used Ed Porter's car with the Western Life and Trust Company emblem on the door, parked it in the driveway as close as I could to the entrance. It was exactly one o'clock when the door opened. 
He was tall and pretty with black hair and broad shoulders. Yes? What is it? I'd like to see Mrs. Markham, please. I'm Mr. Markham. Can I help you? My name's Dollar. I'm with Western Life and Trust Company. Mr. Porter called you? No, he didn't. Oh, well, it must have slipped his mind. He said he was going to call. What's it about? I brought a check from Mrs. Markham on her third endowment policy. Oh. Well, I'll give it to her. She isn't in right now. Well, I'm supposed to deliver it to her. I'll come back another time when she's in. No, you can give it to me. I'll see that she gets it. I'm sorry, Mr. Markham, but I have Look, to Look, I it. know you want to give her the check and try to sell her some more insurance. She's just not in the market. And you can save your little spiel where it'll do some good. Oh, you misunderstand me, Mr. Markham. I have to deliver this to her in person. What's your name again? Dollar. Johnny Dollar. Come in. I'll wait till she comes back and make an appointment. Mr. Porter told me he'd made it for three today, She's here, she's here. Just come in. Why the runaround? Mrs. Markham is desperately ill. I don't want to disturb her with things like like this. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. What's the trouble? Very serious anemia. So if if you'll just give me the I have a report to make out when I deliver this. I just Only take a minute to hand her the check. Then it'll be off my mind and off your mind. Now, look here, Mr... Didn't you call the company's home office about this check? I I called because Mrs. Markham requested me to call. Oh, yes. Just uh, wait here. In the little swirl of his exit, I smelled shaving lotion and guessed at the brand name. I also guessed that his suit cost $300, even if I didn't know what San Francisco tailor had made it. The shirt, the tie, the shoes were expensive, too. Yeah. Mr. Floyd Markham liked expensive things. I wondered if he dyed his hair to keep it all black. I wondered if he was 45 or 50. I also wondered why, in a house of that size, on that kind of street, a servant hadn't answered the door. This way, Mr. Dollar. He led me up a flight of stairs and finally into a high-ceiling room with a fireplace at one end. A gray-haired woman with a sharp, angular face was seated near the window, looking out over the city and the bay. She didn't turn her head when we came into the room, but I could see that her eyes were watery and slightly glazed. Please, don't take too long and don't upset her. Leslie. Leslie, dear. Yes, Floyd? This is Mr. Dollar from the insurance company. He has something for you. Be a good girl, Leslie, and speak to Mr. Dollar. How do you do? And, And ask him... Yes. How is Mr. Porter? Oh, he's uh, fine, Mrs. Markham, fine. He'll be sorry to hear that you've been ill. I really would rather that you didn't tell Mr. Porter. Oh. I'm satisfied to make my own slow recovery and not worry any of my friends. We'd like some sherry, Floyd. Now you know what the doctor said, Leslie. Mr. Dollar, you'd like some sherry, wouldn't you? Why, yes, I'd like that very much. Floyd? I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar. It's absolutely forbidden. And you know that, dear. Uh, Do you have the check, Mr. Dollar? (sighs) Yes, right here. Here you are, Mrs. Markham. Thank you. Is there anything else? Mr. Dollar? Well, uh... Mr. Dollar, I... Now, Leslie... Yes? What is it, Mrs. Markham? I'm very tired. Excuse me if I seem impolite. Good day. Good day, Mrs. Markham. Expense account item five, ten cents. Phone call to Ed Porter at his office. Uh, yes, Mr. Dollar? Look, Mrs. Markham's five, five, about 120, black hair, gray streak to the right of the part, blue eyes, looks about 40 years old, a good 40. Why, yes, that sounds like her. It's killing her, Mr. Porter. My guess is he's been at it for about six months. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Nobody will take a frown at face value anymore now that the word has gotten around about Jack Benny's return to the air. 
with Mary Livingston, Dennis Day, Rochester, Don Wilson, Mel Blank, Frank Nelson, and Mr. Kitzel, nothing less than your very best smile will do for the occasion. Tonight, and every Sunday night, hear CBS Radio's Jack Benny Show and give your sense of humor a real workout. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Markham Matter. Take a rich old house on a rich old street in San Francisco. Walk in with a legitimate insurance check for $50,000 and tell a man named Floyd Markham you want to deliver it to his wife. Tell him this when you know that no one has seen or heard from his wife in six months. Just tell him you want to see her. Insist that you see her. Then stand around and listen to him lie a couple of times. Then let him take you to her. Give her the check. Say goodbye. Twenty minutes after I walked out of the Markham's house and picked up Ed Porter, we drove back to the house and parked a hundred feet from the entrance. This is the darndest thing I ever heard of, Mr. Dollar. I'm not sure it's all clear to me. What's our position? Oh, I wouldn't know that, Mr. Porter. That's up to the legal department. This much I'm sure of right now. Markham's already deposited a hundred thousand dollars of her insurance money into a joint account. If I'm not mistaken, this last check will go into that account, too. Right now, while we're sitting here, she's probably endorsing that check. Well, then I don't see where it's any of our He's business. making her endorse the check. He's making her stay in that house, in that room, away from everybody. Well, how? What way? He said she was ill. You said she appeared ill. I don't I see... I don't a... know how he's doing it, but I'm going to find out. Are you sure this isn't all surmise on your part? You weren't in the room when she said, let's have some sherry. Please, let's have some sherry. Well, I must be pretty She was dumb, really I saying, trying to say, she wanted him to leave the room so she could talk to me. So she could have one little minute to tell me what the matter is, what's going on. His next move is to deposit that check. Then one big withdrawal, the whole 150000 and bye-bye Floyd Markham. Mr. Dollar, I'm just an insurance broker. I don't understand that... Well, how'd you like to be an investigator hmm? for about ten minutes? Me? Yeah. You see that car that just pulled up in the driveway? Well, yes, yes. The girl driving it holds down that dummy office of Markham's. Her name's Bidler. She might be in on this with him. And that's Mr. Markham leaving the house. Good. Now, look, here's what you do. Follow them. I think I know where they're going, but you follow them and make sure. Well, where are they going? To the bank to deposit that check. Oh. Well, where are you going? To have that glass of sherry, Mr. Porter. Ed Porter pulled his hat down low over his face and put both hands on the wheel and took out after that 55 Cadillac sedan. I crossed the street, went back up on the porch of the house and knocked. I didn't expect her to answer. I didn't expect anyone to answer, but I wanted to make sure. I went around to the garden. There wasn't a sound in the big old house when I opened the garden door and went up the stairs again. The door to her room was closed. She wasn't by the window anymore. She was stretched out on the divan. I felt her wrist for a pulse. It was there, faint, but there. About three inches up her arm, there was a series of little marks. I lifted one eyelid and felt her neck muscles. She was doped to the ears. Mrs. Markham. Mrs. Markham, can you hear me? Look, I've come to help you. Me? Yes. Yes, I'm going to take you out of here. Now, don't be frightened. Mr. Dollar? That's right. That's right. That's the ticket. An insurance company? Yes. Now I remember. Yes, that's right. Thank you for bringing my check. I don't want... Want... Want what, Mrs. Markham? Want any of my friends to worry. Oh. I'm improving... But I don't want them to know I'm ill. Just say I'm out of town for a while. He told you to say that, didn't he? Yes. He told me to say exactly that. Mr. Dollar, don't fool me. Please don't fool me. What? You will help me get out of here. You aren't fooling me, are you? Are you? I carried her downstairs and put her in my car and drove her to the St. Regis Emergency Hospital. Expense account item six one hundred dollars deposit with the hospital office. 
I explained as much as necessary to the intern who promised to advise me when Mrs. Markham became rational. After that, I drove back to the house. Ed Porter's blue coupe was parked across the street. I didn't know what to do but come back here. And when I got back, I didn't know what to do either. Slow down, slow down. You're doing fine. Oh, you were right. You were absolutely right. They went straight to the Bank of America to deposit that money. I kind of thought they might be back here by now. No, no, they're over at Angelo's having a drink and some dinner. I followed them there. You're getting to be quite a sleuth, Mr. Porter. Well, I try to do my best and use my head. Uh, Mr. Dollar, did you talk to Mrs. Marker? As much as I could. She was doped. I took her out and put her in the hospital. Oh. Well, should you have done that, Mr. Dollar? I could have left her up in that room to die, Mr. Porter. Oh, yes. Yes. Well, uh, what's our next move? Ours? Well, certainly. I can't quit now, Mr. Uh, Johnny. (laughs) Well, let's go to Angelo's, Eddie. (laughs) Ed Porter settled the hat lower on his ears and gripped the wheel harder, and we took off for Angelo's on Stoker Street. When we got there, we didn't have to go inside to see if our people were still around. The Cadillac sedan was in the parking lot. So we took up a plant across the street. Well, why wait? Why not go in and take them out of there and take them down to the police? Well, that might blow the whole thing. Now we have to wait and see what Mrs. Markham has to say when she's well enough to talk. Yeah, but... Uh... I'm sure she'll have some charges to prefer. In the meantime, we wait and see what's what. Yeah, what do you think he'll do when he goes home and finds her gone? <laughs> well, that'll be pretty interesting. What do you think he'll do? Well, I I imagine he'll, um... uh, He'll think she got up and walked out. No, no, he knows better than that. He's had her doped up for six months. He knows he can go out of the house and she'll stay right where he left her while he's gone. No, that isn't it. Oh. But then he'll know that she had help. That's more like it, Mr. Porter. Uh, I I liked Eddie. It uh, gives me kind of a feeling. Okay, Eddie. Now answer the question. Oh, uh, what'll he do? Well, uh... It's, he'll try to get out of town. That's it. He'll try to leave town. He'll know that he's had it. Come on. Huh? They're pulling out. We followed them to a cocktail lounge near the Presidio. We waited around outside the place for two hours. Expense account item seven twenty-five cents. I called the St. Regis Receiving Hospital. Mrs. Markham's condition was unchanged. Item eight, two dollars, two hamburgers, two Cokes and cigarettes for Mr. Porter and myself. We had just finished eating when Floyd Markham's Cadillac turned out onto the street. We followed it for ten minutes. When Markham parked on a dark hill, we cut our lights and came to a stop. Mr. Dollar? Yeah, Eddie? Can you see what they're doing? Yeah. What? Necking. Huh? Necking, you know. I should have telephoned my wife. At 12.10, Floyd Markham turned the car around and drove back into town. We followed once more. We saw him double park outside a four-story apartment house on a steep hill, let the woman out, then drive off. Eddie? Yeah, Johnny? Think you can handle something else alone? Oh, I'd love to. Women sometimes talk a lot easier than men. You keep on him. When he finds his wife absent, I want to know where he goes. Wherever it is, I'll let you know. You gonna shake her down? Uh, Something like that. Get going. I watched my new assistant investigator follow out after Markham's Cadillac. Then I went inside the apartment house. I, Bidler, was on the mailbox of apartment 104. I walked down the hall, listened a minute, and gave it a try. Yes? Well, what on earth are you doing? I'm here to see you, Miss Bidler. It's important. You're, um, Mr. Harris. I'm Mr. Dollar, Johnny Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. Oh, there was something about you today. I I wasn't sure. Now you're sure. Oh, what are you doing? Right now, I'm working for Western well, Life and Trust Company. You better sit down. Well, I don't know that I'd better do anything, Mr. Dollar. You're rather rude. Then you can stand. We've been checking into Floyd Markham. I don't think I have to tell you what we found out so far. I think you also know that by this time tomorrow, he'll be in jail and you might be right along with him. I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar. I simply oh, don't... don't be under- sorry. Just use your head. I said you might be right along with him. On the other hand, if you have some useful information, the insurance company might be useful to you. What do you mean? Well, I figure he sold you on a, an island trip or uh, an estate in the country bill of goods. It'll be hard at getting it out of him, but we'll get it one way or another. We'll get it all right. 
Now, what do you want to do? I... I want a drink. You? Oh, thanks. I'm... I'm not bad. I'm... I'm not a criminal. I, I've never been in trouble. You are now. Why? Because I fell in love with him? Because you were helping him kill her. What are you talking about? Mrs. Markham. She's in a hospital right now. What? I took her there myself today. He's had a dope with I don't know what for months. Having us sign checks and those deposit slips. <sighs> Funny. Is it? He told me that Mrs. Markham was out of town. Divorcing him. I wondered how I... You were right. It was a country estate. In England. A genteel life, he said. The London theater. Walks in the country. Little harmless things that most people can never do. He said we could do them as soon as he cleaned up his affairs. By tonight, he said we could start pack... packing. I took Iris Bidler with me back to the Markham house. The Cadillac was in the garage and Ed Porter's blue coupe was pulled up across the street. When he saw us in the cab, he walked up. Hi. Hi. How's he doing? Uh, you can talk in front of her. Well, he, he hasn't done anything. No, I mean, I saw the light go on upstairs in Mrs. Markham's room, then it went out again. He's downstairs now, sitting in the living room. Okay, wait here. Uh. Hello, Markham. Hello. If you're worried about your wife, which I doubt, she's in a hospital. Are you a policeman? Insurance investigator. That's Miss Beidler in the taxi over there. Oh. I want you to come with me now. Of course. Yes. Uh, you said your name was Dollar? That's right. Why couldn't you have come around, say, next week? She'd have been dead by then. That's the way she should have been for 16 years. Dead. Yeah. Come on, Markham. Expense account, item 9, $102, hotel and board in San Francisco. Item 10, $116, airfare back to Hartford. Item 11, $42.16, miscellaneous. Remarks? This one will wind up in court. Mrs. Markham's charges will include attempted homicide, attempt to defraud, attempt to... In the end, it was his attempt to run away, and it didn't work. It never works. Even if you get away, you find something new to run from. Total expenses, $968.20. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Before I do, I want to say something to you about Thanksgiving. Now, there's a day that deserves celebration. And heartfelt thanks to the God who made us for being able to live in the most free and peaceful and bountiful country in the world. And yet, why wait for next Thursday or any Thanksgiving day? For Americans, it seems to me, Thanksgiving should be every day. Think about it, won't you? Next week in our story, New Orleans, the French Quarter, a beautiful girl, and high adventure. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in tonight's cast were Lois Corbett, Frank Nelson, Virginia Gregg, Bert Holland, Paula Winslow, and John Daner. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. 
Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs>